Memoirs of General William T. Sherman By William T. Sherman Volume I How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit CompleteAudiobooks.com for more quality content. Note. General W. T. Sherman. His Comrades in Arms. Volunteers and Regulars. Nearly ten years have passed since the close of the Civil War in America, and yet no satisfactory history thereof is accessible to the public. Nor should any be attempted until the government has published, and placed within the reach of students, the abundant materials that are buried in the War Department at Washington. These are in process of compilation. But, at the rate of progress for the past ten years, it is probable that a new century will come before they are published and circulated, with full indexes to enable the historian to make a judicious selection of materials. What is now offered is not designed as a history of the war, or even as a complete account of all the incidents in which the writer bore a part, but merely his recollection of events, corrected by a reference to his own memoranda. Which may assist the future historian when he comes to describe the whole, and account for the motives and reasons which influenced some of the actors in the grand drama of war. I trust a perusal of these pages will prove interesting to the survivors, who have manifested so often their intense love of the cause which moved the nation to vindicate its own authority. And, equally so, to the rising generation, who therefore may learn that a country and government such as ours are worth fighting for, and dying for, if need be. If successful in this, I shall feel amply repaid for departing from the usage of military men, who seldom attempt to publish their own deeds, but rest content with simply contributing by their acts to the honor and glory of their country. William T. Sherman General St. Louis, Missouri, January 21, 1875 I, from 1820 to the Mexican War 1820 to 1846 According to Cothran, in his History of Ancient Woodbury, Connecticut, the Sherman family came from Dedham, Essex County, England. The first recorded name is of Edmund Sherman, with his three sons, Edmund, Samuel, and John, who were at Boston before 1636, and farther it is distinctly recorded that Honorable Samuel Sherman, Rev. John, his brother, and Captain John, his first cousin, arrived from Dedham, Essex County, England, in 1634. Samuel afterward married Sarah Mitchell, who had come, in the same ship, from England, and finally settled at Stratford, Connecticut. The other two, Johns, located at Watertown, Massachusetts. From Captain John Sherman are descended Roger Sherman, the signer of the Declaration of Independence, Honorable William M. Everts, the Messrs. Hoare, of Massachusetts, and many others of national fame. Our own family are descended from the Honorable Samuel Sherman and his son, the Reverend John, who was born in 1650-51, then another John, born in 1687, then Judge Daniel, born in 1721. Then Taylor Sherman, our grandfather, who was born in 1758. Taylor Sherman was a lawyer and judge in Norwalk, Connecticut, where he resided until his death, May 4, 1815, leaving a widow, Betsy Stoddard Sherman, and three children, Charles R. Our father, Daniel, and Betsy. When the state of Connecticut, in 1786, ceded to the United States her claim to the western part of her public domain, as defined by her royal charter, she reserved a large district in what is now northern Ohio. A portion of which, 500,000 acres, composed the Fireland District, which was set apart to indemnify the parties who had lost property in Connecticut by the raids of Generals Arnold, Tryon, and others during the latter part of the Revolutionary War. Our grandfather, Judge Taylor Sherman, was one of the commissioners appointed by the state of Connecticut to quiet the Indian title, and to survey and subdivide this fireland district, which includes the present counties of Huron and Erie. In his capacity as commissioner he made several trips to Ohio in the early part of this century, and it is supposed that he then contracted the disease which proved fatal. 
For his labor and losses he received a title to two sections of land, which fact was probably the prime cause of the migration of our family to the West. My father received a good education, and was admitted to the bar at Norwalk, Connecticut, where, in 1810, he, at twenty years of age, married Mary Hoyt, also of Norwalk, and at once migrated to Ohio, leaving his wife, my mother, for a time. His first purpose was to settle at Zanesville, Ohio, but he finally chose Lancaster, Fairfield County, where he at once engaged in the practice of his profession. In 1811 he returned to Norwalk, where, meantime, was born Charles Taylor Sherman, the eldest of the family, who with his mother was carried to Ohio on horseback. Judge Taylor Sherman's family remained in Norwalk till 1815, when his death led to the emigration of the remainder of the family, viz. Of Uncle Daniel Sherman, who settled at Monroeville, Ohio, as a farmer, where he lived and died quite recently, leaving children and grandchildren. And an aunt, Betsy, who married Judge Parker, of Mansfield, and died in 1851, leaving children and grandchildren, also grandmother Elizabeth Stoddard Sherman, who resided with her daughter, Mrs. Betsy Parker, in Mansfield until her death, August 1, 1848. Thus my father, Charles R. Sherman, became finally established at Lancaster, Ohio, as a lawyer, with his own family in the year 1811, and continued there till the time of his death, in 1829. I have no doubt that he was in the first instance attracted to Lancaster by the natural beauty of its scenery, and the charms of its already established society. He continued in the practice of his profession, which in those days was no sinecure, for the ordinary circuit was made on horseback, and embraced Marietta, Cincinnati, and Detroit. Hardly was the family established there when the War of 1812 caused great alarm and distress in all Ohio. The English captured Detroit and the shores of Lake Erie down to the Maumee River. While the Indians still occupied the greater part of the state. Nearly every man had to be somewhat of a soldier, but I think my father was only a commissary, still, he seems to have caught a fancy for the great chief of the Shawnees, Tecumseh. Perry's victory on Lake Erie was the turning point of the Western Campaign, and General Harrison's victory over the British and Indians at the River Thames in Canada ended the war in the West. And restored peace and tranquility to the exposed settlers of Ohio. My father at once resumed his practice at the bar, and was soon recognized as an able and successful lawyer. When, in 1816, my brother James was born, he insisted on engrafting the Indian name, Tecumseh, on the usual family list. My mother had already named her first son after her own brother Charles. And insisted on the second son taking the name of her other brother James, and when I came along, on the 8th of February, 1820, mother having no more brothers, my father succeeded in his original purpose, and named me William Tecumseh. The family rapidly increased till it embraced six boys and five girls, all of whom attained maturity and married, of these six are still living. In the year 1821 a vacancy occurred in the Supreme Court of Ohio, and I find this petition. Somerset, Ohio, July 6, 1821. May it please your Excellency. We ask leave to recommend to your Excellency's favorable notice Charles R. Sherman, E.S.Q. Of Lancaster, as a man possessing in an eminent degree those qualifications so much to be desired in a judge of the Supreme Court. From a long acquaintance with Mr. Sherman, we are happy to be able to state to Your Excellency that our minds are led to the conclusion that that gentleman possesses a disposition noble and generous, a mind discriminating, comprehensive, and combining a heart pure, benevolent and humane. Manners dignified, mild, and complacent, and a firmness not to be shaken and of unquestioned integrity. But Mr. Sherman's character cannot be unknown to Your Excellency, and on that acquaintance without further comment we might safely rest his pretensions. We think we hazard little in assuring Your Excellency that his appointment would give almost universal satisfaction to the citizens of Perry County. With great consideration, we have the honor to be Your Excellency's most obedient humble servants. Charles A. Hood George Treat Peter Ditter P. Odlin J. B. Orton T. Beckwith 
William P. Dorst. John Murray. Jacob Moynes. B. Eaton. Daniel Griggs. Henry Ditto. Nicholas McCarty. His Excellency Ethan A. Brown. Governor of Ohio, Columbus. He was soon after appointed a judge of the Supreme Court, and served in that capacity to the day of his death. My memory extends back to about 1827, and I recall him, returning home on horseback, when all the boys used to run and contend for the privilege of riding his horse from the front door back to the stable. On one occasion, I was the first, and being mounted rode to the stable, but old Dick was impatient because the stable door was not opened promptly, so he started for the barn of our neighbor Mr. King. There, also, no one was in waiting to open the gate, and, after a reasonable time, Dick started back for home somewhat in a hurry, and threw me among a pile of stones, in front of Preacher Wright's house. Where I was picked up apparently a dead boy. But my time was not yet, and I recovered, though the scars remain to this day. The year 1829 was a sad one to our family. We were then ten children, my eldest brother Charles absent at the State University, Athens, Ohio. My next brother, James, in a store at Cincinnati, and the rest were at home, at school. Father was away on the circuit. One day Jane Sturgeon came to the school, called us out, and when we reached home all was lamentation, news had come that father was ill unto death, at Lebanon, a hundred miles away. Mother started at once, by coach, but met the news of his death about Washington, and returned home. He had ridden on horseback from Cincinnati to Lebanon to hold court, during a hot day in June. On the next day he took his seat on the bench, opened court in the forenoon, but in the afternoon, after recess, was seized with a severe chill and had to adjourn the court. The best medical aid was called in, and for three days with apparent success, but the fever then assumed a more dangerous type, and he gradually yielded to it, dying on the sixth day, viz., June 24, 1829. My brother James had been summoned from Cincinnati, and was present at his bedside, as was also Henry Stoddard, E.S.Q., of Dayton, Ohio, our cousin. Mr. Stoddard once told me that the cause of my father's death was cholera. But at that time, 1829, there was no Asiatic cholera in the United States, and the family, attributed his death to exposure to the hot sun of June, and a consequent fever, typhoid. From the resolutions of the bench, bar, and public generally, now in my possession, his death was universally deplored. More especially by his neighbors in Lancaster, and by the Society of Freemasons, of which he was the high priest of Arch Chapter No. 11. His death left the family very poor, but friends rose up with proffers of generous care and assistance. For all the neighbors knew that mother could not maintain so large a family without help. My eldest brother, Charles, had nearly completed his education at the University at Athens, and concluded to go to his uncle, Judge Parker, at Mansfield, Ohio, to study law. My eldest sister, Elizabeth, soon after married William J. Reese, E.S.Q. James was already in a store at Cincinnati, and, with the exception of the three youngest children, the rest of us were scattered. I fell to the charge of the Honorable Thomas Ewing, who took me to his family, and ever after treated me as his own son. I continued at the academy in Lancaster, which was the best in the place, indeed, as good a school as any in Ohio. We studied all the common branches of knowledge, including Latin, Greek, and French. At first the school was kept by Mr. Parsons. He was succeeded by Mr. Brown, and he by two brothers, Samuel and Mark Howe. These were all excellent teachers, and we made good progress, first at the old academy and afterward at a new schoolhouse, built by Samuel Howe, in the orchard of Hugh Boyle, E.S.Q. Time passed with us as with boys generally. Mr. Ewing was in the United States Senate, and I was notified to prepare for West Point, of which institution we had little knowledge, except that it was very strict, and that the army was its natural consequence. In 1834 I was large for my age, and the construction of canals was the rage in Ohio. A canal was projected to connect with the Great Ohio Canal at Carroll, eight miles above Lancaster, down the valley of the Hawk Hawking to Athens, 
44 miles, and thence to the Ohio River by slack water. Preacher Carpenter, of Lancaster, was appointed to make the preliminary surveys, and selected the necessary working party out of the boys of the town. From our school were chosen underscore 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 Wilson, Emmanuel Geisey, William King, and myself. Geisey and I were the rod men. We worked during that fall and next spring, marking two experimental lines, and for our work we each received a silver half dollar for each day's actual work, the first money any of us had ever earned. In June, 1835, one of our schoolfellows, William Irvin, was appointed a cadet to West Point, and, as it required sixteen years of age for admission, I had to wait another year. During the autumn of 1835 and spring of 1836 I devoted myself chiefly to mathematics and French, which were known to be the chief requisites for admission to West Point. Sometime in the spring of 1836 I received through Mr. Ewing, then at Washington, from the Secretary of War, Mr. Poinsett, the letter of appointment as a cadet, with a list of the articles of clothing necessary to be taken along, all of which were liberally provided by Mrs. Ewing. And with orders to report to Mr. Ewing, at Washington, by a certain date, I left Lancaster about the 20th of May in the stagecoach for Zanesville. There we transferred to the coaches of the Great National Road, the highway of travel from the west to the east. The stages generally traveled in gangs of from one to six coaches, each drawn by four good horses, carrying nine passengers inside and three or four outside. In about three days, traveling day and night, we reached Frederick, Maryland. There we were told that we could take rail cars to Baltimore, and thence to Washington, but there was also a two-horse hack ready to start for Washington direct. Not having full faith in the novel and dangerous railroad, I stuck to the coach, and in the night reached Gadsby's Hotel in Washington City. The next morning I hunted up Mr. Ewing, and found him boarding with a mess of senators at Mrs. Hill's, corner of 3rd and C Streets, and transferred my trunk to the same place. I spent a week in Washington, and think I saw more of the place in that time than I ever have since in the many years of residence there. General Jackson was president, and was at the zenith of his fame. I recall looking at him a full hour, one morning, through the wood railing on Pennsylvania Avenue, as he paced up and down the gravel walk on the north front of the White House. He wore a cap and an overcoat so full that his form seemed smaller than I had expected. I also recall the appearance of Postmaster General Amos Kendall, of Vice President Van Buren, Messrs. Calhoun, Webster, Clay, Cass, Silas Wright, etc. In due time I took my departure for West Point with Cadets Belt and Brono. These were appointed cadets as from Ohio, although neither had ever seen that state. But in those days there were fewer applicants from Ohio than now, and near the close of the term the vacancies unasked for were usually filled from applicants on the spot. Neither of these parties, however, graduated, so the state of Ohio lost nothing. We went to Baltimore by rail, there took a boat up to Haver de Grace, then the rail to Wilmington, Delaware, and up the Delaware in a boat to Philadelphia. I stayed over in Philadelphia one day at the old mansion house, to visit the family of my brother-in-law, Mr. Reese. I found his father a fine sample of the old merchant gentleman, in a good house in Arch Street, with his accomplished daughters, who had been to Ohio, and whom I had seen there. From Philadelphia we took boat to Bordentown, rail to Amboy, and boat again to New York City, stopping at the American Hotel. I stayed a week in New York City, visiting my uncle, Charles Hoyt, at his beautiful place on Brooklyn Heights, and my uncle James, then living in White Street. My friend William Scott was there, the young husband of my cousin, Louise Hoyt. A neatly dressed young fellow, who looked on me as an untamed animal just caught in the far west, fit food for gunpowder, and good for nothing else. About June 12 I embarked in the steamer Cornelius Vanderbilt for West Point. Registered in the office of Lt. C. F. Smith, adjutant of the Military Academy, as a new cadet of the class of 1836, and at once became installed as the plebe of my fellow townsman, William Irvin, then entering his third class. Colonel R. E. de Russie was superintendent, Major John Fowl, 6th United States Infantry, Commandant. The principal professors were, 
Mahan, Engineering, Bartlett, Natural Philosophy, Bailey, Chemistry, Church, Mathematics, Weir, Drawing, and Burrard, French. The routine of military training and of instruction was then fully established, and has remained almost the same ever since. To give a mere outline would swell this to an inconvenient size, and I therefore merely state that I went through the regular course of four years, graduating in June, 1840, number six in a class of 43. These 43 were all that remained of more than 100 which originally constituted the class. At the academy I was not considered a good soldier, for at no time was I selected for any office, but remained a private throughout the whole four years. Then, as now, neatness in dress and form, with a strict conformity to the rules, were the qualifications required for office, and I suppose I was found not to excel in any of these. In studies I always held a respectable reputation with the professors, and generally ranked among the best, especially in drawing, chemistry, mathematics, and natural philosophy. My average demerits, per annum, were about 150, which reduced my final class standing from number 4 to 6. In June, 1840, after the final examination, the class graduated and we received our diplomas. Meantime, Major Delafield, United States Engineers, had become Superintendent, Major C. F. Smith, Commandant of Cadets, but the Corps of Professors and Assistants remained almost unchanged during our whole term. We were all granted the usual furlough of three months, and parted for our homes, there to await assignment to our respective corps and regiments. In due season I was appointed and commissioned 2nd Lieutenant, 3rd Artillery, and ordered to report at Governor's Island, New York Harbor, at the end of September. I spent my furlough mostly at Lancaster and Mansfield, Ohio. Toward the close of September returned to New York, reported to Major Justin Dimmock, commanding the recruiting rendezvous at Governor's Island, and was assigned to command a company of recruits preparing for service in Florida. Early in October this company was detailed, as one of four, to embark in a sailing vessel for Savannah, Georgia, under command of Captain and Brevet Major Penrose. We embarked and sailed, reaching Savannah about the middle of October, where we transferred to a small steamer and proceeded by the inland route to St. Augustine, Florida. We reached St. Augustine at the same time with the 8th Infantry, commanded by Colonel and Brevet Brigadier General William J. Worth. At that time General Zachary Taylor was in chief command in Florida, and had his headquarters at Tampa Bay. My regiment, the 3rd Artillery, occupied the posts along the Atlantic coast of Florida, from St. Augustine south to Key Biscayne, and my own company, A, was at Fort Pierce, Indian River. At St. Augustine I was detached from the company of recruits, which was designed for the 2nd Infantry, and was ordered to join my proper company at Fort Pierce. Colonel William Gates commanded the regiment, with Lieutenant William Austin Brown as adjutant of the regiment. Lieutenant Bragg commanded the post of St. Augustine with his own company, E. and G. Garners, then commanded by Lieutenant Judd. In a few days I embarked in the little steamer William Gaston down the coast, stopping one day at New Smyrna, held by John R. Vinton's company, B., with which was serving Lieutenant William H. Shover. In due season we arrived off the bar of Indian River and anchored. A whaleboat came off with a crew of four men, steered by a character of some note, known as the pilot Ashlock. I transferred self and baggage to this boat, and, with the mails, was carried through the surf over the bar, into the mouth of Indian River Inlet. It was then dark. We transferred to a smaller boat, and the same crew pulled us up through a channel in the middle of Mangrove Islands, the roosting place of thousands of pelicans and birds that rose in clouds and circled above our heads. The water below was alive with fish, whose course through it could be seen by the phosphoric wake. And Ashlock told me many a tale of the Indian War then in progress, and of his adventures in hunting and fishing, which he described as the best in the world. About two miles from the bar, we emerged into the lagoon, a broad expanse of shallow water that lies parallel with the coast, separated from it by a narrow strip of sand, backed by a continuous series of islands and promontories. Covered with a dense growth of mangrove and sawpalmetto. Pulling across this lagoon, 
In about three more miles we approached the lights of Fort Pierce. Reaching a small wharf, we landed, and were met by the officers of the post, Lieutenants George Taylor and Edward J. Steptoe, and Assistant Surgeon James Simons. Taking the mail bag, we walked up a steep sand bluff on which the fort was situated, and across the parade ground to the officers' quarters. These were six or seven log houses, thatched with palmetto leaves, built on high posts, with a porch in front, facing the water. The men's quarters were also of logs forming the two sides of a rectangle, open toward the water. The intervals and flanks were closed with log stockades. I was assigned to one of these rooms, and at once began service with my company, A, then commanded by Lieutenant Taylor. The season was hardly yet come for active operations against the Indians, so that the officers were naturally attracted to Ashlock, who was the best fisherman I ever saw. He soon initiated us into the mysteries of shark spearing, trolling for redfish, and taking the sheep's head and mullet. These abounded so that we could at any time catch an unlimited quantity at pleasure. The companies also owned nets for catching green turtles. These nets had meshes about a foot square, were set across channels in the lagoon, the ends secured to stakes driven into the mat, the lower line sunk with lead or stone weights and the upper line floated with cork. We usually visited these nets twice a day, and found from one to six green turtles entangled in the meshes. Disengaging them, they were carried to pens, made with stakes stuck in the mud, where they were fed with mangrove leaves, and our cooks had at all times an ample supply of the best of green turtles. They were so cheap and common that the soldiers regarded it as an imposition when compelled to eat green turtle steaks, instead of poor Florida beef, or the usual barreled mess pork. I do not recall in my whole experience a spot on earth where fish, oysters, and green turtles so abound as at Fort Pierce, Florida. In November, Major Childs arrived with Lieutenant Van Vliet and a detachment of recruits to fill our two companies, and preparations were at once begun for active operations in the field. At that time the Indians in the peninsula of Florida were scattered, and the war consisted in hunting up and securing the small fragments. To be sent to join the others of their tribe of Seminoles already established in the Indian Territory west of Arkansas. Our expeditions were mostly made in boats in the lagoons extending from the Hall Over, near 200 miles above the fort, down to Jupiter Inlet, about 50 miles below, and in the many streams which emptied therein. Many such expeditions were made during that winter, with more or less success, in which we succeeded in picking up small parties of men, women, and children. On one occasion, near the Hall Over, when I was not present, the expedition was more successful. It struck a party of nearly fifty Indians, killed several warriors, and captured others. In this expedition my classmate, Lieutenant Van Vliet, who was an excellent shot, killed a warrior who was running at full speed among trees, and one of the sergeants of our company, Broderick, was said to have dispatched three warriors. And it was reported that he took the scalp of one and brought it into the fort as a trophy. Broderick was so elated that, on reaching the post, he had to celebrate his victory by a big drunk. There was at the time a poor, weakly soldier of our company whose wife cooked for our mess. She was somewhat of a flirt, and rather fond of admiration. Sergeant Broderick was attracted to her, and hung around the mess house more than the husband fancied. So he reported the matter to Lieutenant Taylor, who reproved Broderick for his behavior. A few days afterward, the husband again appealed to his commanding officer, Taylor who exclaimed, haven't you got a musket? Can't you defend your own family? Very soon after a shot was heard down by the mess house, and it transpired that the husband had actually shot Broderick, inflicting a wound which proved mortal. The law and army regulations required that the man should be sent to the nearest civil court, which was at St. Augustine, accordingly, the prisoner and necessary witnesses were sent up by the next monthly steamer. Among the latter were Lieutenant Taylor and the pilot Ashlock. After they had been gone about a month, the sentinel on the rooftop of our quarters reported the smoke of a steamer approaching the bar, and, as I was acting quartermaster, I took a boat and pulled down to get the mail. I reached the log butt in which the pilots lived, and saw them start with their boat across the bar, board the steamer, and then return. Ashlock was at his old post at the steering oar, with two ladies, 
who soon came to the landing, having passed through a very heavy surf, and I was presented to one as Mrs. Ashlock, and the other as her sister, a very pretty little Menorcan girl of about fourteen years of age. Mrs. Ashlock herself was probably eighteen or twenty years old, and a very handsome woman. I was hurriedly informed that the murder trial was in progress at St. Augustine. That Ashlock had given his testimony, and had availed himself of the chance to take a wife to share with him the solitude of his desolate hut on the beach at Indian River. He had brought ashore his wife, her sister, and their chests, with the mail, and had orders to return immediately to the steamer, Gaston or Harney, to bring ashore some soldiers belonging to another company, E. Braggs, which had been ordered from St. Augustine to Fort Pierce. Ashlock left his wife and her sister standing on the beach near the pilot hut, and started back with his whaleboat across the bar. I also took the mail and started up to the fort, and had hardly reached the wharf when I observed another boat following me. As soon as this reached the wharf the men reported that Ashlock and all his crew, with the exception of one man, had been drowned a few minutes after I had left the beach. They said his surf boat had reached the steamer, had taken on board a load of soldiers, some eight or ten, and had started back through the surf, when on the bar a heavy breaker upset the boat. And all were lost except the boy who pulled the bow oar, who clung to the rope or painter, hauled himself to the upset boat, held on, drifted with it outside the breakers, and was finally beached near a mile down the coast. They reported also that the steamer had got up anchor, run in as close to the bar as she could, paused a while, and then had started down the coast. I instantly took a fresh crew of soldiers and returned to the bar, there sat poor Mrs. Ashlock on her chest of clothes, a weeping widow, who had seen her husband perish amid sharks and waves. She clung to the hope that the steamer had picked him up, but, strange to say, he could not swim, although he had been employed on the water all his life. Her sister was more demonstrative, and wailed as one lost to all hope and life. She appealed to us all to do miracles to save the struggling men in the waves, though two hours had already passed, and to have gone out then among those heavy breakers, with an inexperienced crew, would have been worse than suicide. All I could do was to reorganize the guard at the beach, take the two desolate females up to the fort, and give them the use of my own quarters. Very soon their anguish was quieted, and they began to look, for the return of their steamer with Ashlock and his rescued crew. The next day I went again to the beach with Lieutenant Hord, and we found that one or two bodies had been washed ashore, torn all to pieces by the sharks, which literally swarmed the inlet at every new tide. In a few days the weather moderated, and the steamer returned from the south, but the surf was so high that she anchored a mile off. I went out myself, in the whale or surf boat, over that terrible bar with a crew of, soldiers, boarded the steamer, and learned that none other of Ashlock's crew except the one before mentioned had been saved. But, on the contrary, the captain of the steamer had sent one of his own boats to their rescue, which was likewise upset in the surf, and, out of the three men in her, one had drifted back outside the breakers, clinging to the upturned boat. And was picked up. This sad and fatal catastrophe made us all afraid of that bar, and in returning to the shore I adopted the more prudent course of beaching the boat below the inlet, which ensured us a good ducking, but was attended with less risk to life. I had to return to the fort and bear to Mrs. Ashlock the absolute truth, that her husband was lost forever. Meantime her sister had entirely recovered her equilibrium, and being the guest of the officers, who were extremely courteous to her, she did not lament so loudly the calamity that saved them a long life of banishment on the beach of Indian River. By the first opportunity they were sent back to St. Augustine, the possessors of all of Ashlock's worldly goods and effects, consisting of a good rifle, several cast nets, hand lines, etc., etc. Besides some three hundred dollars in money, which was due him by the quartermaster for his services as pilot. I afterward saw these ladies at St. Augustine, and years afterward the younger one came to Charleston, South Carolina, the wife of the somewhat famous Captain Thistle, agent for the United States for Live Oak in Florida, who was noted as the first of the troublesome class of inventors of modern artillery. He was the inventor of a gun that did not recoil at all, or, if anything it recoiled a little forward. 
One day, in the summer of 1841, the sentinel on the housetop at Fort Pierce called out, Indians. Indians. Everybody sprang to his gun, the companies formed promptly on the parade ground, and soon were reported as approaching the post, from the pine woods in rear, for Indians on horseback. They rode straight up to the gateway, dismounted, and came in. They were conducted by the officer of the day to the commanding officer, Major Childs, who sat on the porch in front of his own room. After the usual pause, one of them, a black man named Joe, who spoke English, said they had been sent in by Kokuchi, Wild Cat, one of the most noted of the Seminole chiefs, to see the big chief of the post. He gradually unwrapped a piece of paper, which was passed over to Major Childs, who read it, and it was in the nature of a safeguard for a Wild Cat to come into Fort Pierce to receive provisions and assistance while collecting his tribe with the purpose of emigrating to their reservation west of Arkansas. The paper was signed by General Worth, who had succeeded General Taylor, at Tampa Bay, in command of all the troops in Florida. Major Childs inquired, where is Kokuchi? And was answered, close by, when Joe explained that he had been sent in by his chief to see if the paper was all right. Major Childs said it was, all right, and that Kokuchi ought to come in himself. Joe offered to go out and bring him in, when Major Childs ordered me to take eight or ten mounted men and go out to escort him in. Detailing ten men to saddle up, and taking Joe and one Indian boy along on their own ponies, I started out under their guidance. We continued to ride five or six miles, when I began to suspect treachery, of which I had heard so much in former years, and had been specially cautioned against by the older officers, but Joe always answered, only a little way. At last we approached one of those close hammocks, so well known in Florida, standing like an island in the interminable pine forest, with a pond of water near it. On its edge I noticed a few Indians loitering, which Joe pointed out as the place. Apprehensive of treachery, I halted the guard, gave orders to the sergeant to watch me closely, and rode forward alone with the two Indian guides. As we neared the hammock, about a dozen Indian warriors rose up and waited for us. When in their midst I inquired for the chief, Kokuchi. He approached my horse and, slapping his breast, said, Me Kokuchi. He was a very handsome young Indian warrior, not more than twenty-five years old, but in his then dress could hardly be distinguished from the rest. I then explained to him, through Joe, that I had been sent by my chief to escort him into the fort. He wanted me to get down and talk, I told him that I had no talk in me, but that, on his reaching the post, he could talk as much as he pleased with the big chief, Major Childs. They all seemed to be indifferent, and in no hurry. And I noticed that all their guns were leaning against a tree. I beckoned to the sergeant, who advanced rapidly with his escort, and told him to secure the rifles, which he proceeded to do. Kokuchi pretended to be very angry, but I explained to him that his warriors were tired and mine were not, and that the soldiers would carry the guns on their horses. I told him I would provide him a horse to ride, and the sooner he was ready the better for all. He then stripped, washed himself in the pond, and began to dress in all his Indian finery, which consisted of buckskin leggings, moccasins, and several shirts. He then began to put on vests, one after another, and one of them had the marks of a bullet, just above the pocket, with the stain of blood. In the pocket was a one dollar Tallahassee bank note, and the rascal had the impudence to ask me to give him silver coin for that dollar. He had evidently killed the wearer, and was disappointed because the pocket contained a paper dollar instead of one in silver. In due time he was dressed with turban and ostrich feathers, and mounted the horse reserved for him, and thus we rode back together to Fort Pierce. Major Childs and all the officers received him on the porch, and there we had a regular talk. Kokuchi was tired of the war. His people were scattered and it would take a moon to collect them for emigration, and he wanted rations for that time, etc., etc. All this was agreed to, and a month was allowed for him to get ready with his whole band, numbering some 150 or 160, to migrate. The talk then ceased, and Kokuchi and his envoys proceeded to get regularly drunk, which was easily done by the agency of commissary whiskey. They stayed at Fort Pierce during the night, 
and the next day departed. Several times during the month there came into the post two or more of these same Indians, always to beg for something to eat or drink, and after a full month Kokuchi and about twenty of his warriors came in with several ponies. But with none of their women or children. Major Childs had not from the beginning the least faith in his sincerity, had made up his mind to seize the whole party and compel them to emigrate. He arranged for the usual council, and instructed Lieutenant Taylor to invite Kokuchi and his uncle, who was held to be a principal chief, to his room to take some good brandy, instead of the common commissary whiskey. At a signal agreed on I was to go to the quarters of Company A, to dispatch the first sergeant and another man to Lieutenant Taylor's room, there to seize the two chiefs and secure them. And with the company I was to enter Major Childs's room and secure the remainder of the party. Meantime Lieutenant Van Vliet was ordered to go to the quarters of his company, F, and at the same signal to march rapidly to the rear of the officers' quarters, so as to catch any who might attempt to escape by the open windows to the rear. All resulted exactly as prearranged, and in a few minutes the whole party was in irons. At first they claimed that we had acted treacherously, but very soon they admitted that for a month Kokuchi had been quietly removing his women and children toward Lake Okeechobee and the Everglades. And that this visit to our post was to have been their last. It so happened that almost at the instant of our seizing these Indians a vessel arrived off the bar with reinforcements from St. Augustine. These were brought up to Fort Pierce, and we marched that night and next day rapidly, some fifty miles, to Lake Okeechobee, in hopes to capture the balance of the tribe, especially the families, but they had taken the alarm and escaped. Kokuchi and his warriors were sent by Major Childs in a schooner to New Orleans en route to their reservation, but General Worth recalled them to Tampa Bay, and by sending out Kokuchi himself the women and children came in voluntarily. And then all were shipped to their destination. This was a heavy loss to the Seminoles, but there still remained in the peninsula a few hundred warriors with their families scattered into very small parcels, who were concealed in the most inaccessible hammocks and swamps. These had no difficulty in finding plenty of food anywhere and everywhere. Deer and wild turkey were abundant, and as for fish there was no end to them. Indeed, Florida was the Indian's paradise, was of little value to us, and it was a great pity to remove the Seminoles at all, for we could have collected there all the Choctaws, Creeks, Cherokees, and Chickasaws, in addition to the Seminoles. They would have thrived in the peninsula, whereas they now occupy lands that are very valuable, which are coveted by their white neighbors on all sides, while the peninsula of Florida still remains with a population less than should make a good state. During that and preceding years General W. S. Harney had penetrated and crossed through the Everglades, capturing and hanging Chekika and his band, and had brought in many prisoners, who were also shipped west. We at Fort Pierce made several other excursions to Jupiter, Lake Worth, Lauderdale, and into the Everglades, picking up here and there a family, so that it was absurd any longer to call it a war. These excursions, however, possessed to us a peculiar charm, for the fragrance of the air, the abundance of game and fish, and just enough of adventure, gave to life a relish. I had just returned to Lauderdale from one of these scouts with Lieutenants Rankin, Ord, George H. Thomas, Field, Van Vliet, and others, when I received notice of my promotion to be first lieutenant of Company G, which occurred November 30, 1841, and I was ordered to return to Fort Pierce. Turn over the public property for which I was accountable to Lieutenant H. S. Burton, and then to join my new company at St. Augustine. I reached St. Augustine before Christmas, and was assigned to command a detachment of twenty men stationed at Picolata, on the St. John's River, eighteen miles distant. Adesti. Augustine were still the headquarters of the regiment, Colonel William Gates, with Company E, Lieutenant Bragg, and Company G, Lieutenant H, B, Judd. The only buildings at Picolata were the one occupied by my detachment, which had been built for a hospital, and the dwelling of a family named Williams, with whom I boarded. On the other hand, St. Augustine had many pleasant families, among whom was prominent that of United States Judge Bronson. I was half my time in St. Augustine or on the road, and remember the old place with pleasure. In February we received orders transferring the whole regiment to the Gulf Posts, and our company, G, 
was ordered to escort Colonel Gates and his family across to the Sewanee River, en route for Pensacola. The company, with the colonel and his family, reached Picolata, where my detachment joined, and we embarked in a steamboat for Palatka. Here Lieutenant Judd discovered that he had forgotten something and had to return to St. Augustine, so that I commanded the company on the march, having with me 2nd Lieutenant George B. Gares. Our first march was to Fort Russell, then Micanopy, Wakahuda, and Wakasasi, all which posts were garrisoned by the 2nd or 7th Infantry. At Wakasasi we met General Worth and his staff, en route for Palatka. Lieutenant Judd overtook us about the Sewanee, where we embarked on a small boat for Cedar Keys, and there took a larger one for Pensacola, where the colonel and his family landed. And our company proceeded on in the same vessel to our post, Fort Morgan, Mobile Point. This fort had not been occupied by troops for many years, was very dirty, and we found little or no stores there. Major Ogden, of the engineers, occupied a house outside the fort. I was quartermaster and commissary, and, taking advantage of one of the engineer schooners engaged in bringing materials for the fort, I went up to Mobile City, and, through the agency of Messrs. Deshaun, Taylor, and Myers, merchants, procured all essentials for the troops, and returned to the post. In the course of a week or ten days arrived another company, H., commanded by Lt. James Ketchum, with Lt. Rankin and Sewell L. Fish, and an assistant surgeon, Wells. Ketchum became the commanding officer, and Lt. Rankin quartermaster. We proceeded to put the post in as good order as possible, had regular guard mounting and parades, but little drill. We found magnificent fishing with the seine on the outer beach, and sometimes in a single haul we would take ten or fifteen barrels of the best kind of fish, embracing pompinos, redfish, snappers, etc. We remained there till June, when the regiment was ordered to exchange from the Gulf posts to those on the Atlantic, extending from Savannah to North Carolina. The brig Watumka was chartered, and our company, G, embarked and sailed to Pensacola, where we took on board another company, D, Burks, commanded by Lt. H. S. Burton, with Colonel Gates, the regimental headquarters, and some families. From Pensacola we sailed for Charleston, South Carolina. The weather was hot, the winds light, and we made a long passage but at last reached Charleston Harbor, disembarked, and took post in Fort Moultrie. Soon after two other companies arrived, Braggs, B., and Keyses, K. The two former companies were already quartered inside of Fort Moultrie, and these latter were placed in gun sheds, outside, which were altered into barracks. We remained at Fort Moultrie nearly five years, until the Mexican War scattered us forever. Our life there was of strict garrison duty, with plenty of leisure for hunting and social entertainments. We soon formed many and most pleasant acquaintances in the city of Charleston, and it so happened that many of the families resided at Sullivan's Island in the summer season, where we could reciprocate the hospitalities extended to us in the winter. During the summer of 1843, having been continuously on duty for three years, I applied for and received a leave of absence for three months, which I spent mostly in Ohio. In November I started to return to my post at Charleston by way of New Orleans, took the stage to Chillicothe, Ohio, November 16, having Henry Stanbury, ESQ, and wife, as traveling companions, we continued by stage. Next day to Portsmouth, Ohio. At Portsmouth Mr. Stanbury took a boat up the river, and I won down to Cincinnati. There I found my brothers Lampson and Hoyt employed in the Gazette printing office, and spent much time with them and Charles Anderson, ESQ, visiting his brother Lars, Mr. Longworth, some of his artist friends, and especially Miss Sally Carneal, then quite a belle, and noted for her fine voice. On the 20th I took passage on the steamboat Manhattan for St. Louis, reached Louisville, where Dr. Conrad, of the Army, joined me, and in the Manhattan we continued on to St. Louis, with a mixed crowd. We reached the Mississippi, Cairo the 23d, and St. Louis, Friday, November 24, 1843. At St. Louis we called on Colonel S. W. Kearney and Major Cooper, his adjutant general, and found my classmate, Lieutenant McNutt, of the Ordnance, stationed at the arsenal, 
also Mr. Dias, an artist, and Pacificus Ord, who was studying law. I spent a week at ST. Lewis, visiting the Arsenal, Jefferson Barracks, and most places of interest, and then became impressed with its great future. It then contained about 40,000 people, and my notes describe 36 good steamboats receiving and discharging cargo at the levee. I took passage December 4 in the steamer John All for New Orleans. As we passed Cairo the snow was falling, and the country was wintry and devoid of verdure. Gradually, however, as we proceeded south, the green color came. Grass and trees showed the change of latitude, and when in the course of a week we had reached New Orleans, the roses were in full bloom, the sugar cane just ripe, and a tropical air prevalent. We reached New Orleans December 11, 1843, where I spent about a week visiting the barracks, then occupied by the 7th Infantry, the theaters, hotels, and all the usual places of interest of that day. On the 16th of December I continued on to Mobile in the steamer fashion by way of Lake Pontchartrain, saw there most of my personal friends, Mr. and Mrs. Bull, Judge Bragg and his brother Dunbar, Deshaun, Taylor, and Myers, etc. And on the 19th of December took passage in the steamboat Bourbon for Montgomery, Alabama, by way of the Alabama River. We reached Montgomery at noon, December 23d, and took cars at 1 p.m. for Franklin, 40 miles, which we reached at 7 p.m. Then stages for Griffin, Georgia, via La Grange and Greenville. This took the whole night of the 23d and the day of the 24th. At Griffin we took cars for Macon, and thence to Savannah, which we reached Christmas night, finding Lieutenants Ridgely and Ketchum at tea, where we were soon joined by Rankin and Beckwith. On the 26th I took the boat for Charleston, reaching my post, and reported for duty Wednesday morning, December 27, 1843. I had hardly got back to my post when, on the 21st of January, 1844, I received from Lt. R. P. Hammond, at Marietta, Georgia, an intimation that Colonel Churchill, Inspector General of the Army, had applied for me to assist him in taking depositions in Upper Georgia and Alabama. Concerning certain losses by volunteers in Florida of horses and equipments by reason of the failure of the United States to provide sufficient forage, and for which Congress had made an appropriation. On the 4th of February the order came from the Adjutant General in Washington for me to proceed to Marietta, Georgia, and report to Inspector General Churchill. I was delayed till the 14th of February by reason of being on a court-martial, when I was duly relieved and started by rail to Augusta, Georgia, and as far as Madison, where I took the mail coach, reaching Marietta on the 17th. There I reported for duty to Colonel Churchill, who was already engaged on his work, assisted by Lt. R. P. Hammond, 3rd Artillery, and a citizen named Stockton. The colonel had his family with him, consisting of Mrs. Churchill, Mary, now Mrs. Professor Baird, and Charles Churchill, then a boy of about fifteen years of age. We all lived in a tavern, and had an office convenient. The duty consisted in taking individual depositions of the officers and men who had composed two regiments and a battalion of mounted volunteers that had served in Florida. An oath was administered to each man by Colonel Churchill, who then turned the claimant over to one of us to take down and record his deposition according to certain forms, which enabled them to be consolidated and tabulated. We remained in Marietta about six weeks, during which time I repeatedly rode to Kennesaw Mountain, and over the very ground where afterward, in 1864, we had some hard battles. After closing our business at Marietta the colonel ordered us to transfer our operations to Belafonte, Alabama. As he proposed to take his family and party by the stage, Hammond lent me his riding horse, which I rode to Alatoona and the Etowah River. Hearing of certain large Indian mounds near the way, I turned to one side to visit them, stopping a couple of days with Colonel Lewis Tumlin, on whose plantation these mounds were. We struck up such an acquaintance that we corresponded for some years, and as I passed his plantation during the war, in 1864, I inquired for him, but he was not at home. From Tumlin's I rode to Rome, and by way of Wills Valley over Sand Mountain and the Raccoon Range to the Tennessee River at Belafonte, Alabama. We all assembled there in March, and continued our work for nearly two months, when, having completed the business, Colonel Churchill, 
with his family, went north by way of Nashville. Hammond, Stockton, and I returning south on horseback, by Rome, Alatoona, Marietta, Atlanta, and Madison, Georgia. Stockton stopped at Marietta, where he resided. Hammond took the cars at Madison, and I rode alone to Augusta, Georgia, where I left the horse and returned to Charleston and Fort Moultrie by rail. Thus by a mere accident I was enabled to traverse on horseback the very ground where in after years I had to conduct vast armies and fight great battles. That the knowledge thus acquired was of infinite use to me, and consequently to the government, I have always felt and stated. During the autumn of 1844, a difficulty arose among the officers of Company B, 3rd Artillery, John R. Yintons, garrisoning Augusta Arsenal, and I was sent up from Fort Moultrie as a sort of peacemaker. After staying there some months, certain transfers of officers were made, which reconciled the difficulty, and I returned to my post, Fort Moultrie. During that winter, 1844-45, I was visiting at the plantation of Mr. Poyas, on the east branch of the Cooper, about fifty miles from Fort Moultrie, hunting deer with his son James, and Lieutenant John F. Reynolds, 3rd Artillery. We had taken our stands, and a deer came out of the swamp near that of Mr. James Poyas, who fired, broke the leg of the deer, which turned back into the swamp and came out again above mine. I could follow his course by the cry of the hounds, which were in close pursuit. Hastily mounting my horse, I struck across the pine woods to head the deer off, and when at full career my horse leaped a fallen log and his forefoot caught one of those hard, unyielding pine knots that brought him with violence to the ground. I got up as quick as possible, and found my right arm out of place at the shoulder, caused by the weight of the double-barreled gun. Seeing Reynolds at some distance, I called out lustily and brought him to me. He soon mended the bridle and saddle, which had been broken by the fall, helped me on my horse, and we followed the course of the hounds. At first my arm did not pain me much, but it soon began to ache so that it was almost unendurable. In about three miles we came to a negro hut, where I got off and rested till Reynolds could overtake Poyas and bring him back. They came at last, but by that time the arm was so swollen and painful that I could not ride. They rigged up an old gig belonging to the negro, in which I was carried six miles to the plantation of Mr. Poyas, senior a neighboring physician was sent for, who tried the usual methods of setting the arm, but without success. Each time making the operation more painful. At last he sent off, got a set of double pulleys and cords, with which he succeeded in extending the muscles and in getting the bone into place. I then returned to Fort Moultrie, but being disabled, applied for a short leave and went north. I started January 25, 1845. Went to Washington, Baltimore, and Lancaster, Ohio, whence I went to Mansfield, and thence back by Newark to Wheeling, Cumberland, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York, whence I sailed back for Charleston on the ship Sullivan. Reaching Fort Moultrie March 9, 1845. About that time, March 1, 1845, Congress had, by a joint resolution, provided for the annexation of Texas, then an independent republic, subject to certain conditions requiring the acceptance of the Republic of Texas to be final and conclusive. We all expected war as a matter of course. At that time General Zachary Taylor had assembled a couple of regiments of infantry in one of dragoons at Fort Jessup, Louisiana, and had orders to extend military protection to Texas against the Indians, or a foreign enemy. The moment the terms of annexation were accepted. He received notice of such acceptance July 7th, and forthwith proceeded to remove his troops to Corpus Christi, Texas, where, during the summer and fall of 1845, was assembled that force with which, in the spring of 1846, was begun the Mexican War. Some time during that summer came to Fort Moultrie orders for sending Company E, 3rd Artillery, Lt. Bragg, to New Orleans, there to receive a battery of field guns, and thence to the camp of General Taylor at Corpus Christi. This was the first company of our regiment sent to the seat of war, and it embarked on the Brig Hain. This was the only company that left Fort Moultrie till after I was detached for recruiting service on the 1st of May, 1846. 
Inasmuch as Charleston afterward became famous, as the spot where began our civil war, a general description of it, as it was in 1846, will not be out of place. The city lies on a long peninsula between the Ashley and Cooper rivers, a low, level peninsula, of sand. Meeting Street is its broadway, with King Street, next west and parallel, the street of shops and small stores. These streets are crossed at right angles by many others, of which Broad Street was the principal, and the intersection of Meeting and Broad was the heart of the city, marked by the guardhouse and St. Michael's Episcopal Church. The Custom House, Post Office, etc., were at the foot of Broad Street, near the wharves of the Cooper River Front. At the extremity of the peninsula was a drive, open to the bay, and faced by some of the handsomest houses of the city, called the Battery. Looking down the bay on the right, was James Island, an irregular triangle of about seven miles, the whole island in cultivation with Sea Island cotton. At the lower end was Fort Johnson, then simply the station of Captain Bowman, United States Engineers, engaged in building Fort Sumter. This fort, Sumter, was erected on an artificial island nearly in mid-channel, made by dumping rocks, mostly brought as ballast in cotton ships from the north. As the rock reached the surface it was leveled, and made the foundation of Fort Sumter. In 1846 this fort was barely above the water. Still farther out beyond James Island, and separated from it by a wide space of salt marsh with crooked channels, was Morris Island, composed of the sand dunes thrown up by the wind and the sea, backed with the salt marsh. On this was the lighthouse, but no people. On the left, looking down the bay from the Battery of Charleston, was, first, Castle Pinckney, a round brick fort, of two tiers of guns, one in embrasure, the other in barbette, built on a marsh island, which was not garrisoned. Farther down the bay a point of the mainland reached the bay, where there was a group of houses, called Mount Pleasant. And at the extremity of the bay, distant six miles, was Sullivan's Island, presenting a smooth sand beach to the sea, with the line of sand hills or dunes thrown up by the waves and winds. And the usual backing of marsh and crooked saltwater channels. At the shoulder of this island was Fort Moultrie, an irregular fort, without ditch or counterscarp, with a brick scarp wall about twelve feet high, which could be scaled anywhere. And this was surmounted by an earth parapet capable of mounting about forty twenty four and thirty two pounder smoothbore iron guns. Inside the fort were three two story brick barracks, sufficient to quarter the officers and men of two companies of artillery. At sea was the usual, bar, changing slightly from year to year, but generally the main ship channel came from the south, parallel to Morris Island, till it was well up to Fort Moultrie, where it curved. Passing close to Fort Sumter and up to the wharves of the city, which were built mostly along the Cooper River front. Charleston was then a proud, aristocratic city, and assumed a leadership in the public opinion of the south far out of proportion to her population, wealth, or commerce. On more than one occasion previously, the inhabitants had almost inaugurated civil war, by their assertion and professed belief that each state had, in the original compact of government, reserved to itself the right to withdraw from the Union at its own option, whenever the people supposed they had sufficient cause. We used to discuss these things at our own mess tables, vehemently and sometimes quite angrily. But I am sure that I never feared it would go further than it had already gone in the winter of 1832-33, when the attempt at nullification was promptly suppressed by President Jackson's famous declaration, the Union must and shall be preserved. And by the judicious management of General Scott. Still, civil war was to be, and, now that it has come and gone, we can rest secure in the knowledge that as the chief cause, slavery, has been eradicated forever, it is not likely to come again. 2. Early Recollections of California 1846-1848 In the spring of 1846 I was a first lieutenant of Company C-1, 3rd Artillery, stationed at Fort Moultrie, South Carolina. The company was commanded by Captain Robert Anderson, Henry B. Judd was the senior first lieutenant, and I was the junior first lieutenant, and George B. Ayers the second lieutenant. Colonel William Gates commanded the post and regiment, with First Lieutenant William Austin as his adjutant. Two other companies were at the post, viz., 
Martin Burks and E. D. Keyses, and among the officers were T. E. W. Sherman, Morris Miller, H. B. Field, William Churchill, Joseph Stewart, and Surgeon McLaren. The country now known as Texas had been recently acquired, and war with Mexico was threatening. One of our companies, Braggs, with George H. Thomas, John F. Reynolds, and Frank Thomas, had gone the year previous and was at that time with General Taylor's army at Corpus Christi, Texas. In that year, 1846, I received the regular detail for recruiting service, with orders to report to the general superintendent at Governor's Island, New York. And accordingly left Fort Moultrie in the latter part of April, and reported to the superintendent, Colonel R. B. Mason, 1st Dragoons, at New York, on the first day of May. I was assigned to the Pittsburgh Rendezvous, whither I proceeded and relieved Lt. Scott. Early in May I took up my quarters at the St. Charles Hotel, and entered upon the discharge of my duties. There was a regular recruiting station already established, with a sergeant, corporal, and two or three men, with a citizen physician, Dr. McDowell, to examine the recruits. The threatening war with Mexico made a demand for recruits, and I received authority to open another sub-rendezvous at Zanesville, Ohio, whither I took the sergeant and established him. This was very handy to me, as my home was at Lancaster, Ohio, only 36 miles off, so that I was thus enabled to visit my friends there quite often. In the latter part of May, when at Wheeling, Virginia, on my way back from Zanesville to Pittsburgh, I heard the first news of the Battle of Palo Alto and Resica de la Palma, which occurred on the 8th and 9th of May, and, in common with everybody else, felt intensely excited. That I should be on recruiting service, when my comrades were actually fighting, was intolerable, and I hurried on to my post, Pittsburgh. At that time the railroad did not extend west of the Alleghenies, and all journeys were made by stagecoaches. In this instance I traveled from Zanesville to Wheeling, thence to Washington, Pennsylvania, and thence to Pittsburgh by stagecoach. On reaching Pittsburgh I found many private letters. One from Ord, then a first lieutenant in Company F, 3rd Artillery, at Fort McHenry, Baltimore, saying that his company had just received orders for California, and asking me to apply for it. Without committing myself to that project, I wrote to the Adjutant General, R. Jones, at Washington, D.C., asking him to consider me as an applicant for any active service, and saying that I would willingly forego the recruiting detail, which I well knew plenty of others would jump at. Impatient to approach the scene of active operations, without authority, and I suppose wrongfully, I left my corporal in charge of the rendezvous, and took all the recruits I had made, about twenty-five, in a steamboat to Cincinnati and turned them over to Major N. C. McRae, commanding at Newport Barracks. I then reported in Cincinnati, to the superintendent of the Western Recruiting Service, Colonel Fanning, an old officer with one arm, who inquired by what authority I had come away from my post. I argued that I took it for granted he wanted all the recruits he could get to forward to the Army at Brownsville, Texas, and did not know but that he might want me to go along. Instead of appreciating my volunteer zeal, he cursed and swore at me for leaving my post without orders, and told me to go back to Pittsburgh. I then asked for an order that would entitle me to transportation back, which at first he emphatically refused, but at last he gave the order, and I returned to Pittsburgh, all the way by stage, stopping again at Lancaster. Where I attended the wedding of my schoolmate Mike Effinger, and also visited my sub-rendezvous at Zanesville. R. S. Ewell, of my class, arrived to open a cavalry rendezvous, but, finding my depot there, he went on to Columbus, Ohio. Tom Jordan afterward was ordered to Zanesville, to take charge of that rendezvous, under the General War Department orders increasing the number of recruiting stations. I reached Pittsburgh late in June, and found the order relieving me from recruiting service, and detailing my classmate H. B. Field to my place. I was assigned to Company F, then under orders for California. By private letters from Lt. Ord, I heard that the company had already started from Fort McHenry for Governor's Island, New York Harbor, to take passage for California in a naval transport. I worked all that night, made up my accounts current, and turned over the balance of cash to the citizen physician, Dr. McDowell. 
and also closed my clothing and property returns, leaving blank receipts with the same gentleman for field signature, when he should get there, to be forwarded to the department at Washington, and the duplicates to me. These I did not receive for more than a year. I remember that I got my orders about 8 p.m. One night, and took passage in the boat for Brownsville, the next morning traveled by stage from Brownsville to Cumberland, Maryland, and thence by cars to Baltimore, Philadelphia, and New York, in a great hurry lest the ship might sail without me. I found Company F at Governor's Island, Captain C. Q. Tompkins in command, Lieutenant E. O. C. Ward Senior First Lieutenant, myself Junior First Lieutenant, Lucien Lozer, and Charles Minor the Second Lieutenants. The company had been filled up to 100 privates, 12 non-commissioned officers, and one ordnance sergeant, Layton, making 113 enlisted men and five officers. Dr. James L. Ord had been employed as acting assistant surgeon to accompany the expedition, and Lt. H. W. Halleck, of the engineers, was also to go along. The United States storeship Lexington was then preparing at the Navy Yard, Brooklyn, to carry us around Cape Horn to California. She was receiving on board the necessary stores for the long voyage, and for service after our arrival there. Lt. Commander Theodorus Bailey was in command of the vessel, Lt. William H. McComb Executive Officer, and past Midshipman Muse, Spots, and J. W. A. Nicholson, were the watch officers, Wilson Purser, and Abernethy Surgeon. The latter was caterer of the mess, and we all made an advance of cash for him to lay in the necessary mess stores. To enable us to prepare for so long a voyage and for an indefinite sojourn in that far-off country, the War Department had authorized us to draw six months' pay in advance. Which sum of money we invested in surplus clothing and such other things as seemed to us necessary. At last the ship was ready, and was towed down abreast of Fort Columbus, where we were conveyed on board, and on the 14th of July, 1846, we were towed to sea by a steam tug, and cast off, Colonel R. B. Mason, still superintendent of the General Recruiting Service, accompanied us down the bay and out to sea, returning with the tug. A few other friends were of the party, but at last they left us, and we were alone upon the sea, and the sailors were busy with the sails and ropes. The Lexington was an old ship, changed from a sloop of war to a store ship, with an after cabin, a ward room, and between decks. In the cabin were Captains Bailey and Tompkins, with whom messed the purser, Wilson. In the ward room were all the other officers, two in each stateroom, and Minor, being an extra lieutenant, had to sleep in a hammock slung in the ward room. Ord and I roomed together, Halleck and Lozer and the others were scattered about. The men were arranged in bunks, between decks, one set along the sides of the ship, and another, double tier, amidships. The crew were slung in hammocks well forward. Of these there were about fifty. We at once subdivided the company into four squads, under the four lieutenants of the company, and arranged with the naval officers that our men should serve on deck by squads, after the manner of their watches. That the sailors should do all the work aloft, and the soldiers on deck. On fair days we drilled our men at the manual, and generally kept them employed as much as possible, giving great attention to the police and cleanliness of their dress and bunks. And so successful were we in this, that, though the voyage lasted nearly two hundred days, every man was able to leave the ship and march up the hill to the fort at Monterey, California, carrying his own knapsack and equipments. The voyage from New York to Rio Janeiro was without accident or anything to vary the usual monotony. We soon settled down to the humdrum of a long voyage, reading some, not much, playing games, but never gambling. And chiefly engaged in eating our meals regularly. In crossing the equator we had the usual visit of Neptune and his wife, who, with a large razor and a bucket of soap suds, came over the sides and shaved some of the greenhorns. But naval etiquette exempted the officers, and Neptune was not permitted to come aft of the mizzenmast. At last, after sixty days of absolute monotony, the island of Raza, off Rio Janeiro, was descried, and we slowly entered the harbor, passing a fort on our right hand, from which came a hail, in the Portuguese language, from a huge speaking trumpet. 
and our officer of the deck answered back in gibberish, according to a well-understood custom of the place. Sugarloaf Mountain, on the south of the entrance, is very remarkable and well-named, is almost conical, with a slight lean. The man-of-war anchorage is about five miles inside the heads, directly in front of the city of Rio Janeiro. Words will not describe the beauty of this perfect harbor, nor the delightful feeling after a long voyage of its fragrant airs, and the entire contrast between all things there and what we had left in New York. We found the United Staten Frigate Columbia anchored there, and after the Lexington was properly moored, nearly all the officers went on shore for sightseeing and enjoyment. We landed at a wharf opposite which was a famous French restaurant, Far Rue, and after ordering supper we all proceeded to the Rua de Ovador, where most of the shops were, especially those for making feather flowers. As much to see the pretty girls as the flowers which they so skillfully made. Thence we went to the theater, where, beside some opera, we witnessed the audience and saw the Emperor Dom Pedro, and his Empress, the daughter of the King of Sicily. After the theater, we went back to the restaurant, where we had an excellent supper, with fruits of every variety in excellence, such as we had never seen before, or even knew the names of. Supper being over, we called for the bill, and it was rendered in French, with Brazilian currency. It footed up some twenty-six thousand reis. The figures alarmed us, so we all put on the waiter's plate various coins in gold, which he took to the counter and returned the change, making the total about sixteen dollars. The mill reis is about a dollar, but being a paper money was at a discount, so is only to be worth about fifty-six cents in coin. The Lexington remained in Rio about a week, during which we visited the palace, a few miles in the country, also the botanic gardens, a place of infinite interest, with its specimens of tropical fruits, spices, etc., etc. And indeed every place of note. The thing I best recall is a visit Halleck and I made to the Corcovado, a high mountain whence the water is conveyed for the supply of the city. We started to take a walk, and passed along the aqueduct, which approaches the city by a aries of arches. Thence up the point of the hill to a place known as the Madre, or fountain, to which all the water that drips from the leaves is conducted by tile gutters, and is carried to the city by an open stone aqueduct. Here we found Mr. Henry A. Wise, of Virginia, the United States Minister to Brazil, and a Dr. Garnett, United States Navy, his intended son-in-law. We had a very interesting conversation, in which Mr. Wise enlarged on the fact that Rio was supplied from the dews of heaven, for in the dry season the water comes from the mists and fogs which hang around the Corcovado, drips from the leaves of the trees, and is conducted to the Madre Fountain by miles of tile gutters. Halleck and I continued our ascent of the mountain, catching from points of the way magnificent views of the scenery round about Rio Janeiro. We reached near the summit what was called the Emperor's Coffee Plantation, where we saw coffee berries in their various stages, and the scaffolds on which the berries were dried before being cleaned. The coffee tree reminded me of the red haw tree of Ohio, and the berries were somewhat like those of the same tree, two grains of coffee being enclosed in one berry. These were dried and cleaned of the husk by hand or by machinery. A short, steep ascent from this place carried us to the summit, from which is beheld one of the most picturesque views on earth. The Oregon Mountains to the west and north, the ocean to the east, the city of Rio with its red-tiled houses at our feet, and the entire harbor like a map spread out, with innumerable bright valleys. Make up a landscape that cannot be described by mere words. This spot is universally visited by strangers, and has often been described. After enjoying it immeasurably, we return to the city by another route, tired but amply repaid by our long walk. In due time all had been done that was requisite, and the Lexington put to sea and resumed her voyage. In October we approached Cape Horn, the first land described was Staten Island, white with snow, and the ship seemed to be aiming for the channel to its west, Straits of Le Maire, but her course was changed and we passed around to the east. In time we saw Cape Horn, an island rounded like an oven, after which it takes its name, Ornos, Oven. Here we experienced very rough weather, buffeting about under storm stay sails, and spending nearly a month before the wind favored our passage and enabled the course of the ship to be changed for Valparaiso. 
One day we sailed parallel with a French sloop of war, and it was sublime to watch the two ships rising and falling in those long deep swells of the ocean. All the time we were followed by the usual large flocks of cape pigeons and albatrosses of every color. The former resembled the common barn pigeon exactly, but are in fact gulls of beautiful and varied colors, mostly dove color. We caught many with fishing lines baited with pork. We also took in the same way many albatrosses. The white ones are very large, and their down is equal to that of the swan. At last Cape Horn and its swelling seas were left behind, and we reached Valparaiso in about sixty days from Rio. We anchored in the open roadstead, and spent there about ten days, visiting all the usual places of interest, its foretop, main top, mizzen top, etc. Halleck and Nord went up to Santiago, the capital of Chile, some sixty miles inland, but I did not go. Valparaiso did not impress me favorably at all. Seen from the sea, it looked like a long string of houses along the narrow beach, surmounted with red banks of earth, with little verdure, and no trees at all. Northward the space widened out somewhat, and gave room for a plaza, but the mass of houses in that quarter were poor. We were there in November, corresponding to our early spring, and we enjoyed the large strawberries which abounded. The independence frigate, Commodore Shubrick, came in while we were there, having overtaken us, bound also for California. We met there also the sloop of war Levant, from California, and from the officers heard of many of the events that had transpired about the time the Navy, under Commodore Sloat, had taken possession of the country. All the necessary supplies being renewed in Valparaiso, the voyage was resumed. For nearly forty days we had uninterrupted favorable winds, being in the trades, and, having settled down to sailor habits, time passed without notice. We had brought with us all the books we could find in New York about California, and had read them over and over again, Wilkes's Exploring Expedition, Dana's Two Years Before the Mast, and Forbes's Account of the Missions. It was generally understood we were bound for Monterey, then the capital of Upper California. We knew, of course, that General Kearney was en route for the same country overland, that Fremont was there with his exploring party. That the Navy had already taken possession, and that a regiment of volunteers, Stevenson's, was to follow us from New York, but nevertheless we were impatient to reach our destination. About the middle of January the ship began to approach the California coast, of which the captain was duly cautious, because the English and Spanish charts differed some fifteen miles in the longitude. And on all the charts a current of two miles an hour was indicated northward along the coast. At last land was made one morning, and here occurred one of those accidents so provoking after a long and tedious voyage. Macomb, the master and regular navigator, had made the correct observations, but Nicholson during the night, by an observation on the North Star, put the ship some twenty miles farther south than was the case by the regular reckoning. So that Captain Bailey gave directions to alter the course of the ship more to the north, and to follow the coast up, and to keep a good lookout for Point Pinos that marks the location of Monterey Bay. The usual north wind slackened, so that when noon allowed Macomb to get a good observation, it was found that we were north of Ano Nuevo, the northern headland of Monterey Bay. The ship was put about, but little by little arose one of those southeast storms so common on the coast in winter, and we buffeted about for several days, cursing that unfortunate observation on the North Star, for, on first sighting the coast. Had we turned from Monterey, instead of away to the north, we would have been snugly anchored before the storm. But the southeaster abetted, and the usual northwest wind came out again, and we sailed steadily down into the roadstead of Monterey Bay. This is shaped somewhat like a fish hook, the barb being the harbor, the point being Point Pinos, the southern headland. Slowly the land came out of the water, the high mountains about Santa Cruz, the low beach of the saunas, and the strongly marked ridge terminating in the sea in a point of dark pine trees. Then the line of whitewashed houses of adobe, backed by the groves of dark oaks, resembling old apple trees, and then we saw two vessels anchored close to the town. One was a small merchant brig and another a large ship apparently dismasted. At last we saw a boat coming out to meet us, and when it came alongside, 
we were surprised to find Lieutenant Henry Wise, master of the Independence frigate, that we had left at Valparaiso. Wise had come off to pilot us to our anchorage. While giving orders to the man at the wheel, he, in his peculiar fluent style, told to us, gathered about him, that the Independence had sailed from Valparaiso a week after us and had been in Monterey a week. That the Californians had broken out into an insurrection, that the naval fleet under Commodore Stockton was all down the coast about San Diego. That General Kearney had reached the country, but had had a severe battle at San Pasqual, and had been worsted, losing several officers and men, himself and others wounded, that war was then going on at Los Angeles. That the whole country was full of guerrillas, and that recently at Yerba Buena the Alcalde, Lieutenant Bartlett, United States Navy, while out after cattle, had been lassoed, etc., etc. Indeed, in the short space of time that Wise was piloting our ship in, he told us more news than we could have learned on shore in a week, and, being unfamiliar with the great distances. We imagined that we should have to debark and begin fighting at once. Swords were brought out, guns oiled and made ready, and everything was in a bustle when the old Lexington dropped her anchor on January 26, 1847, in Monterey Bay, after a voyage of 198 days from New York. Everything on shore looked bright and beautiful, the hills covered with grass and flowers, the live oaks so serene and homelike, and the low adobe houses, with red-tiled roofs and whitened walls, contrasted well with the dark pine trees behind. Making a decidedly good impression upon us who had come so far to spy out the land. Nothing could be more peaceful in its looks than Monterey in January, 1847. We had already made the acquaintance of Commodore Shubrick and the officers of the Independence in Valparaiso, so that we again met as old friends. Immediate preparations were made for landing, and, as I was quartermaster and commissary, I had plenty to do. There was a small wharf and an adobe custom house in possession of the navy. Also a barrack of two stories, occupied by some marines, commanded by Lieutenant Maddox. And on a hill to the west of the town had been built a two-story blockhouse of hewed logs occupied by a guard of sailors under command of Lieutenant Baldwin, United States Navy. Not a single modern wagon or cart was to be had in Monterey, nothing but the old Mexican cart with wooden wheels, drawn by two or three pairs of oxen, yoked by the horns. A man named Tom Cole had two or more of these, and he came into immediate requisition. The United States Consul, and most prominent man there at the time, was Thomas O. Larkin, who had a store and a pretty good two-story house occupied by his family. It was soon determined that our company was to land and encamp on the hill at the blockhouse, and we were also to have possession of the warehouse, or custom house, for storage. The company was landed on the wharf, and we all marched in full dress with knapsacks and arms, to the hill and relieved the guard under Lieutenant Baldwin. Tents and camp equipage were hauled up, and soon the camp was established. I remained in a room at the custom house, where I could superintend the landing of the stores and their proper distribution. I had brought out from New York $20,000 commissary funds, and $8,000 quartermaster funds, and as the ship contained about six months' supply of provisions, also a sawmill, grist mill, and almost everything needed. We were soon established comfortably. We found the people of Monterey a mixed set of Americans, native Mexicans, and Indians, about one thousand all told. They were kind and pleasant, and seemed to have nothing to do, except such as owned ranches in the country for the rearing of horses and cattle. Horses could be bought at any price from four dollars up to sixteen, but no horse was ever valued above a doubloon or Mexican ounce, sixteen dollars. Cattle cost eight dollars fifty cents for the best, and this made beef net about two cents a pound, but at that time nobody bought beef by the pound, but by the carcass. Game of all kinds, elk, deer, wild geese, and ducks, was abundant. But coffee, sugar, and small stores, were rare and costly. There were some half-dozen shops or stores, but their shelves were empty. The people were very fond of riding, dancing, and of shows of any kind. The young fellows took great delight in showing off their horsemanship, and would dash along, picking up a half dollar from the ground, stop their horses in full career and turn about on the space of a bullock's hide. 
and their skill with the lasso was certainly wonderful. At full speed they could cast their lasso about the horns of a bull, or so throw it as to catch any particular foot. These fellows would work all day on horseback in driving cattle or catching wild horses for a mere nothing, but all the money offered would not have hired one of them to walk a mile. The girls were very fond of dancing, and they did dance gracefully and well. Every Sunday, regularly, we had a bail, or dance, and sometimes interspersed through the week. I remember very well, soon after our arrival, that we were all invited to witness a play called, Adam and Eve. Eve was persona Ted by a pretty young girl known as Dolores Gomez, who, however, was dressed very unlike Eve, for she was covered with a petticoat and spangles. Adam was persona Ted by her brother, the same who has since become somewhat famous as the person on whom is founded the McGarahan claim. God Almighty was persona Ted, and heaven's occupants seemed very human. Yet the play was pretty, interesting, and elicited universal applause. All the month of February we were by day preparing for our long stay in the country, and at night making the most of the balls and parties of the most primitive kind, picking up a smattering of Spanish. And extending our acquaintance with the people and the Costumbria del Pius. I can well recall that Ord and I, impatient to look inland, got permission and started for the mission of San Juan Bautista. Mounted on horses, and with our carbines, we took the road by El Toro, quite a prominent hill, around which passes the road to the south, following the Saunas or Monterey River. After about twenty miles over a sandy country covered with oak bushes and scrub, we entered quite a pretty valley in which there was a ranch at the foot of the Toro. Resting there a while and getting some information, we again started in the direction of a mountain to the north of the Saunas, called the Gavilano. It was quite dark when we reached the Saunas River, which we attempted to pass at several points, but found it full of water, and the quicksands were bad. Hearing the bark of a dog, we changed our course in that direction, and, on hailing, were answered by voices which directed us where to cross. Our knowledge of the language was limited, but we managed to understand, and to founder through the sand and water, and reached a small adobe house on the banks of the Salinas, where we spent the night, the house was a single room. Without floor or glass. Only a rude door, and window with bars. Not a particle of food but meat, yet the man and woman entertained us with the language of lords put themselves, their house, and everything, at our disposition, and made little barefoot children dance for our entertainment. We made our supper of beef, and slept on a bullock's hide on the dirt floor. In the morning we crossed the Salinas Plain, about fifteen miles of level ground, taking a shot occasionally at wild geese, which abounded there, and entering the well-wooded valley that comes out from the foot of the Gavilano. We had cruised about all day, and it was almost dark when we reached the house of a Senor Gomez, father of those who at Monterey had performed the parts of Adam and Eve. His house was a two-story adobe, and had a fence in front. It was situated well up among the foothills of the Gavilano, and could not be seen until within a few yards. We hitched our horses to the fence and went in just as Gomez was about to sit down to a tempting supper of stewed hare and tortillas. We were officers and caballeros and could not be ignored. After turning our horses to grass, at his invitation we joined him at supper. The allowance, though ample for one, was rather short for three, and I thought the Spanish grandiloquent politeness of Gomez, who was fat and old, was not over cordial. However, down we sat, and I was helped to a dish of rabbit, with what I thought to be an abundant sauce of tomato. Taking a good mouthful, I felt as though I had taken liquid fire, the tomato was chili Colorado, or red pepper, of the purest kind. It nearly killed me, and I saw Gomez's eyes twinkle, for he saw that his share of supper was increased to, I contented myself with bits of the meat, and an abundant supply of tortillas. Ord was better case hardened, and stood it better. We stayed at Gomez's that night, sleeping, as all did, on the ground, and the next morning we crossed the hill by the bridle path to the old mission of San Juan Bautista. The mission was in a beautiful valley, very level, and bounded on all sides by hills. The plain was covered with wild grasses and mustard, and had abundant water. Cattle and horses were seen in all directions, 
and it was manifest that the priests who first occupied the country were good judges of land. It was Sunday, and all the people, about, a hundred, had come to church from the country roundabout. Ord was somewhat of a Catholic, and entered the church with his clanking spars and kneeled down, attracting the attention of all, for he had on the uniform of an American officer. As soon as church was out, all rushed to the various sports. I saw the priest, with his grey robes tucked up, playing at billiards, others were cock-fighting, and some at horse-racing. My horse had become lame, and I resolved to buy another. As soon as it was known that I wanted a horse, several came for me, and displayed their horses by dashing past and hauling them up short. There was a fine black stallion that attracted my notice, and, after trying him myself, I concluded a purchase. I left with the seller my own lame horse, which he was to bring to me at Monterey, when I was to pay him ten dollars for the other. The mission of San Juan bore the marks of high prosperity at a former period, and had a good pear orchard just under the plateau where stood the church. After spending the day, Ord and I returned to Monterey, about thirty-five miles, by a shorter route, thus passed the month of February, and, though there were no mails or regular expresses. We heard occasionally from Yerba Buena and Sutter's Fort to the north, and from the Army and Navy about Los Angeles at the south. We also knew that a quarrel had grown up at Los Angeles, between General Kearney, Colonel Fremont, and Commodore Stockton, as to the right to control affairs in California. Kearney had with him only the fragments of the two companies of dragoons, which had come across from New Mexico with him, and had been handled very roughly by Don Andreas Pico, at San Pasqual, in which engagement Captains Moore and Johnson and Lieutenant Hammond were killed, and Kearney himself wounded. There remained with him Colonel Swords, Quartermaster, Captain H. S. Turner, First Dragoons, Captains Emery and Warner, Topographical Engineers, Assistant Surgeon Griffin, and Lieutenant J. W. Davidson. Fremont had marched down from the north with a battalion of volunteers. Commodore Stockton had marched up from San Diego to Los Angeles, with General Kearney, his dragoons, and a battalion of sailors and marines, and was soon joined there by Fremont. And they jointly received the surrender of the insurgents under Andreas Pico. We also knew that General R. B. Mason had been ordered to California, that Colonel John D. Stevenson was coming out to California with a regiment of New York volunteers. That Commodore Shubrick had orders also from the Navy Department to control matters afloat, that General Kearney, by virtue of his rank, had the right to control all the land forces in the service of the United States. And that Fremont claimed the same right by virtue of a letter he had received from Colonel Benton, then a senator, and a man of great influence with Polk's administration. So that among the younger officers the query was very natural, who the devil is governor of California? One day I was on board the Independence frigate, dining with the wardroom officers, when a war vessel was reported in the offing, which in due time was made out to be the Cyane, Captain Dupont. After dinner we were all on deck to watch the new arrival, the ships meanwhile exchanging signals, which were interpreted that General Kearney was on board. As the Cyane approached, a boat was sent to meet her, with Commodore Shubrick's flag officer, Lieutenant Lewis, to carry the usual messages, and to invite General Kearney to come on board the Independence as the guest of Commodore Shubrick. Quite a number of officers were on deck, among them Lieutenants Wise, Montgomery Lewis, William Chapman, and others, noted wits and wags of the Navy. In due time the Cyane anchored close by, and our boat was seen returning with a stranger in the stern sheets, clothed in army blue. As the boat came nearer, we saw that it was General Kearney with an old dragoon coat on, and an army cap, to which the general had added the broad visor, cut from a full-dress hat, to shade his face and eyes against the glaring sun of the Gila region. Chapman exclaimed, Fellows, the problem is solved, there is the Grand Vizier, Visor, by G.D. He is Governor of California. All hands received the general with great heartiness, and he soon passed out of our sight into the Commodore's cabin. Between Commodore Shubrick and General Kearney existed from that time forward the greatest harmony and good feeling, and no further trouble existed as to the controlling power on the Pacific coast.
General Kearney had dispatched from San Diego his quartermaster, Colonel Swords, to the Sandwich Islands, to purchase clothing and stores for his men, and had come up to Monterey, bringing with him Turner and Warner. Leaving Emery and the company of dragoons below. He was delighted to find a full strong company of artillery, subject to his orders, well supplied with clothing and money in all respects, and, much to the disgust of our Captain Tompkins. He took half of his company clothing and part of the money held by me for the relief of his worn-out and almost naked dragoons left behind at Los Angeles. In a few days he moved on shore, took up his quarters at Larkin's house, and established his headquarters, with Captain Turner as his adjutant general. One day Turner and Warner were at my tent, and, seeing a store bag full of socks, drawers, and calico shirts, of which I had laid in a three-year supply, and of which they had none, made known to me their wants, and I told them to help themselves. Which Turner and Warner did. The latter, however, insisted on paying me the cost, and from that date to this Turner and I have been close friends. Warner, poor fellow, was afterward killed by Indians. Things gradually came into shape, a semi-monthly courier line was established from Yerba Buena to San Diego, and we were thus enabled to keep pace with events throughout the country. In March Stevenson's regiment arrived. Colonel Mason also arrived by sea from Calau in the storeship Erie, and P. St. George Cook's Battalion of Mormons reached San Luis Rey. A. J. Smith and George Stoneman were with him, and were assigned to the Company of Dragoons at Los Angeles. All these troops and the Navy regarded General Kearney as the rightful commander, though Fremont still remained at Los Angeles, styling himself as governor. Issuing orders and holding his battalion of California volunteers in apparent defiance of General Kearney. Colonel Mason and Major Turner were sent down by sea with a paymaster, with muster rolls and orders to muster this battalion into the service of the United States, to pay and then to muster them out. But on their reaching Los Angeles Fremont would not consent to it, and the controversy became so angry that a challenge was believed to have passed between Mason and Fremont, but the duel never came about. Turner rode up by land in four or five days, and Fremont, becoming alarmed, followed him, as we supposed, to overtake him, but he did not succeed. On Fremont's arrival at Monterey, he camped in a tent about a mile out of town and called on General Kearney, and it was reported that the latter threatened him very severely and ordered him back to Los Angeles immediately. To disband his volunteers, and to cease the exercise of authority of any kind in the country. Feeling a natural curiosity to see Fremont, who was then quite famous by reason of his recent explorations and the still more recent conflicts with Kearney and Mason, I rode out to his camp, and found him in a conical tent with one Captain Owens. Who was a mountaineer, trapper, etc. But originally from Zanesville, Ohio. I spent an hour or so with Fremont in his tent, took some tea with him, and left, without being much impressed with him. In due time Colonel Swords returned from the Sandwich Islands and relieved me as quartermaster. Captain William G. Marcy, son of the Secretary of War, had also come out in one of Stevenson's ships as an assistant commissary of subsistence, and was stationed at Monterey and relieved me as commissary, so that I reverted to the condition of a company officer. While acting as a staff officer I had lived at the Custom House in Monterey, but when relieved I took a tent in line with the other company officers on the hill, where we had a mess. Stevenson A Regiment reached San Francisco Bay early in March, 1847. Three companies were stationed at the Presidio under Major James A. Hardier One Company, brackets, at Sonoma, three, under Colonel Stevenson, at Monterey. And three, under Lieutenant Colonel Burton, at Santa Barbara. One day I was down at the headquarters at Larkin's Horse, when General Kearney remarked to me that he was going down to Los Angeles in the ship Lexington, and wanted me to go along as his aide. Of course this was most agreeable to me. Two of Stevenson's companies, with the headquarters and the colonel, were to go also. They embarked, and early in May we sailed for San Pedro. Before embarking, the United States line of battleship Columbus had reached the coast from China with Commodore Biddle, whose rank gave him the supreme command of the navy on the coast. He was busy in calling in, lassoing, 
from the land service the various naval officers who under Stockton had been doing all sorts of military and civil service on shore. Knowing that I was to go down the coast with General Kearney, he sent for me and handed me two unsealed parcels addressed to Lieutenant Wilson, United States Navy, and Major Gillespie, United States Marines, at Los Angeles. These were written orders pretty much in these words, on receipt of this order you will repair at once on board the United States ship Lexington at San Pedro, and on reaching Monterey you will report to the undersigned, James Biddle. Of course, I executed my part to the letter, and these officers were duly lassoed. We sailed down the coast with a fair wind, and anchored inside the kelp, abreast of Johnson's house. Messages were forthwith dispatched up to Los Angeles, twenty miles off, and preparations for horses made for us to ride up. We landed, and, as Kearney held to my arm in ascending the steep path up the bluff, he remarked to himself, rather than to me, that it was strange that Fremont did not want to return north by the Lexington on account of seasickness. But preferred to go by land over five hundred miles. The younger officers had been discussing what the general would do with Fremont, who was supposed to be in a state of mutiny. Some thought he would be tried and shot, some that he would be carried back in irons. And all agreed that if any one else than Fremont had put on such airs, and had acted as he had done, Kearney would have shown him no mercy, for he was regarded as the strictest sort of a disciplinarian. We had a pleasant ride across the plain which lies between the seashore and Los Angeles, which we reached in about three hours, the infantry following on foot. We found Colonel P. St. George Cook living at the house of a Mr. Pryor, and the company of dragoons, with A. J. Smith, Davidson, Stoneman, and Dr. Griffin, quartered in an adobe house close by. Fremont held his court in the only two-story frame house in the place. After some time spent at Pryor's house, General Kearney ordered me to call on Fremont to notify him of his arrival, and that he desired to see him. I walked round to the house which had been pointed out to me as his, inquired of a man at the door if the colonel was in, was answered, yeah, and was conducted to a large room on the second floor, where very soon Fremont came in. And I delivered my message. As I was on the point of leaving, he inquired where I was going to, and I answered that I was going back to Pryor's house, where the general was, when he remarked that if I would wait a moment he would go along. Of course I waited, and he soon joined me, dressed much as a Californian, with the peculiar high, broad-brimmed hat, with a fancy cord, and we walked together back to Pryor's, where I left him with General Kearney. We spent several days very pleasantly at Los Angeles, then, as now, the chief pueblo of the South, famous for its grapes, fruits, and wines. There was a hill close to the town, from which we had a perfect view of the place. The surrounding country is level, utterly devoid of trees, except the willows and cottonwoods that line the Los Angeles Creek and the acequias, or ditches, which lead from it. The space of ground cultivated in vineyards seemed about five miles by one, embracing the town. Every house had its enclosure of vineyard, which resembled a miniature orchard, the vines being very old, ranged in rows, trimmed very close, with irrigating ditches so arranged that a stream of water could be diverted between each row of vines. The Los Angeles and San Gabriel rivers are fed by melting snows from a range of mountains to the east, and the quantity of cultivated land depends upon the amount of water. This did not seem to be very large. But the San Gabriel River, close by, was represented to contain a larger volume of water, affording the means of greatly enlarging the space for cultivation. The climate was so moderate that oranges, figs, pomegranates, etc. were generally to be found in every yard or enclosure. At the time of our visit, General Kearney was making his preparations to return overland to the United States, and he arranged to secure a volunteer escort out of the battalion of Mormons that was then stationed at San Luis Rey. Under Colonel Cook and a Major Hunt. This battalion was only enlisted for one year, and the time for their discharge was approaching, and it was generally understood that the majority of the men wanted to be discharged so as to join the Mormons who had halted at Salt Lake. But a lieutenant and about forty men volunteered to return to Missouri as the escort of General Kearney. These were mounted on mules and horses, and I was appointed to conduct them to Monterey by land. 
Leaving the party at Los Angeles to follow by sea in the Lexington, I started with the Mormon detachment and traveled by land. We averaged about 30 miles a day, stopped one day at Santa Barbara, where I saw Colonel Burton, and so on by the usually traveled road to Monterey, reaching it in about 15 days, arriving some days in advance of the Lexington. This gave me the best kind of an opportunity for seeing the country, which was very sparsely populated indeed, except by a few families at the various missions. We had no wheeled vehicles, but packed our food and clothing on mules driven ahead, and we slept on the ground in the open air, the rainy season having passed. Fremont followed me by land in a few days, and, by the end of May, General Kearney was already at Monterey to take his departure, leaving to succeed him in command Colonel R. B. Mason, 1st Dragoons. Our captain, Tompkins, too, had become discontented at his separation from his family, tendered his resignation to General Kearney, and availed himself of a sailing vessel bound for Kalau to reach the east. Colonel Mason selected me as his adjutant general. And on the very last day of May General Kearney, with his Mormon escort, with Colonel Cook, Colonel Swords, Quartermaster, Captain Turner, and a naval officer, Captain Radford, took his departure for the East Overland leaving us in full possession of California and its fate. Fremont also left California with General Kearney, and with him departed all cause of confusion and disorder in the country. From that time forth no one could dispute the authority of Colonel Mason as in command of all the United States forces on shore, while the senior naval officer had a like control afloat. This was Commodore James Biddle, who had reached the station from China in the Columbus, and he in turn was succeeded by Commodore T. A. P. Catesby Jones in the line of battleship Ohio. At that time Monterey was our headquarters, and the naval commander for a time remained there, but subsequently San Francisco Bay became the chief naval rendezvous. Colonel R. B. Mason, 1st Dragoons, was an officer of great experience, of stern character, deemed by some harsh and severe, but in all my intercourse with him he was kind and agreeable. He had a large fund of good sense, and, during our long period of service together, I enjoyed his unlimited confidence. He had been in his day a splendid shot and hunter, and often entertained me with characteristic anecdotes of Taylor, Twiggs, Worth, Harvey, Martin Scott, etc., etc., who were then, in Mexico, gaining a national fame. California had settled down to a condition of absolute repose, and we naturally repined at our fate in being so remote from the war in Mexico, where our comrades were reaping large honors. Mason dwelt in a house not far from the Custom House, with Captain Landman, United States Navy, I had a small adobe house back of Larkins. Halleck and Dr. Murray had a small log house not far off. The company of artillery was still on the hill, under the command of Lieutenant Ord, engaged in building a fort whereon to mount the guns we had brought out in the Lexington, and also in constructing quarters out of hewn pine logs for the men. Lieutenant Minor, a very clever young officer, had taken violently sick and died about the time I got back from Los Angeles, leaving Lieutenants Ord and Lozer alone with the company, with Assistant Surgeon Robert Murray. Captain William G. Marcy was the quartermaster and commissary. Nagley's company of Stevenson's regiment had been mounted and was sent out against the Indians in the San Joaquin Valley, and Shannon's company occupied the barracks. Shortly after General Kearney had gone east, we found an order of his on record, removing one Mr. Nash, the Alcalde of Sonoma, and appointing to his place ex-Governor L. W. Boggs. A letter came to Colonel and Governor Mason from Boggs, whom he had personally known in Missouri, complaining that, though he had been appointed Alcalde, the then incumbent, Nash, utterly denied Kearney's right to remove him. Because he had been elected by the people under the proclamation of Commodore Sloat, and refused to surrender his office or to account for his acts as Alcalde. Such a proclamation had been made by Commodore Sloat shortly after the first occupation of California, announcing that the people were free and enlightened American citizens, entitled to all the rights and privileges as such and among them the right to elect their own officers, etc. The people of Sonoma Town and Valley, some forty or fifty immigrants from the United States, and very few native Californians, had elected Mr. Nash, and, as stated, 
he refused to recognize the right of a mere military commander to eject him and to appoint another to his place. Neither General Kearney nor Mason had much respect for this land of Buncombe, but assumed the true doctrine that California was yet a Mexican province, held by right of conquest, that the military commander was held responsible to the country. And that the province should be held in statu quo until a treaty of peace. This letter of Boggs was therefore referred to Captain Brackett, whose company was stationed at Sonoma, with orders to notify Nash that Boggs was the rightful alcalde that he must quietly surrender his office, with the books and records thereof, and that he must account for any monies received from the sale of townlots, etc., etc. And in the event of refusal he, Captain Brackett, must compel him by the use of force. In due time we got Brackett's answer, saying that the little community of Sonoma was in a dangerous state of effervescence caused by his orders. That Nash was backed by most of the Americans there who had come across from Missouri with American ideas. That as he, Brackett, was a volunteer officer, likely to be soon discharged, and as he designed to settle there, he asked in consequence to be excused from the execution of this, to him, unpleasant duty. Such a request, coming to an old soldier like Colonel Mason, aroused his wrath, and he would have proceeded roughshod against Brackett, who, by the way, was a West Point graduate, and ought to have known better. But I suggested to the colonel that, the case being a test one, he had better send me up to Sonoma, and I would settle it quick enough. He then gave me an order to go to Sonoma to carry out the instructions already given to Brackett. I took one soldier with me, Private Barnes, with four horses, two of which we rode, and the other two we drove ahead. The first day we reached Gilroy's and camped by a stream near three or four adobe huts known as Gilroy's Ranch. The next day we passed Murphy's, San Jose, and Santa Clara Mission, camping some four miles beyond, where a kind of hole had been dug in the ground for water. The whole of this distance, now so beautifully improved and settled, was then scarcely occupied, except by poor ranches producing horses and cattle. The Pueblo of San Jose was a string of low adobe houses festooned with red peppers and garlic. And the mission of Santa Clara was a dilapidated concern, with its church and orchard. The long line of poplar trees lining the road from San Jose to Santa Clara bespoke a former period when the priests had ruled the land. Just about dark I was lying on the ground near the well, and my soldier barns had watered our horses and picketed them to grass when we heard a horse crushing his way through the high mustard bushes which filled the plain. And soon a man came to us to inquire if we had seen a saddle horse pass up the road. We explained to him what we had heard, and he went off in pursuit of his horse. Before dark he came back unsuccessful, and gave his name as Bidwell, the same gentleman who has since been a member of Congress, who is married to Miss Kennedy, of Washington City, and now lives in princely style at Chico, California. He explained that he was a surveyor, and had been in the lower country engaged in surveying land. That the horse had escaped him with his saddlebags containing all his notes and papers, and some six hundred dollars in money, all the money he had earned. He spent the night with us on the ground, and the next morning we left him there to continue the search for his horse, and I afterward heard that he had found his saddlebags all right, but never recovered the horse. The next day toward night we approached the mission of San Francisco, and the village of Yerba Buena, tired and weary, the wind as usual blowing a perfect hurricane, and a more desolate region it was impossible to conceive of. Leaving Barnes to work his way into the town as best he could with the tired animals, I took the freshest horse and rode forward. I fell in with Lieutenant Fabia Stanley, United States Navy, and we rode into Yerba Buena together about an hour before sundown, there being nothing but a path from the mission into the town, deep and heavy with drift sand. My horse could hardly drag one foot after the other when we reached the old Hudson Bay Company's house, which was then the store of Howard and Mellis. There I learned where Captain Folsom, the quartermaster, was to be found. He was staying with a family of the name of Grimes, who had a small horse back of Howard's store, which must have been near where Sacramento Street now crosses Kearney. Folsom was a classmate of mine, had come out with Stevenson's regiment as quartermaster, and was at the time the chief quartermaster of the department. His office was in the old custom horse standing at the northwest corner of the plaza. 
He had hired two warehouses, the only ones there at the time, of one Leedsdorf, the principal man of Yerba Buena, who also owned the only public house, or tavern, called the City Hotel, on Kearney Street, at the southeast corner of the plaza. I stopped with Folsom at Mrs. Grimes's, and he sent my horse, as also the other three when Barnes had got in after dark, to a quarrel where he had a little barley, but no hay. At that time nobody fed a horse, but he was usually turned out to pick such scanty grass as he could find on the side hills. The few government horses used in town were usually sent out to the Presidio, where the grass was somewhat better. At that time, July, 1847, what is now called San Francisco was called Yerba Buena. A naval officer, Lieutenant Washington A. Bartlett, its first alcalde, had caused it to be surveyed and laid out into blocks and lots, which were being sold at $16 a lot of 50 viras square. The understanding being that no single person could purchase of the alcalde more than one in lot of 50 varas, and one out lot of a hundred varas. Folsom, however, had got his clerks, orderlies, etc. to buy lots, and they, for a small consideration, conveyed them to him, so that he was nominally the owner of a good many lots. Lieutenant Halleck had bought one of each kind, and so had Warner. Many naval officers had also invested, and Captain Folsom advised me to buy some, but I felt actually insulted that he should think me such a fool as to pay money for property in such a horrid place as Yerba Buena. Especially ridiculing his quarter of the city, then called Happy Valley. At that day Montgomery Street was, as now, the business street, extending from Jackson to Sacramento, the water of the bay leaving barely room for a few houses on its east side. And the public warehouses were on a sandy beach about where the Bank of California now stands, viz. Near the intersection of Sansom and California, streets. Along Montgomery Street were the stores of Howard and Mellis, Frank Ward, Sherman and Ruckel, Ross and Company, and it may be one or two others. Around the plaza were a few houses, among them the City Hotel and the Custom House, single-story adobes with tiled roofs, and they were by far the most substantial and best houses in the place. The population was estimated at about 400, of whom Kanakas, natives of the Sandwich Islands, formed the bulk. At the foot of Clay Street was a small wharf which small boats could reach at high tide. But the principal landing place was where some stones had fallen into the water, about where Broadway now intersects Battery Street. On the steep bluff above had been excavated, by the Navy, during the year before, a bench, wherein were mounted a couple of Navy guns, styled the battery, which, I suppose, gave name to the street. I explained to Folsom the object of my visit, and learned from him that he had no boat in which to send me to Sonoma, and that the only chance to get there was to borrow a boat from the Navy. The line of battleship Columbus was then lying at anchor off the town, and he said if I would get up early the next morning I could go off to her in one of the market boats. Accordingly, I was up bright and early, down at the wharf, found a boat, and went off to the Columbus to see Commodore Biddle. On reaching the ship and stating to the officer of the deck my business, I was shown into the Commodore's cabin, and soon made known to him my object. Biddle was a small-sized man, but vivacious in the extreme. He had a perfect contempt for all humbug, and at once entered into the business with extreme alacrity. I was somewhat amused at the importance he attached to the step. He had a chaplain, and a private secretary, in a small room latticed off from his cabin, and he first called on them to go out, and, when we were alone, he enlarged on the folly of Sloat's proclamation. Giving the people the right to elect their own officers, and commended Kearney and Mason for nipping that idea in the bud, and keeping the power in their own hands. He then sent for the first lieutenant, Drayton, and inquired if there were among the officers on board any who had ever been in the upper bay, and learning that there was a midshipman, Whitaker, he was sent for. It so happened that this midshipman had been on a frolic on shore a few nights before, and was accordingly much frightened when summoned into the Commodore's presence, but as soon as he was questioned as to his knowledge of the bay. He was sensibly relieved, and professed to know everything about it. Accordingly, the long boat was ordered with this midshipman and eight sailors, prepared with water and provisions for several days' absence. 
Biddle then asked me if I knew any of his own officers, and which one of them I would prefer to accompany me. I knew most of them, and we settled down on Lewis McLean. He was sent for, and it was settled that McLean and I were to conduct this important mission, and the Commodore enjoined on us complete secrecy, so as to ensure success, and he especially cautioned us against being pumped by his wardroom officers. Chapman, Lewis, Wise, etc. While on board his ship. With this injunction I was dismissed to the wardroom, where I found Chapman, Lewis, and Wise, dreadfully exercised at our profound secrecy. The fact that McLean and I had been closeted with the Commodore for an hour, that orders for the boat and stores had been made, that the chaplain and clerk had been sent out of the cabin, etc., etc., all excited their curiosity. But McLean and I kept our secret well. The general impression was, that we had some knowledge about the fate of Captain Montgomery's two sons and the crew that had been lost the year before. In 1846 Captain Montgomery commanded at Yerba Buena, on board the St. Mary Sloop of War, and he had a detachment of men stationed up at Sonoma. Occasionally a boat was sent up with provisions or intelligence to them. Montgomery had two sons on board his ship, one a midshipman, the other his secretary. Having occasion to send some money up to Sonoma, he sent his two sons with a good boat and crew. The boat started with a strong breeze and a very large sail, was watched from the deck until she was out of sight, and has never been heard of since. There was, of course, much speculation as to their fate, some contending that the boat must have been capsized in San Pablo Bay, and that all were lost. Others contending that the crew had murdered the officers for the money, and then escaped. But, so far as I know, not a man of that crew has ever been seen or heard of since. When at last the boat was ready for us, we started, leaving all hands, save the Commodore, impressed with the belief that we were going on some errand connected with the loss of the missing boat and crew of the St. Mary. We sailed directly north, up the bay and across San Pablo, reached the month of Sonoma Creek about dark, and during the night worked up the creek some twelve miles by means of the tide, to a landing called the Embarcadero. To maintain the secrecy which the Commodore had enjoined on us, McLean and I agreed to keep up the delusion by pretending to be on a marketing expedition to pick up chickens, pigs, etc., for the mess of the Columbus, soon to depart for home. Leaving the midshipmen and four sailors to guard the boat, we started on foot with the other four for Sonoma Town, which we soon reached. It was a simple open square, around which were some adobe houses, that of General Vallejo occupying one side. On another was an unfinished two-story adobe building, occupied as a barrack by Bracken's company. We soon found Captain Brackett, and I told him that I intended to take Nash a prisoner and convey him back to Monterey to answer for his mutinous behavior. I got an old sergeant of his company, whom I had known in the third artillery, quietly to ascertain the whereabouts of Nash, who was a bachelor, stopping with the family of a lawyer named Green. The sergeant soon returned, saying that Nash had gone over to Napa, but would be back that evening. So McLean and I went up to a farm of some pretensions, occupied by one Andreas Hochner, with a pretty Sitka wife, who lived a couple of miles above Sonoma, and we bought of him some chickens, pigs, etc. We then visited Governor Boggs's family and that of General Vallejo, who was then, as now, one of the most prominent and influential natives of California. About dark I learned that Nash had come back, and then, giving Brackett orders to have a cart ready at the corner of the plaza, McLean and I went to the house of Green. Posting an armed sailor on each side of the house, we knocked at the door and walked in. We found Green, Nash, and two women, at supper. I inquired if Nash were in, and was first answered, no, but one of the women soon pointed to him, and he rose. We were armed with pistols, and the family was evidently alarmed. I walked up to him and took his arm, and told him to come along with me. He asked me, where, and I said, Monterey. Why? I would explain that more at leisure. Green put himself between me and the door, and demanded, in theatrical style, why I dared arrest a peaceable citizen in his house. I simply pointed to my pistol, and told him to get out of the way, which he did. Nash asked to get some clothing, but I told him he should want for nothing. We passed out, 
Green following us with loud words, which brought the four sailors to the front door, when I told him to hush up or I would take him prisoner also. About that time one of the sailors, handling his pistol carelessly, discharged it, and Green disappeared very suddenly. We took Nash to the cart, put him in, and proceeded back to our boat. The next morning we were gone. Nash being out of the way, Boggs entered on his office, and the right to appoint or remove from civil office was never again questioned in California during the military regime. Nash was an old man, and was very much alarmed for his personal safety. He had come across the plains, and had never yet seen the sea. While on our way down the bay, I explained fully to him the state of things in California, and he admitted he had never looked on it in that light before, and professed a willingness to surrender his office. But, having gone so far, I thought it best to take him to Monterey. On our way down the bay the wind was so strong, as we approached the Columbus, that we had to take refuge behind Yerba Buena Island, then called Goat Island, where we landed, and I killed a grey seal. The next morning, the wind being comparatively light, we got out and worked our way up to the Columbus, where I left my prisoner on board, and went on shore to find Commodore Biddle, who had gone to dine with Frank Ward. I found him there, and committed Nash to his charge, with the request that he would send him down to Monterey, which he did in the sloop of Wardale, Captain Selfridge commanding. I then returned to Monterey by land, and, when the Dale arrived, Colonel Mason and I went on board, found poor old Mr. Nash half dead with seasickness and fear, lest Colonel Mason would treat him with extreme military rigor. But, on the contrary, the Colonel spoke to him kindly, released him as a prisoner on his promise to go back to Sonoma, surrender his office to Boggs, and account to him for his acts while in office. He afterward came on shore, was provided with clothing and a horse, returned to Sonoma, and I never have seen him since. Matters and things settled down in Upper California, and all moved along with peace and harmony. The war still continued in Mexico, and the Navy authorities resolved to employ their time with the capture of Mazatlan and Guaymas. Lower California had already been occupied by two companies of Stevenson's regiment, under Lieutenant Colonel Burton, who had taken post at La Paz, and a small party of sailors was on shore at San Joseph, near Cape San Lucas. Detached from the Lexington, Lt. Commander Bailey. The orders for this occupation were made by General Kearney before he left, in pursuance of instructions from the War Department, merely to subserve a political end, for there were few or no people in Lower California, which is a miserable, wretched, dried-up peninsula. I remember the proclamation made by Burton and Captain Bailey, in taking possession, which was in the usual florid style. Bailey signed his name as the senior naval officer at the station, but, as it was necessary to put it into Spanish to reach the inhabitants of the newly acquired country, it was interpreted, El Mas Antiguo de Todos los Oficiales de la Marina, etc. Which, literally, is, the most ancient of all the naval officers, etc., a translation at which we made some fun. The expedition to Mazatlan was, however, for a different purpose, viz. To get possession of the ports of Mazatlan and Guaymas, as a part of the war against Mexico, and not for permanent conquest. Commodore Shubrick commanded this expedition, and took Halleck along as his engineer officer. They captured Mazatlan and Guaymas, and then called on Colonel Mason to send soldiers down to hold possession, but he had none to spare, and it was found impossible to raise other volunteers either in California or Oregon. And the Navy held these places by detachments of sailors and Marines till the end of the war. Burton also called for reinforcements, and Naglier Company was sent to him from Monterey, and these three companies occupied Lower California at the end of the Mexican War. Major Hardy still commanded at San Francisco and above. Company F, 3rd Artillery, and Shannon's Company of Volunteers, were at Monterey, Lippitt's Company at Santa Barbara, Colonel Stevenson, with one company of his regiment, and the company of the 1st Dragoons, was at Los Angeles. And a company of Mormons, re-enlisted out of the Mormon battalion, garrisoned San Diego, and thus matters went along throughout 1847 into 1848. I had occasion to make several trips to Yerba Buena and back, and in the spring of 1848 Colonel Mason and I went down to Santa Barbara in the sloop of Wardale. 
I spent much time in hunting deer and bear in the mountains back of the Carmel Mission, and ducks and geese in the plains of the Salinas. As soon as the fall rain set in, the young oats would sprout up, and myriads of ducks, brant, and geese, made their appearance. In a single day, or rather in the evening of one day and the morning of the next, I could load a pack mule with geese and ducks. They had grown somewhat wild from the increased number of hunters, yet, by marking well the place where a flock lighted, I could, by taking advantage of gullies or the shape of the ground, creep up within range. And, giving one barrel on the ground, and the other as they rose, I have secured as many as nine at one discharge. Colonel Mason on one occasion killed eleven geese by one discharge of small shot. The seasons in California are well marked. About October and November the rains begin, and the whole country, plains and mountains, becomes covered with a bright green grass, with endless flowers. The intervals between the rains give the finest weather possible. These rains are less frequent in March, and cease altogether in April and May, when gradually the grass dies and the whole aspect of things changes, first to yellow, then to brown, and by midsummer all is burnt up and dry as an ash heap. When General Kearney first departed we took his office at Larkins, but shortly afterward we had a broad stairway constructed to lead from the outside to the upper front porch of the barracks. By cutting a large door through the adobe wall, we made the upper room in the center our office, and another side room, connected with it by a door, was Colonel Mason's private office. I had a single clerk, a soldier named Baden, and William E. P. Hartnell, citizen, also had a table in the same room. He was the government interpreter, and had charge of the civil archives. After Halleck's return from Mazatlan, he was, by Colonel Mason, made Secretary of State. And he then had charge of the civil archives, including the land titles, of which Fremont first had possession, but which had reverted to us when he left the country. I remember one day, in the spring of 1848, that two men, Americans, came into the office and inquired for the governor. I asked their business, and one answered that they had just come down from Captain Sutter on special business, and they wanted to see Governor Mason in person. I took them into the colonel, and left them together. After some time the colonel came to his door and called to me. I went in, and my attention was directed to a series of papers unfolded on his table, in which lay about half an ounce of placer gold. Mason said to me, What is that? I touched it and examined one or two of the larger pieces, and asked, Is it gold? Mason asked me if I had ever seen native gold. I answered that, in 1844, I was in Upper Georgia, and there saw some native gold, but it was much finer than this, and that it was in files, or in transparent quills. But I said that, if this were gold, it could be easily tested, first, by its malleability, and next by acids. I took a piece in my teeth, and the metallic luster was perfect. I then called to the clerk, Baden, to bring an axe and hatchet from the backyard. When these were brought, I took the largest piece and beat it out flat, and beyond doubt it was metal, and a pure metal. Still, we attached little importance to the fact, for gold was known to exist at San Fernando, at the south, and yet was not considered of much value. Colonel Mason then handed me a letter from Captain Sutter, addressed to him, stating that he, Sutter, was engaged in erecting a sawmill at Coloma, about forty miles up the American Fork, above his fort at New Helvetia for the general benefit of the settlers in that vicinity. That he had incurred considerable expense, and wanted a preemption to the quarter section of land on which the mill was located, embracing the tail race in which this particular gold had been found. Mason instructed me to prepare a letter, in answer, for his signature. I wrote off a letter, reciting that California was yet a Mexican province, simply held by us as a conquest. That no laws of the United States yet applied to it, much less the land laws or preemption laws, which could only apply after a public survey. Therefore it was impossible for the governor to promise him, Sutter, a title to the land. Yet, as there were no settlements within forty miles, he was not likely to be disturbed by trespassers. Colonel Mason signed the letter, handed it to one of the gentlemen who had brought the sample of gold, and they departed. 
That gold was the first discovered in the Sierra Nevada, which soon revolutionized the whole country, and actually moved the whole civilized world. About this time, May and June, 1848, far more importance was attached to quicksilver. One mine, the New Almaden, 12 miles south of San Jose, was well known, and was in possession of the agent of a Scotch gentleman named Forties, who at the time was British consul at Topeak, Mexico. Mr. Forties came up from San Blas in a small brig, which proved to be a Mexican vessel, the vessel was seized, condemned, and actually sold, but Forties was wealthy, and bought her in. His title to the quicksilver mine was, however, never disputed, as he had bought it regularly, before our conquest of the country, from another British subject, also named Forties, a resident of Santa Clara Mission, who had purchased it of the discoverer, a priest. But the boundaries of the land attached to the mine were even then in dispute. Other men were in search of quicksilver. And the whole range of mountains near the new Almaden mine was stained with the brilliant red of the sulfuret of mercury, cinnabar. A company composed of T. O. Larkin, J. R. Snyder, and others, among them one John Rickard, who was quite a character, also claimed a valuable mine nearby. Rickard was a lawyer from about Buffalo, and by some means had got to the Sandwich Islands, where he became a great favorite of the king, Kamehameha, was his attorney general, and got into a difficulty with the Reverend Mr. Judd, who was a kind of prime minister to his majesty. One or the other had to go, and Rickard left for San Francisco, where he arrived while Colonel Mason and I were there on some business connected with the customs. Rickard at once made a dead set at Mason with flattery, and all sorts of spurious arguments, to convince him that our military government was too simple in its forms for the new state of facts, and that he was the man to remodel it. I had heard a good deal to his prejudice, and did all I could to prevent Mason taking him, into his confidence. We then started back for Monterey. Rickard was along, and night and day he was harping on his scheme. But he disgusted Colonel Mason with his flattery, and, on reaching Monterey, he opened what he called a law office, but there were neither courts nor clients, so necessity forced him to turn his thoughts to something else. And Quicksilver became his hobby. In the spring of 1848 an appeal came to our office from San Jose, which compelled the governor to go up in person. Lieutenant Lozer and I, with a couple of soldiers, went along. At San Jose the governor held some kind of a court, in which Rickard and the Alcalde had a warm dispute about a certain mine which Rickard, as a member of the Larkin Company, had opened within the limits claimed by the new Almaden Company. On our way up we had visited the ground, and were therefore better prepared to understand the controversy. We had found at New Almaden Mr. Walkinshaw, a fine Scotch gentleman, the resident agent of Mr. Forbes. He had built in the valley, near a small stream, a few board houses, and some four or five furnaces for the distillation of the mercury. These were very simple in their structure, being composed of whalers' kettles, set in masonry. These kettles were filled with broken or about the size of macadam stone, mingled with lime. Another kettle, reversed, formed the lid, and the seam was looted with clay. On applying heat, the mercury was volatilized and carried into a chimney stack, where it condensed and flowed back into a reservoir, and then was led in pipes into another kettle outside. After witnessing this process, we visited the mine itself, which outcropped near the apex of the hill, about a thousand feet above the furnaces. We found wagons hauling the mineral down the hill and returning empty, and in the mines quite a number of Sonora miners were blasting and driving for the beautiful or cinnabar. It was then, and is now, a most valuable mine. The added of the mine was at the apex of the hill, which drooped off to the north. We rode along this hill, and saw where many openings had been begun, but these, proving of little or no value, had been abandoned. Three miles beyond, on the west face of the bill, we came to the opening of the Larkin Company. There was evidence of a good deal of work, but the mine itself was filled up by what seemed a landslide. The question involved in the lawsuit before the Alcalde at San Jose was, first, whether the mine was or was not on the land belonging to the new Almaden property. And, next, whether the company had complied with all the conditions of the might laws of Mexico, 
which were construed to be still in force in California. These laws required that anyone who discovered a valuable mine on private land should first file with the alcalde, or judge of the district, a notice and claim for the benefits of such discovery. Then the mine was to be opened and followed for a distance of at least 100 feet within a specified time, and the claimants must take out samples of the mineral and deposit the same with the alcalde, who was then required to inspect personally the mine, to see that it fulfilled all the conditions of the law, before he could give a written title. In this case the alcalde had been to the mine and had possession of samples of the ore. But, as the mouth of the mine was closed up, as alleged, from the act of God, by a landslide. It was contended by Rickard and his associates that it was competent to prove by good witnesses that the mine had been opened into the hill one hundred feet and that, by no negligence of theirs, it had caved in. It was generally understood that Robert J. Walker, United States Secretary of the Treasury, was then a partner in this mining company. And a vessel, the Bark Gray Eagle, was ready at San Francisco to sail for New York with the title papers on which to base a joint stock company for speculative uses. I think the alcalde was satisfied that the law had been complied with, that he had given the necessary papers, and, as at that time there was nothing developed to show fraud, the governor, Mason, did not interfere. At that date there was no public house or tavern in San Jose where we could stop, so we started toward Santa Cruz and encamped about ten miles out, to the west of the town, where we fell in with another party of explorers, of whom Ruckel, of San Francisco, was the head. And after supper, as we sat around the campfire, the conversation turned on Quicksilver in general, and the result of the contest in San Jose in particular. Mason was relating to Ruckel the points and the arguments of Rickard, that the company should not suffer from an act of God, viz. The caving in of the mouth of the mine, when a man named Cash, a fellow who had once been in the quartermaster's employ as a teamster, spoke up, Governor Mason, did Judge Rickard say that? Yes, said the governor. And then Cash related how he and another man, whose name he gave, had been employed by Rickard to undermine a heavy rock that rested above the mouth of the mine, so that it tumbled down, carrying with it a large quantity of earth. And completely filled it up, as we had seen. And, said Cash, it took us three days of the hardest kind of work. This was the act of God, and on the papers procured from the alcalde at that time, I understand, was built a huge speculation, by which thousands of dollars changed hands in the United States and were lost. This happened long before the celebrated McGarrahan claim, which has produced so much noise, and which still is being prosecuted in the courts and in Congress. On the next day we crossed over the Santa Cruz Mountains, from which we had sublime views of the scenery, first looking east toward the lower bay of San Francisco, with the bright plains of Santa Clara and San Jose. And then to the west upon the ocean, the town of Monterey being visible sixty miles off. If my memory is correct, we beheld from that mountain the firing of a salute from the battery at Monterey, and counted the number of guns from the white puffs of smoke, but could not hear the sound. That night we slept on piles of wheat in a mill at Soquel, near Santa Cruz, and, our supplies being short, I advised that we should make an early start next morning, so as to reach the ranch of Don Juan Antonio Vallejo, a particular friend, who had a large and valuable cattle ranch on the Pajaro River, about twenty miles on our way to Monterey. Accordingly, we were off by the first light of day, and by nine o'clock we had reached the ranch. It was on a high point of the plateau, overlooking the plain of the Pajaro, on which were grazing numbers of horses and cattle. The house was of adobe, with a long range of adobe huts occupied by the semi-civilized Indians, who at that time did all the labor of a ranch, the herding and marking of cattle, breaking of horses, and cultivating the little patches of wheat and vegetables which constituted all the farming of that day. Everything about the house looked deserted, and, seeing a small Indian boy leaning up against a post, I approached him and asked him in Spanish, where is the master? Gone to the Presidio, Monterey. Is anybody in the house? No. Is it locked up? Yes. Is no one about who can get in? No, have you any meat? No, any flour or grain? No, any chickens? No, any eggs? 
No, what do you live on? Nada, nothing. The utter indifference of this boy, and the tone of his answer, Nada, attracted the attention of Colonel Mason, who had been listening to our conversation, and who knew enough of Spanish to catch the meaning, and he exclaimed with some feeling. So we get Nada for our breakfast. I felt mortified, for I had held out the prospect of a splendid breakfast of meat and tortillas with rice, chickens, eggs, etc. At the ranch of my friend Josh Antonio, as a justification for taking the governor, a man of sixty years of age, more than twenty miles at a full canter for his breakfast. But there was no help for it, and we accordingly went a short distance to a pond, where we unpacked our mules and made a slim breakfast, on some scraps of hard bread and a bone of pork that remained in our alforjas. This was no uncommon thing in those days, when many a ranchero with his eleven leagues of land, his hundreds of horses and thousands of cattle, would receive us with all the grandiloquence of a Spanish lord. And confess that he had nothing in his house to eat except the carcass of a beef hung up, from which the stranger might cut and cook, without money or price, what he needed. That night we slept on Salinas Plain, and the next morning reached Monterey. All the missions and houses at that period were alive with fleas, which the natives looked on as pleasant titillators, but they so tortured me that I always gave them a wide berth, and slept on a saddle blanket. With the saddle for a pillow and the serape, or blanket, for a cover. We never feared rain except in winter. As the spring and summer of 1848 advanced, the reports came faster and faster from the gold mines at Sutter Sawmill. Stories reached us of fabulous discoveries, and spread throughout the land. Everybody was talking of gold. Gold, until it assumed the character of a fever. Some of our soldiers began to desert, citizens were fitting out trains of wagons and pack mules to go to the mines. We heard of men earning fifty, five hundred, and thousands of dollars per day, and for a time it seemed as though somebody would reach solid gold. Some of this gold began to come to Yerba Buena in trade, and to disturb the value of merchandise, particularly of mules, horses, tin pans, and articles used in mining, I of course could not escape the infection. And at last convinced Colonel Mason that it was our duty to go up and see with our own eyes, that we might report the truth to our government. As yet we had no regular mail to any part of the United States, but mails had come to us at long intervals, around Cape Horn, and one or two overland. I well remember the first overland mail. It was brought by Kit Carson in saddlebags from Taos in New Mexico. We heard of his arrival at Los Angeles, and waited patiently for his arrival at headquarters. His fame then was at its height, from the publication of Fremont's books, and I was very anxious to see a man who had achieved such feats of daring among the wild animals of the Rocky Mountains, and still wilder Indians of the plains. At last his arrival was reported at the tavern at Monterey, and I hurried to hunt him up. I cannot express my surprise at beholding a small, stoop-shouldered man, with reddish hair, freckled face, soft blue eyes, and nothing to indicate extraordinary courage or daring. He spoke but little, and answered questions in monosyllables. I asked for his mail, and he picked up his light saddlebags containing the great overland mail, and we walked together to headquarters, where he delivered his parcel into Colonel Mason's own hands. He spent some days in Monterey, during which time we extracted with difficulty some items of his personal history. He was then by commission a lieutenant in the regiment of mounted rifles serving in Mexico under Colonel Sumner, and, as he could not reach his regiment from California, Colonel Mason ordered that for a time he should be assigned to duty with A. J. Smith's company, 1st Dragoons, at Los Angeles. He remained at Los Angeles some months, and was then sent back to the United Staten with dispatches, traveling 2,000 miles almost alone, in preference to being encumbered by a large party. Toward the close of June, 1848, the gold fever being at its height, by Colonel Mason's orders I made preparations for his trip to the newly discovered gold mines at Sutter's Fort. I selected four good soldiers, with Aaron, Colonel Mason's black servant, and a good outfit of horses and pack mules, we started by the usually traveled route for Yerba Buena. Their Captain Folsom and two citizens joined our party. The first difficulty was to cross the bay to Sausalito. 
Folsom, as quartermaster, had a sort of scow with a large sail, with which to discharge the cargoes of ships that could not come within a mile of the shore. It took nearly the whole day to get the old scow up to the only wharf there, and then the water was so shallow that the scow, with its load of horses, would not float at the first high tide. But by infinite labor on the next tide she was got off and safely crossed over to Sausalito. We followed in a more comfortable schooner. Having safely landed our horses and mules, we picked up and rode to San Rafael Mission, stopping with Don Timoteo Murphy. The next day's journey took us to Bodega, where lived a man named Stephen Smith, who had the only steam sawmill in California. He had a Peruvian wife, and employed a number of absolutely naked Indians in making adobes. We spent a day very pleasantly with him, and learned that he had come to California some years before, at the personal advice of Daniel Webster, who had informed him that sooner or later the United States would be in possession of California. And that in consequence it would become a great country. From Bodega we traveled to Sonoma, by way of Petaluma, and spent a day with General Vallejo. I had been there before, as related, in the business of the Alcalde Nash. From Sonoma we crossed over by way of Napa, Sassoon, and Vaca's Ranch, to the Puta. In the rainy season, the plain between the Puta and Sacramento rivers is impassable, but in July the waters dry up, and we passed without trouble by the trail for Sutter's Embarcadero. We reached the Sacramento River, then full of water, with a deep, clear current. The only means of crossing over was by an Indian dugout canoe. We began by carrying across our packs and saddles, and then our people. When all things were ready, the horses were driven into the water, one being guided ahead by a man in the canoe. Of course, the horses and mules at first refused to take to the water, and it was nearly a day's work to get them across, and even then some of our animals after crossing escaped into the woods and undergrowth that lined the river. But we secured enough of them to reach Sutter's Fort, three miles back from the M. Carcadero, where we encamped at the old slough, or pond, near the fort. On application, Captain Butter sent some Indians back into the bushes, who recovered and brought in all our animals. At that time there was not the sign of a habitation there or thereabouts, except the fort, and an old adobe house, east of the fort, known as the hospital. The fort itself was one of adobe walls, about twenty feet high, rectangular in form, with two-story block houses at diagonal corners. The entrance was by a large gate, open by day and closed at night, with two iron ship's guns near at hand. Inside there was a large house, with a good shingle roof, used as a storehouse, and all round the walls were ranged rooms, the fort wall being the outer wall of the house. The inner wall also was of adobe. These rooms were used by Captain Sutter himself and by his people. He had a blacksmith's shop, carpenter's shop, etc., and other rooms where the women made blankets. Sutter was monarch of all he surveyed, and had authority to inflict punishment even unto death, a power he did not fail to use. He had horses, cattle, and sheep, and of these he gave liberally and without price to all in need. He caused to be driven into our camp a beef and some sheep, which were slaughtered for our use. Already the gold mines were beginning to be felt. Many people were then encamped, some going and some coming, all full of gold stories, and each surpassing the other. We found preparations in progress for celebrating the 4th of July, then close at hand, and we agreed to remain over to assist on the occasion, of course, being the high officials, we were the honored guests. People came from a great distance to attend this celebration of the 4th of July, and the tables were laid in the large room inside the storehouse of the fort. A man of some note, named Sinclair, presided, and after a substantial meal and a reasonable supply of a guardian we began the toasts. All that I remember is that Folsom and I spoke for our party. Others, Captain Sutter included, made speeches, and before the celebration was over Sutter was enthusiastic, and many others showed the effects of the guardian. The next day, namely, July 5, 1848, we resumed our journey toward the mines, and, in twenty-five miles of as hot and dusty a ride as possible, we reached Mormon Island. I have heretofore stated that the gold was first found in the tail race of the stew mill at Coloma, forty miles above Sutter's Fort, 
or 15 above Mormon Island, in the bed of the American Fork of the Sacramento River. It seems that Sutter had employed an American named Marshall, a sort of millwright, to do this work for him, but Marshall afterward claimed that in the matter of the sawmill they were co-partners. At all events, Marshall and the family of Mr. Wimmer were living at Coloma, where the pine trees afforded the best material for lumber. He had under him four white men, Mormons, who had been discharged from Cook's battalion, and some Indians. These were engaged in hewing logs, building a mill dam, and putting up a sawmill. Marshall, as the architect, had made the tub wheel, and had set it in motion, and had also furnished some of the rude parts of machinery necessary for an ordinary up and down sawmill. Labor was very scarce, expensive, and had to be economized. The mill was built over a dry channel of the river which was calculated to be the tail race. After arranging his head race, dam and tub wheel, he let on the water to test the goodness of his machinery. It worked very well until it was found that the tail race did not carry off the water fast enough, so he put his men to work in a rude way to clear out the tail race. They scratched a kind of ditch down the middle of the dry channel, throwing the coarser stones to one side, then, letting on the water again, it would run with velocity down the channel, washing away the dirt, thus saving labor. This course of action was repeated several times, acting exactly like the long Tom afterward resorted to by the miners. As Marshall himself was working in this ditch, he observed particles of yellow metal which he gathered up in his hand, when it seemed to have suddenly flashed across his mind that it was gold. After picking up about an ounce, he hurried down to the fort to report to Captain Sutter his discovery. Captain Sutter himself related to me Marshall's account, saying that, as he sat in his room at the fort one day in February or March, 1848, a knock was heard at his door, and he called out, Come in. In walked Marshall, who was a half-crazy man at best, but then looked strangely wild. What is the matter, Marshall? Marshall inquired if any one was within hearing, and began to peer about the room, and look under the bed, when Sutter, fearing that some calamity had befallen the party up at the sawmill, and that Marshall was really crazy, began to make his way to the door, demanding of Marshall to explain what was the matter. At last he revealed his discovery, and laid before Captain Sutter the pellicles of gold he had picked up in the ditch. At first, Sutter attached little or no importance to the discovery, and told Marshall to go back to the mill, and say nothing of what he had seen to Mr. Wimmer, or anyone else. Yet, as it might add value to the location, he dispatched to our headquarters at Monterey, as I have already related, the two men with a written application for a preemption to the quarter section of land at Coloma. Marshall returned to the mill, but could not keep out of his wonderful ditch, and by some means the other men employed there learned his secret. They then wanted to gather the gold, and Marshall threatened to shoot them if they attempted it. But these men had sense enough to know that if, placer, gold existed at Coloma, it would also be found farther downstream, and they gradually, prospected, until they reached Mormon Island, fifteen miles below. Where they discovered one of the richest placers on earth. These men revealed the fact to some other Mormons who were employed by Captain Sutter at a grist mill he was building still lower down the American Fork, and six miles above his fort. All of them struck for higher wages, to which Sutter yielded, until they asked ten dollars a day, which he refused, and the two mills on which he had spent so much money were never built, and fell into decay. In my opinion, when the Mormons were driven from Nauvoo, Illinois, in 1844, they cast about for a land where they would not be disturbed again, and fixed on California. In the year 1845 a ship, the Brooklyn, sailed from New York for California, with a colony of Mormons, of which Sam Brannan was the leader, and we found them there on our arrival in January, 1847. When General Kearney, at Fort Leavenworth, was collecting volunteers early in 1846, for the Mexican War, he, through the instrumentality of Captain James Allen, brother to our quartermaster, General Robert Allen, raised the battalion of Mormons at Canesville, Iowa, now Council Bluffs, on the express understanding that it would facilitate their migration to California. But when the Mormons reached Salt Lake, in 1846, they learned that they had been forestalled by the United States forces in California, and they then determined to settle down where they were. Therefore, 
when this battalion of five companies of Mormons, raised by Allen, who died on the way, and was succeeded by Cook, was discharged at Los Angeles, California, in the early summer of 1847, most of the men went to their people at Salt Lake. With all the money received, as pay from the United States, invested in cattle and breeding horses. One company re-enlisted for another year, and the remainder sought work in the country. As soon as the fame of the gold discovery spread through California, the Mormons naturally turned to Mormon Island, so that in July, 1848, we found about 300 of them there at work. Sam Brannan was on hand as the high priest, collecting the tithes. Clark, of Clark's Point, an early pioneer, was there also, and nearly all the Mormons who had come out in the Brooklyn, or who had stayed in California after the discharge of their battalion, had collected there. I recall the scene as perfectly today as though it were yesterday. In the midst of a broken country, all parched and dried by the hot sun of July, sparsely wooded with live oaks and straggling pines, lay the valley of the American River, with its bold mountain stream coming out of the snowy mountains to the east. In this valley is a fiat, or gravel bed, which in high water is an island, or is overflown, but at the time of our visit was simply a level gravel bed of the river. On its edges men were digging, and filling buckets with the finer earth and gravel, which was carried to a machine made like a baby's cradle, open at the foot, and at the head a plate of sheet iron or zinc, punctured full of holes. On this metallic plate was emptied the earth, and water was then poured on it from buckets, while one man shook the cradle with violent rocking by a handle. On the bottom were nailed cleats of wood. With this rude machine four men could earn from forty to one hundred dollars a day, averaging sixteen dollars, or a gold ounce, per man per day. While the sun blazed down on the heads of the miners with tropical heat, the water was bitter cold, and all hands were either standing in the water or had their clothes wet all the time, yet there were no complaints of rheumatism or cold. We made our camp on a small knoll, a little below the island, and from it could overlook the busy scene. A few bush huts nearby served as stores, boarding houses, and for sleeping. But all hands slept on the ground, with pine leaves and blankets for bedding. As soon as the news spread that the governor was there, persons came to see us, and volunteered all kinds of information, illustrating it by samples of the gold, which was of a uniform kind, scale gold, bright and beautiful. A large variety, of every conceivable shape and form, was found in the smaller gulches roundabout, but the gold in the river bed was uniformly scale gold. I remember that Mr. Clark was in camp, talking to Colonel Mason about matters and things generally, when he inquired, Governor, what business has Sam Brannan to collect the tithes here? Clark admitted that Brannan was the head of the Mormon Church in California, and he was simply questioning as to Brannan's right, as high priest, to compel the Mormons to pay him the regular tithes. Colonel Mason answered, Brannan has a perfect right to collect the tax, if you Mormons are fools enough to pay it. Then, said Clark, I for one won't pay it any longer. Colonel Mason added, This is public land, and the gold is the property of the United States, all of you here are trespassers, but, as the government is benefited by your getting out the gold, I do not intend to interfere. I understood, afterward, that from that time the payment of the tithe ceased, but Brannan had already collected enough money wherewith to hire Sutter's Hospital, and to open a store there in which he made more money than any merchant in California, during that summer and fall. The understanding was, that the money collected by him as tithes was the foundation of his fortune, which is still very large in San Francisco. That evening we all mingled freely with the miners, and witnessed the process of cleaning up and panning out, which is the last process for separating the pure gold from the fine dirt and black sand. The next day we continued our journey up the valley of the American Fork, stopping at various camps, where mining was in progress, and about noon we reached Coloma, the place where gold had been first discovered. The hills were higher, and the timber of better quality. The river was narrower and bolder, and but few miners were at work there, by reason of Marshall's and Sutter's claim to the site. There stood the sawmill unfinished, the dam and tail race just as they were left when the Mormons ceased work. Marshall and Wimmer's family of wife and half a dozen children were there, guarding their supposed treasure. Living in a house made of clapboards. 
Here also we were shown many specimens of gold, of a coarser grain than that found at Mormon Island. The next day we crossed the American River to its north side, and visited many small camps of men, in what were called the dry diggings. Little pools of water stood in the beds of the streams, and these were used to wash the dirt. And there the gold was in every conceivable shape and size, some of the specimens weighing several ounces. Some of these diggings were extremely rich, but as a whole they were more precarious in results than at the river. Sometimes a lucky fellow would hit on a pocket, and collect several thousand dollars in a few days, and then again he would be shifting about from place to place, prospecting, and spending all he had made. Little stores were being opened at every point, where flour, bacon, etc., were sold, everything being a dollar a pound, and a meal usually costing three dollars. Nobody paid for a bed, for he slept on the ground, without fear of cold or rain. We spent nearly a week in that region, and were quite bewildered by the fabulous tales of recent discoveries, which at the time were confined to the several forks of the American and Yuba rivers. All this time our horses had nothing to eat but the sparse grass in that region, and we were forced to work our way down toward the Sacramento Valley, or to see our animals perish. Still we contemplated a visit to the Yuba and Feather Rivers, from which we had heard of more wonderful diggings, but met a courier, who announced the arrival of a ship at Monterey, with dispatches of great importance from Mazatlan. We accordingly turned our horses back to Sutter's Fort. Crossing the Sacramento again by swimming our horses, and ferrying their loads in that solitary canoe, we took our back track as far as the Napa, and then turned to Benicia, on Carquinez Straits. We found there a solitary adobe house, occupied by Mr. Hastings and his family, embracing Dr. Semple, the proprietor of the ferry. This ferry was a ship's boat, with a latine sail, which could carry across at one time six or eight horses. It took us several days to cross over, and during that time we got well acquainted with the doctor, who was quite a character. He had come to California from Illinois, and was brother to Senator Semple. He was about seven feet high, and very intelligent. When we first reached Monterey, he had a printing press, which belonged to the United States, having been captured at the Custom House, and had been used to print Custom House blanks. With this dar. Semple, as editor, published The Californian, a small sheet of news, once a week, and it was a curiosity in its line, using two V's for a W, and other combinations of letters, made necessary by want of type. After some time he removed to Yerba Buena with his paper, and it grew up to be the Alta California of today. Foreseeing, as he thought, the growth of a great city somewhere on the Bay of San Francisco, he selected Carquinez Straits as its location, and obtained from General Vallejo a title to a league of land. On condition of building up a city thereon to bear the name of Vallejo's wife. This was Francisca Benicia, accordingly, the new city was named Francisca. At this time, the town near the mouth of the bay was known universally as Yerba Buena. But that name was not known abroad, although San Francisco was familiar to the whole civilized world. Now, some of the chief men of Yerba Buena, Folsom, Howard, Leidsdorf, and others, knowing the importance of a name, saw their danger, and, by some action of the Ayuntamiento, or town council, changed the name of Yerba Buena to San Francisco. Dar. Semple was outraged at their changing the name to one so like his of Francisca, and he in turn changed his town to the other name of Mrs. Vallejo, viz., Benicia, and Benicia it has remained to this day. I am convinced that this little circumstance was big with consequences. That Benicia has the best natural site for a commercial city, I am, satisfied. And had half the money and half the labor since bestowed upon San Francisco been expended at Benicia, we should have at this day a city of palaces on the Carquinez Straits. The name of San Francisco, however, fixed the city where it now is. For every ship in 1848-49, which cleared from any part of the world, knew the name of San Francisco, but not Yerba Buena or Benicia. And, accordingly, ships consigned to California came pouring in with their contents, and were anchored in front of Yerba Buena, the first town. Captains and crews deserted for the gold mines, and now half the city in front of Montgomery Street is built over the hulks thus abandoned. 
but Dr. Semple, at that time, was all there was of Benicia. He was captain and crew of his ferry boat, and managed to pass our party to the south side of Carquinez Straits in about two days. Thence we proceeded up Amador Valley to Alameda Creek, and so on to the old mission of San Jose. Thence to the Pueblo of San Jose, where Folsom and those belonging in Yerba Buena went in that direction, and we continued on to Monterey, our party all the way giving official sanction to the news from the gold mines. And adding new force to the fever. On reaching Monterey, we found dispatches from Commodore Shubrick, at Mazatlan, which gave almost positive assurance that the war with Mexico was over. That hostilities had ceased, and commissioners were arranging the terms of peace at Guadalupe Hidalgo. It was well that this news reached California at that critical time. For so contagious had become the gold fever that everybody was bound to go and try his fortune, and the volunteer regiment of Stevenson's would have deserted en masse. Had the men not been assured that they would very soon be entitled to an honorable discharge. Many of our regulars did desert, among them the very men who had escorted us faithfully to the mines and back. Our servants also left us, and nothing less than $300 a month would hire a man in California. Colonel Mason's black boy, Aaron, alone of all our then servants proving faithful. We were forced to resort to all manner of shifts to live. First, we had a mess with a black fellow we called Bustamente as cook, but he got the fever, and had to go. We next took a soldier, but he deserted, and carried off my double-barreled shotgun, which I prized very highly. To meet this condition of facts, Colonel Mason ordered that liberal furloughs should be given to the soldiers, and promises to all in turn, and he allowed all the officers to draw their rations in kind. As the actual valve of the ration was very large, this enabled us to live. Halleck, Murray, Ord, and I, boarded with Dona Augustias, and turned in our rations as pay for our board. Sometime in September, 1848, the official news of the Treaty of Peace reached us, and the Mexican War was over. This treaty was signed in May, and came to us all the way by land by a courier from Lower California, sent from La Paz by Lieutenant Colonel Burton. On its receipt, orders were at once made for the muster out of all of Stevenson's regiment, and our military forces were thus reduced to the single company of dragoons at Los Angeles, and the one company of artillery at Monterey. Nearly all business had ceased, except that connected with gold. And, during that fall, Colonel Mason, Captain Warner, and I, made another trip up to Sutter's Fort, going also to the newly discovered mines on the Stanislaus, called Sonora, named from the miners of Sonora, Mexico, who had first discovered them. We found there pretty much the same state of facts as before existed at Mormon Island and Coloma, and we daily received intelligence of the opening of still other mines north and south. But I have passed over a very interesting fact. As soon as we had returned from our first visit to the gold mines, it became important to send home positive knowledge of this valuable discovery. The means of communication with the United States were very precarious, and I suggested to Colonel Mason that a special courier ought to be sent, that Second Lieutenant Lozer had been promoted to First Lieutenant, and was entitled to go home. He was accordingly detailed to carry the news. I prepared with great care the letter to the Adjutant General of August 17, 1848, which Colonel Mason modified in a few particulars. And, as it was important to send not only the specimens which had been presented to us along our route of travel, I advised the colonel to allow Captain Folsom to purchase and send to Washington a large sample of the commercial gold in general use. And to pay for the same out of the money in his hands known as the Civil Fund, arising from duties collected at the several ports in California. He consented to this, and Captain Folsom bought an oyster can full at ten dollars the ounce, which was the rate of value at which it was then received at the custom house. Folsom was instructed further to contract with some vessel to carry the messenger to South America, where he could take the English steamers as far east as Jamaica. With a conditional charter giving increased payment if the vessel could catch the October steamer. Folsom chartered the Barclaw Lambiecana, owned and navigated by Henry D. Cook, who has since been the governor of the District of Columbia. In due time this vessel reached Monterey, and Lieutenant Lozer, with his report and specimens of gold, embarked and sailed. 
he reached the South American continent at Peta, Peru, in time. Took the English steamer of October to Panama, and thence went on to Kingston, Jamaica, where he found a sailing vessel bound for New Orleans. On reaching New Orleans, he telegraphed to the War Department his arrival. But so many delays had occurred that he did not reach Washington in time to have the matter embraced in the President's regular message of 1848, as we had calculated. Still, the President made it the subject of a special message, and thus became, official, what had before only reached the world in a very indefinite shape. Then began that wonderful development, and the great emigration to California, by land and by sea, of 1849 and 1850. As before narrated, Mason, Warner, and I, made a second visit to the mines in September and October, 1848. As the winter season approached, Colonel Mason returned to Monterey, and I remained for a time at Sutter's Fort. In order to share somewhat in the riches of the land, we formed a partnership in a store at Coloma, in charge of Norman S. Bester, who had been Warner's clerk. We supplied the necessary money, $1,500, $500 each, and Bester carried on the store at Coloma for his share. Out of this investment, each of us realized a profit of about $1,500. Warner also got a regular leave of absence, and contracted with Captain Sutter for surveying and locating the town of Sacramento. He received for this $16 per day for his services as surveyor, and Sutter paid all the hands engaged in the work. The town was laid off mostly up about the fort, but a few streets were staked off along the river bank, and one or two leading to it. Captain Sutter always contended, however, that no town could possibly exist on the immediate bank of the river, because the spring freshets rose over the bank, and frequently it was necessary to swim a horse to reach the boat landing. Nevertheless, from the very beginning the town began to be built on the very river bank, viz., 1st, 2nd, and 3rd streets, with J and K streets leading back. Among the principal merchants and traders of that winter, at Sacramento, were Sam Brannan and Hensley, Reading and Company. For several years the site was annually flooded. But the people have persevered in building the levees, and afterward in raising all the streets, so that Sacramento is now a fine city, the capital of the state, and stands where, in 1848, was nothing but a dense mass of bushes, vines, and submerged land. The old fort has disappeared altogether. During the fall of 1848, Warner, Ord, and I, camped on the bank of the American River, abreast of the fort, at what was known as the Old Tan Yard. I was cook, Ord cleaned up the dishes, and Warner looked after the horses. But Ord was deposed as scullion because he would only wipe the tin plates with a tuft of grass, according to the custom of the country, whereas Warner insisted on having them washed after each meal with hot water. Warner was in consequence promoted to scullion, and Ord became the hostler. We drew our rations in kind from the commissary at San Francisco, who sent them up to us by a boat. And we were thus enabled to dispense a generous hospitality to many a poor devil who otherwise would have had nothing to eat. The winter of 1848-49 was a period of intense activity throughout California. The rainy season was unfavorable to the operations of gold mining, and was very hard upon the thousands of houseless men and women who dwelt in the mountains, and even in the towns. Most of the natives and old inhabitants had returned to their ranches and houses, yet there were not roofs enough in the country to shelter the thousands who had arrived by sea and by land. The news had gone forth to the whole civilized world that gold in fabulous quantities was to be had for the mere digging, and adventurers came pouring in blindly to seek their fortunes, without a thought of house or food. Yerba Buena had been converted into San Francisco. Sacramento City had been laid out, Lots were being rapidly sold, and the town was being built up as an entrepot to the mines. Stockton also had been chosen as a convenient point for trading with the lower or southern mines. Captain Sutter was the sole proprietor of the former, and Captain Charles Weber was the owner of the site of Stockton, which was as yet known as French Camp. 3. Early Recollections of California, Continued. 1849-1850 the department headquarters still remained at Monterey, but, with the few soldiers, we had next to nothing to do. 
In midwinter we heard of the approach of a battalion of the 2nd Dragoons, under Major Lawrence Pike Graham, with Captains Rucker, Coutts, Campbell, and others, along. So exhausted were they by their long march from Upper Mexico that we had to send relief to meet them as they approached. When this command reached Los Angeles, it was left there as the garrison, and Captain A. J. Smith's company of the 1st Dragoons was brought up to San Francisco. We were also advised that the 2nd Infantry, Colonel B. Riley, would be sent out around Cape Horn in sailing ships. That the mounted rifles, under Lt. Colonel Loring, would march overland to Oregon, and that Brigadier General Persifer F. Smith would come out in chief command on the Pacific coast. It was also known that a contract had been entered into with parties in New York and New Orleans for a monthly line of steamers from those cities to California, via Panama. Lt. Col. Burton had come up from Lower California, and, as captain of the 3rd Artillery, he was assigned to command Company F, 3rd Artillery, at Monterey. Captain Warner remained at Sacramento, surveying. And Halleck, Murray, Ord, and I, boarded with Dona Augustias. The season was unusually rainy and severe, but we passed the time with the usual round of dances and parties. The time fixed for the arrival of the mail steamer was understood to be about January 1, 1849, but the day came and went without any tidings of her. Orders were given to Captain Burton to announce her arrival by firing a national salute, and each morning we listened for the guns from the fort. The month of January passed, and the greater part of February, too. As was usual, the army officers celebrated the 22d of February with a grand ball, given in the new stone schoolhouse, which I'll call they Walter Colton had built. It was the largest and best hall then in California. The ball was really a handsome affair, and we kept it up nearly all night. The next morning we were at breakfast, present, Dona Augustias, and Manuelita, Halleck, Murray, and myself. We were dull and stupid enough until a gun from the fort aroused us, then another and another. The steamer, exclaimed all, and, without waiting for hats or anything, off we dashed. I reached the wharf hatless, but the dona sent my cap after me by a servant. The white puffs of smoke hung around the fort, mingled with the dense fog, which hid all the water of the bay, and well out to sea could be seen the black spars of some unknown vessel. At the wharf I found a group of soldiers and a small rowboat, which belonged to a brig at anchor in the bay. Hastily ordering a couple of willing soldiers to get in and take the oars, and Mr. Larkin and Mr. Hartnell asking to go along, we jumped in and pushed off. Steering our boat toward the spars, which loomed up above the fog clear and distinct, in about a mile we came to the black hull of the strange monster, the long-expected and most welcome steamer California. Her wheels were barely moving, for her pilot could not see the shoreline distinctly, though the hills and point of pines could be clearly made out over the fog, and occasionally a glimpse of some white walls showed where the town lay. A Jacob's Ladder was lowered for us from the steamer, and in a minute I scrambled up on deck, followed by Larkin and Hartnell, and we found ourselves in the midst of many old friends. There was Canby, the adjutant general, who was to take my place, Charlie Hoyt, my cousin, General Persifer F. Smith and wife, Gibbs, his aide-de-camp, Major Ogden, of the engineers, and wife. And, indeed, many old Californians, among them Alfred Robinson, and Frank Ward with his pretty bride. By the time the ship was fairly at anchor we had answered a million of questions about gold and the state of the country. And, learning that the ship was out of fuel, had informed the captain, Marshall, that there was abundance of pine wood, but no willing hands to cut it. That no man could be hired at less than an ounce of gold a day, unless the soldiers would volunteer to do it for some agreed-upon price. As for coal, there was not a pound in Monterey, or anywhere else in California. Vessels with coal were known to be en route around Cape Horn, but none had yet reached California. The arrival of this steamer was the beginning of a new epoch on the Pacific coast, yet there she lay, helpless, without coal or fuel. The native Californians, who had never seen a steamship, stood for days on the beach looking at her, with the universal exclamation, Tan Fio. How ugly! And she was truly ugly when compared with the clean, 
well-sparred frigates, and sloops of war that had hitherto been seen on the North Pacific coast. It was first supposed it would take ten days to get wood enough to prosecute her voyage, and therefore all the passengers who could took up their quarters on shore. Major Canby relieved me, and took the place I had held so long as Adjutant General of the Department of California. The time seemed most opportune for me to leave the service, as I had several splendid offers of employment and of partnership, and, accordingly, I made my written resignation. But General Smith put his veto upon it, saying that he was to command the Division of the Pacific, while General Riley was to have the Department of California, and Colonel Loring that of Oregon. He wanted me as his adjutant general, because of my familiarity with the country, and knowledge of its then condition, at the time, he had on his staff Gibbs as aide de camp and Fitzgerald as quartermaster. He also had along with him quite a retinue of servants, hired with a clear contract to serve him for a whole year after reaching California, every one of whom deserted, except a young black fellow named Isaac. Mrs. Smith, a pleasant but delicate Louisiana lady, had a white maid servant, in whose fidelity she had unbounded confidence, but this girl was married to a perfect stranger, and off before she had even landed in San Francisco. It was, therefore, finally arranged that, on the California, I was to accompany General Smith to San Francisco as his adjutant general. I accordingly sold some of my horses, and arranged for others to go up by land. And from that time I became fairly enlisted in the military family of General Persifer F. Smith. I parted with my old commander, Colonel Mason, with sincere regret. To me he had ever been kind and considerate, and, while stern, honest to a fault, he was the very embodiment of the principle of fidelity to the interests of the general government. He possessed a native strong intellect, and far more knowledge of the principles of civil government and law than he got credit for. In private and public expenditures he was extremely economical, but not penurious. In cases where the officers had to contribute money for parties and entertainments, he always gave a double share, because of his allowance of double rations. During our frequent journeys, I was always caterer, and paid all the bills. In settling with him he required a written statement of the items of account, but never disputed one of them. During our time, California was, as now, full of a bold, enterprising, and speculative set of men, who were engaged in every sort of game to make money. I know that Colonel Mason was beset by them to use his position to make a fortune for himself and his friends. But he never bought land or town lots, because, he said, it was his place to hold the public estate for the government as free and unencumbered by claims as possible. And when I wanted him to stop the public land sales in San Francisco, San Jose, etc., he would not. For, although he did not believe the titles given by the alcaldes worth a cent, yet they aided to settle the towns and public lands, and he thought, on the whole, the government would be benefited thereby. The same thing occurred as to the gold mines. He never took a title to a town lot, unless it was one, of no real value, from Alcalde Colton, in Monterey, of which I have never heard since. He did take a share in the store which Warner, Beater, and I, opened at Coloma, paid his share of the capital, $500, and received his share of the profits, $1,500. I think also he took a share in a venture to China with Larkin and others, but, on leaving California, he was glad to sell out without profit or loss. In the stern discharge of his duty he made some bitter enemies, among them Henry M. Nagley, who, in the newspapers of the day, endeavored to damage his fair name. But, knowing him intimately, I am certain that he is entitled to all praise for having so controlled the affairs of the country that, when his successor arrived, all things were so disposed that a civil form of government was an easy matter of adjustment. Colonel Mason was relieved by General Riley sometime in April, and left California in the steamer of the May 1st for Washington and St. Louis, where he died of cholera in the summer of 1850, and his body is buried in Bell Fountain Cemetery. His widow afterward married Major, since General, Don Carlos Buell, and is now living in Kentucky. In overhauling the hold of the steamer California, as she lay at anchor in Monterey Bay, a considerable amount of coal was found under some heavy duplicate machinery. With this, and such wood as had been gathered, 
she was able to renew her voyage. The usual signal was made, and we all went on board. About the 1st of March we entered the heads, and anchored off San Francisco, near the United States line of battleship Ohio, Commodore T. Catesby Jones. As was the universal custom of the day, the crew of the California deserted her, and she lay for months unable to make a trip back to Panama, as was expected of her. As soon as we reached San Francisco, the first thing was to secure an office and a house to live in. The weather was rainy and stormy, and snow even lay on the hills back of the mission. Captain Folsom, the quartermaster, agreed to surrender for our office the old adobe custom house, on the upper corner of the plaza, as soon as he could remove his papers and effects down to one of his warehouses on the beach. And he also rented for us as quarters the old Hudson Bay Company house on Montgomery Street, which had been used by Howard and Melua as a store, and at that very time they were moving their goods into a larger brick building just completed for them. As these changes would take some time, General Smith and Colonel Ogden, with their wives, accepted the hospitality offered by Commodore Jones on board the Ohio. I opened the office at the Custom House, and Gibbs, Fitzgerald, and some others of us, slept in the loft of the Hudson Bay Company House until the lower part was cleared of Howard's store, after which General Smith and the ladies moved in. There we had a general mess, and the efforts at housekeeping were simply ludicrous. One servant after another, whom General Smith had brought from New Orleans, with a solemn promise to stand by him for one whole year, deserted without a word of notice or explanation, and in a few days none remained but little Isaac. The ladies had no maid or attendants, and the general, commanding all the mighty forces of the United States on the Pacific coast, had to scratch to get one good meal a day for his family. He was a gentleman of fine social qualities, genial and gentle, and joked at everything. Poor Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Ogden did not bear it so philosophically. Gibbs, Fitzgerald, and I, could cruise around and find a meal, which cost three dollars, at some of the many restaurants which had sprung up out of redwood boards and cotton lining. But the general and ladies could not go out, for ladies were rara avies at that day in California. Isaac was cook, chambermaid, and everything, thoughtless of himself, and struggling, out of the slimmest means, to compound a breakfast for a large and hungry family. Breakfast would be announced any time between ten and twelve, and dinner according to circumstances. Many a time have I seen General Smith, with a can of preserved meat in his hands, going toward the house, take off his hat on meeting a negro, and, on being asked the reason of his politeness. He would answer that they were the only real gentlemen in California. I confess that the fidelity of Colonel Mason's boy, Aaron, and of General Smith's boy, Isaac, at a time when every white man laughed at promises as something made to be broken, has given me a kindly feeling of respect for the Negroes. And makes me hope that they will find an honorable status in the jumble of affairs in which we now live. That was a dull hard winter in San Francisco, the rains were heavy, and the mud fearful. I have seen mules stumble in the street, and drown in the liquid mud. Montgomery Street had been filled up with brush and clay, and I always dreaded to ride on horseback along it, because the mud was so deep that a horse's legs would become entangled in the bushes below. And the rider was likely to be thrown and drowned in the mud. The only sidewalks were made of stepping stones of empty boxes, and here and there a few planks with barrel staves nailed on. All the town lay along Montgomery Street, from Sacramento to Jackson, and about the plaza. Gambling was the chief occupation of the people. While they were waiting for the cessation of the rainy season, and for the beginning of spring, all sorts of houses were being put up, but of the most flimsy kind, and all were stores, restaurants, or gambling, saloons. Any room twenty by sixty feet would rent for a thousand dollars a month. I had, as my pay, seventy dollars a month, and no one would even try to hire a servant under three hundred dollars. Had it not been for the fifteen hundred dollars I had made in the store at Coloma, I could not have lived through the winter. About the first of April arrived the steamer Oregon. But her captain, Pearson, knew what was the state of affairs on shore, and ran his steamer alongside the line of battleship Ohio at Sausalito. And obtained the privilege of leaving his crew on board as prisoners until he was ready to return to sea. 
Then, discharging his passengers and getting coal out of some of the ships which had arrived, he retook his crew out of limbo and carried the first regular mail back to Panama early in April. In regular order arrived the third steamer, the Panama. And, as the vessels were arriving with coal, the California was enabled to hire a crew and get off. From that time forward these three ships constituted the regular line of mail steamers, which has been kept up ever since. By the steamer Oregon arrived out Major R. P. Hammond, J. M. Williams, James Blair, and others, also the gentlemen who, with Major Ogden, were to compose a joint commission to select the sites for the permanent forts and navy yard of California. This commission was composed of Majors Ogden, Smith, and Ledbetter, of, the Army, and Captains Goldsboro, Van Brunt, and Blunt, of the Navy. These officers, after a most careful study of the whole subject, selected Mare Island for the Navy Yard, and Benicia for the storehouses and arsenals of the Army. The Pacific Mail Steamship Company also selected Benicia as their depot. Thus was again revived the old struggle for supremacy of these two points as the site of the future city of the Pacific. Meantime, however, San Francisco had secured the name. About 600 ships were anchored there without crews, and could not get away, and there the city was, and had to be. Nevertheless, General Smith, being disinterested and unprejudiced, decided on Benicia as the point where the city ought to be, and where the army headquarters should be. By the Oregon there arrived at San Francisco a man who deserves mention here, Baron Steinberger. He had been a great cattle dealer in the United States, and boasted that he had helped to break the United States Bank, by being indebted to it $5 million. At all events, he was a splendid-looking fellow, and brought with him from Washington a letter to General Smith and another for Commodore Jones, to the effect that he was a man of enlarged experience in beef. That the authorities in Washington knew that there existed in California large herds of cattle, which were only valuable for their hides and tallow. That it was of great importance to the government that this beef should be cured and salted so as to be of use to the army and navy, obviating the necessity of shipping salt beef around Cape Horn. I know he had such a letter from the Secretary of War, Marcy, to General Smith, for it passed into my custody, and I happened to be in Commodore Jones's cabin when the Baron presented the one for him from the Secretary of the Navy. The Baron was anxious to pitch in at once, and said that all he needed to start with were salt and barrels. After some inquiries of his purser, the Commodore promised to let him have the barrels with their salt, as fast as they were emptied by the crew. Then the Baron explained that he could get a nice lot of cattle from Don Timoteo Murphy, at the mission of San Rafael, on the north aid of the bay, but he could not get a boat and crew to handle them. Under the authority from the Secretary of the Navy, the Commodore then promised him the use of a boat and crew, until he, the Baron, could find and purchase a suitable one for himself. Then the Baron opened the first regular butcher shop in San Francisco, on the wharf about the foot of Broadway or Pacific Street, where we could buy at 25 or 50 cents a pound the best roasts, steaks, and cuts of beef. Which had cost him nothing, for he never paid anybody if he could help it, and he soon cleaned poor Don Timoteo out. At first, every boat of his, in coming down from the San Rafael, touched at the Ohio, and left the best beefsteaks and roasts for the Commodore, but soon the Baron had enough money to dispense with the borrowed boat, and set up for himself. And from this small beginning, step by step, he rose in a few months to be one of the richest and most influential men in San Francisco. But in his wild speculations he was at last caught, and became helplessly bankrupt. He followed General Fremont to St. Louis in 1861, where I saw him, but soon afterward he died a pauper in one of the hospitals. When General Smith had his headquarters in San Francisco, in the spring of 1849, Steinberger gave dinners worthy any baron of old. And when, in after years, I was a banker there, he used to borrow of me small sums of money in repayment for my share of these feasts. And somewhere among my old packages I hold one of his confidential notes for two hundred dollars, but on the whole I got off easily. I have no doubt that, if this man's history could be written out, it would present phases as wonderful as any of romance, but in my judgment he was a dangerous man, without any true sense of honor or honesty. 
Little by little the rains of that season grew less and less, and the hills once more became green and covered with flowers. It became perfectly evident that no family could live in San Francisco on such a salary as Uncle Sam allowed his most favored officials. So General Smith and Major Ogden concluded to send their families back to the United States, and afterward we menfolks could take to camp and live on our rations. The second infantry had arrived, and had been distributed, for companies to Monterey, and the rest somewhat as Stevenson's regiment had been. A. J. Smith's company of dragoons was sent up to Sonoma, whither General Smith had resolved to move our headquarters. On the steamer which sailed about May 1st, I think the California, we embarked, the ladies for home and we for Monterey. At Monterey we went on shore, and Colonel Mason, who meantime had been relieved by General Riley, went on board, and the steamer departed for Panama. Of all that party I alone am alive. General Riley had, with his family, taken the house which Colonel Mason had formerly used, and Major Canby and wife had secured rooms at Alvarado's. Captain Bain was quartermaster, and had his family in the house of a man named Garner, near the redoubt. Burton and Company F were still at the fort. The four companies of the 2nd Infantry were quartered in the barracks, the same building in which we had had our headquarters, and the company officers were quartered in hired buildings nearby. General Smith and his aide, Captain Gibbs, went to Larkin's house, and I was at my old rooms at Dona Augustia's. As we intended to go back to San Francisco by land and afterward to travel a good deal, General Smith gave me the necessary authority to fit out the party. There happened to be several trains of horses and mules in town, so I purchased about a dozen horses and mules at $200 a head, on account of the quartermaster's department. And we had them kept under guard in the quartermaster's corral. I remember one night being in the quarters of Lt. Alfred Sully, where nearly all the officers of the garrison were assembled, listening to Sully's stories. Lt. Derby, Squibub, was one of the number, as also Fred Steele, Neighbor, Jones, and others, when, just after, Tattoo, the orderly sergeants came to report the result of, Tattoo, roll call. One reported five men absent, another eight, and so on, until it became certain that twenty-eight men had deserted and they were so bold and open in their behavior that it amounted to defiance. They had deliberately slung their knapsacks and started for the gold mines. Dar. Murray and I were the only ones present who were familiar with the country, and I explained how easy they could all be taken by a party going out at once to Salinas Plain. Where the country was so open and level that a rabbit could not cross without being seen. That the deserters could not go to the mines without crossing that plain, and could not reach it before daylight. All agreed that the whole regiment would desert if these men were not brought back. Several officers volunteered on the spot to go after them, and, as the soldiers could not be trusted, it was useless to send any but officers in pursuit. Someone went to report the affair to the adjutant general, Canby, and he to General Riley. I waited some time, and, as the thing grew cold, I thought it was given up, and went to my room and to bed. About midnight I was called up and informed that there were seven officers willing to go, but the difficulty was to get horses and saddles. I went down to Larkin's house and got General Smith to consent that we might take the horses I had bought for our trip. It was nearly three o'clock a.m. before we were all mounted and ready. I had a musket which I used for hunting. With this I led off at a canter, followed by the others. About six miles out, by the faint moon, I saw ahead of us in the sandy road some blue coats, and, fearing lest they might resist or escape into the dense bushes which lined the road, I halted and found with me Paymaster Hill, Captain N. H. Davis, and Lieutenant John Hamilton. We waited some time for the others, viz. Canby, Murray, Gibbs, and Sully, to come up, but as they were not in sight we made a dash up the road and captured six of the deserters, who were Germans, with heavy knapsacks on, trudging along the deep, sandy road. They had not expected pursuit, had not heard our horses, and were accordingly easily taken. Finding myself the senior officer present, I ordered Lieutenant Hamilton to search the men and then to march them back to Monterey, suspecting, as was the fact, that the rest of our party had taken a road that branched off a couple of miles back. 
Daylight broke as we reached the Saunas River, 12 miles out, and there the trail was broad and fresh leading directly out on the Saunas Plain. This plain is about 5 miles wide, and then the ground becomes somewhat broken. The trail continued very plain, and I rode on at a gallop to where there was an old adobe ranch on the left of the road, with the head of a lagoon, or pond, close by. I saw one or two of the soldiers getting water at the pond, and others up near the house. I had the best horse and was considerably ahead, but on looking back could see Hill and Davis coming up behind at a gallop. I motioned to them to hurry forward, and turned my horse across the head of the pond, knowing the ground well, as it was a favorite place for shooting geese and ducks. Approaching the house, I ordered the men who were outside to go in. They did not know me personally, and exchanged glances, but I had my musket cocked, and, as the two had seen Davis and Hill coming up pretty fast, they obeyed. Dismounting, I found the house full of deserters, and there was no escape for them. They naturally supposed that I had a strong party with me, and when I ordered them to fall in, they obeyed from habit. By the time Hill and Davis came up I had them formed in two ranks, the front rank facing about, and I was taking away their bayonets, pistols, etc. We disarmed them, destroying a musket and several pistols, and, on counting them, we found that we three had taken eighteen, which, added to the six first captured, made twenty-four. We made them sling their knapsacks and begin their homeward march. It was near night when we got back, so that these deserters had traveled nearly forty miles since Tattoo of the night before. The other party had captured three, so that only one man had escaped. I doubt not this prevented the desertion of the bulk of the second infantry that spring, for at that time so demoralizing was the effect of the gold mines that everybody not in the military service justified desertion, because a soldier, if free, could earn more money in a day than he received per month. Not only did soldiers and sailors desert, but captains and masters of ships actually abandoned their vessels and cargoes to try their luck at the mines. Preachers and professors forgot their creeds and took to trade, and even to keeping gambling houses. I remember that one of our regular soldiers, named Reese, in deserting stole a favorite double-barreled gun of mine, and when the orderly sergeant of the company, Carson, was going on furlough. I asked him when he came across Reese to try and get my gun back. When he returned he told me that he had found Reese and offered him a hundred dollars for my gun, but Reese sent me word that he liked the gun, and would not take a hundred dollars for it. Soldiers or sailors who could reach the mines were universally shielded by the miners, so that it was next to useless to attempt their recapture. In due season General Persifer Smith, Gibbs, and I, with some hired packers, started back for San Francisco, and soon after we transferred our headquarters to Sonoma. About this time Major Joseph Hooker arrived from the east, the regular adjutant general of the division, relieved me, and I became thereafter one of General Smith's regular aides de camp. As there was very little to do, General Smith encouraged us to go into any business that would enable us to make money. R. P. Hammond, James Blair, and I, made a contract to survey for Colonel J. D. Stevenson his newly projected city of New York of the Pacific, situated at the month of the San Joaquin River. The contract embraced, also, the making of soundings and the marking out of a channel through Sassoon Bay. We hired, in San Francisco, a small metallic boat, with a sail, laid in some stores, and proceeded to the United States ship Ohio, anchored at Sausalito, where we borrowed a sailor boy and lead lines with which to sound the channel. We sailed up to Benicia, and, at General Smith's request, we surveyed and marked the line dividing the city of Benicia from the government reserve. We then sounded the bay back and forth, and staked out the best channel up Sassoon Bay, from which Blair made out sailing directions. We then made the preliminary surveys of the city of New York of the Pacific, all of which were duly plotted. And for this work we each received from Stevenson $500 and 10 or 15 lots. I sold enough lots to make up another $500, and let the balance go, for the city of New York of the Pacific never came to anything. Indeed, cities at the time were being projected by speculators all round the bay and all over the country. While we were surveying at New York of the Pacific, occurred one of those little events that showed the force of the gold fever. 
We had a sailor boy with us, about seventeen years old, who cooked our meals and helped work the boat. On shore, we had the sail spread so as to shelter us against the wind and dew. One morning I awoke about daylight, and looked out to see if our sailor boy was at work getting breakfast, but he was not at the fire at all. Getting up, I discovered that he had converted a tule bolsa into a sail boat, and was sailing for the gold mines. He was astride this bolsa, with a small parcel of bread and meat done up in a piece of cloth. Another piece of cloth, such as we used for making our signal stations, he had fixed into a sail. And with a paddle he was directing his precarious craft right out into the broad bay, to follow the general direction of the schooners and boats that he knew were ascending the Sacramento River. He was about a hundred yards from the shore. I jerked up my gun, and hailed him to come back. After a moment's hesitation, he let go his sheet and began to paddle back. This bolsa was nothing but a bundle of tule, or bulrush, bound together with grass ropes in the shape of a cigar, about ten feet long and about two feet through the butt. With these the California-Indiana cross streams of considerable size. When he came ashore, I gave him a good overhauling for attempting to desert, and put him to work getting breakfast. In due time we returned him to his ship, the Ohio. Subsequently, I made a bargain with Mr. Hartnell to survey his ranch at Cosney's River, Sacramento Valley. Ord and a young citizen, named Seton, were associated with me in this. I bought of Rodman M. Price a surveyor's compass, chain, etc. And, in San Francisco, a small wagon and harness. Availing ourselves of a schooner, chartered to carry Major Miller and two companies of the 2nd Infantry from San Francisco to Stockton, we got up to our destination at little cost. I recall an occurrence that happened when the schooner was anchored in Carquinez Straits, opposite the soldiers' camp on shore. We were waiting for daylight and a fair wind. The schooner lay anchored at an ebb tide, and about daylight oared and I had gone ashore for something. Just as we were pulling off from shore, we heard the loud shouts of the men, and saw them all running down toward the water. Our attention thus drawn, we saw something swimming in the water, and pulled toward it, thinking it a coyote, but we soon recognized a large grizzly bear, swimming directly across the channel. Not having any weapon, we hurriedly pulled for the schooner, calling out, as we neared it, a bear. A bear. It so happened that Major Miller was on deck, washing his face and hands. He ran rapidly to the bow of the vessel, took the musket from the hands of the sentinel, and fired at the bear, as he passed but a short distance ahead of the schooner. The bear rose, made a growl or howl, but continued his course. As we scrambled up the port aid to get our guns, the mate, with a crew, happened to have a boat on the starboard aid, and, armed only with a hatchet, they pulled up alongside the bear, and the mate struck him in the head with the hatchet. The bear turned, tried to get into the boat, but the mate struck his claws with repeated blows, and made him let go. After several passes with him, the mate actually killed the bear, got a rope round him, and towed him alongside the schooner, where he was hoisted on deck. The carcass weighed over six hundred pounds. It was found that Major Miller's shot had struck the bear in the lower jaw, and thus disabled him. Had it not been for this, the bear would certainly have upset the boat and drowned all in it. As it was, however, his meat served us a good turn in our trip up to Stockton. At Stockton we disembarked our wagon, provisions, and instruments. There I bought two fine mules at three hundred dollars each, and we hitched up and started for the Combs River. About twelve miles off was the Mokalumni, a wide, bold stream, with a canoe as a ferryboat. We took our wagon to pieces, and ferried it and its contents across, and then drove our mules into the water. In crossing, one mule became entangled in the rope of the other, and for a time we thought he was a gone mule. But at last he revived and we hitched up. The mules were both pack animals, neither had ever before seen a wagon. Young Seton also was about as green, and had never handled a mule. We put on the harness, and began to hitch them in, when one of the mules turned his head, saw the wagon, and started. We held on tight, but the beast did not stop until he had shivered the tongue pole into a dozen fragments. 
The fact was, that Seaton had hitched the traces before he had put on the blind bridle. There was considerable swearing done, but that would not mend the pole. There was no place nearer than Sutter's Fort to repair damages, so we were put to our wits' end. We first sent back a mile or so, and bought a raw hide. Gathering up the fragments of the pole and cutting the hide into strips, we finished it in the rudest manner. As long as the hide was green, the pole was very shaky. But gradually the sun dried the hide, tightened it, and the pole actually held for about a month. This cost us nearly a day of delay. But, when damages were repaired, we harnessed up again, and reached the crossing of the Kosumnis, where our survey was to begin. The expedient, or title papers, of the ranch described it as containing nine or eleven leagues on the Kosumnis, south side, and between the San Joaquin River and Sierra Nevada Mountains. We began at the place where the road crosses the Kosumnis, and laid down a line four miles south, perpendicular to the general direction of the stream. Then, surveying up the stream, we marked each mile so as to admit of a subdivision of one mile by four. The land was dry and very poor, with the exception of here and there some small pieces of bottom land, the great bulk of the bottom land occurring on the north side of the stream. We continued the survey up some twenty miles into the hills above the mill of Daler and Sheldon. It took about a month to make this survey, which, when finished, was duly plotted, and for it we received one-tenth of the land, or two subdivisions. Ord and I took the land, and we paid Seton for his labor in cash. By the sale of my share of the land, subsequently, I realized three thousand dollars. After finishing Hartnell's survey, we crossed over to Daler's, and did some work for him at five hundred dollars a day for the party. Having finished our work on the Kosumnis, we proceeded to Sacramento, where Captain Sutter employed us to connect the survey of Sacramento City, made by Lieutenant Warner, and that of Sutterville, three miles below. Which was then being surveyed by Lieutenant J. W. Davidson, of the 1st Dragoons. At Sutterville, the plateau of the Sacramento approached quite near the river, and it would have made a better site for a town than the low, submerged land where the city now stands. But it seems to be a law of growth that all natural advantages are disregarded wherever once business chooses a location. Old Sutter's Embarcadero became Sacramento City, simply because it was the first point used for unloading boats for Sutter's Fort. Just as the site for San Francisco was fixed by the use of Yerba Buena as the hide landing for the mission of San Francisco de Assis. I invested my earnings in this survey in three lots in Sacramento City, on which I made a fair profit by a sale to one McNulty, of Mansfield, Ohio. I only had a two months leave of absence, during which General Smith, his staff, and a retinue of civil friends, were making a tour of the gold mines, and hearing that he was en route back to his headquarters at Sonoma, I knocked off my work. Sold my instruments, and left my wagon and mules with my cousin Charlie Hoyt, who had a store in Sacramento, and was on the point of moving up to a ranch, for which he had bargained, on Bear Creek, on which was afterward established camp far west. He afterward sold the mules, wagon, etc., for me, and on the whole I think I cleared, by those two months' work, about six thousand dollars. I then returned to headquarters at Sonoma, in time to attend my fellow aide de camp Gibbs through a long and dangerous sickness, during which he was on board a store ship, guarded by Captain George Johnson, who now resides in San Francisco. General Smith had agreed that on the first good opportunity he would send me to the United States as a bearer of dispatches, but this he could not do until he had made the examination of Oregon, which was also in his command. During the summer of 1849 there continued to pour into California a perfect stream of people. Steamers came, and a line was established from San Francisco to Sacramento, of which the senator was the pioneer, charging $16 a passage, and actually coining money. Other boats were built out of materials which had either come around Cape Horn or were brought from the Sandwich Islands. Wharves were built, houses were springing up as if by magic, and the Bay of San Francisco presented as busy a scene of life as any part of the world. Major Allen, of the quartermaster's department, who had come out as chief quartermaster of the division, was building a large warehouse at Benicia, with a row of quarters, out of lumber at $100 per thousand feet. 
and the work was done by men at $16 a day. I have seen a detailed soldier, who got only his monthly pay of $8 a month, and 20 cents a day for extra duty, nailing on weatherboards and shingles, alongside a citizen who was paid $16 a day. This was a real injustice, made the soldiers discontented, and it was hardly to be wondered at that so many deserted. While the mass of people were busy at gold and in mammoth speculations, a set of busy politicians were at work to secure the prizes of civil government. Gwynne and Fremont were there, and T. Butler King, of Georgia, had come out from the East, scheming for office. He stayed with us at Sonoma, and was generally regarded as the government candidate for United States Senator. General Riley as governor, and Captain Halleck as Secretary of State, had issued a proclamation for the election of a convention to frame a state constitution. In due time the elections were held, and the convention was assembled at Monterey. Dar. Semple was elected president, and Gwynne, Sutter, Halleck, Butler King, Sherwood, Gilbert, Shannon, and others, were members. General Smith took no part in this convention, but sent me down to watch the proceedings, and report to him. The only subject of interest was the slavery question. There were no slaves then in California, save a few who had come out as servants, but the southern people at that time claimed their share of territory, out of that acquired by the common labors of all sections of the Union in the war with Mexico. Still, in California there was little feeling on the subject. I never heard General Smith, who was a Louisianian, express any opinion about it. Nor did Butler King, of Georgia, ever manifest any particular interest in the matter. A committee was named to draft a constitution, which in due time was reported, with the usual clause, then known as the Wilmot Proviso, excluding slavery. And during the debate which ensued very little opposition was made to this clause, which was finally adopted by a large majority, although the convention was made up in large part of men from our southern states. This matter of California being a free state, afterward, in the National Congress, gave rise to angry debates, which at one time threatened civil war. The result of the convention was the election of state officers, and of the legislature which sat in San Jose in October and November, 1849, and which elected Fremont and Gwynn as the first United States Senators in Congress from the Pacific Coast. Shortly after returning from Monterey, I was sent by General Smith up to Sacramento City to instruct Lieutenants Warner and Williamson, of the engineers, to push their surveys of the Sierra Nevada Mountains. For the purpose of ascertaining the possibility of passing that range by a railroad, a subject that then elicited universal interest. It was generally assumed that such a road could not be made along any of the immigrant roads then in use, and Warner's orders were to look farther north up the Feather River, or some one of its tributaries. Warner was engaged in this survey during the summer and fall of 1849, and had explored, to the very end of Goose Lake, the source of Feather River. Then, leaving Williamson with the baggage and part of the men, he took about ten men and a first-rate guide, crossed the summit to the east, and had turned south, having the range of mountains on his right hand. With the intention of regaining his camp by another pass in the mountain. The party was strung out, single file, with wide spaces between, Warner ahead. He had just crossed a small valley and ascended one of the spurs covered with sagebrush and rocks, when a band of Indians rose up and poured in a shower of arrows. The mule turned and ran back to the valley, where Warner fell off dead, punctured by five arrows. The mule also died. The guide, who was near to Warner, was mortally wounded, and one or two men had arrows in their bodies, but recovered. The party gathered about Warner's body, in sight of the Indians, who hooped and yelled, but did not venture away from their cover of rocks. This party of men remained there all day without burying the bodies, and at night, by a wide circuit, passed the mountain, and reached Williamson's camp. The news of Warner's death cast a gloom over all the old Californians, who knew him well. He was a careful, prudent, and honest officer, well qualified for his business, and extremely accurate in all his work. He and I had been intimately associated during our four years together in California, and I felt his loss deeply. The season was then too far advanced to attempt to avenge his death, 
and it was not until the next spring that a party was sent out to gather up and bury his scattered bones. As winter approached, the immigrants overland came pouring into California, dusty and worn with their 2,000 miles of weary travel across the plains and mountains. Those who arrived in October and November reported thousands still behind them, with oxen perishing, and short of food. Appeals were made for help, and General Smith resolved to attempt relief. Major Rucker, who had come across with Pike. Graham's battalion of dragoons, had exchanged with Major Fitzgerald, of the quartermaster's department, and was detailed to conduct this relief. General Smith ordered him to be supplied with $100,000 out of the civil fund, subject to his control, and with this to purchase at Sacramento flour, bacon, etc., and to hire men and mules to send out and meet the immigrants. Major Rucker fulfilled this duty perfectly, sending out pack trains loaded with food by the many routes by which the immigrants were known to be approaching, went out himself with one of these trains. And remained in the mountains until the last immigrant had got in. No doubt this expedition saved many a life which has since been most useful to the country. I remained at Sacramento a good part of the fall of 1849, recognizing among the immigrants many of my old personal friends, John C. Fall, William King, Sam Stambaugh, Hugh Ewing, Hampton Denman, etc. I got Rucker to give these last two employment along with the train for the relief of the immigrants. They had proposed to begin a ranch on my land on the Cosumnes, but afterward changed their minds, and went out with Rucker. While I was at Sacramento General Smith had gone on his contemplated trip to Oregon, and promised that he would be back in December, when he would send me home with dispatches. Accordingly, as the winter and rainy season was at hand, I went to San Francisco, and spent some time at the Presidio, waiting patiently for General Smith's return. About Christmas a vessel arrived from Oregon with the dispatches, and an order for me to deliver them in person to General Winfield Scott, in New York City. General Smith had sent them down, remaining in Oregon for a time. Of course I was all ready, and others of our set were going home by the same conveyance, viz., Rucker, Ord, A. J. Smith, some under orders, and the others on leave. Wanting to see my old friends in Monterey, I arranged for my passage in the steamer of January 1, 1850, paying $600 for passage to New York, and went down to Monterey by land, Rucker accompanying me. The weather was unusually rainy, and all the plain about Santa Clara was under water, but we reached Monterey in time. I again was welcomed by my friends, Dona Augustias, Manuelita, and the family, and it was resolved that I should take two of the boys home with me and put them at Georgetown College for education, viz. Antonio and Porfirio, thirteen and eleven years old. The Dona gave me a bag of gold dust to pay for their passage and to deposit at the college. On the 2D day of January punctually appeared the steamer Oregon. We were all soon on board and off for home. At that time the steamers touched at San Diego, Acapulco, and Panama. Our passage down the coast was unusually pleasant. Arrived at Panama, we hired mules and rode across to Gorgona, on the Cruces River, where we hired a boat and paddled down to the mouth of the river, off which lay the steamer Crescent City. It usually took four days to cross the isthmus, every passenger taking care of himself, and it was really funny to watch the efforts of women and men unaccustomed to mules. It was an old song to us, and the trip across was easy and interesting. In due time we were rowed off to the Crescent City, rolling back and forth in the swell, and we scrambled aboard by a Jacob's Ladder from the stern. Some of the women had to be hoisted aboard by lowering a tub from the end of a boom. Fun to us who looked on, but awkward enough to the poor women, especially to a very fat one, who attracted much notice. General Fremont, wife and child, Lily, were passengers with us down from San Francisco, but Mrs. Fremont not being well, they remained over one trip at Panama. Senator Gwynne was one of our passengers, and went through to New York. We reached New York about the close of January, after a safe and pleasant trip. Our party, composed of Ward, J. Smith, and Rucker, with the two boys, Antonio and Porfirio, put up at Delmonico's, on Bowling Green. And, as soon as we had cleaned up somewhat, I took a carriage, 
went to General Scott's office in 9th Street, delivered my dispatches, was ordered to dine with him next day, and then went forth to hunt up my old friends and relations, the Scots. Hoyts, etc. etc. On reaching New York, most of us had rough soldiers' clothing, but we soon got a new outfit, and I dined with General Scott's family, Mrs. Scott being present, and also their son in law and daughter, Colonel and Mrs. H. L. Scott. The general questioned me pretty closely in regard to things on the Pacific coast, especially the politics, and startled me with the assertion that our country was on the eve of a terrible civil war. He interested me by anecdotes of my old army comrades in his recent battles around the city of Mexico, and I felt deeply the fact that our country had passed through a foreign war, that my comrades had fought great battles. And yet I had not heard a hostile shot. Of course, I thought it the last and only chance in my day, and that my career as a soldier was at an end. After some four or five days spent in New York, I was, by an order of General Scott, sent to Washington, to lay before the Secretary of War, Crawford, of Georgia, the dispatches which I had brought from California. On reaching Washington, I found that Mr. Ewing was Secretary of the Interior, and I at once became a member of his family. The family occupied the house of Mr. Blair, on Pennsylvania Avenue, directly in front of the War Department. I immediately repaired to the War Department, and placed my dispatches in the hands of Mr. Crawford, who questioned me somewhat about California, but seemed little interested in the subject, except so far as it related to slavery and the routes through Texas. I then went to call on the President at the White House. I found Major Bliss, who had been my teacher in mathematics at West Point, and was then General Taylor's son-in-law and private secretary. He took me into the room, now used by the President's private secretaries, where President Taylor was. I had never seen him before, though I had served under him in Florida in 1840-41, and was most agreeably surprised at his fine personal appearance, and his pleasant, easy manners. He received me with great kindness, told me that Colonel Mason had mentioned my name with praise, and that he would be pleased to do me any act of favor. We were with him nearly an hour, talking about California generally, and of his personal friends, Percifer Smith, Riley, Canby, and others, although General Scott was generally regarded by the army as the most accomplished soldier of the Mexican War, yet General Taylor had that blunt, honest, and stern character, that endeared him to the masses of the people and made him president. Bliss, too, had gained a large fame by his marked skill and intelligence as an adjutant general and military adviser. His manner was very unmilitary, and in his talk he stammered and hesitated, so as to make an unfavorable impression on a stranger. But he was wonderfully accurate and skillful with his pen, and his orders and letters form a model of military precision and clearness. For Missouri, Louisiana, and California. 1850-1855. Having returned from California in January, 1850, with dispatches for the War Department, and having delivered them in person first to General Scott in New York City, and afterward to the Secretary of War, Crawford, in Washington City. I applied for and received a leave of absence for six months. I first visited my mother, then living at Mansfield, Ohio, and returned to Washington, where, on the first day of May, 1850, I was married to Miss Ellen Boyle Ewing, daughter of the Honorable Thomas Ewing, Secretary of the Interior. The marriage ceremony was attended by a large and distinguished company, embracing Daniel Webster, Henry Clay, T. H. Benton, President Taylor, and all his cabinet. This occurred at the house of Mr. Ewing, the same now owned and occupied by Mr. F. P. Blair, Sr., on Pennsylvania Avenue, opposite the War Department. We made a wedding tour to Baltimore, New York, Niagara, and Ohio, and returned to Washington by the 1st of July. General Taylor participated in the celebration of the 4th of July, a very hot day, by hearing a long speech from the Honorable Henry S. Foote at the base of the Washington Monument. Returning from the celebration much heated and fatigued, he partook too freely of his favorite iced milk with cherries, and during that night was seized with a severe colic which by morning had quite prostrated him. It was said that he sent for his son-in-law, Surgeon Wood, United States Army, stationed in Baltimore, and declined medical assistance from anybody else. 
Mr. Ewing visited him several times, and was manifestly uneasy and anxious, as was also his son-in-law, Major Bliss, then of the army, and his confidential secretary. He rapidly grew worse, and died in about four days. At that time there was a high state of political feeling pervading the country, on account of the questions growing out of the new territories just acquired from Mexico by the war. Congress was in session, and General Taylor's sudden death evidently created great alarm. I was present in the Senate gallery, and saw the oath of office administered to the Vice President, Mr. Fillmore, a man of splendid physical proportions and commanding appearance, but on the faces of senators and people could easily be read the feelings of doubt and uncertainty that prevailed. All knew that a change in the cabinet and general policy was likely to result, but at the time it was supposed that Mr. Fillmore, whose home was in Buffalo, would be less liberal than General Taylor to the politicians of the South, who feared, or pretended to fear, a crusade against slavery. Or, as was the political cry of the day, that slavery would be prohibited in the territories and in the places exclusively under the jurisdiction of the United States. Events, however, proved the contrary. I attended General Taylor's funeral as a sort of aide-de-camp, at the request of the adjutant general of the army, Roger Jones, whose brother, a militia general, commanded the escort, composed of militia and some regulars. Among the regulars I recall the names of Captains John Sedgwick and W. F. Barry. Hardly was General Taylor decently buried in the Congressional Cemetery when the political struggle recommenced, and it became manifest that Mr. Fillmore favored the general compromise then known as Henry Clay's Omnibus Bill, and that a general change of cabinet would at once occur, Webster was to succeed Mr. Clayton as Secretary of State, Corwin to succeed Mr. Meredith as Secretary of the Treasury, and A. H. H. Stewart to succeed Mr. Ewing as Secretary of the Interior. Mr. Ewing, however, was immediately appointed by the Governor of the State to succeed Corwin in the Senate. These changes made it necessary for Mr. Ewing to discontinue housekeeping, and Mr. Corwin took his home and furniture off his hands. I escorted the family out to their home in Lancaster, Ohio. But, before this had occurred, some most interesting debates took place in the Senate, which I regularly attended, and heard Clay, Benton, Foots, King of Alabama, Dayton, and the many real orators of that day. Mr. Calhoun was in his seat, but he was evidently approaching his end, for he was pale and feeble in the extreme. I heard Mr. Webster's last speech on the floor of the Senate, under circumstances that warrant a description. It was publicly known that he was to leave the Senate, and enter the new cabinet of Mr. Fillmore, as his Secretary of State, and that prior to leaving he was to make a great speech on the Omnibus Bill. Resolved to hear it, I went up to the Capitol on the day named, an hour or so earlier than usual. The speech was to be delivered in the old Senate chamber, now used by the Supreme Court. The galleries were much smaller than at present, and I found them full to overflowing, with a dense crowd about the door, struggling to reach the stairs. I could not get near, and then tried the reporter's gallery, but found it equally crowded. So I feared I should lose the only possible opportunity to hear Mr. Webster. I had only a limited personal acquaintance with any of the senators, but had met Mr. Corwin quite often at Mr. Ewing's house, and I also knew that he had been extremely friendly to my father in his lifetime, so I ventured to send in to him my card, W.T.S., 1st Lieutenant, 3rd Artillery. He came to the door promptly, when I said, Mr. Corwin, I believe Mr. Webster is to speak today. His answer was, yes, he has the floor at one o'clock. I then added that I was extremely anxious to hear him. Well, said he, why don't you go into the gallery? I explained that it was full, and I had tried every access, but found all jammed with people. Well, said he, what do you want of me? I explained that I would like him to take me on the floor of the Senate. That I had often seen from the gallery persons on the floor, no better entitled to it than I. He then asked in his quizzical way, are you a foreign ambassador? No, are you the governor of a state? No, are you a member of the other house? Certainly not, have you ever had a vote of thanks by name? No. Well, these are the only privileged members. 
I then told him he knew well enough who I was, and that if he chose he could take me in. He then said, have you any impudence? I told him, a reasonable amount if occasion called for it. Do you think you could become so interested in my conversation as not to notice the doorkeeper? Pointing to him. I told him that there was not the least doubt of it, if he would tell me one of his funny stories. He then took my arm, and led me a turn in the vestibule, talking about some indifferent matter, but all the time directing my looks to his left hand, toward which he was gesticulating with his right. And thus we approached the doorkeeper, who began asking me, for an ambassador. Governor of a state. Member of Congress, etc. But I caught Corwin's eye, which said plainly, don't mind him, pay attention to me, and in this way we entered the Senate chamber by a side door. Once in, Corwin said, now you can take care of yourself, and I thanked him cordially. I found a seat close behind Mr. Webster, and near General Scott, and heard the whole of the speech. It was heavy in the extreme, and I confess that I was disappointed and tired long before it was finished. No doubt the speech was full of fact and argument, but it had none of the fire of oratory, or intensity of feeling, that marked all of Mr. Clay's efforts. Toward the end of July, as before stated, all the family went home to Lancaster. Congress was still in session, and the bill adding four captains to the commissary department had not passed, but was reasonably certain to, and I was equally sure of being one of them. At that time my name was on the muster roll of, Light, Company C, 3rd Artillery, Braggs, stationed at Jefferson Barracks, near St. Louis. But, as there was cholera at ST. Lewis, on application, I was permitted to delay joining my company until September. Early in that month, I proceeded to Cincinnati, and thence by steamboat to St. Lewis, and then to Jefferson Barracks, where I reported for duty to Captain and Brevet Colonel Braxton Bragg, commanding, Light, Company C, 3rd Artillery. The other officers of the company were 1st Lieutenant James A. Hardy, and afterward Hikaliah Brown. New horses had just been purchased for the battery, and we were preparing for work, when the mail brought the orders announcing the passage of the bill increasing the commissary department by four captains, to which were promoted Captain Shiras. Blair, Sherman, and Bowen. I was ordered to take post at St. Louis, and to relieve Captain A. J. Smith, 1st Dragoons, who had been acting in that capacity for some months. My commission bore date September 27, 1850. I proceeded forthwith to the city, relieved Captain Smith, and entered on the discharge of the duties of the office. Colonel N. S. Clark, 6th Infantry, commanded the department, Major D. C. Buell was Adjutant General, and Captain W. S. Hancock was Regimental Quartermaster, Colonel Thomas Swords was the Depot Quartermaster, and we had our offices in the same building, on the corner of Washington Avenue and 2nd. Subsequently Major S. Van Vliet relieved Colonel Swords. I remained at the planter's house until my family arrived, when we occupied a house on Shoto Avenue, near 12th. During the spring and summer of 1851, Mr. Ewing and Mr. Henry Stoddard, of Dayton, Ohio, a cousin of my father, were much in ST. Lewis, on business connected with the estate of Major Amos Stoddard, who was of the old army, as early as the beginning of this century. He was stationed at the village of St. Louis at the time of the Louisiana Purchase, and when Lewis and Clark made their famous expedition across the continent to the Columbia River. Major Stoddard at that early day had purchased a small farm back of the village, of some Spaniard or Frenchman, but, as he was a bachelor, and was killed at Fort Meigs, Ohio, during the War of 1812, the title was for many years lost sight of and the farm was covered over by other claims and by occupants. As St. Louis began to grow, his brothers and sisters, and their descendants, concluded to look up the property. After much and fruitless litigation, they at last retained Mr. Stoddard, of Dayton, who in turn employed Mr. Ewing, and these, after many years of labor, established the title, and in the summer of 1851 they were put in possession by the United States Marshal. The ground was laid off, the city survey extended over it, and the whole was sold in partition. I made some purchases, and acquired an interest, which I have retained more or less ever since. 
we continued to reside in Esti. Lewis throughout the year 1851, and in the spring of 1852 I had occasion to visit Fort Leavenworth on duty, partly to inspect a lot of cattle which a Mr. Gordon, of Cass County, had contracted to deliver in New Mexico, to enable Colonel Sumner to attempt his scheme of making the soldiers in New Mexico self-supporting, by raising their own meat, and in a measure their own vegetables. I found Fort Leavenworth then, as now, a most beautiful spot, but in the midst of a wild Indian country. There were no whites settled in what is now the state of Kansas. Weston, in Missouri, was the great town, and speculation in town lots there and thereabout burnt the fingers of some of the army officers, who wanted to plant their scanty dollars in a fruitful soil. I rode on horseback over to Gordon's farm, saw the cattle, concluded the bargain, and returned by way of Independence, Missouri. At Independence I found F.X. Aubrey, a noted man of that day, who had just made a celebrated ride of six hundred miles in six days. That spring the United States Quartermaster, Major L. C. Easton, at Fort Union, New Mexico, had occasion to send some message east by a certain date, and contracted with Aubrey to carry it to the nearest post office, then Independence, Missouri, making his compensation conditional on the time consumed. He was supplied with a good horse, and an order on the outgoing trains for an exchange. Though the whole route was infested with hostile Indians, and not a house on it, Aubrey started alone with his rifle. He was fortunate in meeting several outward-bound trains, and there, by made frequent changes of horses, some four or five, and reached Independence in six days, having hardly rested or slept the whole way. Of course, he was extremely fatigued, and said there was an opinion among the wild Indians that if a man sleeps out his sleep, after such extreme exhaustion, he will never awake. And, accordingly, he instructed his landlord to wake him up after eight hours of sleep. When aroused at last, he saw by the clock that he had been asleep twenty hours, and he was dreadfully angry, threatened to murder his landlord, who protested he had tried in every way to get him up, but found it impossible. And had let him sleep it out, Aubrey, in describing his sensations to me, said he took it for granted he was a dead man. But in fact he sustained no ill effects, and was off again in a few days. I met him afterward often in California, and always esteemed him one of the best samples of that bold race of men who had grown up on the plains, along with the Indians, in the service of the fur companies. He was afterward, in 1856, killed by R. C. Whiteman, in a barroom row, at Santa Fe, New Mexico, where he had just arrived from California. In going from Independence to Fort Leavenworth, I had to swim Milk Creek, and sleep all night in a Shawnee camp. The next day I crossed the Kaw or Kansas River in a ferry boat, maintained by the blacksmith of the tribe, and reached the fort in the evening. At that day the whole region was unsettled, where now exist many rich counties, highly cultivated, embracing several cities of from ten to forty thousand inhabitants. From Fort Leavenworth I returned by steamboat to St. Louis. In the summer of 1852, my family went to Lancaster, Ohio, but I remained at my post. Late in the season, it was rumored that I was to be transferred to New Orleans, and in due time I learned the cause. During a part of the Mexican War, Major Sewell, of the 7th Infantry, had been acting commissary of subsistence at New Orleans, then the great depot of supplies for the troops in Texas, and of those operating beyond the Rio Grande. Commissaries at that time were allowed to purchase in open market, and were not restricted to advertising and awarding contracts to the lowest bidders. It was reported that Major Sewell had purchased largely of the house of Perry Sewell and Company, Mr. Sewell being a relative of his. When he was relieved in his duties by Major Wagman, of the regular commissary department, the latter found Perry Sewell and Company so prompt and satisfactory that he continued the patronage. For which there was a good reason, because stores for the use of the troops at remote posts had to be packed in a particular way, to bear transportation in wagons, or even on pack mules. And this firm had made extraordinary preparations for this exclusive purpose. Sometime about 1849, a brother of Major Wagaman, who had been clerk to Captain Casey, Commissary of Subsistence, at Tampa Bay, Florida, was thrown out of office by the death of the captain. 
and he naturally applied to his brother in New Orleans for employment. And he, in turn, referred him to his friends, Messrs. Perry Sewell and Company. These first employed him as a clerk, and afterward admitted him as a partner. Thus it resulted, in fact, that Major Wagaman was dealing largely, if not exclusively, with a firm of which his brother was a partner. One day, as General Twiggs was coming across Lake Pontchartrain, he fell in with one of his old cronies, who was an extensive grocer. This gentleman gradually led the conversation to the downward tendency of the times since he and Twiggs were young, saying that, in former years, all the merchants of New Orleans had a chance at government patronage. But now, in order to sell to the army commissary, one had to take a brother in as a partner. General Twiggs resented this, but the merchant again affirmed it, and gave names. As soon as General Twiggs reached his office, he instructed his adjutant general, Colonel Bliss, who told me this, to address a categorical note of inquiry to Major Wagaman. The Major very frankly stated the facts as they had arisen, and insisted that the firm of Perry Sewell and Company had enjoyed a large patronage, but deserved it richly by reason of their promptness, fairness, and fidelity. The correspondence was sent to Washington, and the result was, that Major Wagaman was ordered to St. Louis, and I was ordered to New Orleans. I went down to New Orleans in a steamboat in the month of September, 1852, taking with me a clerk, and, on arrival, assumed the office, in a bank building facing Lafayette Square, in which were the offices of all the Army Departments. General D. Twiggs was in command of the department, with Colonel W. W. S. Bliss, son-in-law of General Taylor, as his adjutant general. Colonel A. C. Myers was quartermaster, Captain John F. Reynolds aide-de-camp, and Colonel A. J. Coffee paymaster. I took rooms at the St. Louis Hotel, kept by a most excellent gentleman, Colonel Mudge. Mr. Perry Sewell came to me in person, soliciting a continuance of the custom which he had theretofore enjoyed. But I told him frankly that a change was necessary, and I never saw or heard of him afterward. I simply purchased an open market, arranged for the proper packing of the stores, and had not the least difficulty in supplying the troops and satisfying the head of the department in Washington. About Christmas, I had noticed that my family, consisting of Mrs. Sherman, two children, and nurse, with my sister Fanny, now Mrs. Moulton, of Cincinnati, Ohio, were en route for New Orleans by steam packet. So I hired a house on Magazine Street, and furnished it. Almost at the moment of their arrival, also came from a tea. Lewis my personal friend Major Turner, with a parcel of documents, which, on examination, proved to be articles of copartnership for a bank in California under the title of Lucas, Turner and Company, in which my name was embraced as a partner. Major Turner was, at the time, actually en route for New York, to embark for San Francisco, to inaugurate the bank, in the nature of a branch of the firm already existing at St. Louis under the name of Lucas and Simons. We discussed the matter very fully, and he left with me the papers for reflection, and went on to New York and California. Shortly after arrived James H. Lucas, ESQ, the principal of the banking firm in ST. Lewis, a most honorable and wealthy gentleman. He further explained the full program of the branch in California, that my name had been included at the insistence of Major Turner, who was a man of family and property in ST. Lewis, unwilling to remain long in San Francisco, and who wanted me to succeed him there. He offered me a very tempting income, with an interest that would accumulate and grow. He also disclosed to me that, in establishing a branch in California, he was influenced by the apparent prosperity of Page, Bacon and Company, and further that he had received the principal data, on which he had founded the scheme, from B.R. Nisbet, who was then a teller in the firm of Page, Bacon and Company, of San Francisco, that he also was to be taken in as a partner, and was fully competent to manage all the details of the business, but, as Nisbet was comparatively young, Mr. Lucas wanted me to reside in San Francisco permanently, as the head of the firm. All these matters were fully discussed, and I agreed to apply for a six months leave of absence, go to San Francisco, see for myself, and be governed by appearances there. I accordingly, with General Twiggs's approval, 
applied to the adjutant general for a six months leave, which was granted, and Captain John F. Reynolds was named to perform my duties during my absence. During the stay of my family in New Orleans, we enjoyed the society of the families of General Twiggs, Colonel Myers, and Colonel Bliss, as also of many citizens, among whom was the wife of Mr. Day, sister to my brother-in-law, Judge Bartley. General Twiggs was then one of the oldest officers of the army. His history extended back to the War of 1812, and he had served in early days with General Jackson in Florida and in the Creek campaigns. He had fine powers of description, and often entertained us, at his office, with accounts of his experiences in the earlier settlements of the Southwest. Colonel Bliss had been General Taylor's adjutant in the Mexican War, and was universally regarded as one of the most finished and accomplished scholars in the army, and his wife was a most agreeable and accomplished lady. Late in February, I dispatched my family up to Ohio in the steamboat Tecumseh, Captain Pierce, disposed of my house and furniture, turned over to Major Reynolds the funds, property, and records of the office, and took passage in a small steamer for Nicaragua, en route for California. We embarked early in March, and in seven days reached Greytown, where we united with the passengers from New York, and proceeded, by the Nicaragua River and Lake, for the Pacific Ocean. The river was low, and the little steam canal boats, for in number, grounded often, so that the passengers had to get into the water, to help them over the bear. In all there were about six hundred passengers, of whom about sixty were women and children. In four days we reached Castillo, where there is a decided fall, passed by a short railway, and above this fall we were transferred to a larger boat, which carried us up the rest of the river, and across the beautiful Lake Nicaragua. Studded with volcanic islands. Landing at Virgin Bay, we rode on mules across to San Juan del Sur, where lay at anchor the propeller S. S. Lewis, Captain Partridge, I think. Passengers were carried through the surf by natives to small boats, and rowed off to the Lewis. The weather was very hot, and quite a scramble followed for staterooms, especially for those on deck. I succeeded in reaching the purser's office, got my ticket for a berth in one of the best staterooms on deck, and, just as I was turning from the window, a lady who was a fellow passenger from New Orleans, a Mrs. D. Dash, called to me to secure her and her lady friend berths on deck, saying that those below were unendurable. I spoke to the purser, who, at the moment perplexed by the crowd and clamor, answered, I must put their names down for the other two berths of your stateroom. But, as soon as the confusion is over, I will make some change whereby you shall not suffer. As soon as these two women were assigned to a stateroom, they took possession, and I was left out. Their names were recorded as, Captain Sherman and Ladies. As soon as things were quieted down I remonstrated with the purser, who at last gave me a lower berth in another and larger stateroom on deck, with five others, so that my two ladies had the stateroom all to themselves. At every meal the steward would come to me, and say, Captain Sherman, will you bring your ladies to the table, and we had the best seats in the ship. This continued throughout the voyage, and I assert that, my ladies, were of the most modest and best behaved in the ship. But some time after we had reached San Francisco one of our fellow passengers came to me and inquired if I personally knew Mrs. D. Dash, with flaxen tresses, who sang so sweetly for us, and who had come out under my especial escort. I replied I did not, more than the chance acquaintance of the voyage, and what she herself had told me, viz., that she expected to meet her husband, who lived about Mokalumni Hill. He then informed me that she was a woman of the town. Society in California was then decidedly mixed. In due season the steamship Lewis got under way. She was a wooden ship, long and narrow, bark-rigged, and a propeller, very slow, moving not over eight miles an hour. We stopped at Acapulco, and, in eighteen days, passed in sight of Point Pinoa at Monterey, and at the speed we were traveling expected to reach San Francisco at 4 a.m. the next day. The cabin passengers, as was usual, bought of the steward some champagne and cigars, and we had a sort of ovation for the captain, purser, and surgeon of the ship, who were all very clever fellows, though they had a slow and poor ship. Late at night all the passengers went to bed, expecting to enter the port at daylight. I did not undress, as I thought the captain could and would run in at night, 
and I lay down with my clothes on. About 4 a.m. I was awakened by a bump and sort of grating of the vessel, which I thought was our arrival at the wharf in San Francisco, but instantly the ship struck heavily. The engine stopped, and the running to and fro on deck showed that something was wrong. In a moment I was out of my stateroom, at the bulwark, holding fast to a stanchion, and looking over the side at the white and seething water caused by her sudden and violent stoppage. The sea was comparatively smooth, the night pitch dark, and the fog deep and impenetrable, the ship would rise with the swell, and come down with a bump and quiver that was decidedly unpleasant. Soon the passengers were out of their rooms, undressed, calling for help, and praying as though the ship were going to sink immediately. Of course she could not sink, being already on the bottom, and the only question was as to the strength of hull to stand the bumping and straining. Great confusion for a time prevailed, but soon I realized that the captain had taken all proper precautions to secure his boats, of which there were six at the davits. These are the first things that steerage passengers make for in case of shipwreck, and right over my head I heard the captain's voice say in a low tone, but quite decided, let go that falls, or, damn you, I'll blow your head off. This seemingly harsh language gave me great comfort at the time, and on saying so to the captain afterward, he explained that it was addressed to a passenger who attempted to lower one of the boats. Guards, composed of the crew, were soon posted to prevent any interference with the boats, and the officers circulated among the passengers the report that there was no immediate danger, that, fortunately, the sea was smooth. That we were simply aground, and must quietly await daylight. They advised the passengers to keep quiet, and the ladies and children to dress and sit at the doors of their staterooms, there to await the advice and action of the officers of the ship, who were perfectly cool and self-possessed. Meantime the ship was working over a reef for a time I feared she would break in two. But, as the water gradually rose inside to a level with the sea outside, the ship swung broadside to the swell, and all her keel seemed to rest on the rock or sand. At no time did the sea break over the deck, but the water below drove all the people up to the main deck and to the promenade deck, and thus we remained for about three hours, when daylight came. But there was a fog so thick that nothing but water could be seen. The captain caused a boat to be carefully lowered, put in her a trustworthy officer with a boat compass, and we saw her depart into the fog. During her absence the ship's bell was kept tolling. Then the fires were all out, the ship full of water, and gradually breaking up, wriggling with every swell like a willow basket, the sea all round us full of the floating fragments of her sheeting, twisted and torn into a spongy condition. In less than an hour the boat returned, saying that the beach was quite near, not more than a mile away, and had a good place for landing. All the boats were then carefully lowered, and manned by crews belonging to the ship. A piece of the gangway, on the leeward side, was cut away, and all the women, and a few of the worst scared men, were lowered into the boats, which pulled for shore. In a comparatively short time the boats returned, took new loads, and the debarkation was afterward carried on quietly and systematically. No baggage was allowed to go on shore except bags or parcels carried in the hands of passengers. At times the fog lifted so that we could see from the wreck the tops of the hills, and the outline of the shore. And I remember sitting on, the upper or hurricane deck with the captain, who had his maps and compass before him, and was trying to make out where the ship was. I thought I recognized the outline of the hills below the mission of Dolores, and so stated to him. But he called my attention to the fact that the general line of hills bore northwest, whereas the coast south of San Francisco bears due north and south. He therefore concluded that the ship had overrun her reckoning, and was then to the north of San Francisco. He also explained that, the passage up being longer than usual, viz., 18 days, the coal was short. That at the time the firemen were using some cut-up spars along with the slack of coal, and that this fuel had made more than usual steam, so that the ship must have glided along faster than reckoned. This proved to be the actual case, for, in fact, the steamship Lewis was wrecked April 9, 1853, on Duckworth Reef, Bolinas Bay, about 18 miles above the entrance to San Francisco. The captain had sent ashore the purser in the first boat, with orders to work his way to the city as soon as possible, 
to report the loss of his vessel, and to bring back help. I remained on the wreck till among the last of the passengers, managing to get a can of crackers and some sardines out of the submerged pantry, a thing the rest of the passengers did not have, and then I went quietly ashore in one of the boats. The passengers were all on the beach, under a steep bluff, had built fires to dry their clothes, but had seen no human being, and had no idea where they were. Taking along with me a fellow passenger, a young chap about eighteen years old, I scrambled up the bluff, and walked back toward the hills, in hopes to get a good view of some known object. It was then the month of April, and the hills were covered with the beautiful grasses and flowers of that season of the year. We soon found horse paths and tracks, and following them we came upon a drove of horses grazing at large, some of which had saddle marks. At about two miles from the beach we found a corral. And thence, following one of the strongest marked paths, in about a mile more we descended into a valley, and, on turning a sharp point, reached a board shanty, with a horse picketed nearby. For men were inside eating a meal. I inquired if any of the Lewis's people had been there. They did not seem to understand what I meant when I explained to them that about three miles from them, and beyond the old corral, the steamer Lewis was wrecked, and her passengers were on the beach. I inquired where we were, and they answered, at Bolinas Creek, that they were employed at a sawmill just above, and were engaged in shipping lumber to San Francisco. That a schooner loaded with lumber was then about two miles down the creek, waiting for the tide to get out, and doubtless if we would walk down they would take us on board. I wrote a few words back to the captain, telling him where he was, and that I would hurry to the city to send him help. My companion and I there went on down the creek, and soon described the schooner anchored out in the stream. On being hailed, a small boat came in and took us on board. The captain willingly agreed for a small sum to carry us down to San Francisco. And, as his whole crew consisted of a small boy about twelve years old, we helped him to get up his anchor and pull the schooner down the creek and out over the bar on a high tide. This must have been about two p.m. Once over the bar, the sails were hoisted, and we glided along rapidly with a strong, fair, northwest wind. The fog had lifted, so we could see the shores plainly, and the entrance to the bay. In a couple of hours we were entering the bay, and running, wing and wing. Outside the wind was simply the usual strong breeze, but, as it passes through the head of the Golden Gate, it increases, and there, too, we met a strong ebb tide. The schooner was loaded with lumber, much of which was on deck, lashed down to ring bolts with rawhide thongs. The captain was steering, and I was reclining on the lumber, looking at the familiar shore, as we approached Fort Point, when I heard a sort of cry, and felt the schooner going over. As we got into the throat of the heads, the force of the wind, meeting a strong ebb tide, drove the nose of the schooner under water, she dove like a duck, went over on her side, and began, to drift out with the tide. I found myself in the water, mixed up with pieces of plank and ropes, struck out, swam round to the stern, got on the keel, and clambered up on the side. Satisfied that she could not sink, by reason of her cargo, I was not in the least alarmed, but thought two shipwrecks in one day not a good beginning for a new, peaceful career. Nobody was drowned, however. The captain and crew were busy in securing such articles as were liable to float off, and I looked out for some passing boat or vessel to pick us up. We were drifting steadily out to sea, while I was signaling to a boat about three miles off, toward Sausalito, and saw her tack and stand toward us. I was busy watching this sailboat, when I heard a Yankee's voice, close behind, saying, this is a nice mess you've got yourselves into, and looking about I saw a man in a small boat, who had seen us upset. And had rowed out to us from a schooner anchored close under the fort. Some explanations were made, and when the sailboat coming from Sausalito was near enough to be spoken to, and the captain had engaged her to help his schooner, we bade him goodbye, and got the man in the small boat to carry us ashore. And land us at the foot of the bluff, just below the fort. Once there, I was at home, and we footed it up to the Presidio. Of the sentinel I inquired who was in command of the post, and was answered, Major Merchant. He was not then in, but his adjutant, Lieutenant Gardner, was. I sent my card to him. He came out, 
and was much surprised to find me covered with sand, and dripping with water, a good specimen of a shipwrecked mariner. A few words of explanation sufficed. Horses were provided, and we rode hastily into the city, reaching the office of the Nicaragua Steamship Company, C. K. Garrison, agent, about dark, just as the purser had arrived, by a totally different route. It was too late to send relief that night, but by daylight next morning two steamers were en route for and reached the place of wreck in time to relieve the passengers and bring them, and most of the baggage. I lost my carpet bag, but saved my trunk. The Lewis went to pieces the night after we got off, and, had there been an average sea during the night of our shipwreck, none of us probably would have escaped. That evening in San Francisco I hunted up Major Turner, whom I found boarding, in company with General E. A. Hitchcock, at a Mrs. Ross's, on Clay Street, near Powell. I took quarters with them, and began to make my studies, with a view to a decision whether it was best to undertake this new and untried scheme of banking, or to return to New Orleans and hold on to what I then had, a good army commission. At the time of my arrival, San Francisco was in the top wave of speculation and prosperity. Major Turner had rented at $600 a month the office formerly used and then owned by Adams and Company. On the east side of Montgomery Street, between Sacramento and California Streets. B. R. Nisbet was the active partner, and James Riley the teller. Already the bank of Lucas, Turner and Company. Was established and was engaged in selling bills of exchange, receiving deposits, and loaning money at 3% a month. Page, Bacon and Company, and Adams and Company. Were in full blast across the street, in Parrott's new granite building, and other bankers were doing seemingly a prosperous business, among them Wells, Fargo and Company, Drexel, Sather and Church, Burgoyne and Company, James King of Wynn, Sanders and Brenham. Davidson and Company, Palmer, Cook and Company, and others. Turner and I had rooms at Mrs. Ross's, and took our meals at restaurants downtown, mostly at a Frenchman's named Martin, on the southwest corner of Montgomery and California streets. General Hitchcock, of the Army, commanding the Department of California, usually messed with us, also a Captain Mason, and Lieutenant Whiting, of the Engineer Corps. We soon secured a small share of business, and became satisfied there was room for profit. Everybody seemed to be making money fast, the city was being rapidly extended and improved, people paid their 3%. A month interest without fail, and without deeming it excessive. Turner, Nisbet, and I, daily discussed the prospects, and gradually settled down to the conviction that with $200,000 capital, and a credit of $50,000 in New York, we could build up a business that would help the ST. Lewis House, and at the same time pay expenses in California, with a reasonable profit. Of course, Turner never designed to remain long in California, and I consented to go back to St. Louis, confer with Mr. Lucas and Captain Simons, agree upon further details, and then return permanently. I have no memoranda by me now by which to determine the fact, but think I returned to New York in July, 1853, by the Nicaragua route, and thence to St. Lewis by way of Lancaster, Ohio, where my family still was. Mr. Lucas promptly agreed to the terms proposed, and further consented, on the expiration of the lease of the Adams and Company. Office, to erect a new banking house in San Francisco, to cost $50,000. I then returned to Lancaster, explained to Mr. Ewing and Mrs. Sherman all the details of our agreement, and, meeting their approval, I sent to the Adjutant General of the Army my letter of resignation, to take effect at the end of the six months' leave, and the resignation was accepted. To take effect September 6, 1853. Being then a citizen, I engaged a passage out to California by the Nicaragua route, in the steamer leaving New York September 20th, for myself and family, and accordingly proceeded to New York, where I had a conference with Mr. Meigs, cashier of the American Exchange Bank, and with Messrs. Wadsworth and Sheldon, bankers, who were our New York correspondents, and on the 20th embarked for San Juan del Norte, with the family, composed of Mrs. Sherman, Lizzie, then less than a year old, and her nurse, Mary Lynch. Our passage down was uneventful, 
and, on the boats up the Nicaragua River, pretty much the same as before. On reaching Virgin Bay, I engaged a native with three mules to carry us across to the Pacific, and as usual the trip partook of the ludicrous, Mrs. Sherman mounted on a donkey about as large as a Newfoundland dog. Mary Lynch on another, trying to carry Lizzie on a pillow before her, but her mule had a fashion of lying down, which scared her, till I exchanged mules, and my California spurs kept that mule on his legs. I carried Lizzie some time till she was fast asleep, when I got our native man to carry her a while. The child woke up, and, finding herself in the hands of a dark-visaged man, she yelled most lustily till I got her away. At the summit of the pass, there was a clear running brook, where we rested an hour, and bathed Lizzie in its sweet waters. We then continued to the end of our journey, and, without going to the tavern at San Juan del Sur, we passed directly to the vessel, then at anchor about two miles out. To reach her we engaged a native boat, which had to be kept outside the surf. Mrs. Sherman was first taken in the arms of two stout natives, Mary Lynch, carrying Lizzie, was carried by two others. And I followed, mounted on the back of a strapping fellow, while fifty or a hundred others were running to and fro, cackling like geese. Mary Lynch got scared at the surf, and began screaming like a fool, when Lizzie became convulsed with fear, and one of the natives rushed to her, caught her out of Mary's arms, and carried her swiftly to Mrs. Sherman, who, by that time, was in the boat, but Lizzie had fainted with fear, and for a long time sobbed as though permanently injured. For years she showed symptoms that made us believe she had never entirely recovered from the effects of the scare. In due time we reached the steamer Sierra Nevada, and got a good stateroom. Our passage up the coast was pleasant enough. We reached San Francisco, on the 15th of October, and took quarters at an hotel on Stockton Street, near Broadway. Major Turner remained till some time in November, when he also departed for the East, leaving me and Nisbet to manage the bank. I endeavored to make myself familiar with the business, but of course Nisbet kept the books, and gave his personal attention to the loans, discounts, and drafts, which yielded the profits. I soon saw, however, that the 3% charged as premium on bills of exchange was not all profit, but out of this had to come one and a fourth to one and a half for freight, one and a third for insurance, with some indefinite promise of a return premium. Then, the, cost of blanks, boxing of the bullion, etc., etc. Indeed, I saw no margin for profit at all. Nisbet, however, who had long been familiar with the business, insisted there was a profit, in the fact that the gold dust or bullion shipped was more valuable than its cost to us. We, of course, had to remit bullion to meet our bills on New York, and bought crude gold dust, or bars refined by Kellogg and Humbert or E. Just and Company, for at that time the United States Mint was not in operation. But, as the reports of our shipments came back from New York, I discovered that I was right and Nisbet was wrong, and, although we could not help selling our checks on New York NST. Lewis at the same price as other bankers, I discovered that, at all events, the exchange business in San Francisco was rather a losing business than profitable. The same as to loans. We could loan, at 3%. A month, all our own money, say $250,000, and a part of our deposit account. This latter account in California was decidedly uncertain. The balance due depositors would run down to a mere nominal sum on steamer days, which were the 1st and 15th of each month, and then would increase till the next steamer day. So that we could not make use of any reasonable part of this balance for loans beyond the next steamer day. Or, in other words, we had an expensive bank, with expensive clerks, and all the machinery for taking care of other people's money for their benefit, without corresponding profit. I also saw that loans were attended with risk commensurate with the rate. Nevertheless, I could not attempt to reform the rules and customs established by others before me, and had to drift along with the rest toward that Niagara that none foresaw at the time. Shortly after arriving out in 1853, we looked around for a site for the new bank, and the only place then available on Montgomery Street, the Wall Street of San Francisco, was a lot at the corner of Jackson Street, facing Montgomery. With an alley on the north, belonging to James Lick. 
The ground was 60 by 62 feet, and I had to pay for it $32,000. I then made a contract with the builders, Kaiser, and Brown, to erect a three-story brick building, with finished basement, for about $50,000. This made $82,000 instead of $50,000, but I thought Mr. Lucas could stand it and would approve, which he did, though it resulted in loss to him. After the Civil War, he told me he had sold the building for $40,000, about half its cost, but luckily gold was then at $250. So that he could use the $40,000 gold as the equivalent of $100,000 currency. The building was erected, I gave it my personal supervision, and it was strongly and thoroughly built, for I saw it two years ago, when several earthquakes had made no impression on it. Still, the choice of site was unfortunate, for the city drifted in the opposite direction, viz., toward Market Street. I then thought that all the heavy business would remain toward the foot of Broadway and Jackson Street, because there were the deepest water and best wharves, but in this I made a mistake. Nevertheless, in the spring of 1854, the new bank was finished, and we removed to it, paying rents thereafter to our Mr. Lucas instead of to Adams and Company. A man named Wright, during the same season, built a still finer building just across the street from us, Pioche, Bayer K. and Company. Were already established on another corner of Jackson Street, and the new Metropolitan Theatre was in progress diagonally opposite us. During the whole of 1854 our business steadily grew, our average deposits going up to half a million, and our sales of exchange and consequent shipment of bullion averaging $200,000 per steamer. I signed all bills of exchange, and insisted on Nisbet consulting me on loans and discounts. Spite of every caution, however, we lost occasionally by bad loans, and worse by the steady depreciation of real estate. The city of San Francisco was then extending her streets, sewering them, and planking them, with three-inch lumber. In payment for the lumber and the work of contractors, the city authorities paid scrip in even sums of one hundred, five hundred, one thousand, and five thousand dollars. These formed a favorite collateral for loans at from fifty to sixty cents on the dollar, and no one doubted their ultimate value, either by redemption or by being converted into city bonds. The notes also of H. Meggs, Neely Thompson and Company, etc. Lumber dealers were favorite notes, for they paid their interest promptly, and lodged large margins of these street improvement warrants as collateral. At that time, Meggs was a prominent man, lived in style in a large house on Broadway, was a member of the city council, and owned large sawmills up the coast about Mendocino. In him Nisbet had unbounded faith, but, for some reason, I feared or mistrusted him, and remember that I cautioned Nisbet not to extend his credit, but to gradually contract his loans. On looking over our bills receivable, then about $600,000, I found Meggs, as principal or inderser, owed us about $80,000, all, however, secured by city warrants. Still, he kept bank accounts elsewhere, and was generally a borrower. I instructed Nisbet to insist on his reducing his line as the notes matured, and, as he found it indelicate to speak to Meggs, I instructed him to refer him to me. Accordingly, when, on the next steamer day, Meggs appealed at the counter for a draft on Philadelphia, of about $20,000, for which he offered his note and collateral, he was referred to me. And I explained to him that our draft was the same as money. That he could have it for cash, but that we were already in advance to him some seventy-five or eighty thousand dollars, and that instead of increasing the amount I must insist on its reduction. He inquired if I mistrusted his ability, etc. I explained, certainly not, but that our duty was to assist those who did all their business with us, and, as our means were necessarily limited, I must restrict him to some reasonable sum, say, twenty-five thousand dollars. Meggs invited me to go with him to a rich mercantile house on Clay Street, whose partners belonged in Hamburg, and there, in the presence of the principals of the house, he demonstrated, as clearly as a proposition in mathematics, that his business at Mendocino was based on calculations that could not fail. The bill of exchange which he wanted, he said would make the last payment on a propeller already built in Philadelphia, which would be sent to San Francisco to tow into and out of port the schooners and brigs that were bringing his lumber down the coast. 
I admitted all he said, but renewed my determination to limit his credit to $25,000. The Hamburg firm then agreed to accept for him the payment of all his debt to us, except the $25,000, payable in equal parts for the next three steamer days. Accordingly, Meggs went back with me to our bank, wrote his note for $25,000, and secured it by mortgage on real estate and city warrants, and substituted the three acceptances of the Hamburg firm for the overplus. I surrendered to him all his former notes, except one for which he was inderser. The three acceptances duly matured and were paid. One morning Meggs and family were missing, and it was discovered they had embarked in a sailing vessel for South America. This was the beginning of a series of failures in San Francisco, that extended through the next two years. As soon as it was known that Meggs had fled, the town was full of rumors, and everybody was running to and fro to secure his money. His debts amounted to nearly a million dollars. The Hamburg house which, had been humbugged, were heavy losers and failed, I think. I took possession of Meggs's dwelling house and other property for which I held his mortgage, and in the city warrants thought I had an overplus. But it transpired that Meggs, being in the city council, had issued various quantities of street scrip, which was adjudged a forgery, though, beyond doubt, most of it, if not all, was properly signed, but fraudulently issued. On this city scrip our bank must have lost about $10,000. Meg subsequently turned up in Chile, where again he rose to wealth and has paid much of his San Francisco debts, but none to us. He is now in Peru, living like a prince. With Meg's fell all the lumber dealers, and many persons dealing in city scrip. Compared with others, our loss was a trifle. In a short time things in San Francisco resumed their wonted course, and we generally laughed at the escapade of Meg's, and the cursing of his deluded creditors. Shortly after our arrival in San Francisco, I rented of a Mr. Marriott, son of the English Captain Marriott, the author, a small frame house on Stockton Street, near Green, buying of him his furniture, and we removed to it about December 1, 1853. Close by, around on Green Street, a man named Dickey was building two small brick houses, on ground which he had leased of Nicholson. I bought one of these houses, subject to the ground rent, and moved into it as soon as finished. Lieutenant T. H. Stevens, of the United States Navy, with his family, rented the other, we lived in this house throughout the year 1854, and up to April 17, 1855. V. California. 1855-1857. During the winter of 1854-55, I received frequent intimations in my letters from the St. Louis House, that the Bank of Page, Bacon and Company was in trouble, growing out of their relations to the Ohio and Mississippi Railroad, to the contractors for building which they had made large advances, to secure which they had been compelled to take, as it were, an assignment of the contract itself. And finally to assume all the liabilities of the contractors. Then they had to borrow money in New York, and raise other money from time to time, in the purchase of iron and materials for the road, and to pay the hands. The firm in ST. Lewis and that in San Francisco were different, having different partners, and the St. Louis house naturally pressed the San Francisco firm to ship largely of gold dust, which gave them a great name. Also to keep as large a balance as possible in New York to sustain their credit. Mr. Page was a very wealthy man, but his wealth consisted mostly of land and property in St. Louis. He was an old man, and a good one. Had been a baker, and knew little of banking as a business. This part of his general business was managed exclusively by his son-in-law, Henry D. Bacon, who was young, handsome, and generally popular. How he was drawn into that affair of the Ohio and Mississippi Road I have no means of knowing, except by hearsay. Their business in New York was done through the American Exchange Bank, and through Duncan, Sherman and Company. As we were rival houses, the St. Louis partners removed our account from the American Exchange Bank to the Metropolitan Bank. And, as Wadsworth and Sheldon had failed, I was instructed to deal in time bills, and in European exchange, with Shenchert and Gebhard, bankers in Nassau Street. In California the House of Page, Bacon and Company was composed of the same partners as in St. 
Lewis, with the addition of Henry Haight, Judge Chambers, and young Frank Page. The latter had charge of the branch in Sacramento. Haight was the real head man, but he was too fond of lager beer to be entrusted with so large a business. Beyond all comparison, Page, Bacon and Company were the most prominent bankers in California in 1853-55. Though I had notice of danger in that quarter, from our partners in St. Louis, nobody in California doubted their wealth and stability. They must have had, during that winter, an average deposit account of nearly $2 million, of which $700,000 was in certificates of deposit, the most stable of all accounts in a bank. Thousands of miners invested their earnings in such certificates, which they converted into drafts on New York, when they were ready to go home or wanted to send their pile to their families. Adams and Company were next in order, because of their numerous offices scattered throughout the mining country. A gentleman named Haskell had been in charge of Adams and Company. In San Francisco, but in the winter of 1854-55 some changes were made, and the banking department had been transferred to a magnificent office in Halleck's new metropolitan block. James King of W.M. had discontinued business on his own account, and been employed by Adams and Company as their cashier and banker, and Isaiah C. Wood had succeeded Haskell in chief control of the express department. Wells, Fargo and Company were also bankers as well as express men, and William J. Pardee was the resident partner. As the mail steamer came in on February 17, 1855, according to her custom, she ran close to the Long Wharf, Megzas, on North Beach, to throw ashore the express parcels of news for speedy delivery. Some passenger on deck called to a man of his acquaintance standing on the wharf, that Page and Bacon had failed in New York. The news spread like wildfire, but soon it was met by the newspaper accounts to the effect that some particular acceptances of Page and Bacon, of St. Louis, in the hands of Duncan, Sherman and Company, in New York, had gone to protest. All who had balances at Page, Bacon and Company, yes, or held certificates of deposit, were more or less alarmed, wanted to secure their money, and a general excitement pervaded the whole community. Word was soon passed round that the matter admitted of explanation, viz., that the two houses were distinct and separate concerns, that every draft of the California house had been paid in New York, and would continue to be paid. It was expected that this assertion would quiet the fears of the California creditors, but for the next three days there was a steady run on that bank. Page, Bacon and Company stood the first day's run very well, and, as I afterward learned, paid out about $600,000 in gold coin. On the 20th of February Henry Height came to our bank, to see what help we were willing to give him. But I was out, and Nisbet could not answer positively for the firm. Our condition was then very strong. The deposit account was about $600,000, and we had in our vault about $500,000 in coin and bullion, besides an equal amount of good bills receivable. Still I did not like to weaken ourselves to help others. But in a most friendly spirit, that night after bank hours, I went down to Page, Bacon and Company, and entered their office from the rear. I found in the cashier's room Folsom, Parrot, Dewey and Payne, Captain Ritchie, Donahue, and others, citizens and friends of the house, who had been called in for consultation. Passing into the main office, where all the bookkeepers, tellers, etc. with gaslights, were busy writing up the day's work, I found Mr. Page, Henry Height, and Judge Chambers. I spoke to Height, saying that I was sorry I had been out when he called at our bank, and had now come to see him in the most friendly spirit. Height had evidently been drinking, and said abruptly that all the banks would break, that no bank could instantly pay all its obligations, etc. I answered he could speak for himself, but not for me. That I had come to offer to buy with cash a fair proportion of his bullion, notes, and bills, but, if they were going to fail, I would not be drawn in. Height's manner was extremely offensive, but Mr. Page tried to smooth it over, saying they had had a bad day's run, and could not answer for the result till their books were written up. I passed back again into the room where the beforenamed gentlemen were discussing some paper which lay before them, and was going to pass out, when Captain Folsom, 
who was an officer of the army, a classmate and intimate friend of mine, handed me the paper the contents of which they were discussing. It was very short, and in Henry Haight's handwriting, pretty much in these terms, we, the undersigned property holders of San Francisco, having personally examined the books, papers, etc., of Page, Bacon and Company, do hereby certify that the house is solvent and able to pay all its debts, etc. Height had drawn up and asked them to sign this paper, with the intention to publish it in the next morning's papers, for effect. While I was talking with Captain Folsom, Height came into the room to listen. I admitted that the effect of such a publication would surely be good, and would probably stave off immediate demand till their assets could be in part converted or realized. But I naturally inquired of Folsom, have you personally examined the accounts, as herein recited, and the assets, enough to warrant your signature to this paper, for, thereby you in effect become indersers. Folsom said they had not, when Height turned on me rudely and said, do you think the affairs of such a house as Page, Bacon and Company can be critically examined in an hour? I answered, these gentlemen can do what they please, but they have twelve hours before the bank will open on the morrow, and if the ledger is written up, as I believed it was or could be by midnight, they can, by counting the coin, bullion on hand, and notes or stocks of immediate realization, approximate near enough for them to endorse for the remainder. But Hyde pooh-poohed me, and I left. Folsom followed me out, told me he could not afford to imperil all he had, and asked my advice. I explained to him that my partner Nisbet had been educated and trained in that very house of Page, Bacon and Company. That we kept our books exactly as they did, that every day the ledger was written up, so that from it one could see exactly how much actual money was due the depositors and certificates. And then, by counting the money in the vault, estimating the bullion on hand, which, though not actual money, could easily be converted into coin, and supplementing these amounts by bills receivable, they ought to arrive at an approximate result. After Folsom had left me, John Parrott also stopped and talked with me to the same effect. Next morning I looked out for the notice, but no such notice appeared in the morning papers, and I afterward learned that, on Parrott and Folsom demanding an actual count of the money in the vault. Haight angrily refused unless they would accept his word for it, when one after the other declined to sign his paper. The run on page, Bacon and company therefore continued throughout the 21st, and I expected all day to get an invitation to close our bank for the next day, February 22nd, which we could have made a holiday by concerted action. But each banker waited for Page, Bacon and Company to ask for it, and, no such circular coming, in the then state of feeling no other banker was willing to take the initiative. On the morning of February 22nd, 1855, everybody was startled by receiving a small slip of paper, delivered at all the houses, on which was printed a short notice that, for want of coin, Page, Bacon and Company, found it necessary to close their bank for a short time. Of course, we all knew the consequences, and that every other bank in San Francisco would be tried. During the 22D we all kept open, and watched our depositors closely. But the day was generally observed by the people as a holiday, and the firemen paraded the streets of San Francisco in unusual strength. But, on writing up our books that night, we found that our deposit account had diminished about $65,000. Still, there was no run on us, or any other of the banks, that day. Yet, observing little knots of men on the street, discussing the state of the banks generally, and overhearing Haight's expression quoted, that, in case of the failure of Page, Bacon and Company, all the other banks would break, I deemed it prudent to make ready. For some days we had refused all loans and renewals, and we tried, without, success, some of our call loans, but, like Hotspur spirits, they would not come. Our financial condition on that day, February 22, 1855, was, due depositors and demand certificates, $520,000, to meet which, we had in the vault, coin, $380,000. Bullion, $75,000, and bills receivable, about $600,000. Of these, at least $100,000 were on demand, with stock collaterals. Therefore, for the extent of our business, we were stronger than the Bank of England, 
or any bank in New York City. Before daylight next morning, our doorbell was rung, and I was called downstairs by E. Casserly, E.S.Q. An eminent lawyer of the day, since United States Senator, who informed me he had just come up from the office of Adams and Company, to tell me that their affairs were in such condition that they would not open that morning at all. And that this, added to the suspension of Page, Bacon and Company, announced the day before, would surely cause a general run on all the banks. I informed him that I expected as much, and was prepared for it. In going down to the bank that morning, I found Montgomery Street full, but, punctually to the minute, the bank opened, and in rushed the crowd. As usual, the most noisy and clamorous were men and women who held small certificates. Still, others with larger accounts were in the crowd, pushing forward for their balances. All were promptly met and paid. Several gentlemen of my personal acquaintance merely asked my word of honor that their money was safe, and went away. Others, who had large balances, and no immediate use for coin, gladly accepted gold bars, whereby we paid out the $75,000 of bullion, relieving the coin to that amount. Meantime, rumors from the street came pouring in that Wright and Company had failed, then Wells, Fargo and Company, then Palmer, Cook and Company, and indeed all, or nearly all, the banks of the city. And I was told that parties on the street were betting high, first, that we would close our doors at eleven o'clock, then twelve, and so on, but we did not, till the usual hour that night. We had paid every demand, and still had a respectable amount left. This run on the bank, the only one I ever experienced, presented all the features, serious and comical, usual to such occasions. At our counter happened that identical case, narrated of others, of the Frenchman, who was nearly squeezed to death in getting to the counter, and, when he received his money, did not know what to do with it. If you got the money, I no want him. But if you no got him, I want it like the devil. Toward the close of the day, some of our customers deposited, rather ostentatiously, small amounts, not aggregating more than eight or ten thousand dollars. Bookkeepers and tellers were kept at work to write up the books, and these showed. Due depositors and certificates, about $120,000, for which remained of coin about $50,000. I resolved not to sleep until I had collected from those owing the bank a part of their debts, for I was angry with them that they had stood back and allowed the panic to fall on the banks alone. Among these were Captain Folsom, who owed us $25,000, secured by a mortgage on the American Theater and Tahama Hotel. James Smiley, contractor for building the Custom House, who owed us two notes of $20,016,000, for which we held, as collateral, two acceptances of the collector of the port, Major R. P. Hammond, for $20,000 each, besides other private parties that I need not name. The acceptances given to Smiley were for work done on the Custom House, but could not be paid until the work was actually laid in the walls and certified by Major Tower, United States Engineers. But Smiley had an immense amount of granite, brick, iron, etc., on the ground, in advance of construction, and these acceptances were given him expressly that he might raise money thereon for the payment of such materials. Therefore, as soon as I got my dinner, I took my saddle horse, and rode to Captain Folsom's house, where I found him in great pain and distress, mental and physical. He was sitting in a chair, and bathing his head with a sponge. I explained to him the object of my visit, and he said he had expected it, and had already sent his agent, Van Winkle, downtown, with instructions to raise what money he could at any cost, but he did not succeed in raising a cent. So great was the shock to public confidence, that men slept on their money, and would not loan it for ten per cent. A week, on any security whatever, even on mint certificates, which were as good as gold, and only required about ten days to be paid in coin by the United States Mint. I then rode up to Hammond's house, on Rincon Hill, and found him there. I explained to him exactly Smiley's affairs, and only asked him to pay one of his acceptances. He inquired, why not both? I answered that was so much the better, it would put me under still greater obligations. He then agreed to meet me at our bank at 10 p.m. I sent word to others that I demanded them to pay what they could on their paper, and then returned to the bank, 
to meet Hammond. In due time, he came down with Palmer, of Palmer, Cook and Company. And there he met Smiley, who was, of course, very anxious to retire his notes. We there discussed the matter fully, when Hammond said, Sherman, give me up my two acceptances, and I will substitute therefore my check of forty thousand dollars, with the distinct understanding that, if the money is not needed by you, it shall be returned to me, and the transaction then to remain statu quo. To this there was a general assent. Nisbet handed him his two acceptances, and he handed me his check, signed as collector of the port, on Major J. R. Snyder, United States Treasurer, for $40,000. I afterward rode out, that night, to Major Snyder's house on North Beach, saw him, and he agreed to meet me at 8 a.m. next day, at the United States Mint, and to pay the check, so that I could have the money before the bank opened. The next morning, as agreed on, we met, and he paid me the check in two sealed bags of gold coin, each marked $20,000, which I had carried to the bank, but never opened them, or even broke the seals. That morning our bank opened as usual, but there was no appearance of a continuation of the run. On the contrary, money began to come back on deposit, so that by night we had a considerable increase, and this went on from day to day, till nearly the old condition of things returned. After about three days, finding I had no use for the money obtained on Hammond's check, I took the identical two bags back to the cashier of the custom house, and recovered the two acceptances which had been surrendered as described. And Smiley's two notes were afterward paid in their due course, out of the cash received on those identical acceptances. But, years afterward, on settling with Hammond for the custom house contract when completed, there was a difference, and Smiley sued Lucas, Turner and Company. For money had and received for his benefit, being the identical $40,000 herein explained, but he lost his case. Hammond, too, was afterward removed from office, and indicted in part for this transaction. He was tried before the United States Circuit Court, Judge McAllister presiding, for a violation of the Sub-Treasury Act, but was acquitted. Our bank, having thus passed so well through the crisis, took at once a first rank. But these bank failures had caused so many mercantile losses, and had led to such an utter downfall in the value of real estate, that everybody lost more or less money by bad debts, by depreciation of stocks and collaterals, that became unsaleable. If not worthless. About this time, viz., February, 1855, I had exchanged my house on Green, Street, with Mr. Sloat, for the half of a fifty-vara lot on Harrison Street, between Fremont and First, on which there was a small cottage, and I had contracted for the building of a new frame house thereon, at six thousand dollars. This house was finished on the 9th of April, and my family moved into it at once. For some time Mrs. Sherman had been anxious to go home to Lancaster, Ohio, where we had left our daughter Minnie, with her grandparents, and we arranged that S. them. Bowman, E.S.Q., and wife, should move into our new house and board us, viz., Lizzie, Willie with the nurse Biddy, and myself, for a fair consideration. It so happened that two of my personal friends, Messrs. Winters and Cunningham of Marysville, and a young fellow named Egan, now a captain in the commissary department, were going east in the steamer of the middle of April, and that Mr. William H. Aspinwall, of New York, and Mr. Chauncey, of Philadelphia, were also going back, and they all offered to look to the personal comfort of Mrs. Sherman on the voyage. They took passage in the steamer Golden Age, Commodore Watkins, which sailed on April 17, 1855. Their passage down the coast was very pleasant till within a day's distance of Panama, when one bright moonlit night, April 29, the ship, running at full speed, between the islands Kibo and Kakara, struck on a sunken reef. Tore out a streak in her bottom, and at once began to fill with water. Fortunately she did not sink fast, but swung off into deep water, and Commodore Watkins happening to be on deck at the moment, walking with Mr. Aspinwall, learning that the water was rushing in with great rapidity, gave orders for a full head of steam, and turned the vessel's bow straight for the island Kakara. The water rose rapidly in the hold, the passengers were all assembled, fearful of going down, the fires were out, and the last revolution of the wheels made, when her bow touched gently on the beach, 
and the vessel's stern sank in deep water. Lines were got out, and the ship held in an upright position, so that the passengers were safe, and but little incommoded. I have often heard Mrs. Sherman tell of the boy Egan, then about fourteen years old, coming to her stateroom, and telling to her not to be afraid, as he was a good swimmer. But on coming out into the cabin, partially dressed, she felt more confidence in the cool manner, bearing, and greater strength of Mr. Winters. There must have been nearly a thousand souls on board at the time, few of whom could have been saved had the steamer gone down in mid-channel, which surely would have resulted, had not Commodore Watkins been on deck. Or had he been less prompt in his determination to beach his ship. A sailboat was dispatched toward Panama, which luckily met the steamer John T. Stevens, just coming out of the bay, loaded with about a thousand passengers bound for San Francisco, and she at once proceeded to the relief of the Golden Age. Her passengers were transferred in small boats to the Stevens, which vessel, with her two thousand people crowded together with hardly standing room, returned to Panama. Whence the passengers for the East proceeded to their destination without further delay. Luckily for Mrs. Sherman, Purser Goddard, an old Ohio friend of ours, was on the Stevens, and most kindly gave up his own room to her, and such lady friends as she included in her party. The Golden Age was afterward partially repaired at Kakara, pumped out, and steamed to Panama, when, after further repairs, she resumed her place in the line. I think she is still in existence, but Commodore Watkins afterward lost his life in China, by falling down a hatchway. Mrs. Sherman returned in the latter part of November of the same year, when Mr. and Mrs. Bowman, who meantime had bought a lot next to us and erected a house thereon, removed to it, and we thus continued close neighbors and friends until we left the country for good in 1857. During the summer of 1856, in San Francisco, occurred one of those unhappy events, too common to new countries, in which I became involved in spite of myself. William Neely Johnson was governor of California, and resided at Sacramento City. General John E. Wolt commanded the Department of California, having succeeded General Hitchcock, and had his headquarters at Benicia, and a Mr. Van Ness was mayor of the city. Politics had become a regular and profitable business, and politicians were more than suspected of being corrupt. It was reported and currently believed that the sheriff, Scannell, had been required to pay the Democratic Central Committee a hundred thousand dollars for his nomination, which was equivalent to an election. For an office of the nominal salary of twelve thousand dollars a year for four years. In the election all sorts of dishonesty were charged and believed, especially of ballot box stuffing, and too generally the better classes avoided the elections and dodged jury duty. So that the affairs of the city government necessarily passed into the hands of a low set of professional politicians. Among them was a man named James Casey, who edited a small paper, the printing office of which was in a room on the third floor of our banking office. I hardly knew him by sight, and rarely if ever saw his paper, but one day Mr. Sather, of the excellent banking firm of Drexel, Sather and Church, came to me, and called my attention to an article in Casey's paper so full of falsehood and malice, that we construed it as an effort to blackmail the banks generally. At that time we were all laboring to restore confidence, which had been so rudely shaken by the panic, and I went upstairs, found Casey, and pointed out to him the objectionable nature of his article. Told him plainly that I could not tolerate his attempt to print and circulate slanders in our building, and, if he repeated it, I would cause him and his press to be thrown out of the windows. He took the hint and moved to more friendly quarters. I mention this fact, to show my estimate of the man, who became a figure in the drama I am about to describe. James King of W.M. As before explained, was in 1853 a banker on his own account, but sometime in 1854 he had closed out his business, and engaged with Adams and Company as cashier. When this firm failed, he, in common with all the employees, was thrown out of employment, and had to look around for something else. He settled down to the publication of an evening paper, called The Bulletin, and, being a man of fine manners and address, he at once constituted himself the champion of society against the public and private characters whom he saw fit to arraign. As might have been expected, 
This soon brought him into the usual newspaper war with other editors, and especially with Casey, and epithets of La Eatonsville were soon bandying back and forth between them. One evening of May, 1856, King published, in the Bulletin, copies of papers procured from New York, to show that Casey had once been sentenced to the state penitentiary at Sing Sing. Casey took mortal offense, and called at the Bulletin office, on the corner of Montgomery and Merchant Streets, where he found King, and violent words passed between them, resulting in Casey giving King notice that he would shoot him on sight. King remained in his office till about 5 or 6 p.m., when he started toward his home on Stockton Street, and, as he neared the corner of Washington, Casey approached him from the opposite direction, called to him, and began firing. King had on a short cloak, and in his breast pocket a small pistol, which he did not use. One of Casey's shots struck him high up in the breast, from which he reeled, was caught by some passing friend, and carried into the express office on the corner, where he was laid on the counter, and a surgeon sent for. Casey escaped up Washington Street, went to the city hall, and delivered himself to the sheriff, Scannell, who conveyed him to jail and locked him in a cell. Meantime, the news spread like wildfire, and all the city was in commotion, for Grog was very popular. Nisbet, who boarded with us on Harrison Street, had been delayed at the bank later than usual, so that he happened to be near at the time, and, when he came out to dinner, he brought me the news of this affair. And said that there was every appearance of a riot downtown that night. This occurred toward the evening of May 14, 1856. It so happened that, on the urgent solicitation of Van Winkle and of Governor Johnson, I had only a few days before agreed to accept the commission of Major General of the 2nd Division of Militia, embracing San Francisco. I had received the commission, but had not as yet formally accepted it, or even put myself in communication with the volunteer companies of the city. Of these, at that moment of time, there was a company of artillery with four guns, commanded by a Captain Johns, formerly of the army, and two or three uniformed companies of infantry. After dinner I went downtown to see what was going on. Found that King had been removed to a room in the Metropolitan Block, that his life was in great peril. That Casey was safe in jail, and the sheriff had called to his assistance a posse of the city police, some citizens, and one of the militia companies. The people were gathered in groups on the streets, and the words, Vigilance Committee, were freely spoken, but I saw no signs of immediate violence. The next morning, I again went to the jail, and found all things quiet, but the militia had withdrawn. I then went to the city hall, saw the mayor, Van Ness, and some of the city officials, agreed to do what I could to maintain order with such militia as were on hand, and then formally accepted the commission, and took the oath. In 1851, when I was not in California, there had been a vigilance committee, and it was understood that its organization still existed. All the newspapers took ground in favor of the Vigilance Committee, except the Herald, John Nugent, editor, and nearly all the best people favored that means of redress. I could see they were organizing, hiring rendezvous, collecting arms, etc. Without concealment. It was soon manifest that the companies of volunteers would go with the committee, and that the public authorities could not rely on them for aid or defense. Still, there were a good many citizens who contended that, if the civil authorities were properly sustained by the people at large, they could and would execute the law. But the papers inflamed the public mind, and the controversy spread to the country. About the third day after the shooting of King, Governor Johnson telegraphed me that he would be down in the evening boat, and asked me to meet him on arrival for consultation. I got C. H. Garrison to go with me, and we met the governor and his brother on the wharf, and walked up to the International Hotel on Jackson Street, above Montgomery. We discussed the state of affairs fully. And Johnson, on learning that his particular friend, William T. Coleman, was the president of the Vigilance Committee, proposed to go and see him. En route we stopped at King's room, ascertained that he was slowly sinking, and could not live long. And then near midnight we walked to the Turnverein Hall, where the committee was known to be sitting in consultation. This hall was on Bush Street, at about the intersection of Stockton. It was all lighted up within, but the door was locked. The governor knocked at the door, 
and on inquiry from inside, who's there? Gave his name. After some delay we were admitted into a sort of vestibule, beyond which was a large hall, and we could hear the suppressed voices of a multitude. We were shown into a bar room to the right, when the governor asked to see Coleman. The man left us, went into the main hall, and soon returned with Coleman, who was pale and agitated. After shaking hands all round, the governor said, Coleman, what the devil is the matter here? Coleman said, Governor, it is time this shooting on our streets should stop. The governor replied, I agree with you perfectly, and have come down, from Sacramento to assist. Coleman rejoined that, the people were tired of it, and had no faith in the officers of the law. A general conversation then followed, in which it was admitted that King would die, and that Casey must be executed. But the manner of execution was the thing to be settled, Coleman contending that the people would do it without trusting the courts or the sheriff. It so happened that at that time Judge Norton was on the bench of the court having jurisdiction, and he was universally recognized as an able and upright man, whom no one could or did mistrust. And it also happened that a grand jury was then in session. Johnson argued that the time had passed in California for mobs and vigilance committees, and said if Coleman and associates would use their influence to support the law, he, the governor, would undertake that, as soon as King died. The grand jury should indict, that Judge Norton would try the murderer, and the whole proceeding should be as speedy as decency would allow. Then Coleman said, the people had no confidence in Scannell, the sheriff, who was, he said, in collusion with the rowdy element of San Francisco. Johnson then offered to be personally responsible that Casey should be safely guarded, and should be forthcoming for trial and execution at the proper time. I remember very well Johnson's assertion that he had no right to make these stipulations, and maybe no power to fulfill them, but he did it to save the city and state from the disgrace of a mob. Coleman disclaimed that the vigilance organization was a mob, admitted that the proposition of the governor was fair, and all he or anyone should ask. And added, if we would wait a while, he would submit it to the council, and bring back an answer. We waited nearly an hour, and could hear the hum of voices in the hall, but no words, when Coleman came back, accompanied by a committee, of which I think the two brothers Arrington, Thomas Smiley the auctioneer, Seymour, Truett, and others, were members. The whole conversation was gone over again, and the governor's proposition was positively agreed to, with this further condition, that the vigilance committee should send into the jail a small force of their own men. To make certain that Casey should not be carried off or allowed to escape. The governor, his brother William, Garrison, and I, then went up to the jail, where we found the sheriff and his posse comitatus of police and citizens. These were styled the Law and Order Party, and some of them took offense that the governor should have held communication with the damned rebels, and several of them left the jail. But the sheriff seemed to agree with the governor that what he had done was right and best. And, while we were there, some eight or ten armed men arrived from the vigilance committee, and were received by the sheriff, Scannell, as a part of his regular posse. The governor then, near daylight, went to his hotel, and I to my house for a short sleep. Next day I was at the bank, as usual, when, about noon the governor called. And asked me to walk with him down street he said he had just received a message from the vigilance committee to the effect that they were not bound by Coleman's promise not to do anything till the regular trial by jury should be had, etc. He was with reason furious, and asked me to go with him to Truett's store, over which the executive committee was said to be in session. We were admitted to a front room upstairs, and heard voices in the back room. The governor inquired for Coleman, but he was not forthcoming. Another of the committee, Seymour, met us, denied in toto the promise of the night before, and the governor openly accused him of treachery and falsehood. The quarrel became public, and the newspapers took it up, both parties turning on the governor, one, the vigilantes, denying the promise made by Coleman, their president. And the other, the law and order party, refusing any farther assistance, because Johnson had stooped to make terms with rebels. At all events, he was powerless, and had to let matters drift to a conclusion. King died about Friday, May 20, and the funeral was appointed for the next Sunday. 
Early on that day the governor sent for me at my house. I found him on the roof of the International, from which we looked down on the whole city, and more especially the face of Telegraph Hill, which was already covered with a crowd of people, while others were moving toward the jail on Broadway. Parties of armed men, in good order, were marching by platoons in the same direction, and formed in line along Broadway, facing the jail door. Soon a small party was seen to advance to this door, and knock. A parley ensued, the doors were opened, and Casey was led out. In a few minutes another prisoner was brought out, who, proved to be Cora, a man who had once been tried for killing Richardson, the United States Marshal, when the jury disagreed, and he was awaiting a new trial. These prisoners were placed in carriages, and escorted by the armed force down to the rooms of the Vigilance Committee, through the principal streets of the city. The day was exceedingly beautiful, and the whole proceeding was orderly in the extreme. I was under the impression that Casey and Cora were hanged that same Sunday, but was probably in error. But in a very few days they were hanged by the neck, dead, suspended from beams projecting from the windows of the committee's rooms, without other trial than could be given in secret, and by night. We all thought the matter had ended there, and accordingly the governor returned to Sacramento in disgust, and I went about my business. But it soon became manifest that the Vigilance Committee had no intention to surrender the power thus usurped. They took a building on Clay Street, near front, fortified it, employed guards and armed sentinels, sat in midnight council, issued writs of arrest and banishment, and utterly ignored all authority but their own. A good many men were banished and forced to leave the country, but they were of that class we could well spare. Yankee Sullivan, a prisoner in their custody, committed suicide, and a feeling of general insecurity pervaded the city. Business was deranged, and the bulletin, then under control of Tom King, a brother of James, poured out its abuse on some of our best men, as well as the worst. Governor Johnson, being again appealed to, concluded to go to work regularly, and telegraphed me about the 1st of June to meet him at General Wool's headquarters at Benicia that night. I went up, and we met at the hotel where General Wool was boarding. Johnson had with him his Secretary of State. We discussed the state of the country generally, and I had agreed that if Wool would give us arms and ammunition out of the United States arsenal at Benicia, and if Commodore Farragut, of the Navy, commanding the Navy Yard on Mare Island, would give us a ship, I would call out volunteers, and, when a sufficient number had responded, I would have the arms come down from Benicia in the ship, arm my men. Take possession of a 32-pound gun battery at the Marine Hospital on Rincon Point, thence command a dispersion of the unlawfully armed force of the Vigilance Committee, and arrest some of the leaders. We played cards that night, carrying on a conversation, in which Wool insisted on a proclamation commanding the Vigilance Committee to disperse, etc. And he told us how he had on some occasion, as far back as 1814, suppressed a mutiny on the northern frontier. I did not understand him to make any distinct promise of assistance that night, but he invited us to accompany him on an inspection of the arsenal the next day, which we did. On handling some rifled muskets in the arsenal storehouse he asked me how they would answer our purpose. I said they were the very things, and that we did not want cartridge boxes or belts, but that I would have the cartridges carried in the breeches pockets, and the caps in the vest pockets. I knew that there were stored in that arsenal four thousand muskets, for I recognized the boxes which we had carried out in the Lexington around Cape Horn in 1846. Afterward we all met at the quarters of Captain D.R. Jones of the Army, and I saw the Secretary of State, D. F. Douglas, E.S.Q. Walk out with General Wool in earnest conversation, and this Secretary of State afterward asserted that Wool there and then promised us the arms and ammunition, provided the Governor would make his proclamation for the committee to disperse. And that I should afterward call out the militia, etc. On the way back to the hotel at Benicia, General Wool, Captain Callender of the Arsenal, and I, were walking side by side. And I was telling him, General Wool, that I would also need some ammunition for the 32-pound guns then in position at Rinian Point, when Wool turned to Callender and inquired, did I not order those guns to be brought away? Callender said, yes, General. I made a requisition on the quartermaster for transportation, but his schooner has been so busy that the guns are still there. Then said Wool, 
let them remain, we may have use for them. I therefrom inferred, of course, that it was all agreed to so far as he was concerned. Soon after we had reached the hotel, we ordered a buggy, and Governor Johnson and I drove to Vallejo, six miles, crossed over to Mare Island, and walked up to the Commandant's house, where we found Commodore Farragut and his family. We stated our business fairly, but the Commodore answered very frankly that he had no authority, without orders from his department, to take any part in civil broils, he doubted the wisdom of the attempt. Said he had no ship available except the John Adams, Captain Boutwell, and that she needed repairs. But he assented at last, to the proposition to let the sloop John Adams drop down abreast of the city after certain repairs, to lie off there for moral effect, which afterward actually occurred. We then returned to Benicia, and Wool's first question was, what luck? We answered, not much, and explained what Commodore Farragut could and would do, and that, instead of having a naval vessel, we would seize and use one of the Pacific Mail Company's steamers, lying at their dock in Benicia. To carry down to San Francisco the arms and munitions when the time came. As the time was then near at hand for the arrival of the evening boats, we all walked down to the wharf together, where I told Johnson that he could not be too careful, that I had not heard General Wool make a positive promise of assistance. Upon this, Johnson called General Wool to one side, and we three drew together. Johnson said, General Wool, General Sherman is very particular, and wants to know exactly what you propose to do. Wool answered, I understand, Governor, that in the first place a writ of habeas corpus will be issued commanding the jailers of the Vigilance Committee to produce the body of some one of the prisoners held by them, which, of course, will be refused. That you then issue your proclamation commanding them to disperse, and, failing this, you will call out the militia, and command General Sherman with it to suppress the Vigilance Committee as an unlawful body. To which the governor responded, yes. Then, said Wool, on General Sherman's making his requisition, approved by you, I will order the issue of the necessary arms and ammunition. I remember well that I said, emphatically, that is all I want. Now, Governor, you may go ahead. We soon parted, Johnson and Douglas taking the boat to Sacramento, and I to San Francisco. The Chief Justice, Terry, came to San Francisco the next day, issued a writ of habeas corpus for the body of one Maloney, which writ was resisted, as we expected. The governor then issued his proclamation, and I published my orders, dated June 4, 1855. The quartermaster general of the state, General Kibbe, also came to San Francisco, took an office in the city hall, engaged several rooms for armories, and soon the men began to enroll into companies. In my general orders calling out the militia, I used the expression, when a sufficient number of men are enrolled, arms and ammunition will be supplied. Some of the best men of the vigilantes came to me and remonstrated, saying that collision would surely result, that it would be terrible, etc. All I could say in reply was, that it was for them to get out of the way. Remove your fort. Cease your midnight councils, and prevent your armed bodies from patrolling the streets. They inquired where I was to get arms, and I answered that I had them certain. But personally I went right along with my business at the bank, conscious that at any moment we might have trouble. Another committee of citizens, a conciliatory body, was formed to prevent collision if possible, and the newspapers boiled over with vehement vituperation. This second committee was composed of such men as Crockett, Ritchie, Thornton, Bailey Payton, Foote, Donahue, Kelly, and others, a class of the most intelligent and wealthy men of the city, who earnestly and honestly desired to prevent bloodshed. They also came to me, and I told them that our men were enrolling very fast, and that, when I deemed the right moment had come, the Vigilance Committee must disperse, else bloodshed and destruction of property would inevitably follow. They also had discovered that the better men of the Vigilance Committee itself were getting tired of the business, and thought that in the execution of K.C. and Cora, and the banishment of a dozen or more rowdies, they had done enough. And were then willing to stop. It was suggested that, if our law and order party would not arm, by a certain day near at hand the committee would disperse, and some of their leaders would submit to an indictment and trial by a jury of citizens. Which they knew would acquit them of crime. 
One day in the bank a man called me to the counter and said, if you expect to get arms of General Wu, you will be mistaken, for I was at Benicia yesterday and heard him say he would not give them. This person was known to me to be a man of truth, and I immediately wrote to General Wu a letter telling him what I had heard, and how any hesitation on his part would compromise me as a man of truth and honor. Adding that I did not believe we should ever need the arms, but only the promise of them, for, the committee was letting down, and would soon disperse and submit to the law, etc. I further asked him to answer me categorically that very night, by the Stockton boat, which would pass Benicia on its way down about midnight, and I would sit up and wait for his answer. I did wait for his letter, but it did not come, and the next day I got a telegraphic dispatch from Governor Johnson, who, at Sacramento, had also heard of General Wool's back down, asking me to meet him again at Benicia that night. I went up in the evening boat, and found General Wool's aide de camp Captain Arnold, of the army, on the wharf, with a letter in his hand, which he said was for me. I asked for it, but he said he knew its importance, and preferred we should go to General Wool's room together, and the general could hand it to me in person. We did go right up to General Wool's, who took the sealed parcel and laid it aside, saying that it was literally a copy of one he had sent to Governor Johnson, who would doubtless give me a copy. But I insisted that I had made a written communication, and was entitled to a written answer. At that moment several gentlemen of the conciliation party, who had come up in the same steamer with me, asked for admission and came in. I recall the names of Crockett, Foote, Bailey Payton, Judge Thornton, Donahue, etc. And the conversation became general, while trying to explain away the effect of our misunderstanding, taking good pains not to deny his promise made to me personally on the wharf. I renewed my application for the letter addressed to me, then lying on his table. On my statement of the case, Bailey Payton said, General Wool, I think General Sherman has a right to a written answer from you, for he is surely compromised. Upon this Wool handed me the letter. I opened and read it, and it denied any promise of arms, but otherwise was extremely evasive and noncommittal. I had heard of the arrival at the wharf of the governor and party, and was expecting them at Wool's room, but, instead of stopping at the hotel where we were, they passed to another hotel on the block above. I went up and found there, in a room on the second floor over the barroom, Governor Johnson, Chief Justice Terry, Jones, of Palmer, Cook and Company, E. D. Baker, Volney E. Howard, and one or two others. All were talking furiously against Wool, denouncing him as a D. D. liar, and not sparing the severest terms. I showed the Governor General Wool's letter to me, which he said was in effect the same as the one addressed to and received by him at Sacramento. He was so offended that he would not even call on General Wool, and said he would never again recognize him as an officer or gentleman. We discussed matters generally, and Judge Terry said that the Vigilance Committee were a set of D. Deport merchants, that they were getting scared, and that General Wool was in collusion with them to bring the state into contempt, etc. I explained that there were no arms in the state except what General Wool had, or what were in the hands of the Vigilance Committee of San Francisco, and that the part of wisdom for us was to be patient and cautious. About that time Crockett and his associates sent up their cards, but Terry and the more violent of the governor's followers denounced them as no better than vigilantes, and wanted the governor to refuse even to receive them. I explained that they were not vigilantes, that Judge Thornton was a law and order man, was one of the first to respond to the call of the sheriff. And that he went actually to the jail with his one arm the night we expected the first attempt at rescue, etc. Johnson then sent word for them to reduce their business to writing. They simply sent in a written request for an audience, and they were then promptly admitted. After some general conversation, the governor said he was prepared to hear them, when Mr. Crockett rose and made a prepared speech embracing a clear and fair statement of the condition of things in San Francisco. Concluding with the assertion of the willingness of the committee to disband and submit to trial after a certain date not very remote. All the time Crockett was speaking, Terry sat with his hat on, drawn over his eyes, and with his feet on a table. As soon as Crockett was through, they were dismissed, and Johnson began to prepare a written answer. This was scratched, altered, and amended, to suit the notions of his counselors, 
and at last was copied and sent. This answer amounted to little or nothing. Seeing that we were powerless for good, and that violent counsels would prevail under the influence of Terry and others, I sat down at the table, and wrote my resignation, which Johnson accepted in a complimentary note on the spot. And at the same time he appointed to my place General Volney E. Howard, then present, a lawyer who had once been a member of Congress from Texas, and who was expected to drive the D. D. Port merchants into the bay at short notice. I went soon after to General Wool's room, where I found Crockett and the rest of his party, told them that I was out of the fight, having resigned my commission, that I had neglected business that had been entrusted to me by my St. Louis partners. And that I would thenceforward mind my own business, and leave public affairs severely alone. We all returned to San Francisco that night by the Stockton boat, and I never afterward had anything to do with politics in California, perfectly satisfied with that short experience. Johnson and Wool fought out their quarrel of veracity in the newspapers and on paper. But, in my opinion, there is not a shadow of doubt that General Wool did deliberately deceive us. That he had authority to issue arms, and that, had he adhered to his promise, we could have checked the committee before it became a fixed institution, and a part of the common law of California. Major General Volney E. Howard came to San Francisco soon after, continued the organization of militia which I had begun, succeeded in getting a few arms from the country. But one day the Vigilance Committee sallied from their armories, captured the arms of the Law and Order Party, put some of their men into prison, while General Howard, with others, escaped to the country. After which the Vigilance Committee had it all their own way. Subsequently, in July, 1856, they arrested Chief Justice Terry, and tried him for stabbing one of their constables, but he managed to escape at night, and took refuge on the John Adams. In August, they hanged Hetherington and Brace in broad daylight, without any jury trial, and, soon after, they quietly disbanded. As they controlled the press, they wrote their own history, and the world generally gives them the credit of having purged San Francisco of rowdies and roughs. But their success has given great stimulus to a dangerous principle, that would at any time justify the mob in seizing all the power of government. And who is to say that the Vigilance Committee may not be composed of the worst, instead of the best, elements of a community? Indeed, in San Francisco, as soon as it was demonstrated that the real power had passed from the city hall to the committee room, the same set of bailiffs, constables, and rowdies that had infested the city hall were found in the employment of the vigilantes. And, after three months' experience, the better class of people became tired of the midnight sessions and left the business and power of the committee in the hands of a court, of which a Sydney man was reported to be the head or chief justice. During the winter of 1855-56, and indeed throughout the year 1856, all kinds of business became unsettled in California. The mines continued to yield about 50 millions of gold a year. But little attention was paid to agriculture or to any business other than that of mining, and, as the placer gold was becoming worked out, the miners were restless and uneasy, and were shifting about from place to place. Impelled by rumors put afloat for speculative purposes. A great many extensive enterprises by joint stock companies had been begun, in the way of water ditches, to bring water from the head of the mountain streams down to the richer alluvial deposits. And nearly all of these companies became embarrassed or bankrupt. Foreign capital, also, which had been attracted to California by reason of the high rates of interest, was being withdrawn, or was tied up in property which could not be sold. And, although our banks having withstood the panic gave us great credit, still the community itself was shaken, and loans of money were risky in the extreme. A great many merchants, of the highest name, availed themselves of the extremely liberal bankrupt law to get discharged of their old debts, without sacrificing much, if any, of their stocks of goods on hand, except a lawyer's fee. Thus realizing Martin Burke's saying that, many a clever fellow had been ruined by paying his debts. The merchants and businessmen of San Francisco did not intend to be ruined by such a course. I raised the rate of exchange from three to three and a half, while others kept on at the old rate, and I labored hard to collect old debts, and strove, in making new loans, to be on the safe side. 
The state and city both denied much of their public debt, in fact, repudiated it, and real estate, which the year before had been first-class security, became utterly unsaleable. The office labor and confinement, and the anxiety attending the business, aggravated my asthma to such an extent that at times it deprived me of sleep and threatened to become chronic and serious. And I was also conscious that the first and original cause which had induced Mr. Lucas to establish the bank in California had ceased. I so reported to him, and that I really believed that he could use his money more safely and to better advantage in St. Louis. This met his prompt approval, and he instructed me gradually to draw out, preparatory to a removal to New York City. Accordingly, early in April, 1857, I published an advertisement in the San Francisco papers, notifying our customers that, on the first day of May, we would discontinue business and remove East, requiring all to withdraw their accounts. And declaring that, if any remained on that day of May, their balances would be transferred to the banking house of Parrot and Company. Punctually to the day, this was done, and the business of Lucas, Turner and Company of San Francisco, was discontinued, except the more difficult and disagreeable part of collecting their own monies and selling the real estate, to which the firm had succeeded by purchase or foreclosure. One of the partners, B. R. Nisbet, assisted by our attorney, S. M. Bowman, E.S.Q., remained behind to close up the business of the bank. 6. California, New York, and Kansas. 1857-1859. Having closed the bank at San Francisco on the first day of May, 1857, accompanied by my family I embarked in the steamer Sonora for Panama, crossed the Isthmus, and sailed to New York, whence we proceeded to Lancaster, Ohio, where Mrs. Sherman and the family stopped, and I went on to St. Louis. I found there that some changes had been made in the parent, house, that Mr. Lucas had bought out his partner, Captain Simons, and that the firm's name had been changed to that of James H. Lucas and Company. It had also been arranged that an office or branch was to be established in New York City, of which I was to have charge, on pretty much the same terms and conditions as in the previous San Francisco firm. Mr. Lucas, Major Turner, and I, agreed to meet in New York, soon after the 4th of July. We met accordingly at the Metropolitan Hotel, selected an office, no. 12, Paul Street, purchased the necessary furniture, and engaged a teller, bookkeeper, and porter. The new firm was to bear the same title of Lucas, Turner and Company. With about the same partners in interest, but the nature of the business was totally different. We opened our office on the 21st of July, 1857, and at once began to receive accounts from the West and from California, but our chief business was as the resident agents of the St. Louis firm of James H. Lucas & Company. Personally I took rooms at No. 100, Prince Street, in which house were also quartered Major J. G. Barnard, and Lieutenant J. B. McPherson, United States Engineers, both of whom afterward attained great fame in the Civil War. My business relations in New York were with the Metropolitan Bank and Bank of America, and with the very wealthy and most respectable firm of Shutchhart and Gebhardt, of Nassau Street. Everything went along swimmingly till the 21st of August, when all Wall Street was thrown into a spasm by the failure of the Ohio Life and Trust Company, and the panic so resembled that in San Francisco, that, having nothing seemingly at stake, I felt amused. But it soon became a serious matter even to me. Western stocks and securities tumbled to such a figure, that all Western banks that held such securities, and had procured advances thereon, were compelled to pay up or substitute increased collaterals. Our own house was not a borrower in New York at all, but many of our Western correspondents were, and it taxed my tune to watch their interests. In September, the panic extended so as to threaten the safety of even some of the New York banks not connected with the West, and the alarm became general, and at last universal. In the very midst of this panic came the news that the steamer Central America, formerly the George Law, with 600 passengers and about $1,600,000 of treasure, coming from Aspinwall, had foundered at sea. Off the coast of Georgia, and that about 60 of the passengers had been providentially picked up by a Swedish bark, and brought into Savannah. 
The absolute loss of this treasure went to swell the confusion and panic of the day. A few days after, I was standing in the vestibule of the Metropolitan Hotel, and heard the captain of the Swedish bark tell his singular story of the rescue of these passengers. He was a short, sailor-like looking man, with a strong German or Swedish accent. He said that he was sailing from some port in Honduras for Sweden, running down the Gulf Stream off Savannah. The weather had been heavy for some days, and, about nightfall, as he paced his deck, he observed a man-of-war hawk circle about his vessel, gradually lowering, until the bird was as it were aiming at him. He jerked out a belaying pin, struck at the bird, missed it, when the hawk again rose high in the air, and a second time began to descend, contract his circle, and make at him again. The second time he hit the bird, and struck it to the deck. This strange fact made him uneasy, and he thought it betokened danger, he went to the binnacle, saw the course he was steering, and without any particular reason he ordered the steersman to alter the course one point to the east. After this it became quite dark, and he continued to promenade the deck, and had settled into a drowsy state, when as in a dream he thought he heard voices all round his ship. Waking up, he ran to the side of the ship, saw something struggling in the water, and heard clearly cries for help. Instantly heaving his ship to, and lowering all his boats, he managed to pick up sixty or more persons who were floating about on skylights, doors, spare, and whatever fragments remained of the Central America. Had he not changed the course of his vessel by reason of the mysterious conduct of that man-of-war hawk, not a soul would probably have survived the night. It was stated by the rescued passengers, among whom was Billy Birch, that the Central America had sailed from Aspinwall with the passengers and freight which left San Francisco on the 1st of September, and encountered the gale in the Gulf Stream somewhere off Savannah, in which she sprung a leak, filled rapidly, and went down. The passengers who were saved had clung to doors, skylights, and such floating objects as they could reach, and were thus rescued, all the rest, some five hundred in number, had gone down with the ship. The panic grew worse and worse, and about the end of September there was a general suspension of the banks of New York, and a money crisis extended all over the country. In New York, Lucas, Turner and Company had nothing at risk. We had large cash balances in the Metropolitan Bank and in the Bank of America, all safe, and we held, for the account of the St. Louis House, at least $200,000, of ST. Lewis City and County bonds, and of acceptances falling due right along, none extending beyond 90 days. I was advised from St. Louis that money matters were extremely tight, but I did not dream of any danger in that quarter. I knew well that Mr. Lucas was worth two or three million dollars in the best real estate, and inferred from the large balances to their credit with me that no mere panic could shake his credit, but, early on the morning of October 7, my cousin, James M. Hoyt, came to me in bed, and read me a paragraph in the morning paper, to the effect that James H., Lucas and Company, of St. Louis, had suspended. I was, of course, surprised, but not sorry. For I had always contended that a man of so much visible wealth as Mr. Lucas should not be engaged in a business subject to such vicissitudes. I hurried down to the office, where I received the same information officially, by telegraph, with instructions to make proper disposition of the affairs of the bank, and to come out to St. Louis, with such assets as would be available there. I transferred the funds belonging to all our correspondents, with lists of outstanding checks, to one or other of our bankers, and with the cash balance of the St. Louis house and their available assets started for St. Louis. I may say with confidence that no man lost a cent by either of the banking firms of Lucas, Turner and Company, of San Francisco or New York, but, as usual, those who owed us were not always as just. I reached his tea. Lewis October 17th, and found the partners engaged in liquidating the balances due depositors as fast as collections could be forced, and, as the panic began to subside, this process became quite rapid, and Mr. Lucas, by making a loan in Philadelphia, was enabled to close out all accounts without having made any serious sacrifices, of course, no person ever lost a cent by him, he has recently died, leaving an estate of $8 million. During his lifetime, 
I had opportunities to know him well, and take much pleasure in bearing testimony to his great worth and personal kindness. On the failure of his bank, he assumed personally all the liabilities, released his partners of all responsibility, and offered to assist me to engage in business, which he supposed was due to me because I had resigned my army commission. I remained in St. Louis till the 17th of December, 1857, assisting in collecting for the bank, and in controlling all matters which came from the New York and San Francisco branches. B. R. Nisbet was still in San Francisco, but had married a Miss Thornton, and was coming home. There still remained in California a good deal of real estate, and notes, valued at about $200,000 in the aggregate, so that, at Mr. Lucas's request, I agreed to go out again, to bring matters, if possible, nearer a final settlement. I accordingly left ST. Lewis, reached Lancaster, where my family was, on the 10th, stayed there till after Christmas, and then went to New York, where I remained till January 5th, when I embarked on the steamer Moles Taylor, Captain McGowan, for Aspinwall. Caught the Golden Gate, Captain Whiting, at Panama, January 15, 1858, and reached San Francisco on the 28th of January. I found that Nisbet and wife had gone to St. Louis, and that we had passed each other at sea. He had carried the ledger and books to St. Louis, but left a schedule, notes, etc., in the hands of S. M. Bowman, E.S.Q., who passed them over to me. On the 30th of January I published a notice of the dissolution of the partnership, and called on all who were still indebted to the firm of Lucas, Turner and Company to pay up, or the notes would be sold at auction. I also advertised that all the real property, was for sale. Business had somewhat changed since 1857. Parrot and Company, Garrison, Fritz and Ralston, Wells, Fargo and Company, Drexel, Sather and Church, and Talent and Wild, were the principal bankers. Property continued almost unsaleable, and prices were less than a half of what they had been in 1853-54. William Blending, ESQ, had rented my house on Harrison Street, so I occupied a room in the bank, no. 11, and boarded at the Meg's house, corner of Broadway in Montgomery, which we owned. Having reduced expenses to a minimum, I proceeded, with all possible dispatch, to collect outstanding debts, in some instances making sacrifices and compromises. I made some few sales, and generally aimed to put matters in such a shape that time would bring the best result. Some of our heaviest creditors were John M. Rhodes and Company, of Sacramento and Shasta, Langton and Company, of Downeyville, and E. M. Stranger of Murphy's. In trying to put these debts in course of settlement, I made some arrangement in Downeyville with the law firm of Spears and Thornton, to collect, by suit, a certain note of Green and Purdy for $12,000. Early in April, I learned that Spears had collected $3,700 in money, had appropriated it to his own use, and had pledged another good note taken in part payment of $3,053. He pretended to be insane. I had to make two visits to Downeyville on this business, and there, made the acquaintance of Mr. Stewart, now a senator from Nevada. He was married to a daughter of Governor Foote. Was living in a small frame house on the bar just below the town, and his little daughter was playing about the door in the sand. Stewart was then a lawyer in Downeyville, in good practice. Afterward, by some lucky stroke, became part owner of a valuable silver mine in Nevada, and is now accounted a millionaire. I managed to save something out of Spears, and more out of his partner Thornton. This affair of Spears ruined him, because his insanity was manifestly feigned. I remained in San Francisco till July 3d, when, having collected and remitted every cent that I could raise, and got all the property in the best shape possible, hearing from St. Lewis that business had revived, and that there was no need of further sacrifice, I put all the papers, with a full letter of instructions, and power of attorney, in the hands of William Blending, ESQ. And took passage on the good steamer Golden Gate, Captain Whiting, for Panama and home. I reached Lancaster on July 28, 1858, and found all the family well. I was then perfectly unhampered, but the serious and greater question remained, what was I to do to support my family, 
consisting of a wife and four children, all accustomed to more than the average comforts of life. I remained at Lancaster all of August, 1858, during which time I was discussing with Mr. Ewing and others what to do next. Major Turner and Mr. Lucas, in St. Louis, were willing to do anything to aid me, but I thought best to keep independent. Mr. Ewing had property at Chauncey, consisting of salt wells and coal mines, but for that part of Ohio I had no fancy. Two of his sons, Hugh and T. E., Jr., had established themselves at Leavenworth, Kansas, where they and their father had bought a good deal of land, some near the town, and some back in the country. Mr. Ewing offered to confide to me the general management of his share of interest, and Hugh and T. E., Jr., offered me an equal copartnership in their law firm. Accordingly, about the 1st of September, I started for Kansas, stopping a couple of weeks in St. Louis, and reached Leavenworth. I found about two miles below the fort, on the river bank, where in 1851 was a tangled thicket, quite a handsome and thriving city, growing rapidly in rivalry with Kansas City and St. Joseph, Missouri. After looking about and consulting with friends, among them my classmate Major Stuart Van Vliet, quartermaster at the fort, I concluded to accept the proposition of Mr. Ewing, and accordingly the firm of Sherman and Ewing was duly announced, and our services to the public offered as attorneys at law. We had an office on Main Street, between Shawnee and Delaware, on the second floor, over the office of Hampton Denman, ESQ, mayor of the city. This building was a mere shell, and our office was reached by a stairway on the outside. Although in the course of my military reading I had studied a few of the ordinary law books, such as Blackstone, Kent, Starkey, etc., I did not presume to be a lawyer, but our agreement was that Thomas Ewing, Jr., a good and thorough lawyer, should manage all business in the courts, while I gave attention to collections, agencies for houses and lands, and such business as my experience in banking had qualified me for. Yet, as my name was embraced in a law firm, it seemed to me proper to take out a license. Accordingly, one day when United States Judge LeCompte was in our office, I mentioned the matter to him. He told me to go down to the clerk of his court, and he would give me the license. I inquired what examination I would have to submit to, and he replied, none at all, he would admit me on the ground of general intelligence. During that summer we got our share of the business of the profession, then represented by several eminent law firms, embracing names that have since flourished in the Senate and in the higher courts of the country. But the most lucrative single case was given me by my friend Major Van Vliet, who employed me to go to Fort Riley, 136 miles west of Fort Leavenworth, to superintend the repairs to the military road. For this purpose he supplied me with a four-mule ambulance and driver. The country was then sparsely settled, and quite as many Indians were along the road as white people. Still there were embryo towns all along the route, and a few farms sprinkled over the beautiful prairies. On reaching Indianola, near Topeka, I found everybody down with the chills and fever. My own driver became so shaky that I had to act as driver and cook. But in due season I reconnoitred the road, and made contracts for repairing some bridges, and for cutting such parts of the road as needed it. I then returned to Fort Leavenworth, and reported, receiving a fair compensation. On my way up I met Colonel Sumner's column, returning from their summer scout on the plains, and spent the night with the officers, among whom were Captain Sackett, Sturgis, etc. Also at Fort Riley I was cordially received and entertained by some old army friends, among them Major Sedgwick, Captains Tot, Eli Long, etc. Mrs. Sherman and children arrived out in November, and we spent the winter very comfortably in the house of Thomas Ewing, Jr., on the corner of 3rd and Pottawatomie Streets. On the 1st of January, 1859, Daniel McCook, ESQ, was admitted to membership in our firm, which became Sherman, Ewing and McCook. Our business continued to grow, but, as the income hardly sufficed for three such expensive personages, I continued to look about for something more certain and profitable, and during that spring undertook for the Han. Thomas Ewing, of Ohio, to open a farm on a large tract of land he owned on Indian Creek, forty miles west of Leavenworth, for the benefit of his grandnephew, 
Henry Clark, and his grandniece, Mrs. Walker. These arrived out in the spring, by which time I had caused to be erected a small frame dwelling house, a barn, and fencing for a hundred acres. This helped to pass away time, but afforded little profit. And on the 11th of June, 1859, I wrote to Major D. C. Buell, Assistant Adjutant General, on duty in the War Department with Secretary of War Floyd, inquiring if there was a vacancy among the Army paymasters, or anything in his line that I could obtain. He replied promptly, and sent me the printed program for a military college about to be organized in Louisiana, and advised me to apply for the superintendent's place, saying that General G. Mason Graham, the half-brother of my old commanding general, R. B. to Mason, was very influential in this matter, and would doubtless befriend me on account of the relations that had existed between General Mason and myself in California. Accordingly, I addressed a letter of application to the Honorable R. C. Wycliffe, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, asking the answer to be sent to me at Lancaster, Ohio, where I proposed to leave my family. But, before leaving this branch of the subject, I must explain a little matter of which I have seen an account in print, complimentary or otherwise of the firm of Sherman, Ewing and McCook, more especially of the senior partner. One day, as I sat in our office, an Irishman came in and said he had a case and wanted a lawyer. I asked him to sit down and give me the points of his case, all the other members of the firm being out. Our client stated that he had rented a lot of an Irish landlord for five dollars a month, that he had erected thereon a small frame shanty, which was occupied by his family. That he had, paid his rent regularly up to a recent period, but to his house he had appended a shed which extended over a part of an adjoining vacant lot belonging to the same landlord, for which he was charged two and a half dollars a month. Which he refused to pay. The consequence was, that his landlord had for a few months declined even his five dollars monthly rent until the arrears amounted to about seventeen dollars, for which he was sued. I told him we would undertake his case, of which I took notes, and a fee of five dollars in advance, and in due order I placed the notes in the hands of McCook, and thought no more of it. A month or so after, our client rushed into the office and said his case had been called at Judge Gardner's, I think and he wanted his lawyer right away. I sent him up to the circuit court, Judge Pettits, for McCook, but he soon returned, saying he could not find McCook, and accordingly I hurried with him up to Judge Gardner's office, intending to ask a continuance, but I found our antagonist there. With his lawyer and witnesses, and Judge Gardner would not grant a continuance, so of necessity I had to act, hoping that at every minute McCook would come. But the trial proceeded regularly to its end, we were beaten, and judgment was entered against our client for the amount claimed, and costs. As soon as the matter was explained to McCook, he said, execution, could not be taken for ten days, and, as our client was poor, and had nothing on which the landlord could levy but his house, McCook advised him to get his neighbors together. To pick up the house, and carry it on to another vacant lot, belonging to a non-resident, so that even the house could not be taken in execution. Thus the grasping landlord, though successful in his judgment, failed in the execution, and our client was abundantly satisfied. In due time I closed up my business at Leavenworth, and went to Lancaster, Ohio, where, in July, 1859, I received notice from Governor Wycliffe that I had been elected superintendent of the proposed college. And inviting me to come down to Louisiana as early as possible, because they were anxious to put the college into operation by the 1st of January following. For this honorable position I was indebted to Major D. C. Buell and General G. Mason Graham, to whom I have made full and due acknowledgment. During the Civil War, it was reported and charged that I owed my position to the personal friendship of Generals Bragg and Beauregard, and that, in taking up arms against the South, I had been guilty of a breach of hospitality and friendship. I was not indebted to General Bragg, because he himself told me that he was not even aware that I was an applicant, and had favored the selection of Major Jenkins, another West Point graduate. General Beauregard had nothing whatever to do with the matter. 7. Louisiana. 1859-1861. In the autumn of 1859, having made arrangements for my family to remain in Lancaster, I proceeded, via Columbus, Cincinnati, and Louisville, to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 
where I reported for duty to Governor Wycliffe, who, by virtue of his office, was the president of the Board of Supervisors of the new institution over which I was called to preside. He explained to me the act of the legislature under which the institution was founded, told me that the building was situated near Alexandria, in the parish of Rapides, and was substantially finished. That the future management would rest with a board of supervisors, mostly citizens of Rapides Parish, where also resided the governor-elect, T. O. Moore, who would soon succeed him in his office as governor and president ex officio, and advised me to go at once to Alexandria, and put myself in communication with Moore and the supervisors. Accordingly I took a boat at Baton Rouge, for the mouth of Red River. The river being low, and its navigation precarious, I there took the regular mail coach, as the more certain conveyance, and continued on toward Alexandria. I found, as a fellow passenger in the coach, Judge Henry Boyce, of the United States District Court, with whom I had made acquaintance years before, at St. Louis, and, as we neared Alexandria, he proposed that we should stop at Governor Moore's and spend the night. Moore's house and plantation were on Bayou Robert, about eight miles from Alexandria. We found him at home, with his wife and a married daughter, and spent the night there. He sent us forward to Alexandria the next morning, in his own carriage. On arriving at Alexandria, I put up at an inn, or boarding house, and almost immediately thereafter went about ten miles farther up Bayou Rapides, to the plantation and house of General G. Mason Graham, to whom I looked as the principal man with whom I had to deal. He was a high-toned gentleman, and his whole heart was in the enterprise. He at once put me at ease. We acted together most cordially from that time forth, and it was at his house that all the details of the seminary were arranged. We first visited the college building together. It was located on an old country place of 400 acres of Pineland, with numerous springs, and the building was very large and handsome. A carpenter, named James, resided there, and had the general charge of the property. But, as there was not a table, chair, blackboard, or anything on hand, necessary for a beginning, I concluded to quarter myself in one of the rooms of the seminary, and board with an old black woman who cooked for James so that I might personally push forward the necessary preparations. There was an old rail fence about the place, and a large pile of boards in front. I immediately engaged four carpenters, and set them at work to make out of these boards mess tables, benches, blackboards, etc. I also opened a correspondence with the professors-elect, and with all parties of influence in the state, who were interested in our work, at the meeting of the Board of Supervisors, held at Alexandria, August 2, 1859. Five professors had been elected, one. W. T. Sherman, superintendent, and professor of engineering, etc., two. Anthony Vallis, professor of mathematics, philosophy, etc., three. Francis W. Smith, professor of chemistry, etc., four. David F. Boyd, professor of languages, English and ancient, five. E. Bertie Saint Ange, Professor of French and Modern Languages. These constituted the academic board, while the general supervision remained in the Board of Supervisors, composed of the Governor of the State, the Superintendent of Public Education, and twelve members, nominated by the Governor. And confirmed by the Senate. The institution was bound to educate sixteen beneficiary students, free of any charge for tuition. These had only to pay for their clothing and books, while all others had to pay their entire expenses, including tuition. Early in November, Profs. Smith, Yalaz, St. Ange, and I, met a committee of the Board of Supervisors, composed of T. C. Manning, G. Mason Graham, and W. W. Whittington, at General Graham's house, and resolved to open the institution to pupils on the first day of January, 1860. We adopted a series of bylaws for the government of the institution, which was styled the Louisiana Seminary of Learning and Military Academy. This title grew out of the original grant, by the Congress of the United States, of a certain township of public land, to be sold by the state, and dedicated to the use of a seminary of learning. 
I do not suppose that Congress designed thereby to fix the name or title, but the subject had so long been debated in Louisiana that the name, though awkward, had become familiar. We appended to it, Military Academy, as explanatory of its general design. On the 17th of November, 1859, the governor of the state, Wycliffe, issued officially a general circular, prepared by us, giving public notice that the Seminary of Learning would open on the first day of January, 1860. Containing a description of the locality, and the general regulations for the proposed institution, and authorizing parties to apply for further information to the superintendent at Alexandria, Louisiana. The legislature had appropriated for the 16 beneficiaries at the rate of $283 per annum, to which we added $60 as tuition for pay cadets. And, though the price was low, we undertook to manage for the first year on that basis. Promptly to the day, we opened, with about 60 cadets present. Major Smith was the commandant of cadets, and I the superintendent. I had been to New Orleans, where I had bought a supply of mattresses, books, and everything requisite, and we started very much on the basis of West Point and of the Virginia Military Institute, but without uniforms or muskets. Yet with roll calls, sections, and recitations, we kept as near the standard of West Point as possible. I kept all the money accounts, and gave general directions to the steward, professors, and cadets. The other professors had their regular classes and recitations. We all lived in rooms in the college building, except Vallis, who had a family, and rented a house nearby. A Creole gentleman, B. Jurian, E.S.Q., had been elected steward, and he also had his family in a house not far off. The other professors had a mess in a room adjoining the mess hall. A few more cadets joined in the course of the winter, so that we had in all, during the first term, 73 cadets, of whom 59 passed the examination on the 30th of July, 1860. During our first term many defects in the original act of the legislature were demonstrated, and, by the advice of the Board of Supervisors, I went down to Baton Rouge during the session of the legislature. To advocate and urge the passage of a new bill, putting the institution on a better footing. Thomas O. Moores was then governor, Bragg was a member of the Board of Public Works, and Richard Taylor was a senator. I got well acquainted with all of these, and with some of the leading men of the state, and was always treated with the greatest courtesy and kindness. In conjunction with the proper committee of the legislature, we prepared a new bill, which was passed and approved on the 7th of March, 1860, by which we were to have a beneficiary cadet for each parish, in all 56 and $15,000 annually for their maintenance. Also $20,000 for the general use of the college. During that session we got an appropriation of $15,000 for building two professors' houses, for the purchase of philosophical and chemical apparatus, and for the beginning of a college library. The seminary was made a state arsenal, under the title of State Central Arsenal, and I was allowed $500 a year as its superintendent. These matters took me several times to Baton Rouge that winter, and I recall an event of some interest, which most have happened in February. At that time my brother, John Sherman, was a candidate, in the National House of Representatives, for Speaker, against Bacchuk, of Virginia. In the South he was regarded as an abolitionist, the most horrible of all monsters. And many people of Louisiana looked at me with suspicion, as the brother of the abolitionist, John Sherman, and doubted the propriety of having me at the head of an important state institution. By this time I was pretty well acquainted with many of their prominent men, was generally esteemed by all in authority, and by the people of Rapides Parish especially, who saw that I was devoted to my particular business. And that I gave no heed to the political excitement of the day. But the members of the state senate and house did not know me so well, and it was natural that they should be suspicions of a northern man, and the brother of him who was the abolition candidate for Speaker of the House. One evening, at a large dinner party at Governor Moore's, at which were present several members of the Louisiana legislature, Taylor, Bragg, and the Attorney General Hyams, after the ladies had left the table. I noticed at Governor Moore's end quite a lively discussion going on, in which my name was frequently used. At length the governor called to me, saying, Colonel Sherman, 
you can readily understand that, with your brother the abolitionist candidate for speaker. Some of our people wonder that you should be here at the head of an important state institution. Now, you are at my table, and I assure you of my confidence. Won't you speak your mind freely on this question of slavery, that so agitates the land? You are under my roof, and, whatever you say, you have my protection. I answered, Governor Moores, you mistake in calling my brother, John Sherman, an abolitionist. We have been separated since childhood, I in the army, and he pursuing his profession of law in northern Ohio. And it is possible we may differ in general sentiment, but I deny that he is considered at home an abolitionist. And, although he prefers the free institutions under which he lives to those of slavery which prevail here, he would not of himself take from you by law or force any property whatever, even slaves. Then said Moore, give us your own views of slavery as you see it here and throughout the South. I answered in effect that, the people of Louisiana were hardly responsible for slavery, as they had inherited it. That I found two distinct conditions of slavery, domestic and field hands. The domestic slaves, employed by the families, were probably better treated than any slaves on earth. But the condition of the field hands was different, depending more on the temper and disposition of their masters and overseers than were those employed about the house. And I went on to say that, were I a citizen of Louisiana, and a member of the legislature, I would deem it wise to bring the legal condition of the slaves more near the status of human beings under all Christian and civilized governments. In the first place, I argued that, in sales of slaves made by the state, I would forbid the separation of families, letting the father, mother, and children, be sold together to one person, instead of each to the highest bidder. And, again, I would advise the repeal of the statute which enacted a severe penalty for even the owner to teach his slave to read and write, because that actually qualified property and took away a part of its value. Illustrating the assertion by the case of Henry Sampson, who had been the slave of Colonel Chambers, of Rapides Parish, who had gone to California as the servant of an officer of the army, and who was afterward employed by me in the bank at San Francisco. At first he could not write or read, and I could only afford to pay him one hundred dollars a month. But he was taught to read and write by Riley, our bank teller, when his services became worth two hundred and fifty dollars a month, which enabled him to buy his own freedom and that of his brother and his family. What I said was listened to by all with the most profound attention, and, when I was through, some one, I think it was Mr. Hyams, struck the table with his fist, making the glasses jingle, and said, By God, he is right. And at once he took up the debate, which went on, for an hour or more, on both sides with ability and fairness. Of course, I was glad to be thus relieved, because at the time all men in Louisiana were dreadfully excited on questions affecting their slaves, who constituted the bulk of their wealth, and without whom they honestly believed that sugar, cotton, and rice, could not possibly be cultivated. On the 30th and 31st of July, 1860, we had an examination at the seminary, winding up with a ball, and as much publicity as possible to attract general notice. And immediately thereafter we all scattered, the cadets to their homes, and the professors wherever they pleased, all to meet again on the first day of the next November. Major Smith and I agreed to meet in New York on a certain day in August, to purchase books, models, etc. I went directly to my family in Lancaster, and after a few days proceeded to Washington, to endeavor to procure from the general government the necessary muskets and equipments for our cadets by the beginning of the next term. I was in Washington on the 17th day of August, and hunted up my friend Major Buell, of the Adjutant General's Department, who was on duty with the Secretary of War, Floyd. I had with me a letter of Governor Moore's, authorizing me to act in his name. Major Buell took me into Floyd's room at the War Department, to whom I explained my business, and I was agreeably surprised to meet with such easy success. Although the state of Louisiana had already drawn her full quota of arms, Floyd promptly promised to order my requisition to be filled, and I procured the necessary blanks at the ordnance office, filled them with two hundred cadet muskets. And all equipments complete, and was assured that all these articles would be shipped to Louisiana in season for our use that fall. These assurances were faithfully carried out. I then went on to New York, 
there met Major Smith according to appointment, and together we selected and purchased a good supply of uniforms, clothing, and textbooks, as well as a fair number of books of history and fiction, to commence a library. When this business was completed, I returned to Lancaster, and remained with my family till the time approached for me to return to Louisiana. I again left my family at Lancaster, until assured of the completion of the two buildings designed for the married professors for which I had contracted that spring with Mr. Mills, of Alexandria, and which were well under progress when I left in August. One of these was designed for me and the other for Vallis. Mr. Ewing presented me with a horse, which I took down the river with me, and en route I ordered from Grimsley and Company a full equipment of saddle, bridle, etc., the same that I used in the war, and which I lost with my horse, shot under me at Shiloh. Reaching Alexandria early in October, I pushed forward the construction of the two buildings, some fences, gates, and all other work, with the object of a more perfect start at the opening of the regular term November 1, 1860. About this time Dr. Powhatan Clark was elected assistant professor of chemistry, etc., and acted as secretary of the board of supervisors, but no other changes were made in our small circle of professors. November came, and with it nearly if not quite all our first set of cadets, and others, to the number of about 130. We divided them into two companies, issued arms and clothing, and began a regular system of drills and instruction, as well as the regular recitations. I had moved into my new house, but prudently had not sent for my family, nominally on the ground of waiting until the season was further advanced, but really because of the storm that was lowering heavy on the political horizon. The presidential election was to occur in November, and the nominations had already been made in stormy debates by the usual conventions. Lincoln and Hamlin, to the South utterly unknown, were the nominees of the Republican Party, and for the first time both these candidates were from northern states. The Democratic Party divided, one set nominating a ticket at Charleston, and the other at Baltimore. Breckinridge and Lane were the nominees of the Southern or Democratic Party. And Bell and Everett, a kind of compromise, mostly in favor in Louisiana. Political excitement was at its very height, and it was constantly asserted that Mr. Lincoln's election would imperil the Union. I purposely kept aloof from politics, would take no part, and remember that on the day of the election in November I was notified that it would be advisable for me to vote for Bell and Everett, but I openly said I would not, and I did not. The election of Mr. Lincoln fell upon us all like a clap of thunder. People saw and felt that the South had threatened so long that, if she quietly submitted, the question of slavery in the territories was at an end forever. I mingled freely with the members of the Board of Supervisors, and with the people of Rapides Parish generally, keeping aloof from all cliques and parties, and I certainly hoped that the threatened storm would blow over. As had so often occurred before, after similar threats. At our seminary the order of exercises went along with the regularity of the seasons. Once a week, I had the older cadets to practice reading, reciting, and elocution, and noticed that their selections were from Calhoun, Yancey, and other southern speakers. All treating of the defense of their slaves and their home institutions as the very highest duty of the patriot. Among boys this was to be expected, and among the members of our board, though most of them declaimed against politicians generally, and especially abolitionists, as pests, yet there was a growing feeling that danger was in the wind. I recall the visit of a young gentleman who had been sent from Jackson, by the governor of Mississippi, to confer with Governor Moore, then on his plantation at Bayou Robert, and who had come over to see our college. He spoke to me openly of secession as a fixed fact, and that its details were only left open for discussion. I also recall the visit of some man who was said to be a high officer in the order of Knights of the Golden Circle, of the existence of which order I was even ignorant, until explained to me by Major Smith and Dr. Clark. But in November, 1860, no man ever approached me offensively, to ascertain my views, or my proposed course of action in case of secession. And no man in or out of authority ever tried to induce me to take part in steps designed to lead toward disunion. I think my general opinions were well known and understood, viz., that secession was treason, was war, 
and that in no event would the North and West permit the Mississippi River to pass out of their control. But some men at the South actually supposed at the time that the Northwestern states, in case of a disruption of the general government, would be drawn in self-interest to an alliance with the South. What I now write I do not offer as anything like a history of the important events of that time, but rather as my memory of them, the effect they had on me personally, and to what extent they influenced my personal conduct. South Carolina seceded December 20, 1860, and Mississippi soon after. Emissaries came to Louisiana to influence the governor, legislature, and people, and it was the common assertion that, if all the cotton states would follow the lead of South Carolina, it would diminish the chances of civil war. Because a bold and determined front would deter the general government from any measures of coercion. About this time also, viz., early in December, we received Mr. Buchanan's annual message to Congress, in which he publicly announced that the general government had no constitutional power to coerce a state. I confess this staggered me, and I feared that the prophecies and assertions of Allison and other European commentators on our form of government were right, and that our constitution was a mere rope of sand, that would break with the first pressure. The legislature of Louisiana met on the 10th of December, and passed an act calling a convention of delegates from the people, to meet at Baton Rouge, on the 8th of January, to take into consideration the State of the Union. And, although it was universally admitted that a large majority of the voters of the state were opposed to secession, disunion, and all the steps of the South Carolinians, yet we saw that they were powerless. And that the politicians would sweep them along rapidly to the end, prearranged by their leaders in Washington. Before the ordinance of secession was passed, or the convention had assembled, on the faith of a telegraphic dispatch sent by the two senators, Benjamin and Slidell, from their seats in the United States Senate at Washington. Governor Moore ordered the seizure of all the United States forts at the mouth of the Mississippi and Lake Pontchartrain, and of the United States arsenal at Baton Rouge. The forts had no garrisons, but the arsenal was held by a small company of artillery, commanded by Major Haskins, a most worthy and excellent officer, who had lost an arm in Mexico. I remember well that I was strongly and bitterly impressed by the seizure of the arsenal, which occurred on January 10, 1861. When I went first to Baton Rouge, in 1859, en route to Alexandria, I found Captain Ricketts' company of artillery stationed in the arsenal, but soon after there was somewhat of a clamor on the Texas frontier about Brownsville which induced the War Department to order Ricketts' company to that frontier. I remember that Governor Moore remonstrated with the Secretary of War because so much dangerous property, composed of muskets, powder, etc., had been left by the United States unguarded, in a parish where the slave population was as five or six to one of whites, and it was on his official demand that the United States government ordered Haskins' company to replace Ricketts. This company did not number forty men. In the night of January 9, about 500 New Orleans militia, under command of a Colonel Wheat, went up from New Orleans by boat, landed, surrounded the arsenal, and demanded its surrender. Haskins was of course unprepared for such a step, yet he at first resolved to defend the post as he best could with his small force. But Bragg, who was an old army acquaintance of his, had a parley with him, exhibited to him the vastly superior force of his assailants, embracing two field batteries, and offered to procure for him honorable terms. To march out with drums and colors, and to take unmolested passage in a boat up to St. Lewis, alleging, further, that the old union was at an end, and that a just settlement would be made between the two new fragments for all the property stored in the arsenal. Of course it was Haskins's duty to have defended his post to the death. But up to that time the national authorities in Washington had shown such pusillanimity, that the officers of the army knew not what to do. The result, anyhow, was that Haskins surrendered his post, and at once embarked for St. Louis. The arms and munitions stored in the arsenal were scattered, some to Mississippi, some to New Orleans, some to Shreveport. And to me, at the central arsenal, were consigned 2,000 muskets, 300 Jaeger rifles, and a large amount of cartridges and ammunition. The invoices were signed by the former ordnance sergeant, Oladowski, as a captain of ordnance, and I think he continued such on General Bragg's staff through the whole of the subsequent civil war. 
these arms, etc. came up to me at Alexandria, with orders from Governor Moore to receipt for and account for them. Thus I was made the receiver of stolen goods, and these goods the property of the United States. This grated hard on my feelings as an ex-army officer, and on counting the arms I noticed that they were packed in the old familiar boxes, with the U.S. simply scratched off. General G. Mason Graham had resigned as the chairman of the executive committee, and Drive S. Smith, of Alexandria, then a member of the state senate, had succeeded him as chairman, and acted as head of the board of supervisors. At the time I was in most intimate correspondence with all of these parties, and our letters must have been full of politics, but I have only retained copies of a few of the letters, which I will embody in this connection, as they will show. Better than by anything I can now recall, the feelings of parties at that critical period. The seizure of the arsenal at Baton Rouge occurred January 10, 1861, and the secession ordinance was not passed until about the 25th or 26th of the same month. At all events, after the seizure of the arsenal, and before the passage of the ordinance of secession, viz., on the 18th of January, I wrote as follows. Louisiana State Seminary of Learning and Military Academy. January 18, 1861. Governor Thomas O. Moore, Baton, Rouge, Louisiana. Sir, as I occupy a quasi-military position under the laws of the state, I deem it proper to acquaint you that I accepted such position when Louisiana was a state in the Union. And when the motto of this seminary was inserted in marble over the main door, by the liberality of the general government of the United States. The Union, Esto Perpetua. Recent events foreshadow a great change, and it becomes all men to choose. If Louisiana withdraw from the Federal Union, I prefer to maintain my allegiance to the Constitution as long as a fragment of it survives. And my longer stay here would be wrong in every sense of the word. In that event, I beg you will send or appoint some authorized agent to take charge of the arms and munitions of war belonging to the state, or advise me what disposition to make of them. And furthermore, as President of the Board of Supervisors, I beg you to take immediate steps to relieve me as superintendent, the moment the state determines to secede. For on no earthly account will I do any act or think any thought hostile to or in defiance of the old government of the United States. With great respect, your obedient servant. W. T. Sherman, Superintendent. Private. January 18, 1861. To Governor Moore. My dear sir, I take it for granted that you have been expecting for some days the accompanying paper from me, the above official letter. I have repeatedly and again made known to General Graham and Dr. Smith that, in the event of a severance of the relations hitherto existing between the confederated states of this union, I would be forced to choose the old union. It is barely possible all the states may secede, south and north, that new combinations may result, but this process will be one of time and uncertainty, and I cannot with my opinions await the subsequent development. I have never been a politician, and therefore undervalue the excited feelings and opinions of present rulers, but I do think, if this people cannot execute a form of government like the present, that a worse one will result. I will keep the cadets as quiet as possible. They are nervous, but I think the interest of the state requires them here, guarding this property, and acquiring a knowledge which will be useful to your state in aftertimes. When I leave, which I now regard as certain, the present professors can manage well enough, to afford you leisure time to find a suitable successor to me. You might order Major Smith to receipt for the arms, and to exercise military command, while the academic exercises could go on under the board. In time, some gentlemen will turn up, better qualified than I am, to carry on the seminary to its ultimate point of success. I entertain the kindest feelings toward all, and would leave the state with much regret. Only in great events we must choose, one way or the other. Truly, your friend. W. T. Sherman. January 19, 1881, Saturday. Drive S. Smith, President Board of Supervisors, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Dear Sir, I have just finished my quarterly reports to the parents of all the cadets here, or who have been here. 
all my books of account are written up to date. All bills for the houses, fences, etc. are settled, and nothing now remains but the daily tontine of recitations and drills. I have written officially and unofficially to Governor Moore, that with my opinions of the claimed right of accession, of the seizure of public forts, arsenals, etc. and the ignominious capture of a United States garrison, stationed in your midst, as a guard to the arsenal and for the protection of your own people, it would be highly improper for me longer to remain. No great inconvenience can result to the seminary. I will be the chief loser. I came down two months before my pay commenced. I made sacrifices in Kansas to enable me thus to obey the call of Governor Wycliffe, and you know that last winter I declined a most advantageous offer of employment abroad. And thus far I have received nothing as superintendent of the arsenal, though I went to Washington and New York, at my own expense, on the faith of the $500 salary promised. These are all small matters in comparison with those involved in the present state of the country, which will cause sacrifices by millions, instead of by hundreds. The more I think of it, the more I think I should be away, the sooner the better. And therefore I hope you will join with Governor Moores in authorizing me to turn over to Major Smith the military command here, and to the academic board the control of the daily exercises and recitations. There will be no necessity of your coming up. You can let Major Smith receive the few hundreds of cash I have on hand, and I can meet you on a day certain in New Orleans, when we can settle the bank account. Before I leave, I can pay the steward jury in his account for the month, and there would be no necessity for other payments till about the close of March, by which time the board can meet and elect a treasurer and superintendent also. At present I have no class, and there will be none ready till about the month of May, when there will be a class in surveying. Even if you do not elect a superintendent in the meantime, Major Smith could easily teach this class, as he is very familiar with the subject matter, indeed. I think you will do well to leave the subject of a new superintendent until one perfectly satisfactory turns up. There is only one favor I would ask. The seminary has plenty of money in bank. The legislature will surely appropriate for my salary as superintendent of this arsenal. Would you not let me make my drafts on the state treasury, send them to you, let the treasurer note them for payment when the appropriation is made, and then pay them out of the seminary fund? The drafts will be paid in March, and the seminary will lose nothing. This would be just to me. For I actually spent $200 and more in going to Washington and New York, thereby securing from the United States, in advance, $3,000 worth of the very best arms and clothing and books, at a clear profit to the seminary of over $800. I may be some time in finding new employment, and will stand in need of this money, $500, otherwise I would abandon it. I will not ask you to put the board of supervisors to the trouble of meeting, unless you can get a quorum at Baton Rouge. With great respect, your friend. W. T. Sherman. By course of mail, I received the following answer from Governor Moore, the original of which I still possess. It is all in General Bragg's handwriting, with which I am familiar. Executive Office. Baton Rouge, Louisiana, January 23, 1861. My dear SIR, it is with the deepest regret I acknowledge receipt of your communication of the 18th inst. In the pressure of official business, I can now only request you to transfer to Professor Smith the arms, munitions, and funds in your hands, whenever you conclude to withdraw from the position you have filled with so much distinction. You cannot regret more than I do the necessity which deprives us of your services, and you will bear with you the respect, confidence, and admiration, of all who have been associated with you. Very truly, your friend. Thomas O. Moore. Colonel W. T. Sherman, Superintendent Military Academy, Alexandria. I must have received several letters from Bragg, about this time, which have not been preserved. For I find that, on the 1st of February, 1861, I wrote him thus. Seminary of Learning Alexandria, Louisiana, February 1, 1881. Colonel Braxton Bragg, Baton, Rouge, Louisiana. Dear Sir, Yours of January 23 d and 27th are received. 
I thank you most kindly, and Governor Moores through you, for the kind manner in which you have met my wishes. Now that I cannot be compromised by political events, I will so shape my course as best to serve the institution, which has a strong hold on my affections and respect. The Board of Supervisors will be called for the ninth instant, and I will cooperate with them in their measures to place matters here on a safe and secure basis. I expect to be here two weeks, and will make you full returns of money and property belonging to the state central arsenal. All the arms and ammunition are safely stored here. Then I will write you more at length. With sincere respect, your friend. W. T. Sherman. Major Smith's receipt to me, for the arms and property belonging both to the seminary and to the arsenal, is dated February 19, 1861. I subjoin also, in this connection, copies of one or two papers that may prove of interest. Baton Rouge, January 28, 1881. To Major Sherman, Superintendent, Alexandria. My dear S.I.R., your letter was duly received, and would have been answered ere this time could I have arranged sooner the matter of the five hundred dollars. I shall go from here to New Orleans today or tomorrow, and will remain there till Saturday after next, perhaps. I shall expect to meet you there, as indicated in your note to me. I need not tell you that it is with no ordinary regret that I view your determination to leave us, for really I believe that the success of our institution, now almost assured, is jeopardized thereby. I am sore that we will never have a superintendent with whom I shall have more pleasant relations than those which have existed between yourself and me. I fully appreciate the motives which have induced you to give up a position presenting so many advantages to yourself and sincerely hope that you may, in any future enterprise, enjoy the success which your character and ability merit and deserve. Should you come down on the rapides, steamer, please look after my wife, who will, I hope, accompany you on said boat, or some other good one. Colonel Bragg informs me that the necessary orders have been given for the transfer and receipt by Major Smith of the public property. I herewith transmit a request to the Secretary to convene the Board of Supervisors, that they may act as seems best to them in the premises. In the meantime, Major Smith will command by seniority the cadets, and the academic board will be able to conduct the scientific exercises of the institution until the Board of Supervisors can have time to act. Hoping to meet you soon at the ST. Charles, I am. Most truly, your friend and servant, S. Smith. P. S. Governor Moores desires me to express his profound regret that the state is about to lose one who we all fondly hoped had cast his destinies for weal or for woe among us. And that he is sensible that we lose thereby an officer whom it will be difficult, if not impossible, to replace. S. A. S. Baton Rouge, February 11, 1881. To Major Sherman, Alexandria. Dear Sir, I have been in New Orleans for ten days, and on returning here find two letters from you, also your prompt answer to the resolution of the House of Representatives, for which I am much obliged. The resolution passed the last day before adjournment. I was purposing to respond, when your welcome reports came to hand. I have arranged to pay you your five hundred dollars. I will say nothing of general politics, except to give my opinion that there is not to be any war. In that event, would it not be possible for you to become a citizen of our state? Everyone deplores your determination to leave us. At the same time, your friends feel that you are abandoning a position that might become an object of desire to any one. I will try to meet you in New Orleans at any time you may indicate. But it would be best for you to stop here, when, if possible, I will accompany you. Should you do so, you will find me just above the State House, and facing it. Bring with you a few copies of the Rules of the Seminary. Yours truly. S. A. Smith. Colonel W. T. Sherman. Sir, I am instructed by the Board of Supervisors of this institution to present a copy of the resolutions adopted by them at their last meeting. Resolved, that the thanks of the Board of Supervisors are due, and are hereby tendered, to Colonel William T. Sherman for the able and efficient manner in which he has conducted the affairs of the seminary during the time the institution has been under his control, a period attended with unusual difficulties.
requiring on the part of the superintendent to successfully overcome them a high order of administrative talent. And the board further bear willing testimony to the valuable services that Colonel Sherman has rendered them in their efforts to establish an institution of learning in accordance with the beneficent design of the state and federal governments. Evincing at all times a readiness to adapt himself to the ever-varying requirements of an institution of learning in its infancy, struggling to attain a position of honor and usefulness. Resolved, further, that, in accepting the resignation of Colonel Sherman as superintendent of the State Seminary of Learning and Military Academy, we tender to him assurances of our high personal regard. And our sincere regret at the occurrence of causes that render it necessary to part with so esteemed and valued a friend, as well as co-labor in the cause of education. Powhatan Clark, Secretary of the Board A copy of the resolution of the Academic Board, passed at their session of April 1, 1861. Resolved, that in the resignation of the late superintendent, Colonel W. T. Sherman, the academic board deem it not improper to express their deep conviction of the loss the institution has sustained in being thus deprived of an able head. They cannot fail to appreciate the manliness of character which has always marked the actions of Colonel Sherman. While he is personally endeared to many of them as a friend, they consider it their high pleasure to tender to him in this resolution their regret on his separation, and their sincere wish for his future welfare. I have given the above at some length, because, during the Civil War, it was in southern circles asserted that I was guilty of a breach of hospitality in taking up arms against the South. They were manifestly the aggressors, and we could only defend our own by assailing them. Yet, without any knowledge of what the future had in store for me, I took unusual precautions that the institution should not be damaged by my withdrawal. About the 20th of February, having turned over all property, records, and money, on hand, to Major Smith, and taking with me the necessary documents to make the final settlement with Drive S.A. Smith, at the bank in New Orleans, where the funds of the institution were deposited to my credit, I took passage from Alexandria for that city, and arrived there, I think, on the 23d. Dar. Smith met me, and we went to the bank, where I turned over to him the balance, got him to audit all my accounts, certify that they were correct and just, and that there remained not one cent of balance in my hands. I charged in my account current for my salary up to the end of February, at the rate of $4,000 a year, and for the $500 due me as superintendent of the central arsenal, all of which was due and had been fairly earned. And then I stood free and discharged of any and every obligation, honorary or business, that was due by me to the state of Louisiana, or to any corporation or individual in that state. This business occupied two or three days, during which I stayed at the St. Louis Hotel. I usually sat at table with Colonel and Mrs. Bragg, and an officer who wore the uniform of the state of Louisiana, and was addressed as Captain. Bragg wore a colonel's uniform, and explained to me that he was a colonel in the state service, a colonel of artillery, and that some companies of his regiment garrisoned Forts Jackson and St. Philip, and the arsenal at Baton Rouge. Beauregard at the time had two sons at the Seminary of Learning. I had given them some of my personal care at the father's request, and, wanting to tell him of their condition and progress, I went to his usual office in the Custom House building, and found him in the act of starting for Montgomery, Alabama. Bragg said afterward that Beauregard had been sent for by Jefferson Davis, and that it was rumored that he had been made a brigadier general, of which fact he seemed jealous, because in the old army Bragg was the senior. Davis and Stevens had been inaugurated president and vice president of the Confederate States of America, February 18, 1860, at Montgomery, and those states only embraced the seven cotton states. I recall a conversation at the tea table, one evening, at the St. Louis Hotel. When Bragg was speaking of Beauregard's promotion, Mrs. Bragg, turning to me, said, You know that my husband is not a favorite with the new president. My mind was resting on Mr. Lincoln as the new president, and I said I did not know that Bragg had ever met Mr. Lincoln, when Mrs. Bragg said, quite pointedly, I didn't mean your president, but our president. I knew that Bragg hated Davis bitterly, and that he had resigned from the army in 1855, or 1856, because Davis, as Secretary of War, had ordered him, with his battery, from Jefferson Barracks, Missouri, 
to Fort Smith or Fort Washita. In the Indian country, as Bragg expressed it, to chase Indians with six-pounders. I visited the quartermaster, Colonel A. C. Myers, who had resigned from the army, January 28, 1861, and had accepted service under the new regime. His office was in the same old room in the Lafayette Square building, which he had in 1853, when I was there a commissary, with the same pictures on the wall, and the letters U.S. on everything, including his desk, papers, etc. I asked him if he did not feel funny. No, not at all. The thing was inevitable, secession was a complete success. There would be no war, but the two governments would settle all matters of business in a friendly spirit, and each would go on in its allotted sphere, without further confusion. About this date, February 16, General Twiggs, Myers's father-in-law, had surrendered his entire command, in the Department of Texas, to some state troops, with all the government property. Thus consummating the first serious step in the drama of the conspiracy, which was to form a confederacy of the cotton states, before working upon the other slave or border states, and before the 4th of March. The day for the inauguration of President Lincoln. I walked the streets of New Orleans, and found business going along as usual. Ships were strung for miles along the lower levee, and steamboats above, all discharging or receiving cargo. The pelican flag of Louisiana was flying over the Custom House, Mint, City Hall, and everywhere. At the levee ships carried every flag on earth except that of the United States, and I was told that during a procession on the 22d of February, celebrating their emancipation from the despotism of the United States government. Only one national flag was shown from a house, and that the houses of Cuthbert Bullitt, on Lafayette Square. He was commanded to take it down, but he refused, and defended it with his pistol. The only officer of the army that I can recall, as being there at the time, who was faithful, was Colonel C. L. Kilburn, of the commissary department, and he was preparing to escape north. Everybody regarded the change of government as final. That Louisiana, by a mere declaration, was a free and independent state, and could enter into any new alliance or combination she chose. Men were being enlisted and armed, to defend the state, and there was not the least evidence that the national administration designed to make any effort, by force, to vindicate the national authority. I therefore bade adieu to all my friends, and about the 25th of February took my departure by railroad, for Lancaster, via Cairo and Cincinnati. Before leaving this subject, I will simply record the fate of some of my associates. The seminary was dispersed by the war, and all the professors and cadets took service in the Confederacy, except Yalaz, St. Ange, and Cadet Taliaferro. The latter joined a Union regiment, as a lieutenant, after New Orleans was retaken by the United States fleet under Farragut. I think that both Yalaz and St. Ange have died in poverty since the war. Major Smith joined the rebel army in Virginia, and was killed in April, 1865, as he was withdrawing his garrison, by night, from the batteries at Drury's Bluff, at the time General Lee began his final retreat from Richmond. Boyd became a captain of engineers on the staff of General Richard Taylor, was captured, and was in jail at Natchez, Mississippi, when I was on my Meridian expedition. He succeeded in getting a letter to me on my arrival at Vicksburg, and, on my way down to New Orleans, I stopped at Natchez, took him along, and enabled him to effect an exchange through General Banks. As soon as the war was over, he returned to Alexandria, and reorganized the old institution, where I visited him in 1867, but, the next winter, the building took fire and burned to the ground. The students, library, apparatus, etc., were transferred to Baton Rouge, where the same institution now is, under the title of the Louisiana University. I have been able to do them many acts of kindness, and am still in correspondence, with Colonel Boyd, its president. General G. Mason Graham is still living on his plantation, on Bayou Rapides, old and much respected. Drive S. A. Smith became a surgeon in the rebel army, and at the close of the war was medical director of the Trans-Mississippi Department, with General Kirby Smith. I have seen him since the war, at New Orleans, where he died about a year ago. Dar. 
Clark was in Washington recently, applying for a place as United States Consul Abroad. I assisted him, but with no success, and he is now at Baltimore, Maryland. After the Battle of Shiloh, I found among the prisoners Cadet Barrow, fitted him out with some clean clothing, of which he was in need, and from him learned that Cadet Workman was killed in that battle. Governor Moore's plantation was devastated by General Banks's troops. After the war he appealed to me, and through the Attorney General, Henry Stanbury, I aided in having his land restored to him, and I think he is now living there. Bragg, Beauregard, and Taylor, enacted high parts in the succeeding war, and now reside in Louisiana or Texas. 8. Missouri. April and May, 1861. During the time of these events in Louisiana, I was in constant correspondence with my brother, John Sherman, at Washington, Mr. Ewing, at Lancaster, Ohio, and Major H. S. Turner, at St. Louis. I had managed to maintain my family comfortably at Lancaster, but was extremely anxious about the future. It looked like the end of my career, for I did not suppose that civil war could give me an employment that would provide for the family. I thought, and may have said, that the national crisis had been brought about by the politicians, and, as it was upon us, they might fight it out, therefore, when I turned north from New Orleans, I felt more disposed to look to St. Louis for a home, and to Major Turner to find me employment, than to the public service. I left New Orleans about the 1st of March, 1861, by rail to Jackson and Clinton, Mississippi, Jackson, Tennessee, and Columbus, Kentucky, where we took a boat to Cairo, and thence, by rail, to Cincinnati and Lancaster. All the way, I heard, in the cars and boats, warm discussions about polities, to the effect that, if Mr. Lincoln should attempt coercion of the seceded states, the other slave or border states would make common cause, when, it was believed, it would be madness to attempt to reduce them to subjection. In the South, the people were earnest, fierce and angry, and were evidently organizing for action, whereas, in Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio, I saw not the least sign of preparation. It certainly looked to me as though the people of the North would tamely submit to a disruption of the Union, and the orators of the South used, openly and constantly, the expressions that there would be no war. And that a lady's thimble would hold all the blood to be shed. On reaching Lancaster, I found letters from my brother John, inviting me to come to Washington, as he wanted to see me, and from Major Tamer, at a tea. Lewis, that he was trying to secure for me the office of president of the Fifth Street Railroad, with a salary of $2,500, that Mr. Lucas and D. A. January held a controlling interest of stock, would vote for me, and the election would occur in March. This suited me exactly, and I answered Turner that I would accept, with thanks. But I also thought it right and proper that I should first go to Washington, to talk with my brother, Senator Sherman. Mr. Lincoln had just been installed, and the newspapers were filled with rumors of every kind indicative of war. The chief act of interest was that Major Robert Anderson had taken by night into Fort Sumter all the troops garrisoning Charleston Harbor. And that he was determined to defend it against the demands of the state of South Carolina and of the Confederate states. I must have reached Washington about the 10th of March. I found my brother there, just appointed senator, in place of Mr. Chase, who was in the cabinet, and I have no doubt my opinions, thoughts, and feelings, wrought up by the events in Louisiana, seemed to him gloomy and extravagant. About Washington I saw but few signs of preparation, though the Southern senators and representatives were daily sounding their threats on the floors of Congress, and were publicly withdrawing to join the Confederate Congress at Montgomery. Even in the War Department and about the public offices there was open, unconcealed talk, amounting to high treason. One day, John Sherman took me with him to see Mr. Lincoln. He walked into the room where the secretary to the president now sits, we found the room full of people, and Mr. Lincoln sat at the end of the table, talking with three or four gentlemen, who soon left. John walked up, shook hands, and took a chair near him, holding in his hand some papers referring to minor appointments in the state of Ohio, which formed the subject of conversation. Mr. 
Lincoln took the papers, said he would refer them to the proper heads of departments, and would be glad to make the appointments asked for, if not already promised. John then turned to me, and said, Mr. President, this is my brother, Colonel Sherman, who is just up from Louisiana, he may give you some information you want. Ah, said Mr. Lincoln, how are they getting along down there? I said, they think they are getting along swimmingly, they are preparing for war. Oh, well, said he, I guess we'll manage to keep house. I was silenced, said no more to him, and we soon left. I was sadly disappointed, and remember that I broke out on John, D., Ming the politicians generally, saying, you have got things in a hell of a fig, and you may get them out as you best can. Adding that the country was sleeping on a volcano that might burst forth at any minute, but that I was going to St. Louis to take care of my family, and would have no more to do with it. John begged me to be more patient, but I said I would not, that I had no time to wait, that I was off for St. Louis, and off I went. At Lancaster I found letters from Major Turner, inviting me to St. Louis, as the place in the Fifth Street Railroad was a sure thing, and that Mr. Lucas would rent me a good house on Locust Street, suitable for my family, for six hundred dollars a year. Mrs. Sherman and I gathered our family and effects together, started for St. Louis March 27, where we rented of Mr. Lucas the house on Locust Street, between 10th and 11th, and occupied it on the 1st of April. Charles Ewing and John Hunter had formed a law partnership in St. Louis, and agreed to board with us, taking rooms on the third floor in the latter part of March, I was duly elected president of the Fifth Street Railroad, and entered on the discharge of my duties April 1, 1861. We had a central office on the corner of Fifth and Locust, and also another up at the stables in Bremen. The road was well stocked and in full operation, and all I had to do was to watch the economical administration of existing affairs, which I endeavored to do with fidelity and zeal. But the whole air was full of wars and rumors of wars. The struggle was going on politically for the border states. Even in Missouri, which was a slave state, it was manifest that the governor of the state, Claiborne Jackson, and all the leading politicians, were for the South in case of a war. The house on the northwest corner of Fifth and Pine was the rebel headquarters, where the rebel flag was hung publicly, and the crowds about the planter's house were all more or less rebel. There was also a camp in Lindell's Grove, at the end of Olive, Street, under command of General D. M. Frost, a northern man, a graduate of West Point, in open sympathy with the southern leaders. This camp was nominally a state camp of instruction, but, beyond doubt, was in the interest of the Southern cause. Designed to be used against the national authority in the event of the general government's attempting to coerce the Southern Confederacy. General William S. Harvey was in command of the Department of Missouri, and resided in his own house, on 4th Street, below Market, and there were five or six companies of United States troops in the arsenal, commanded by Captain N. Lyon. Throughout the city, there had been organized, almost exclusively out of the German part of the population, for or five regiments of home guards, with which movement Frank Blair, B. Gratz Brown, John M. Schofield, Clinton B. Fisk, and others, were most active on the part of the national authorities. Frank Blair's brother Montgomery was in the cabinet of Mr. Lincoln at Washington, and to him seemed committed the general management of affairs in Missouri. The newspapers fanned the public excitement to the highest pitch, and threats of attacking the arsenal on the one hand, and the mob of D. D. rebels in Camp Jackson on the other, were bandied about. I tried my best to keep out of the current, and only talked freely with a few men, among them Colonel John O'Fallon, a wealthy gentleman who resided above St. Louis. He daily came down to my office in Bremen, and we walked up and down the pavement by the hour, deploring the sad condition of our country, and the seeming drift toward dissolution and anarchy. I used also to go down to the arsenal occasionally to see Lyon, Totten, and other of my army acquaintance, and was glad to see them making preparations to defend their post, if not to assume the offensive. The bombardment of Fort Sumter, which was announced by telegraph, began April 12th, and ended on the 14th. We then knew that the war was actually begun, and though the South was openly, manifestly the aggressor, 
yet her friends and apologists insisted that she was simply acting on a justifiable defensive, and that in the forcible seizure of the public forts within her limits the people were acting with reasonable prudence and foresight. Yet neither party seemed willing to invade or cross the border. Davis, who ordered the bombardment of Sumter, knew the temper of his people well, and foresaw that it would precipitate the action of the border states. For almost immediately Virginia, North Carolina, Arkansas, and Tennessee, followed the lead of the cotton states, and conventions were deliberating in Kentucky and Missouri. On the night of Saturday, April 6, I received the following, dispatch. Washington, April 6, 1861. Major W. T. Sherman. Will you accept the chief clerkship of the War Department? We will make you Assistant Secretary of War when Congress meets. M. Blair, Postmaster General. To which I replied by telegraph, Monday morning, I cannot accept, and by mail as follows. Monday, April 8, 1861. Office of the St. Louis Railroad Company. Honorable M. Blair, Washington, D.C. I received, about nine o'clock Saturday night, your telegraph dispatch, which I have this moment answered, I cannot accept. I have quite a large family, and when I resigned my place in Louisiana, on account of secession, I had no time to lose. And, therefore, after my hasty visit to Washington, where I saw no chance of employment, I came to St. Louis, have accepted a place in this company, have rented a house, and incurred other obligations, so that I am not at liberty to change. I thank you for the compliment contained in your offer, and assure you that I wish the administration all success in its almost impossible task of governing this distracted and anarchical people. Yours truly. W.T. Sherman. I was afterward told that this letter gave offense, and that some of Mr. Lincoln's cabinet concluded that I too would prove false to the country. Later in that month, after the capture of Fort Sumter by the Confederate authorities, a D.R. Cornyn came to our house on Locust Street, one night after I had gone to bed, and told me he had been sent by Frank Blair, who was not well, and wanted to see me that night at his house. I dressed and walked over to his house on Washington Avenue, near 14th, and found there, in the front room, several gentlemen, among whom I recall Henry T. Blow. Blair was in the back room, closeted with some gentlemen, who soon left, and I was called in. He there told me that the government was mistrustful of General Harvey, that a change in the command of the department was to be made. That he held it in his power to appoint a brigadier general, and put him in command of the department, and he offered me the place. I told him I had once offered my services, and they were declined, that I had made business engagements in St. Louis, which I could not throw off at pleasure, that I had long deliberated on my course of action, and must decline his offer, however tempting and complimentary. He reasoned with me, but I persisted. He told me, in that event, he should appoint Lyon, and he did so. Finding that even my best friends were uneasy as to my political status, on the 8th of May I addressed the following official letter to the Secretary of War. Office of Visti. Lewis Railroad Company. May 8, 1881. Honorable S. Cameron, Secretary of War, Washington, D.C. Dear Sir, I hold myself now, as always, prepared to serve my country in the capacity for which I was trained. I did not and will not volunteer for three months, because I cannot throw my family on the cold charity of the world. But for the three years' call, made by the President, an officer can prepare his command and do good service. I will not volunteer as a soldier, because rightfully or wrongfully I feel unwilling to take a mere private's place, and, having for many years lived in California and Louisiana. The men are not well enough acquainted with me to elect me to my appropriate place. Should my services be needed, the records of the War Department will enable you to designate the station in which I can render most service. Yours truly, W. T. Sherman. To this I do not think I received a direct answer. But, on the 10th of the same month, I was appointed Colonel of the 13th Regular Infantry. I remember going to the arsenal on the 9th of May, taking my children with me in the streetcars. Within the arsenal wall were drawn up in parallel lines four regiments of the Home Guards, 
and I saw men distributing cartridges to the boxes. I also saw General Lyon running about with his hair in the wind, his pockets full of papers, wild and irregular, but I knew him to be a man of vehement purpose and of determined action. I saw of course that it meant business, but whether for defense or offense I did not know. The next morning I went up to the railroad office in Bremen, as usual, and heard at every corner of the streets that the Dutch were moving on Camp Jackson. People were barricading their houses, and men were running in that direction. I hurried through my business as quickly as I could, and got back to my house on Locust Street by twelve o'clock. Charles Ewing and Hunter were there, and insisted on going out to the camp to see the fun. I tried to dissuade them, saying that in case of conflict the bystanders were more likely to be killed than the men engaged, but they would go. I felt as much interest as anybody else, but stayed at home, took my little son Willie, who was about seven years old, and walked up and down the pavement in front of our house. Listening for the sound of musketry or cannon in the direction of Camp Jackson. While so engaged Miss Eliza Dean, who lived opposite us, called me across the street, told me that her brother-in-law, Dr. Scott, was a surgeon in Frost's camp, and she was dreadfully afraid he would be killed. I reasoned with her that General Lyon was a regular officer, that if he had gone out, as reported, to Camp Jackson, he would take with him such a force as would make resistance impossible. But she would not be comforted, saying that the camp was made up of the young men from the first and best families of St. Louis, and that they were proud, and would fight. I explained that young men of the best families did not like to be killed better than ordinary people. Edging gradually up the street, I was in Olive Street just about twelfth, when I saw a man running from the direction of Camp Jackson at full speed, calling, as he went, they've surrendered, they've surrendered. So I turned back and rang the bell at Mrs. Dean's. Eliza came to the door, and I explained what I had heard, but she angrily slammed the door in my face. Evidently she was disappointed to find she was mistaken in her estimate of the rash courage of the best families. I again turned in the direction of Camp Jackson, my boy Willie with me still. At the head of Olive Street, abreast of Lindell's Grove, I found Frank Blair's regiment in the street, with ranks opened, and the Camp Jackson prisoners inside. A crowd of people was gathered around, calling to the prisoners by name, some hurrying for Jeff Davis, and others encouraging the troops. Men, women, and children, were in the crowd. I passed along till I found myself inside the grove, where I met Charles Ewing and John Hunter, and we stood looking at the troops on the road, heading toward the city. A band of music was playing at the head, and the column made one or two ineffectual starts, but for some reason was halted. The battalion of regulars was abreast of me, of which Major Rufus Saxton was in command, and I gave him an evening paper, which I had bought of the newsboy on my way out. He was reading from it some piece of news, sitting on his horse, when the column again began to move forward, and he resumed his place at the head of his command. At that part of the road, or street, was an embankment about eight feet high, and a drunken fellow tried to pass over it to the people opposite. One of the regular sergeant file closers ordered him back, but he attempted to pass through the ranks, when the sergeant barred his progress with his musket aport. The drunken man seized his musket, when the sergeant threw him off with violence, and he rolled over and over down the bank. By the time this man had picked himself up and got his hat, which had fallen off, and had again mounted the embankment, the regulars had passed, and the head of Osterhaus's regiment of home guards had come up. The man had in his hand a small pistol, which he fired off, and I heard that the ball had struck the leg of one of Osterhaus's staff, the regiment stopped. There was a moment of confusion, when the soldiers of that regiment began to fire over our heads in the grove. I heard the balls cutting the leaves above our heads, and saw several men and women running in all directions, some of whom were wounded. Of course there was a general stampede. Charles Ewing threw Willie on the ground and covered him with his body. Hunter ran behind the hill, and I also threw myself on the ground. The fire ran back from the head of the regiment toward its rear, and as I saw the men reloading their pieces, I jerked Willie up, ran back with him into a gully which covered us, lay there until I saw that the fire had ceased. And that the column was again moving on, when I took up Willie and started back for home round by way of Market Street. 
A woman and child were killed outright, two or three men were also killed, and several others were wounded. The great mass of the people on that occasion were simply curious spectators, though men were sprinkled through the crowd calling out, Hurrah for Jeff Davis! And others were particularly abusive of the damned Dutch lion posted a guard in charge of the vacant camp, and marched his prisoners down to the arsenal, some were paroled, and others held, till afterward they were regularly exchanged. A very few days after this event, May 14, I received a dispatch from my brother Charles in Washington, telling me to come on at once. That I had been appointed a colonel of the 13th Regular Infantry, and that I was wanted at Washington immediately. Of course I could no longer defer action. I saw Mr. Lucas, Major Turner, and other friends and parties connected with the road, who agreed that I should go on. I left my family, because I was under the impression that I would be allowed to enlist my own regiment, which would take some time, and I expected to raise the regiment and organize it at Jefferson Barracks. I repaired to Washington, and there found that the government was trying to rise to a level with the occasion. Mr. Lincoln had, without the sanction of law, authorized the raising of ten new regiments of regulars, each infantry regiment to be composed of three battalions of eight companies each, and had called for 75,000 state volunteers. Even this call seemed to me utterly inadequate, still it was none of my business. I took the oath of office, and was furnished with a list of officers, appointed to my regiment, which was still, incomplete. I reported in person to General Scott, at his office on 17th Street, opposite the War Department, and applied for authority to return west, and raise my regiment at Jefferson Barracks, but the general said my lieutenant colonel, Burbank, was fully qualified to superintend the enlistment, and that he wanted me there. And he at once dictated an order for me to report to him in person for inspection duty. Satisfied that I would not be permitted to return to St. Louis, I instructed Mrs. Sherman to pack up, return to Lancaster, and trust to the fate of war. I also resigned my place as president of the Fifth Street Railroad, to take effect at the end of May, so that in fact I received pay from that road for only two months' service, and then began my new army career. 9. From the Battle of Bull Run to Paducah, Kentucky and Missouri. 1861-1862. And now that, in these notes, I have fairly reached the period of the Civil War, which ravaged our country from 1861 to 1865, an event involving a conflict of passion, of prejudice, and of arms, that has developed results which, for better or worse, have left their mark on the world's history, I feel that I tread on delicate ground. I have again and again been invited to write a history of the war, or to record for publication my personal recollections of it, with large offers of money therefore. All of which I have heretofore declined, because the truth is not always palatable, and should not always be told. Many of the actors in the grand drama still live, and they and their friends are quick to controversy, which should be avoided. The great end of peace has been attained, with little or no change in our form of government, and the duty of all good men is to allow the passions of that period to subside. That we may direct our physical and mental labor to repair the waste of war, and to engage in the greater task of continuing our hitherto wonderful national development. What I now propose to do is merely to group some of my personal recollections about the historic persons and events of the day, prepared not with any view to their publication, but rather for preservation till I am gone. And then to be allowed to follow into oblivion the cords of similar papers, or to be used by some historian who may need them by way of illustration. I have heretofore recorded how I again came into the military service of the United States as a colonel of the 13th Regular Infantry, a regiment that had no existence at the time, and that, instead of being allowed to enlist the men and instruct them, as expected, I was assigned in Washington City, by an order of Lieutenant General Winfield Scott, to inspection duty near him on the 20th of June, 1861. At that time Lieutenant General Scott commanded the Army-in-Chief, with Colonel E.D. Townsend as his adjutant general. Major G. W. Cullum, United States Engineers, and Major Schuyler Hamilton, as aides, de camp. The general had an office upstairs on 17th Street, opposite the War Department, and resided in a house close by, on Pennsylvania Avenue. 
all fears for the immediate safety of the capital had ceased, and quite a large force of regulars and volunteers had been collected in and about Washington. Brigadier General J. K. Mansfield commanded in the city, and Brigadier General Irvin McDowell on the other side of the Potomac, with his headquarters at Arlington House. His troops extended in a semicircle from Alexandria to above Georgetown. Several forts and redoubts were either built or in progress, and the people were already clamorous for a general forward movement. Another considerable army had also been collected in Pennsylvania under General Patterson, and, at the time I speak of, had moved forward to Hagerstown and Williamsport, on the Potomac River. My brother, John Sherman, was a volunteer aide de camp to General Patterson, and, toward the end of June, I went up to Hagerstown to see him. I found that army in the very act of moving, and we rode down to Williamsport in a buggy, and were present when the leading division crossed the Potomac River by fording it waist deep. My friend and classmate, George H. Thomas, was there, in command of a brigade in the leading division. I talked with him a good deal, also with General Cadwallader, and with the staff officers of General Patterson, viz. Fitz John Porter, Belger, Beckwith, and others, all of whom seemed encouraged to think that the war was to be short and decisive, and that, as soon as it was demonstrated that the general government meant in earnest to defend its rights and property, some general compromise would result. Patterson's army crossed the Potomac River on the 1st or 2d of July, and, as John Sherman was to take his seat as a senator in the called session of Congress, to meet July 4th, he resigned his place as aide de camp, presented me his two horses and equipment, and we returned to Washington together. The Congress assembled punctually on the 4th of July, and the message of Mr. Lincoln was strong and good, it recognized the fact that civil war was upon us, that compromise of any kind was at an end. And he asked for 400,000 men, and 400 million dollars, wherewith to vindicate the national authority, and to regain possession of the captured forts and other property of the United States. It was also immediately demonstrated that the tone and temper of Congress had changed since the Southern senators and members had withdrawn, and that we, the military, could now go to work with some definite plans and ideas. The appearance of the troops about Washington was good, but it was manifest they were far from being soldiers. Their uniforms were as various as the states and cities from which they came, their arms were also of every pattern and caliber. And they were so loaded down with overcoats, haversacks, knapsacks, tents, and baggage, that it took from twenty-five to fifty wagons to move the camp of a regiment from one place to another. And some of the camps had bakeries and cooking establishments that would have done credit to Delmonico. While I was on duty with General Scott, viz., from June 20th to about June 30th, the general frequently communicated to those about him his opinions and proposed plans. He seemed vexed with the clamors of the press for immediate action, and the continued interference in details by the President, Secretary of War, and Congress. He spoke of organizing a grand army of invasion, of which the regulars were to constitute the Iron Column, and seemed to intimate that he himself would take the field in person, though he was at the time very old, very heavy, and very unwieldy. His age must have been about seventy-five years. At that date, July 4, 1861, the rebels had two armies in front of Washington. The one at Manassas Junction, commanded by General Beauregard, with his advance guard at Fairfax Courthouse, and indeed almost in sight of Washington. The other, commanded by General Joe Johnston, was at Winchester, with its advance at Martinsburg and Harper's Ferry, but the advance had fallen back before Patterson, who then occupied Martinsburg and the line of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. The temper of Congress and the people would not permit the slow and methodical preparation desired by General Scott, and the cry of, on to Richmond which was shared by the volunteers, most of whom had only engaged for ninety days, forced General Scott to hasten his preparations, and to order a general advance about the middle of July. McDowell was to move from the defenses of Washington, and Patterson from Martinsburg. In the organization of McDowell's army into divisions and brigades, Colonel David Hunter was assigned to command the second division, and I was ordered to take command of his former brigade which was composed of five regiments in position in and about Fort Corcoran, and on the ground opposite Georgetown. 
I assumed command on the 30th of June, and proceeded at once to prepare it for the general advance. My command constituted the 3rd Brigade of the 1st Division, which division was commanded by Brigadier General Daniel Tyler, a graduate of West Point, but who had seen little or no actual service. I applied to General McDowell for home staff officers, and he gave me, as Adjutant General, Lieutenant Piper, of the 3rd Artillery, and, as aide de camp Lieutenant McQueston, a fine young cavalry officer, fresh from West Point. I selected for the field the 13th New York, Colonel Quinby, the 69th New York, Colonel Corcoran, the 79th New York, Colonel Cameron, and the 2nd Wisconsin, Lieutenant, Colonel Peck. These were all good, strong, volunteer regiments, pretty well commanded, and I had reason to believe that I had one of the best brigades in the whole army. Captain Ayres's battery of the 3rd Regular Artillery was also attached to my brigade. The other regiment, the 29th New York, Colonel Bennett, was destined to be left behind in charge of the forts and camps during our absence, which was expected to be short. Soon after I had assumed the command, a difficulty arose in the 69th, an Irish regiment. This regiment had volunteered in New York, early in April, for 90 days. But, by reason of the difficulty of passing through Baltimore, they had come via Annapolis, had been held for duty on the railroad as a guard for nearly a month before they actually reached Washington. And were then mustered in about a month after enrollment. Some of the men claimed that they were entitled to their discharge in 90 days from the time of enrollment, whereas the muster roll read 90 days from the date of mustering. One day, Colonel Corcoran explained this matter to me. I advised him to reduce the facts to writing, and that I would submit it to the War Department for an authoritative decision. He did so, and the War Department decided that the muster roll was the only contract of service, that it would be construed literally, and that the regiment would be held till the expiration of three months from the date of muster in, viz. to about August 1, 1861. General Scott at the same time wrote one of his characteristic letters to Corcoran, telling him that we were about to engage in battle, and he knew his Irish friends would not leave him in such a crisis. Corcoran and the officers generally wanted to go to the expected battle, but a good many of the men were not so anxious. In the second Wisconsin, also, was developed a personal difficulty. The actual colonel was S.P. Kuhn, a good-hearted gentleman, who knew no more of the military art than a child, whereas his lieutenant colonel, Peck, had been to West Point, and knew the drill. Preferring that the latter should remain in command of the regiment, I put Colonel Kuhn on my personal staff, which reconciled the difficulty. In due season, about July 15, our division moved forward leaving our camp standing. Keyes's brigade in the lead, then Schenck's, then mine, and Richardson's last. We marched via Vienna, Germantown, and Centerville, where all the army, composed of five divisions, seemed to converge. The march demonstrated little save the general laxity of discipline, for with all my personal efforts I could not prevent the men from straggling for water, blackberries, or anything on the way they fancied. At Centerville, on the 18th, Richardson's brigade was sent by General Tyler to reconnoiter Blackburn's ford across Bull Run, and he found it strongly guarded. From our camp, at Centerville, we heard the cannonading, and then a sharp musketry fire. I received orders from General Tyler to send forward Ayres's battery, and very soon after another order came for me to advance with my whole brigade. We marched the three miles at the double quick, arrived in time to relieve Richardson's brigade, which was just drawing back from the ford, worsted, and stood for half an hour or so under a fire of artillery, which killed four or five of my men. General Tyler was there in person, giving directions, and soon after he ordered us all back to our camp in Centerville. This reconnaissance had developed a strong force, and had been made without the orders of General McDowell. However, it satisfied us that the enemy was in force on the other side of Bull Run, and had no intention to leave without a serious battle. We lay in camp at Centerville all of the 19th and 20th, and during that night began the movement which resulted in the Battle of Bull Run, on July 21. Of this so much has been written that more would be superfluous. And the reports of the opposing commanders, McDowell and Johnston, are fair and correct. 
It is now generally admitted that it was one of the best planned battles of the war, but one of the worst fought. Our men had been told so often at home that all they had to do was to make a bold appearance, and the rebels would run. And nearly all of us for the first time then heard the sound of cannon and muskets in anger, and saw the bloody scenes common to all battles, with which we were soon to be familiar. We had good organization, good men, but no cohesion, no real discipline, no respect for authority, no real knowledge of war. Both armies were fairly defeated, and, whichever had stood fast, the other would have run. Though the North was overwhelmed with mortification and shame, the South really had not much to boast of, for in the three or four hours of fighting their organization was so broken up that they did not and could not follow our army. When it was known to be in a state of disgraceful and causeless flight. It is easy to criticize a battle after it is over, but all now admit that none others, equally raw in war, could have done better than we did at Bull Run, and the lesson of that battle should not be lost on a people like ours. I insert my official report, as a condensed statement of my share in the battle. Headquarters 3rd Brigade, 1st Division. Fort Corcoran, July 25, 1861. To Captain A. Baird, Assistant Adjutant General, 1st Division, General Tyler's. Sir, I have the honor to submit this my report of the operations of my brigade during the action of the 21st instant. The brigade is composed of the 13th New York Volunteers, Colonel Quinby's 69th New York, Colonel Corcoran. 79th New York, Colonel Cameron, 2nd Wisconsin, Lieutenant Colonel Peck, and Company E, 3rd Artillery, under command of Captain R. B. Ayers, 5th Artillery. We left our camp near Centerville, pursuant to orders, at half past 2 a.m. Taking place in your column, next to the brigade of General Schenck, and proceeded as far as the halt, before the enemy's position, near the stone bridge across Bull Run. Here the brigade was deployed in line along the skirt of timber to the right of the Warrington Road, and remained quietly in position till after 10 a.m. The enemy remained very quiet, but about that time we saw a rebel regiment leave its cover in our front, and proceed in double-quick time on the road towards Sudley Springs. By which we knew the columns of Colonels Hunter and Heinzelman were approaching. About the same time we observed in motion a large mass of the enemy, below and on the other side of the stone bridge. I directed Captain Ayers to take position with his battery near our right, and to open fire on this mass. But you had previously detached the two rifle guns belonging to this battery, and, finding that the smoothbore guns did not reach the enemy's position, we ceased firing. And I sent a request that you would send to me the 30-pounder rifle gun attached to Captain Carlyle's battery. At the same time I shifted the New York 69th to the extreme right of the brigade. Thus we remained till we heard the musketry fire across Bull Run, showing that the head of Colonel Hunter's column was engaged. This firing was brisk, and showed that Hunter was driving before him the enemy, till about noon, when it became certain the enemy had come to a stand, and that our forces on the other side of Bull Run were all engaged, artillery and infantry. Here you sent me the order to cross over with the whole brigade, to the assistance of Colonel Hunter. Early in the day, when reconnoitering the ground, I had seen a horseman descend from a bluff in our front, cross the stream, and show himself in the open field on this aid. And, inferring that we could cross over at the same point, I sent forward a company as skirmishers, and followed with the whole brigade, the New York 69th leading. We found no difficulty in crossing over, and met with no opposition in ascending the steep bluff opposite with our infantry, but it was impassable to the artillery, and I sent word back to Captain Ayers to follow if possible. Otherwise to use his discretion. Captain Ayers did not cross Bull Run, but remained on that side, with the rest of your division. His report herewith describes his operations during the remainder of the day. Advancing slowly and cautiously with the head of the column, to give time for the regiments in succession to close up their ranks, we first encountered a party of the enemy retreating along a cluster of pines. Lieutenant Colonel Haggerty, of the 69th, without orders, rode out alone, and endeavored to intercept their retreat. One of the enemy, in full view, at short range, shot Haggerty, and he fell dead from his horse. The 69th opened fire on this party, which was returned, 
but, determined to effect our junction with Hunter's division, I ordered this fire to cease, and we proceeded with caution toward the field where we then plainly saw our forces engaged. Displaying our colors conspicuously at the head of our column, we succeeded in attracting the attention of our friends, and soon formed the brigade in rear of Colonel Porter's. Here I learned that Colonel Hunter was disabled by a severe wound, and that General McDowell was on the field. I sought him out, and received his orders to join in pursuit of the enemy, who was falling back to the left of the road by which the army had approached from Sudley Springs. Placing Colonel Quinby's regiment of rifles in front, in column, by division, I directed the other regiments to follow in line of battle, in the order of the Wisconsin 2nd, New York 79th, and New York 69th. Quinby's regiment advanced steadily down the hill and up the ridge, from which he opened fire upon the enemy, who had made another stand on ground very favorable to him, and the regiment continued advancing as the enemy gave way. Till the head of the column reached the point near which Ricketts battery was so severely cut up. The other regiments descended the hill in line of battle, under a severe cannonade, and, the ground affording comparative shelter from the enemy's artillery, they changed direction, by the right flank, and followed the road before mentioned. At the point where this road crosses the ridge to our left front, the ground was swept by a most severe fire of artillery, rifles, and musketry, and we saw, in succession, several regiments driven from it. Among them the Zouaves and Battalion of Marines. Before reaching the crest of this hill, the roadway was worn deep enough to afford shelter, and I kept the several regiments in it as long as possible. But when the Wisconsin 2nd was abreast of the enemy, by order of Major Wadsworth, of General McDowell's staff, I ordered it to leave the roadway, by the left flank, and to attack the enemy. This regiment ascended to the brow of the hill steadily, received the severe fire of the enemy, returned it with spirit, and advanced, delivering its fire. This regiment is uniformed in grey cloth, almost identical with that of the great bulk of the secession army. And, when the regiment fell into confusion and retreated toward the road, there was a universal cry that they were being fired on by our own men. The regiment rallied again, passed the brow of the hill a second time, but was again repulsed in disorder. By this time the New York 79th had closed up, and in like manner it was ordered to cross the brow of, the hill, and drive the enemy from cover. It was impossible to get a good view of this ground. In it there was one battery of artillery, which poured an incessant fire upon our advancing column, and the ground was very irregular with small clusters of pines, affording shelter, of which the enemy took good advantage. The fire of rifles and musketry was very severe. The 79th, headed by its colonel, Cameron, charged across the hill, and for a short time the contest was severe. They rallied several times under fire, but finally broke, and gained the cover of the hill. This left the field open to the New York 69th, Colonel Corcoran, who, in his turn, led his regiment over the crest. And had in full, open view the ground so severely contested, the fire was very severe, and the roar of cannon, musketry, and rifles, incessant, it was manifest the enemy was here in great force, far superior to us at that point. The 69th held the ground for some time, but finally fell back in disorder. All this time Quinby's regiment occupied another ridge, to our left, overlooking the same field of action, and similarly engaged. Here, about half past 3 p.m., began the scene of confusion and disorder that characterized the remainder of the day. Up to that time, all had kept their places, and seemed perfectly cool, and used to the shell and shot that fell, comparatively harmless, all around us. But the short exposure to an intense fire of small arms, at close range, had killed many, wounded more, and had produced disorder in all of the battalions that had attempted to encounter it. Men fell away from their ranks, talking, and in great confusion. Colonel Cameron had been mortally wounded, was carried to an ambulance, and reported dying. Many other officers were reported dead or missing, and many of the wounded were making their way, with more or less assistance, to the buildings used as hospitals, on the ridge to the west. We succeeded in partially reforming the regiments, but it was manifest that they would not stand, and I directed Colonel Corcoran to move along the ridge to the rear, near the position where we had first formed the brigade. 
General McDowell was there in person, and need all possible efforts to reassure the men. By the active exertions of Colonel Corcoran, we formed an irregular square against the cavalry which were then seen to issue from the position from which we had been driven. And we began our retreat toward the same fort of Bull Run by which we had approached the field of battle. There was no positive order to retreat, although for an hour it had been going on by the operation of the men themselves. The ranks were thin and irregular, and we found a stream of people strung from the hospital across Bull Run, and far toward Centerville. After putting in motion the irregular square in person, I pushed forward to find Captain Ayres's battery at the crossing of Bull Run. I sought it at its last position, before the brigade had crossed over, but it was not there. Then passing through the woods, where, in the morning, we had first formed line, we approached the blacksmith's shop, but there found a detachment of the secession cavalry and thence made a circuit, avoiding Cub Run Bridge, into Centerville. Where I found General McDowell, and from him understood that it was his purpose to rally the forces, and make a stand at Centerville. But, about nine o'clock at night, I received from General Tyler, in person, the order to continue the retreat to the Potomac. This retreat was by night, and disorderly in the extreme. The men of different regiments mingled together, and some reached the river at Arlington, some at Long Bridge, and the greater part returned to their former camp, at or near Fort Corcoran. I reached this point at noon the next day, and found a miscellaneous crowd crossing over the aqueduct and ferries. Conceiving this to be demoralizing, I at once commanded the guard to be increased, and all persons attempting to pass over to be stopped. This soon produced its effect, men sought their proper companies and regiments. Comparative order was restored, and all were posted to the best advantage. I herewith enclose the official report of Captain Belly, commanding officer of the New York 69th, also, fall lists of the killed, wounded, and missing. Our loss was heavy, and occurred chiefly at the point near where Ricketts' battery was destroyed. Lieutenant Colonel Haggerty was killed about noon, before we had effected a junction with Colonel Hunter's division. Colonel Cameron was mortally wounded leading his regiment in the charge, and Colonel Corcoran has been missing since the cavalry charge near the building used as a hospital. For names, rank, etc., of the above, I refer to the lists herewith. Lieutenants Piper and McQueston, of my personal staff, were under fire all day, and carried orders to and fro with as much coolness as on parade. Lieutenant Bagley, of the New York 69th, a volunteer aide, asked leave to serve with his company, during the action, and is among those reported missing. I have intelligence that he is a prisoner, and slightly wounded. Colonel Kuhn, of Wisconsin, a volunteer aide, also rendered good service during the day. W. T. Sherman, Colonel Commanding Brigade. This report, which I had not read probably since its date till now, recalls to me vividly the whole scene of the affair at Blackburn's Ford. When for the first time in my life I saw a cannonball strike men and crash through the trees and saplings above and around us, and realized the always sickening confusion as one approaches a fight from the rear. Then the night march from Centerville, on the Warrenton Road, standing for hours wondering what was meant. The deployment along the edge of the field that sloped down to Bull Run, and waiting for Hunter's approach on the other aid from the direction of Sudley Springs, away off to our right. The terrible scare of a poor negro who was caught between our lines, the crossing of Bull Run, and the fear lest we should be fired on by our own men, the killing of Lieutenant Colonel Haggerty, which occurred in plain sight. And the first scenes of a field strewed with dead men and horses. Yet, at that period of the battle, we were the victors and felt jubilant. At that moment, also, my brigade passed Hunter's division. But Heinzelman's was still ahead of us, and we followed its lead along the road toward Manassas Junction, crossing a small stream and ascending a long hill, at the summit of which the battle was going on. Here my regiments came into action well, but successively, and were driven back, each in its turn. For two hours we continued to dash at the woods on our left front, which were full of rebels. But I was convinced their organization was broken, and that they had simply halted there and taken advantage of these woods as a cover, to reach which we had to pass over the intervening fields about the Henry House, which were clear, open, and gave them a decided advantage. 
After I had put in each of my regiments, and had them driven back to the cover of the road, I had no idea that we were beaten, but reformed the regiments in line in their proper order, and only wanted a little rest. When I found that my brigade was almost alone, except Sykes regulars, who had formed square against cavalry and were coming back. I then realized that the whole army was, in retreat, and that my own men were individually making back for the stone bridge. Corcoran and I formed the brigade into an irregular square, but it fell to pieces. And, along with a crowd, disorganized but not much scared, the brigade got back to Centerville to our former camps. Corcoran was captured, and held a prisoner for some time, but I got safe to Centerville. I saw General McDowell in Centerville, and understood that several of his divisions had not been engaged at all, that he would reorganize them at Centerville, and there await the enemy. I got my four regiments in parallel lines in a field, the same in which we had camped before the battle, and had lain down to sleep under a tree, when I heard someone asking for me. I called out where I was, when General Tyler in person gave me orders to march back to our camps at Fort Corcoran. I aroused my aides, gave them orders to call up the sleeping men, have each regiment to leave the field by a flank and to take the same road back by which we had come. It was near midnight, and the road was full of troops, wagons, and batteries. We tried to keep our regiment separate, but all became inextricably mixed. Toward morning we reached Vienna, where I slept some hours, and the next day, about noon, we reached Fort Corcoran. A slow, mizzling rain had set in, and probably a more gloomy day never presented itself. All organization seemed to be at an end. But I and my staff labored hard to collect our men into their proper companies and into their former camps, and, on the 23d of July, I moved the 2nd Wisconsin and 79th New York closer into Fort Corcoran. And got things in better order than I had expected. Of course, we took it for granted that the rebels would be on our heels, and we accordingly prepared to defend our posts. By the 25th I had collected all the materials, made my report, and had my brigade about as well governed as any in that army. Although most of the 90-day men, especially the 69th, had become extremely tired of the war, and wanted to go home. Some of them were so mutinous, at one time, that I had the battery to unlimber, threatening, if they dared to leave camp without orders, I would open fire on them. Drills and the daily exercises were resumed, and I ordered that at the three principal roll calls the men should form ranks with belts and muskets. And that they should keep their ranks until I in person had received the reports and had dismissed them. The 69th still occupied Fort Corcoran, and one morning, after Reveille, when I had just received the report, had dismissed the regiment, and was leaving. I found myself in a crowd of men crossing the drawbridge on their way to a barn close by, where they had their sinks. Among them was an officer, who said, Colonel, I am going to New York today. What can I do for you? I answered, How can you go to New York? I do not remember to have signed a leave for you. He said, No, he did not want a leave. He had engaged to serve three months, and had already served more than that time. If the government did not intend to pay him, he could afford to lose the money. That he was a lawyer, and had neglected his business long enough, and was then going home. I noticed that a good many of the soldiers had paused about us to listen, and knew that, if this officer could defy me, they also would. So I turned on him sharp, and said, Captain, this question of your term of service has been submitted to the rightful authority, and the decision has been published in orders. You are a soldier, and must submit to orders till you are properly discharged. If you attempt to leave without orders, it will be mutiny, and I will shoot you like a dog. Go back into the fort now, instantly, and don't dare to leave without my consent. I had on an overcoat, and may have had my hand about the breast, for he looked at me hard, paused a moment, and then turned back into the fort. The men scattered, and I returned to the house where I was quartered, close by. That same day, which must have been about July 26th, I was near the river bank, looking at a blockhouse which had been built for the defense of the aqueduct. When I saw a carriage coming by the road that crossed the Potomac River at Georgetown by a ferry. I thought I recognized in the carriage the person of President Lincoln. I hurried across a bend, 
so as to stand by the roadside as the carriage passed. I was in uniform, with a sword on, and was recognized by Mr. Lincoln and Mr. Seward, who rode side by side in an open hack. I inquired if they were going to my camps, and Mr. Lincoln said, Yes, we heard that you had got over the big scare, and we thought we would come over and see the boys. The roads had been much changed and were rough. I asked if I might give directions to his coachman, he promptly invited me to jump in and to tell the coachman which way to drive. Intending to begin on the right and follow round to the left, I turned the driver into a side road which led up a very steep hill, and, seeing a soldier, called to him and sent him up hurriedly to announce to the Colonel, Bennett. I think, that the President was coming, as we slowly ascended the hill, I discovered that Mr. Lincoln was full of feeling, and wanted to encourage our men. I asked if he intended to speak to them, and he said he would like to. I asked him then to please discourage all cheering, noise, or any sort of confusion. That we had had enough of it before Bull Run to ruin any set of men, and that what we needed were cool, thoughtful, hard-fighting soldiers, no more hurrying, no more humbug. He took my remarks in the most perfect good nature. Before we had reached the first camp, I heard the drum beating the assembly, saw the men running for their tents, and in a few minutes the regiment was in line, arms presented, and then brought to an order and parade rest. Mr. Lincoln stood up in the carriage, and made one of the neatest, best, and most feeling addresses I ever listened to, referring to our late disaster at Bull Run, the high duties that still devolved on us, and the brighter days yet to come. At one or two points the soldiers began to cheer, but he promptly checked them, saying, Don't cheer, boys. I confess I rather like it myself, but Colonel Sherman here says it is not military, and I guess we had better defer to his opinion. In winding up, he explained that, as president, he was commander-in-chief, that he was resolved that the soldiers should have everything that the law allowed, and he called on one and all to appeal to him personally in case they were wronged. The effect of this speech was excellent. We passed along in the same manner to all the camps of my brigade, and Mr. Lincoln complimented me highly for the order, cleanliness, and discipline, that he observed. Indeed, he and Mr. Seward both assured me that it was the first bright moment they had experienced since the battle. At last we reached Fort Corcoran. The carriage could not enter, so I ordered the regiment, without arms, to come outside, and gather about Mr. Lincoln, who would speak to them. He made to them the same feeling address, with more personal allusions, because of their special gallantry in the battle under Corcoran, who was still a prisoner in the hands of the enemy. And he concluded with the same general offer of redress in case of grievances. In the crowd I saw the officer with whom I had had the passage at Reveille that morning. His face was pale, and lips compressed. I foresaw a scene, but sat on the front seat of the carriage as quiet as a lamb. This officer forced his way through the crowd to the carriage, and said, Mr. President, I have a cause of grievance. This morning I went to speak to Colonel Sherman, and he threatened to shoot me. Mr. Lincoln, who was still standing, said, threatened to shoot you. Yes, sir, he threatened to shoot me. Mr. Lincoln looked at him, then at me, and stooping his tall, spare form toward the officer, said to him in a loud stage whisper, easily heard for some yards around, well, if I were you, and he threatened to shoot, I would not trust him. For I believe he would do it. The officer turned about and disappeared, and the men laughed at him. Soon the carriage drove on, and, as we descended the hill, I explained the facts to the president, who answered, of course I didn't know anything about it, but I thought you knew your own business best. I thanked him for his confidence, and assured him that what he had done would go far to enable me to maintain good discipline, and it did. By this time the day was well spent. I asked to take my leave, and the President and Mr. Seward drove back to Washington. This spirit of mutiny was common to the whole army, and was not subdued till several regiments or parts of regiments had been ordered to Fort Jefferson, Florida, as punishment. General McDowell had resumed his headquarters at the Arlington House, and was busily engaged in restoring order to his army, 
sending off the 90 days men, and replacing them by regiments which had come under the three years' call. We were all trembling lest we should be held personally accountable for the disastrous result of the battle. General McClellan had been summoned from the West to Washington, and changes in the subordinate commands were announced almost daily. I remember, as a group of officers were talking in the large room of the Arlington House, used as the adjutant general's office, one evening, some young officer came in with a list of the new brigadiers just announced at the War Department. Which embraced the names of Heintzeven, Keyes, Franklin, Andrew Porter, W. T. Sherman, and others, who had been colonels in the battle, and all of whom had shared the common stampede. Of course, we discredited the truth of the list, and Heintzeven broke out in his nasal voice, Boys, it's all a lie. Every mother's son of you will be cashiered. We all felt he was right, but, nevertheless, it was true, and we were all announced in general orders as brigadier generals of volunteers. General McClellan arrived, and, on assuming command, confirmed McDowell's organization. Instead of coming over the river, as we expected, he took a house in Washington, and only came over from time to time to have a review or inspection. I had received several new regiments, and had begun two new forts on the hill or plateau, above and farther out than Fort Corcoran. And I organized a system of drills, embracing the evolutions of the line, all of which was new to me, and I had to learn the tactics from books. But I was convinced that we had a long, hard war before us, and made up my mind to begin at the very beginning to prepare for it. August was passing, and troops were pouring in from all quarters. General McClellan told me he intended to organize an army of a hundred thousand men, with one hundred field batteries, and I still hoped he would come on our side of the Potomac, pitch his tent, and prepare for real hard work. But his headquarters still remained in a house in Washington City. I then thought, and still think, that was a fatal mistake. His choice as general-in-chief at the time was fully justified by his high reputation in the army and country, and, if he then had any political views or ambition, I surely did not suspect it. About the middle of August I got a note from Brigadier General Robert Anderson, asking me to come and see him at his room at Willard's Hotel. I rode over and found him in conversation with several gentlemen, and he explained to me that events in Kentucky were approaching a crisis. That the legislature was in session, and ready, as soon as properly backed by the general government, to take open sides for the Union cause, that he was offered the command of the Department of the Cumberland, to embrace Kentucky, Tennessee, etc. And that he wanted help, and that the President had offered to allow him to select out of the new brigadiers four of his own choice. I had been a lieutenant in Captain Anderson's company, at Fort Moultrie, from 1843 to 1846, and he explained that he wanted me as his right hand. He also indicated George H. Thomas, D. C. Buell, and Burnside, as the other three. Of course, I always wanted to go west, and was perfectly willing to go with Anderson, especially in a subordinate capacity, we agreed to call on the President on a subsequent day, to talk with him about it, and we did. It hardly seems probable that Mr. Lincoln should have come to Willard's Hotel to meet us, but my impression is that he did, and that General Anderson had some difficulty in prevailing on him to appoint George H. Thomas, a native of Virginia, to be Brigadier General, because so many Southern officers, had already played false. But I was still more emphatic in my endorsement of him by reason of my talk with him at the time he crossed the Potomac with Patterson's army, when Mr. Lincoln promised to appoint him and to assign him to duty with General Anderson. In this interview with Mr. Lincoln, I also explained to him my extreme desire to serve in a subordinate capacity, and in no event to be left in a superior command. He promised me this with promptness, making the jocular remark that his chief trouble was to find places for the too many generals who wanted to be at the head of affairs, to command armies, etc. The official order is dated. Special Order No. 114. Headquarters of the Army. Washington, August 24, 1881. The following assignment is made of the general officers of the volunteer service, whose appointment was announced in General Orders No. 82, from the War Department. To the Department of the Cumberland, Brigadier General Robert Anderson, Commanding. 
Brigadier General W. T. Sherman. Brigadier General George H. Thomas. By command of Lieutenant General Scott. E. D. Townsend, Assistant Adjutant General. After some days, I was relieved in command of my brigade and post by Brigadier General Fitz John Porter, and at once took my departure for Cincinnati, Ohio, via Crescent, Pennsylvania, where General Anderson was with his family. And he, Thomas, and I, met by appointment at the house of his brother, Lars Anderson, ESQ, in Cincinnati. We were there on the 1st and 2d of September, when several prominent gentlemen of Kentucky met us, to discuss the situation, among whom were Jackson, Harlan, Speed, and others. At that time, William Nelson, an officer of the Navy, had been commissioned a Brigadier General of Volunteers, and had his camp at Dick Robinson, a few miles beyond the Kentucky River, south of Nicholasville, and Brigadier General L. H. Rousseau had another camp at Jeffersonville, opposite Louisville. The state legislature was in session at Frankfurt, and was ready to take definite action as soon as General Anderson was prepared, for the state was threatened with invasion from Tennessee, by two forces, one from the direction of Nashville. Commanded by Generals Albert Sidney Johnston and Buckner. And the other from the direction of Cumberland Gap, commanded by Generals Crittenden and Zollicoffer. General Anderson saw that he had not force enough to resist these two columns, and concluded to send me in person for help to Indianapolis and Springfield, to confer with the governors of Indiana, and Illinois, and to General Fremont. Who commanded in ST? Lewis. McClellan and Fremont were the two men toward whom the country looked as the great Union leaders, and toward them were streaming the newly raised regiments of infantry and cavalry, and batteries of artillery. Nobody seeming to think of the intervening link covered by Kentucky. While I was to make this tour, Generals Anderson and Thomas were to go to Louisville and initiate the department. None of us had a staff or any of the machinery for organizing an army, and, indeed, we had no army to organize. Anderson was empowered to raise regiments in Kentucky, and to commission a few brigadier generals. At Indianapolis I found Governor Morton and all the state officials busy in equipping and providing for the new regiments, and my object was to divert some of them toward Kentucky. But they were called for as fast as they were mustered in either for the army of McClellan or Fremont. At Springfield also I found the same general activity in zeal, Governor Yates busy in providing for his men. But these men also had been promised to Fremont. I then went on to St. Louis, where all was seeming activity, bustle, and preparation. Meeting R. M. Rennick at the planter's house, where I stopped, I inquired where I could find General Fremont. Rennick said, What do you want with General Fremont? I said I had come to see him on business, and he added, You don't suppose that he will see such as you? and went on to retail all the scandal of the day, that Fremont was a great potentate, surrounded by sentries and guards, that he had a more showy court than any real king. That he kept senators, governors, and the first citizens, dancing attendance for days and weeks before granting an audience, etc. That if I expected to see him on business, I would have to make my application in writing, and submit to a close scrutiny by his chief of staff and by his civil surroundings. Of course I laughed at all this, and renewed my simple inquiry as to where was his office, and was informed that he resided and had his office at Major Brandt's new house on Shoto Avenue. It was then late in the afternoon, and I concluded to wait till the next morning, but that night I received a dispatch from General Anderson in Louisville to hurry back, as events were pressing, and he needed me. Accordingly, I rose early next morning before daybreak, got breakfast with the early railroad passengers, and about sunrise was at the gate of General Fremont's headquarters. A sentinel with drawn saber paraded up and down in front of the house. I had on my undress uniform indicating my rank, and inquired of the sentinel, is General Fremont up? He answered, I don't know. Seeing that he was a soldier by his bearing, I spoke in a sharp, emphatic voice, then find out. He called for the corporal of the guard, and soon a fine-looking German sergeant came, to whom I addressed the same inquiry. He in turn did not know, and I bade him find out, as I had immediate and important business with the general. The sergeant entered the house by the front basement door, 
and after 10 or 15 minutes the main front door above was slowly opened from the inside, and who should appear but my old San Francisco acquaintance Isaiah C. Woods, whom I had not seen or heard of since his flight to Australia, at the time of the failure of Adams and Company in 1851. He ushered me in hastily, closed the door, and conducted me into the office on the right of the hall. We were glad to meet, after so long and eventful an interval, and mutually inquired after our respective families and special acquaintances. I found that he was a commissioned officer, a major on duty with Fremont, and Major Eaton, now of the paymaster's department, was in the same office with him. I explained to them that I had come from General Anderson, and wanted to confer with General Fremont in person. Woods left me, but soon returned, said the general would see me in a very few minutes, and within ten minutes I was shown across the hall into the large parlor, where General Fremont received me very politely. We had met before, as early as 1847, in California, and I had also seen him several times when he was senator. I then in a rapid manner ran over all the points of interest in General Anderson's new sphere of action, hoped he would spare us from the new levies what troops he could, and generally act in concert with us. He told me that his first business would be to drive the rebel General Price and his army out of Missouri, when he would turn his attention down the Mississippi. He asked my opinion about the various kinds of field artillery which manufacturers were thrusting on him, especially the then newly invented James Gunn. And afterward our conversation took a wide turn about the character of the principal citizens of St. Louis, with whom I was well acquainted. Telling General Fremont that I had been summoned to Louisville and that I should leave in the first train, viz., at 3 p.m., I took my leave of him. Returning to Wood's office, I found there two more Californians, viz., Messrs. Palmer and Haskell, so I felt that, while Fremont might be suspicious of others, he allowed free ingress to his old California acquaintances. Returning to the planter's house, I heard of Beard, another Californian, a Mormon, who had the contract for the line of redoubts which Fremont had ordered to be constructed around the city. Before he would take his departure for the interior of the state. And while I stood near the office counter, I saw old Baron Steinberger, a prince among our early California adventurers, come in and look over the register. I avoided him on purpose, but his presence in St. Lewis recalled the maxim, where the vultures are, there is a carcass close by, and I suspected that the profitable contracts of the quartermaster, McKinstry, had drawn to St. Louis some of the most enterprising men of California. I suspect they can account for the fact that, in a very short time, Fremont fell from his high estate in Missouri, by reason of frauds, or supposed frauds, in the administration of the affairs of his command. I left St. Louis that afternoon and reached Louisville the next morning. I found General Anderson quartered at the Louisville Hotel, and he had taken a dwelling homes on underscore 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 street as an office. Captain O. D. Greens was his adjutant general, Lieutenant Throckmorton his aide, and Captain Prime, of the Engineer Corps, was on duty with him. General George H. Thomas had been dispatched to Camp Dick Robinson, to relieve Nelson. The city was full of all sorts of rumors. The legislature, moved by considerations purely of a political nature, had taken the step, whatever it was, that amounted to an adherence to the Union, instead of joining the already seceded states. This was universally known to be the signal for action. For it we were utterly unprepared, whereas the rebels were fully prepared. General Sidney Johnston immediately crossed into Kentucky, and advanced as far as Bowling Green, which he began to fortify, and thence dispatched General Buckner with a division forward toward Louisville. General Zollicoffer, in like manner, entered the state and advanced as far as Somerset. On the day I reached Louisville the excitement ran high. It was known that Columbus, Kentucky, had been occupied, September 7, by a strong rebel force, under Generals Pillow and Polk, and that General Grant had moved from Cairo and occupied Paducah in force on the 6th. Many of the rebel families expected Buckner to reach Louisville at any moment. That night, General Anderson sent for me, and I found with him Mr. Guthrie, President of the Louisville and Nashville Railroad, who had in his hands a dispatch to the effect that the bridge across the rolling fork of Salt Creek, 
less than 30 miles out, had been burned, and that Buckner's force en route for Louisville, had been detained beyond Green River by a train thrown from the track. We learned afterward that a man named Byrd had displaced a rail on purpose to throw the train off the track, and thereby give us time. Mr. Guthrie explained that in the ravine just beyond Salt Creek were several high and important trestles which, if destroyed, would take months to replace, and General Anderson thought it well. Worth the effort to save them. Also, on Muldraws Hill beyond, was a strong position, which had in former years been used as the site for the state camp of instruction, and we all supposed that General Buckner, who was familiar with the ground, was aiming for a position there, from which to operate on Louisville. All the troops we had to counteract Buckner were Rousseau's legion, and a few home guards in Louisville. The former were still encamped across the river at Jeffersonville. So General Anderson ordered me to go over, and with them, and such home guards as we could collect, make the effort to secure possession of Muldraws Hill before Buckner could reach it. I took Captain Prime with me. And crossed over to Rousseau's camp. The long roll was beaten, and within an hour the men, to the number of about one thousand, were marching for the ferry boat and for the Nashville depot. Meantime General Anderson had sent to collect some home guards, and Mr. Guthrie to get the trains ready. It was after midnight before we began to move. The trains proceeded slowly, and it was daybreak when we reached Lebanon Junction, twenty-six miles out, where we disembarked, and marched to the bridge over Salt River, which we found had been burnt. Whether to prevent Buckner coming into Louisville, or us from going out, was not clear. Rousseau's legion forded the stream and marched up to the state camp of instruction, finding the high trestles all secure. The railroad hands went to work at once to rebuild the bridge. I remained a couple of days at Lebanon Junction, during which General Anderson forwarded two regiments of volunteers that had come to him. Before the bridge was done we advanced the whole camp to the summit of Muldraws Hill, just back of Elizabethtown. There I learned definitely that General Buckner had not crossed Green River at all, that General Sidney Johnston was fortifying Bowling Green, and preparing for a systematic advance into Kentucky, of which he was a native. And with whose people and geography he must have been familiar. As fast as fresh troops reached Louisville, they were sent out to me at Muldraws Hill, where I was endeavoring to put them into shape for service. And by the 1st of October I had the equivalent of a division of two brigades preparing to move forward toward Green River. The daily correspondence between General Anderson and myself satisfied me that the worry and harassment at Louisville were exhausting his strength and health, and that he would soon leave. On a telegraphic summons from him, about the 5th of October, I went down to Louisville, when General Anderson said he could not stand the mental torture of his command any longer, and that he must go away, or it would kill him. On the 8th of October he actually published an order relinquishing the command, and, by reason of my seniority, I had no alternative but to assume command, though much against the grain, and in direct violation of Mr. Lincoln's promise to me. I am certain that, in my earliest communication to the War Department, I renewed the expression of my wish to remain in a subordinate position, and that I received the assurance that Brigadier General Buell would soon arrive from California. And would be sent to relieve me. By that time I had become pretty familiar with the geography and the general resources of Kentucky. We had parties all over the state raising regiments and companies. But it was manifest that the young men were generally inclined to the cause of the South, while the older men of property wanted to be let alone, i.e., to remain neutral. As to a forward movement that fall, it was simply impracticable. For we were forced to use divergent lines, leading our columns farther and farther apart, and all I could attempt was to go on and collect force and material at the two points already chosen, viz., Dick Robinson in Elizabethtown. General George H. Thomas still continued to command the former, and on the 12th of October I dispatched Brigadier General A. M. C. D. McCook to command the latter, which had been moved forward to Nolan Creek, 52 miles out of Louisville, toward Bowling Green. Staff officers began to arrive to relieve us of the constant drudgery which, up to that time, had been forced on General Anderson and myself, and these were all good men. Colonel Thomas Swords, quartermaster, arrived on the 13th. Paymaster Larned on the 14th, 
and Lt. Smizer, 5th Artillery, Acting Ordnance Officer, on the 20th, Capt. Simons was already on duty as the Commissary of Subsistence, Capt. O. D. Green was the Adjutant General, and completed a good working staff. The everlasting worry of citizens complaining of every petty delinquency of a soldier, and forcing themselves forward to discuss politics, made the position of a commanding general no sinecure. I continued to strengthen the two corps forward and their routes of supply. All the time expecting that Sidney Johnston, who was a real general, and who had as correct information of our situation as I had, would unite his force with Zollicoffer, and fall on Thomas at Dick Robinson. Or McCook at Nolan, had he done so in October, 1861, he could have walked into Louisville, and the vital part of the population would have hailed him as a deliverer. Why he did not, was to me a mystery then and is now, for I know that he saw the move, and had his wagons loaded up at one time for a start toward Frankfurt, passing between our two camps. Conscious of our weakness, I was unnecessarily unhappy, and doubtless exhibited it too much to those near me. But it did seem to me that the government at Washington, intent on the larger preparations of Fremont in Missouri and McClellan in Washington, actually ignored us in Kentucky. About this time, say the middle of October, I received notice, by telegraph, that the Secretary of War, Mr. Cameron, then in St. Louis, would visit me at Louisville, on his way back to Washington. I was delighted to have an opportunity to properly represent the actual state of affairs, and got Mr. Guthrie to go with me across to Jeffersonville, to meet the Secretary of War and escort him to Louisville. The train was behind time, but Mr. Guthrie and I waited till it actually arrived. Mr. Cameron was attended by Adjutant General Lorenzo Thomas, and six or seven gentlemen who turned out to be newspaper reporters. Mr. Cameron's first inquiry was, when he could start for Cincinnati, saying that, as he had been detained at St. Louis so long, it was important he should hurry on to Washington. I explained that the regular mailboat would leave very soon, viz. At 12 m. but I begged him to come over to Louisville, that I wanted to see him on business as important as any in Washington, and hoped he would come and spend at least a day with us. He asked if everything was not well with us, and I told him far from it, that things were actually bad, as bad as bad could be. This seemed to surprise him, and Mr. Guthrie added his persuasion to mine, when Mr. Cameron, learning that he could leave Louisville by rail via Frankfurt next morning early, and make the same connections at Cincinnati, consented to go with us to Louisville. With the distinct understanding that he must leave early the next morning for Washington. We accordingly all took hacks, crossed the river by the ferry, and drove to the Galt House, where I was then staying. Brigadier General T. J. Wood had come down from Indianapolis by the same train, and was one of the party. We all proceeded to my room on the first floor of the Galt House, where our excellent landlord, Silas Miller, E.S.Q., sent us a good lunch and something to drink. Mr. Cameron was not well, and lay on my bed, but joined in the general conversation. He and his party seemed to be full of the particulars of the developments in St. Louis of some of Fremont's extravagant contracts and expenses, which were the occasion of Cameron's trip to St. Louis, and which finally resulted in Fremont's being relieved, first by General Hunter, and after by General H. W. Halleck. After some general conversation, Mr. Cameron called to me, Now, General Sherman, tell us of your troubles. I said I preferred not to discuss business with so many strangers present. He said, they are all friends, all members of my family, and you may speak your mind freely and without restraint. I am sure I stepped to the door, locked it to prevent intrusion, and then fully and fairly represented the state of affairs in Kentucky, especially the situation and numbers of my troops. I complained that the new levies of Ohio and Indiana were diverted east and west, and we got scarcely anything. That our forces at Nolan and Dick Robinson were powerless for invasion, and only tempting to a general such as we believed Sidney Johnston to be, that, if Johnston chose, he could march to Louisville any day. Cameron exclaimed, You astonish me. Our informants, the Kentucky senators and members of Congress, claim that they have in Kentucky plenty of men, and all they want are arms and money. I then said it was not true. 
for the young men were arming and going out openly in broad daylight to the rebel camps, provided with good horses and guns by their fathers, who were at best neutral. And as to arms, he had, in Washington, promised General Anderson 40,000 of the best Springfield muskets, instead of which we had received only about 12,000 Belgian muskets, which the governor of Pennsylvania had refused. As had also the governor of Ohio, but which had been adjudged good enough for Kentucky. I asserted that volunteer colonels raising regiments in various parts of the state had come to Louisville for arms, and when they saw what I had to offer had scorned to receive them, to confirm the truth of which I appealed to Mr. Guthrie, who said that every word I had spoken was true, and he repeated what I had often heard him say, that no man who owned a slave or a mule in Kentucky could be trusted. Mr. Cameron appeared alarmed at what was said, and turned to Adjutant General L. Thomas, to inquire if he knew of any troops available, that had not been already assigned. He mentioned Negley's Pennsylvania Brigade, at Pittsburgh, and a couple of other regiments that were then en route for St. Louis. Mr. Cameron ordered him to divert these to Louisville, and Thomas made the telegraphic orders on the spot. He further promised, on reaching Washington, to give us more of his time and assistance. In the general conversation which followed, I remember taking a large map of the United States, and assuming the people of the whole South to be in rebellion, that our task was to subdue them, showed that McClellan was on the left. Having a frontage of less than a hundred miles, and Fremont the right, about the same. Whereas I, the center, had from the Big Sandy to Paducah, over three hundred miles of frontier, that McClellan had a hundred thousand men, Fremont sixty thousand, whereas to me had only been allotted about eighteen thousand. I argued that, for the purpose of defense we should have sixty thousand men at once, and for offense, would need two hundred thousand, before we were done. Mr. Cameron, who still lay on the bed, threw up his hands and exclaimed, Great God! Where are they to come from? I asserted that there were plenty of men at the North, ready and willing to come, if he would only accept their services. For it was notorious that regiments had been formed in all the northwestern states, whose services had been refused by the War Department, on the ground that they would not be needed. We discussed all these matters fully, in the most friendly spirit, and I thought I had aroused Mr. Cameron to a realization of the great war that was before us, and was in fact upon us. I heard him tell General Thomas to make a note of our conversation, that he might attend to my requests on reaching Washington. We all spent the evening together agreeably in conversation, many Union citizens calling to pay their respects, and the next morning early we took the train for Frankfurt, Mr. Cameron and party going on to Cincinnati and Washington, and I to Camp Dick Robinson to see General Thomas and the troops there. I found General Thomas in a tavern, with most of his regiments camped about him. He had sent a small force some miles in advance toward Cumberland Gap, under Brigadier General Shope. Remaining there a couple of days, I returned to Louisville. On the 22d of October, General Negley's brigade arrived in boats from Pittsburgh, was sent out to Camp Nolan, and the 37th Indiana. Colonel Hazard, and 2nd Minnesota, Colonel Van Cleve, also reached Louisville by rail, and were posted at Elizabethtown and Lebanon Junction. These were the same troops which had been ordered by Mr. Cameron when at Louisville, and they were all that I received thereafter, prior to my leaving Kentucky. On reaching Washington, Mr. Cameron called on General Thomas, as he himself afterward told me, to submit his memorandum of events during his absence, and in that memorandum was mentioned my insane request for 200,000 men. By some newspaper man this was seen and published, and, before I had the least conception of it, I was universally published throughout the country as, insane, crazy, etc. Without any knowledge, however, of this fact, I had previously addressed to the Adjutant General of the Army at Washington this letter. Headquarters Department of the Cumberland, Louisville, Kentucky. October 22, 1881. To General L. Thomas, Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. Sir, on my arrival at Camp Dick Robinson, I found General Thomas had stationed a Kentucky regiment at Rock Castle Hill, beyond a river of the same name, and had sent an Ohio and an Indiana regiment forward in support. He was embarrassed for transportation, 
and I authorized him to hire teams, and to move his whole force nearer to his advance guard, so as to support it, as he had information of the approach of Zollicoffer toward London. I have just heard from him, that he had sent forward General Shope with Colonel Wolford's cavalry, Colonel Stedman's Ohio regiment, and a battery of artillery, followed on a succeeding day by a Tennessee brigade. He had still two Kentucky regiments, the 38th Ohio and another battery of artillery, with which he was to follow yesterday. This force, if concentrated, should be strong enough for the purpose. At all events, it is all he had or I could give him. I explained to you fully, when here, the supposed position of our adversaries, among which was a force in the valley of Big Sandy, supposed to be advancing on Paris, Kentucky. General Nelson at Maysville was instructed to collect all the men he could, and Colonel Gill's regiment of Ohio volunteers. Colonel Harris was already in position at Olympian Springs, and a regiment lay at Lexington, which I ordered to his support. This leaves the line of Thomas's operations exposed, but I cannot help it. I explained so fully to yourself and the Secretary of War the condition of things, that I can add nothing new until further developments, you know my views that this great center of our field is too weak, far too weak. And I have begged and implored till I dare not say more. Buckner still is beyond Green River. He sent a detachment of his men, variously estimated at from two to four thousand toward Greensburg. General Ward, with about one thousand men, retreated to Campbellsburg, where he called to his assistance some partially formed regiments to the number of about two thousand. The enemy did not advance, and General Ward was at last dates at Campbellsburg. The officers charged with raising regiments must of necessity be near their homes to collect men, and for this reason are out of position. But at or near Greensburg and Lebanon, I desire to assemble as large a force of the Kentucky volunteers as possible. This organization is necessarily irregular, but the necessity is so great that I must have them, and therefore have issued to them arms and clothing during the process of formation. This has facilitated their enlistment. But inasmuch as the legislature has provided money for organizing the Kentucky Volunteers, and entrusted its disbursement to a board of loyal gentlemen, I have endeavored to cooperate with them to hasten the formation of these corps. The great difficulty is, and has been, that as volunteers offer, we have not arms and clothing to give them. The arms sent us are, as you already know, European muskets of uncouth pattern, which the volunteers will not touch. General McCook has now three brigades, Johnson's, Woods, and Rousseau's. Negley's brigade arrived today, and will be sent out at once. The Minnesota regiment has also arrived, and will be sent forward. Hazard's Regiment of Indiana Troops I have ordered to the month of Salt Creek, an important point on the Turnpike Road leading to Elizabethtown. I again repeat that our force here is out of all proportion to the importance of the position. Our defeat would be disastrous to the nation, and to expect of new men, who never bore arms, to do miracles, is not right. I am, with much respect, yours truly. W. T. Sherman, Brigadier General Commanding. About this time my attention was drawn to the publication in all the Eastern papers, which of course was copied at the West, of the report that I was, crazy, insane, and mad. That, I had demanded 200,000 men for the defense of Kentucky. And the authority given for this report was stated to be the Secretary of War himself, Mr. Cameron, who never, to my knowledge, took pains to affirm or deny it. My position was therefore simply unbearable, and it is probable I resented the cruel insult with language of intense feeling. Still I received no orders, no reinforcements, not a word of encouragement or relief. About November 1st, General McClellan was appointed commander-in-chief of all the armies in the field, and by telegraph called for a report from me. It is herewith given. Headquarters The Department of the Cumberland, Louisville, Kentucky, November 4th, 1861. General L. Thomas, Adjutant General, Washington, D.C. Sir, in compliance with the telegraphic orders of General McClellan, received late last night, I submit this report of the forces in Kentucky, and of their condition. The tabular statement shows the position of the several regiments. The camp at Nolan is at the present extremity of the Nashville Railroad. 
This force was thrown forward to meet the advance of Buckner's army, which then fell back to Green River, 23 miles beyond. These regiments were substantially without means of transportation, other than the railroad, which is guarded at all dangerous points, yet is liable to interruption at any moment. By the tearing up of a rail by the disaffected inhabitants or a hired enemy. These regiments are composed of good materials, but devoid of company officers of experience, and have been put under thorough drill since being in camp. They are generally well clad, and provided for. Beyond Green River, the enemy has massed his forces, and it is very difficult to ascertain even the approximate numbers. No pains have been spared to ascertain them, but without success, and it is well known that they far outnumber us. Depending, however, on the railroads to their rear for transportation, they have not thus far advanced this side of Green River, except in marauding parties. This is the proper line of advance, but will require a very large force, certainly 50,000 men, as their railroad facilities south enable them to concentrate at Munfordsville the entire strength of the south. General McCook's command is divided into four brigades, under Generals Wood, R. W., Johnson, Rousseau, and Negley. General Thomas's line of operations is from Lexington, toward Cumberland Gap and Ford, which are occupied by a force of rebel Tennesseans, under the command of Zollicoffer. Thomas occupies the position at London, in front of two roads which lead to the fertile part of Kentucky, the one by Richmond, and the other by Crab Orchard, with his reserve at Camp Dick Robinson, eight miles south of the Kentucky River. His provisions and stores go by railroad from Cincinnati to Nicholasville, and thence in wagons to his several regiments. He is forced to hire transportation. Brigadier General Nelson is operating by the line from Olympian Springs, east of Paris, on the Covington and Lexington Railroad, toward Prestonburg. In the valley of the Big Sandy where is assembled a force of from 25 to 3,500 rebel Kentuckians waiting reinforcements from Virginia. My last report from him was to October 28, at which time he had Colonel Harris's Ohio 2nd, 900 strong, Colonel Norton's 21st Ohio, 1,000 and Colonel Sills 33rd Ohio, 750 strong. With two irregular Kentucky regiments, Colonels Marshall and Metcalf. These troops were on the road near Hazel Green and West Liberty, advancing toward Prestonburg. Upon an inspection of the map, you will observe these are all divergent lines, but rendered necessary, from the fact that our enemies choose them as places of refuge from pursuit, where they can receive assistance from neighboring states. Our lines are all too weak, probably with the exception of that to Prestonburg. To strengthen these, I am thrown on the raw levies of Ohio and Indiana, who arrive in detachments, perfectly fresh from the country, and loaded down with baggage, also upon the Kentuckians, who are slowly forming regiments all over the state. At points remote from danger, and whom it will be almost impossible to assemble together. The organization of this latter force is, by the laws of Kentucky, under the control of a military board of citizens, at the capital, Frankfurt, and they think they will be enabled to have fifteen regiments toward the middle of this month. But I doubt it, and deem it unsafe to rely on them, there are four regiments forming in the neighborhood of Owensboro, near the mouth of Green River, who are doing good service, also in the neighborhood of Campbellsville. But it is unsafe to rely on troops so suddenly armed and equipped. They are not yet clothed or uniformed. I know well you will think our force too widely distributed, but we are forced to it by the attitude of our enemies, whose force and numbers the country never has and probably never will comprehend. I am told that my estimate of troops needed for this line, viz., 200,000, has been construed to my prejudice, and therefore leave it for the future. This is the great center on which our enemies can concentrate whatever force is not employed elsewhere. Detailed statement of present force enclosed with this. With great respect, your obedient servant. W. T. Sherman, Brigadier General Commanding. Brigadier General McCook's Camp, at Nolan, 52 miles from Louisville, Kentucky, November 4, 1861. First Brigade, General Rousseau, Third Kentucky, Colonel Bulkley, Fourth Kentucky, Colonel Whitaker, First Cavalry, Colonel Board. Stone's Battery, 2 Companies 19th United States Infantry, and 2 Companies 15th United States Infantry, 
Captain Gilman. 2nd Brigade, General T. J. Wood, dot, 38th Indiana, Colonel Scribner. 39th Indiana, Colonel Harrison, 30th Indiana, Colonel Base, 29th Indiana, Colonel Miller. 3rd Brigade, General Johnson, dot, 49th Ohio, Colonel Gibson, 15th Ohio, Colonel Dickey, 34th Illinois, Colonel King. 32nd Indiana, Colonel Willock. 4th Brigade, General Negley, dot, 77th Pennsylvania, Colonel Hambright, 78th Pennsylvania, Colonel Sinnell, 79th Pennsylvania, Colonel Stambaugh, Battery, Captain Mueller. Camp Dick Robinson, General G. H. Thomas, dot, Kentucky, Colonel Bramlett, Kentucky, Colonel Fry, Kentucky Cavalry, Colonel Wolford, 14th Ohio, Colonel Stedman, 1st Artillery, Colonel Barnett, 3rd Ohio, Colonel Carter. East Tennessee, Colonel Byrd. Bardstown, Kentucky, 10th Indiana, Colonel Manson. Crab Orchard, 33rd Indiana, Colonel Coburn. Jeffersonville, Indiana, 34th Indiana, Colonel Steele, 36th Indiana, Colonel Gross. 1st Wisconsin, Colonel Starkweather. Mouth of Salt River, 9th Michigan, Colonel Duffield, 37th Indiana, Colonel Hazard. Lebanon Junction, 2nd Minnesota, Colonel Van Cleve. Olympian Springs, 2nd Ohio, Colonel Harris. Cynthiana, Kentucky, 35th Ohio, Colonel Van Dever. Nicholasville, Kentucky, 21st Ohio, Colonel Norton, 38th Ohio, Colonel Bradley. Big Hill, 17th Ohio, Colonel Connell. Colesburg. 24th Illinois, Colonel Hecker. Elizabethtown, Kentucky, 19th Illinois, Colonel Turchin. Owensboro or Henderson, 31st Indiana, Colonel Cruft, Colonel Edwards, Forming Rock Castle, Colonel Boyle, Harrodsburg. Colonel Barney, Irvine, Colonel Hazard, Bucksville, Colonel Haskins, Somerset. And, in order to conclude this subject, I also add copies of two telegraphic dispatches, sent for General McClellan's use about the same time, which are all the official letters received at his headquarters, as certified by the Adjutant General, L. Thomas, in a letter of February 1, 1862, in answer to an application of my brother, Senator John Sherman, and on which I was adjudged insane. Louisville, November 3, 10 p.m. To General McClellan, Washington, D.C. Dispatch just received. We are forced to operate on three lines, all dependent on railroads of doubtful safety, requiring strong guards. From Paris to Prestonburg, three Ohio regiments and some militia, enemy variously reported from 3,500 to 7,000. From Lexington toward Cumberland Gap, Brigadier General Thomas, one Indiana and five Ohio regiments, two Kentucky and two Tennessee, hired wagons and badly clad. Zollicoffer, at Cumberland Ford, about 7,000. Lee reported on the way with Virginia reinforcements. In front of Louisville, 52 miles, McCook, with four brigades of about 13,000, with four regiments to guard the railroad, at all times in danger. Enemy along the railroad from Green River to Bowling Green, Nashville, and Clarksville. Buckner, Hardy, Sidney Johnston, Folk, and Pillow, the two former in immediate command, the force as large as they want or can subsist, from 25 to 30,000. Bowling Green strongly fortified. Our force is too small to do good, and too large to sacrifice. W. T. Sherman, Brigadier General. Headquarters The Department of the Cumberland, Louisville. Kentucky, November 6, 1861. General L. Thomas, Adjutant General. Sir, General McClellan telegraphs me to report to him daily the situation of affairs here. The country is so large that it is impossible to give clear and definite views. Our enemies have a terrible advantage in the fact that in our midst, in our camps, and along our avenues of travel, they have active partisans, farmers and businessmen, who seemingly pursue their usual calling, but are in fact spies. They report all our movements and strength, while we can procure information only by circuitous and unreliable means. 
I enclose you the copy of an intercepted letter, which is but the type of others. Many men from every part of the state are now enrolled under Buckner, have gone to him, while ours have to be raised in neighborhoods, and cannot be called together except at long notice. These volunteers are being organized under the laws of the state, and the 10th of November is fixed for the time of consolidating them into companies and regiments. Many of them are armed by the United States as home guards, and many by General Anderson and myself, because of the necessity of being armed to guard their camps against internal enemies. Should we be overwhelmed, they would scatter, and their arms and clothing will go to the enemy, furnishing the very material they so much need. We should have here a very large force, sufficient to give confidence to the Union men of the ability to do what should be done, possess ourselves of all the state. But all see and feel we are brought to a standstill, and this produces doubt and alarm. With our present force it would be simple madness to cross Green River, and yet hesitation may be as fatal. In like manner the other columns are in peril, not so much in front as rear, the railroads over which our stores must pass being much exposed. I have the Nashville Railroad guarded by three regiments, yet it is far from being safe. And, the moment actual hostilities commence, these roads will be interrupted, and we will be in a dilemma. To meet this in part one have put a cargo of provisions at the mouth of Salt River, guarded by two regiments. All these detachments weaken the main force, and endanger the whole. Do not conclude, as before, that I exaggerate the facts. They are as stated, and the future looks as dark as possible. It would be better if some man of sanguine mind were here, for I am forced to order according to my convictions. Yours truly. W. T. Sherman, Brigadier General Commanding. After the war was over, General Thomas J. Wood, then in command of the District of Vicksburg, prepared a statement addressed to the public, describing the interview with the Secretary of War, which he calls a, Council of War. I did not then deem it necessary to renew a matter which had been swept into oblivion by the war itself, but, as it is evidenced by an eyewitness, it is worthy of insertion here. Statement. On the 11th of October, 1861, the writer, who had been personally on mustering duty in Indiana, was appointed a Brigadier General of Volunteers, and ordered to report to General Sherman, then in command of the Department of the Cumberland. With his headquarters at Louisville, having succeeded General Robert Anderson. When the writer was about leaving Indianapolis to proceed to Louisville, Mr. Cameron, returning from his famous visit of inspection to General Fremont's department, at St. Louis, Missouri, arrived at Indianapolis, and announced his intention to visit General Sherman. The writer was invited to accompany the party to Louisville. Taking the early morning train from Indianapolis to Louisville on the 16th of October, 1861, the party arrived in Jeffersonville shortly after midday. General Sherman met the party in Jeffersonville, and accompanied it to the Galt House, in Louisville, the hotel at which he was stopping. During the afternoon General Sherman informed the writer that a council of war was to be held immediately in his private room in the hotel, and desired him to be present at the council. General Sherman and the writer proceeded directly to the room. The writer entered the room first, and observed in it Mr. Cameron, Adjutant General L. Thomas, and some other persons, all of whose names he did not know, but whom he recognized as being of Mr. Cameron's party. The name of one of the party the writer had learned, which he remembers as Wilkinson, or Wilkerson, and who he understood was a writer for the New York Tribune newspaper. The Honorable James Guthrie was also in the room, having been invited, on account of his eminent position as a citizen of Kentucky, his high civic reputation, and his well-known devotion to the Union, to meet the Secretary of War in the Council. When General Sherman entered the room he closed the door, and turned the key in the lock. Before entering on the business of the meeting, General Sherman remarked substantially, Mr. Cameron, we have met here to discuss matters and interchange views which should be known only by persons high in the confidence of the government. There are persons present whom I do not know, and I desire to know, before opening the business of the council, whether they are persons who may be properly allowed to hear the views which I have to submit to you. Mr. Cameron replied, with some little testiness of manner, that the persons referred to belonged to his party, 
and there was no objection to their knowing whatever might be communicated to him. Certainly the legitimate and natural conclusion from this remark of Mr. Cameron's was that whatever views might be submitted by General Sherman would be considered under the protection of the seal of secrecy, and would not be divulged to the public till all apprehension of injurious consequences from such disclosure had passed. And it may be remarked, further, that justice to General Sherman required that if, at any future time, his conclusions as to the amount of force necessary to conduct the operations committed to his charge should be made public. The grounds on which his conclusions were based should be made public at the same time. Mr. Cameron then asked General Sherman what his plans were. To this General Sherman replied that he had no plans, that no sufficient force had been placed at his disposition with which to devise any plan of operations. That, before a commanding general could project a plan of campaign, he must know what amount of force he would have to operate with. The general added that he had views which he would be happy to submit for the consideration of the secretary. Mr. Cameron desired to hear General Sherman's views. General Sherman began by giving his opinion of the people of Kentucky, and the then condition of the state. He remarked that he believed a very large majority of the people of Kentucky were thoroughly devoted to the Union, and loyal to the government, and that the Unionists embraced almost all the older and more substantial men in the state. But, unfortunately, there was no organization nor arms among the Union men. That the rebel minority, thoroughly vindictive in its sentiments, was organized and armed, this having been done in advance by their leaders, and, beyond the reach of the federal forces, overawed and prevented the Union men from organizing. That, in his opinion, if federal protection were extended throughout the state to the Union men, a large force could be raised for the service of the government. General Sherman next presented a resume of the information in his possession as to the number of the rebel troops in Kentucky. Commencing with the force at Columbus, Kentucky, the reports varied, giving the strength from 10 to 20,000. It was commanded by Lt. Gen. Polk. Gen. Sherman fixed it at the lowest estimate, say, 10,000. The force at Bowling Green, commanded by Gen. A. S. Johnston, supported by Hardy, Buckner, and others, was variously estimated at from 18 to 30,000. General Sherman estimated this force at the lowest figures given to it by his information, 18,000. He explained that, for purposes of defense, these two forces ought, owing to the facility with which troops might be transported from one to the other, by the network of railroads in Middle and West Tennessee, to be considered almost as one. General Sherman remarked, also, on the facility with which reinforcements could be transported by railroad to Bowling Green, from the other rebellion states. The third organized body of rebel troops was in eastern Kentucky, under General Zollicoffer, estimated, according to the most reliable information, at 6,000 men. This force threatened a descent, if unrestrained, on the bluegrass region of Kentucky, including the cities of Lexington, and Frankfort, the capital of the state. And if successful in its primary movements, as it would gather head as it advanced, might endanger the safety of Cincinnati. General Sherman said that the information in his possession indicated an intention, on the part of the rebels, of a general and grand advance toward the Ohio River. He further expressed the opinion that, if such advance should be made, and not checked, the rebel force would be swollen by at least 20,000 recruits from the disloyalists in Kentucky. His low computation of the organized rebel soldiers then in Kentucky fixed the strength at about 35,000. Add 20,000 for reinforcements gained in Kentucky, to say nothing of troops drawn from other rebel states, and the effective rebel force in the state, at a low estimate, would be 55,000 men. General Sherman explained forcibly how largely the difficulties of suppressing the rebellion would be enhanced, if the rebels should be allowed to plant themselves firmly with strong fortifications, at commanding points on the Ohio River. It would be facile for them to carry the war thence into the loyal states north of the river. To resist an advance of the rebels, General Sherman stated that he did not have at that time in Kentucky more than some 12 to 14,000 effective men. The bulk of this force was posted at Camp Nolan, on the Louisville and Nashville Railway, 50 miles south of Louisville. A part of it was in eastern Kentucky, 
under General George H. Thomas, and a very small force was in the lower valley of Green River. This disposition of the force had been made for the double purpose of watching and checking the rebels, and protecting the raising and organization of troops among the Union men of Kentucky. Having explained the situation from the defensive point of view, General Sherman proceeded to consider it from the offensive standpoint. The government had undertaken to suppress the rebellion. The onus faciendi, therefore, rested on the government. The rebellion could never be put down, the authority of the paramount government asserted, and the union of the states declared perpetual, by force of arms, by maintaining the defensive. To accomplish these grand desiderata, it was absolutely necessary the government should adopt, and maintain until the rebellion was crushed, the offensive. For the purpose of expelling the rebels from Kentucky, General Sherman said that at least 60,000 soldiers were necessary. Considering that the means of accomplishment must always be proportioned to the end to be achieved, and bearing in mind the array of rebel force then in Kentucky, every sensible man must admit that the estimate of the force given by General Sherman for driving the rebels out of the state, and re-establishing and maintaining the authority of the government, was a very low one. The truth is that, before the rebels were driven from Kentucky, many more than 60,000 soldiers were sent into the state. Ascending from the consideration of the narrow question of the political and military situation in Kentucky, and the extent of force necessary to redeem the state from rebel thraldom. Forecasting in his sagacious intellect the grand and daring operations which, three years afterward, he realized in a campaign, taken in its entirety, without a parallel in modern times, General Sherman expressed the opinion that to carry the war to the Gulf of Mexico, and destroy all armed opposition to the government, in the entire Mississippi Valley, at least 200,000 troops were absolutely requisite. So soon as General Sherman had concluded the expression of his views, Mr. Cameron asked, with much warmth and apparent irritation, where do you suppose, General Sherman, all this force is to come from? General Sherman replied that he did not know, that it was not his duty to raise, organize, and put the necessary military force into the field, that duty pertained to the War Department. His duty was to organize campaigns and command the troops after they had been put into the field. At this point of the proceedings, General Sherman suggested that it might be agreeable to the Secretary to hear the views of Mr. Guthrie. Thus appealed to, Mr. Guthrie said he did not consider himself, being a civilian, competent to give an opinion as to the extent of force necessary to parry the war to the Gulf of Mexico. But, being well informed of the condition of things in Kentucky, he endorsed fully General Sherman's opinion of the force required to drive the rebels out of the state. The foregoing is a circumstantial account of the deliberations of the council that were of any importance. A good deal of desultory conversation followed, on immaterial matters. And some orders were issued by telegraph, by the Secretary of War, for some small reinforcements to be sent to Kentucky immediately, from Pennsylvania and Indiana. A short time after the council was held, the exact time is not now remembered by the writer, an imperfect narrative of it appeared in the New York Tribune. This account announced to the public the conclusions uttered by General Sherman in the Council, without giving the reasons on which his conclusions were based. The unfairness of this course to General Sherman needs no comment. All military men were shocked by the gross breach of faith which had been committed. T. H. J. Wood, Major General Volunteers. Vicksburg, Mississippi, August 24, 1886. Brigadier General Don Carlos Buell arrived at Louisville about the middle of November, with orders to relieve me, and I was transferred for duty to the Department of the Missouri, and ordered to report in person to Major General H. W. Halleck at St. Louis. I accompanied General Buell to the camp at Nolan, where he reviewed and inspected the camp and troops under the command of General A. M. C. D. McCook, and on our way back General Buell inspected the Regiment of Hazard at Elizabethtown. I then turned over my command to him, and took my departure for St. Louis. At the time I was so relieved I thought, of course, it was done in fulfillment of Mr. Lincoln's promise to me, and as a necessary result of my repeated demand for the fulfillment of that promise. But I saw and felt, and was of course deeply moved to observe, 
the manifest belief that there was more or less of truth in the rumor that the cares, perplexities, and anxiety of the situation had unbalanced my judgment and mind. It was, doubtless, an incident common to all civil wars, to which I could only submit with the best grace possible, trusting to the future for an opportunity to redeem my fortune and good name. Of course I could not deny the fact, and had to submit to all its painful consequences for months. And, moreover, I could not hide from myself that many of the officers and soldiers subsequently placed under my command looked at me askance and with suspicion. Indeed, it was not until the following April that the Battle of Shiloh gave me personally the chance to redeem my good name. On reaching St. Louis and reporting to General Halleck, I was received kindly, and was shortly afterward, viz. November 23d, sent up to Sedalia to inspect the camp there, and the troops located along the road back to Jefferson City, and I was ordered to assume command in a certain contingency. I found General Steeles at Sedalia with his regiments scattered about loosely, and General Pope at Otterville, twenty miles back, with no concert between them. The rebel general, Sterling Price, had his forces down about Osceola and Warsaw. I advised General Halleck to collect the whole of his men into one camp on the La Mine River, near Georgetown, to put them into brigades and divisions, so as to be ready to be handled, and I gave some preliminary orders looking to that end. But the newspapers kept harping on my insanity and paralyzed my efforts. In spite of myself, they tortured from me some words and acts of imprudence. General Halleck telegraphed me on November 26, unless telegraph lines are interrupted, make no movement of troops without orders, and on November 29, no forward movement of troops on Osceola will be made. Only strong reconnoitering parties will be sent out in the supposed direction of the enemy, the bulk of the troops being held in position till more reliable information is obtained. About the same time I received the following dispatch. Headquarters, St. Louis, Missouri. November 28, 1881. Brigadier General Sherman, Sedalia. Mrs. Sherman is here. General Halleck is satisfied, from reports of scouts received here, that no attack on Sedalia is intended. You will therefore return to this city, and report your observations on the condition of the troops you have examined. Please telegraph when you will leave. Schuyler Hamilton, Brigadier General and aide de camp I accordingly returned to St. Louis, where I found Mrs. Sherman, naturally and properly distressed at the continued and reiterated reports of the newspapers of my insanity, and she had come from Lancaster to see me. This recall from Sedalia simply swelled the cry. It was alleged that I was recalled by reason of something foolish I had done at Sedalia, though in fact I had done absolutely nothing, except to recommend what was done immediately thereafter on the advice of Colonel McPherson. On a subsequent inspection, seeing and realizing that my efforts were useless, I concluded to ask for a twenty days leave of absence, to accompany Mrs. Sherman to our home in Lancaster, and to allow the storm to blow over somewhat. It also happened to be midwinter, when nothing was doing, so Mrs. Sherman and I returned to Lancaster, where I was born, and where I supposed I was better known and appreciated. The newspapers kept up their game as though instigated by malice, and chief among them was the Cincinnati Commercial, whose editor, Halstead, was generally believed to be an honorable man. P. B. Ewing, E. S. Q. Being in Cincinnati, saw him and asked him why he, who certainly knew better, would reiterate such a damaging slander. He answered, quite cavalierly, that it was one of the news items of the day, and he had to keep up with the time. But he would be most happy to publish any correction I might make, as though I could deny such a malicious piece of scandal affecting myself. On the 12th of November I had occasion to write to General Halleck, and I have a copy of his letter in answer. St. Louis, December 18, 1881. Brigadier General W. T. Sherman, Lancaster, Ohio. My dear General, yours of the 12th was received a day or two ago, but was mislaid for the moment among private papers, or I should have answered it sooner. The newspaper attacks are certainly shameless and scandalous, but I cannot agree with you, that they have us in their power, to destroy us as they please. I certainly get my share of abuse, but it will not disturb me. 
Your movement of the troops was not countermanded by me because I thought it an unwise one in itself, but because I was not then ready for it. I had better information of Price's movements than you had, and I had no apprehension of an attack. I intended to concentrate the forces on that line, but I wished the movement delayed until I could determine on a better position. After receiving Lt. Col. McPherson's report, I made precisely the location you had ordered. I was desirous at the time not to prevent the advance of Price by any movement on our part, hoping that he would move on Lexington, but finding that he had determined to remain at Osceola for some time at least, I made the movement you proposed. As you could not know my plans, you and others may have misconstrued the reason of my countermanding your orders. I hope to see you well enough for duty soon. Our organization goes on slowly, but we will effect it in time. Yours truly. H. W. Halleck. And subsequently, in a letter to Honorable Thomas Ewing, in answer to some inquiries involving the same general subject, General Halleck wrote as follows. Honorable Thomas Ewing, Lancaster, Ohio. Dear S.I.R., your note of the 13th, and one of this date, from Mr. Sherman, in relation to Brigadier General Sherman's having been relieved from command in Sedalia, in November last, are just received. General Sherman was not put in command at Sedalia, he was authorized to assume it, and did so for a day or two. He did not know my plans, and his movement of troops did not accord with them. I therefore directed him to leave them as they were, and report here the result of his inspection, for which purpose he had been ordered there. No telegram or dispatch of any kind was sent by me, or by anyone with my knowledge or authority, in relation to it. After his return here, I gave him a leave of absence of twenty days, for the benefit of his health. As I was then pressing General McClellan for more officers, I deemed it necessary to explain why I did so. I used these words, I am satisfied that General Sherman's physical and mental system is so completely broken by labor and care as to render him, for the present, unfit for duty, perhaps a few weeks rest may restore him. This was the only communication I made on the subject. On no occasion have I ever expressed an opinion that his mind was affected otherwise than by overexertion, to have said so would have done him the greatest injustice. After General Sherman returned from his short leave, I found that his health was nearly restored, and I placed him temporarily in command of the camp of instruction, numbering over 15,000 men. I then wrote to General McClellan that he would soon be able to again take the field. I gave General Sherman a copy of my letter. This is the total of my correspondence on the subject. As evidence that I have every confidence in General Sherman, I have placed him in command of Western Kentucky, a command only second in importance in this department. As soon as divisions and columns can be organized, I propose to send him into the field where he can render most efficient service. I have seen newspaper squibs, charging him with being, crazy, etc. This is the grossest injustice. I do not, however, consider such attacks worthy of notice. The best answer is General Sherman's present position, and the valuable services he is rendering to the country. I have the fullest confidence in him. Very respectfully, your obedient servant. H. W. Halleck, Major General. On returning to St. Louis, on the expiration of my leave of absence, I found that General Halleck was beginning to move his troops, one part, under General U. S. Grant, up the Tennessee River, and another part, under General S. R. Curtis, in the direction of Springfield, Missouri. General Grant was then at Paducah, and General Curtis was under orders for Rolls. I was ordered to take Curtis's place in command of the Camp of Instruction, at Benton Barracks, on the ground back of North St. Louis, now used as the fair grounds, by the following order, greater than. Special Order No. 87. Headquarters Department of the Missouri. St. Louis, December 23, 1861. Extract. Brigadier General W. T. Sherman, United States Volunteers, is hereby assigned to the command of the Camp of Instruction and Post of Benton Barracks. He will have every armed regiment and company in his command ready for service at a moment's warning, and will notify all concerned that, when marching orders are received, it is expected that they will be instantly obeyed. 
no excuses for delay will be admitted. General Sherman will immediately report to these headquarters what regiments and companies, at Benton Barracks, are ready for the field. By order of Major General Halleck. J. C. Kelton, Assistant Adjutant General. I immediately assumed command, and found, in the building constructed for the commanding officer, Brigadier General Strong, and the family of a captain of Iowa cavalry, with whom we boarded. Major Curtis, son of General Curtis, was the adjutant general, but was soon relieved by Captain J. H. Hammond, who was appointed assistant adjutant general and assigned to duty with me. Brigadier General Hurlbut was also there, and about a dozen regiments of infantry and cavalry. I at once gave all matters pertaining to the post my personal attention, got the regiments in as good order as possible, kept up communication with General Halleck's headquarters by telegraph, and when orders came for the movement of any regiment or detachment, it moved instantly. The winter was very wet, and the ground badly drained. The quarters had been erected by General Fremont, under contract, they were mere shells, but well arranged for a camp, embracing the fair grounds, and some forty acres of flat ground west of it. I instituted drills, and was specially ordered by General Halleck to watch Generals Hurlbut and Strong, and report as to their fitness for their commissions as brigadier generals. I had known Hurlbut as a young lawyer, in Charleston, South Carolina, before the Mexican War, at which time he took a special interest in military matters, and I found him far above the average in the knowledge of regimental and brigade drill. And so reported. General Strong had been a merchant, and he told me that he never professed to be a soldier, but had been urged on the Secretary of War for the commission of a brigadier general, with the expectation of becoming quartermaster or commissary general. He was a good, kind-hearted gentleman, boiling over with patriotism and zeal. I advised him what to read and study, was considerably amused at his receiving instruction from a young lieutenant who knew the company and battalion drill, and could hear him practice in his room the words of command, and tone of voice. Break from the right, to march to the left. Battalion, halt. Forward into line etc. Of course I made a favorable report in his case. Among the infantry and cavalry colonels were some who afterward rose to distinction, David Stewart, Gordon Granger, Bussey, etc., etc. Though it was midwinter, General Halleck was pushing his preparations most vigorously, and surely he brought order out of chaos in St. Louis with commendable energy. I remember, one night, sitting in his room, on the second floor of the planter's house, with him and General Cullum, his chief of staff, talking of things generally, and the subject then was of the much-talked-of advance. As soon as the season would permit. Most people urged the movement down the Mississippi River, but Generals Polk and Pillow had a large rebel force, with heavy guns in a very strong position, at Columbus, Kentucky, about 18 miles below Cairo. Commodore Foote had his gunboat fleet at Cairo, and General U.S. Grant, who commanded the district, was collecting a large force at Paducah, Cairo, and Bird's Point. General Halleck had a map on his table, with a large pencil in his hand, and asked, where is the rebel line? Cullum drew the pencil through Bowling Green, Forts Donelson and Henry, and Columbus, Kentucky. That is their line, said Halleck. Now, where is the proper place to break it? And either Cullum or I said, naturally the center. Halleck drew a line perpendicular to the other, near its middle, and it coincided nearly with the general course of the Tennessee River. And he said, that's the true line of operations. This occurred more than a month before General Grant began the movement, and, as he was subject to General Halleck's orders, I have always given Halleck the full credit for that movement, which was skillful, successful. And extremely rich in military results. Indeed, it was the first real success on our side in the Civil War. The movement up the Tennessee began about the 1st of February, and Fort Henry was captured by the joint action of the Navy under Commodore Foote and the land forces under General Grant, on the 6th of February, 1862. About the same time, General S. R. Curtis had moved forward from Rolls, and, on the 8th of March, defeated the rebels under McCulloch, Van Dom, and Price, at Pea Ridge. As soon as Fort Henry fell, 
General Grant marched straight across to Fort Donelson, on the Cumberland River, invested the place, and, as soon as the gunboats had come round from the Tennessee, and had bombarded the waterfront, he assaulted. Whereupon Buckner surrendered the garrison of 12,000 men, Pillow and ex-Secretary of War General Floyd having personally escaped across the river at night, occasioning a good deal of fun and criticism at their expense. Before the fall of Donelson, but after that of Henry, I received, at Benton Barracks, the following orders. Headquarters The Department of Missouri. St. Lewis, February 13, 1862. Brigadier General Sherman, Benton Barracks. You will immediately repair to Paducah, Kentucky, and assume command of that post. Brigadier General Hurlbut will accompany you. The command of Benton Barracks will be turned over to General Strong. H. W. Halleck, Major General. I started for Paducah the same day, and think that General Cullum went with me to Cairo. General Halleck's purpose being to push forward the operations up the Tennessee River with unusual vigor. On reaching Paducah, I found this dispatch. Headquarters The Department of Missouri. St. Lewis, February 15, 1862. Brigadier General Sherman, Paducah, Kentucky. Send General Grant everything you can spare from Paducah and Smith and also General Hurlbut. Bowling Green has been evacuated entirely. H. W. Halleck, Major General. The next day brought us news of the surrender of Buckner, and probably at no time during the war did we all feel so heavy a weight raised from our breasts, or so thankful for a most fruitful series of victories. They at once gave Generals Halleck, Grant, and C. F. Smith, great fame. Of course, the rebels let go their whole line, and fell back on Nashville and Island No. 10, and to the Memphis and Charleston Railroad. Everybody was anxious to help. Boats passed up and down constantly, and very soon arrived the rebel prisoners from Donelson. I saw General Buckner on the boat, he seemed self-sufficient, and thought their loss was not really so serious to their cause as we did. About this time another force of twenty or twenty-five thousand men was collected on the west bank of the Mississippi, above Cairo, under the command of Major General John Pope, designed to become the Army of the Mississippi, and to operate. In conjunction with the Navy, down the river against the enemy's left flank, which had held the strong post of Columbus, Kentucky, but which, on the fall of Fort Donelson, had fallen back to New Madrid and Island No. 10. X. Battle of Shiloh. March and April, 1862. By the end of February, 1862, Major General Halleck commanded all the armies in the Valley of the Mississippi, from his headquarters in St. Louis. These were, the Army of the Ohio, Major General Buell, in Kentucky, the Army of the Tennessee, Major General Grant, at Forts Henry in Donelson, the Army of the Mississippi, Major General Pope, and that of General S. R. Curtis, in southwest Missouri. He posted his Chief of Staff, General Cullum, at Cairo, and me at Paducah, chiefly to expedite and facilitate the important operations then in progress up the Tennessee and Cumberland Rivers. Fort Donelson had surrendered to General Grant on the 16th of February, and there must have been a good deal of confusion resulting from the necessary care of the wounded and disposition of prisoners, common to all such occasions. And there was a real difficulty in communicating between St. Lewis and Fort Donelson. General Buell had also followed up the rebel army, which had retreated hastily from Bowling Green to and through Nashville, a city of so much importance to the South, that it was at one time proposed as its capital. Both Generals Grant and Buell looked to its capture as an event of great importance. On the 21st General Grant sent General Smith with his division to Clarksville, 50 miles above Donelson, toward Nashville, and on the 27th went himself to Nashville to meet and confer with General Buell, but returned to Donelson the next day. Meantime, General Halleck at a Lewis must have felt that his armies were getting away from him, and began to send dispatches to me at Paducah, to be forwarded by boat, or by a rickety telegraph line up to Fort Henry, which lay entirely in a hostile country. And was consequently always out of repair. On the 1st of March I received the following dispatch, 
and forwarded it to General Grant, both by the telegraph and boat. To General Grant, Fort Henry. Transports will be sent you as soon as possible, to move your column up the Tennessee River. The main object of this expedition will be to destroy the railroad bridge over Bear Creek, near Eastport, Mississippi, and also the railroad connections at Corinth, Jackson, and Humboldt. It is thought best that these objects be attempted in the order named. Strong detachments of cavalry and light artillery, supported by infantry, may by rapid movements reach these points from the river, without any serious opposition. Avoid any general engagements with strong forces. It will be better to retreat than to risk a general battle. This should be strongly impressed on the officers sent with expeditions from the river. General C. F. Smith or some very discreet officer should be selected for such commands. Having accomplished these objects, or such of them as may be practicable, you will return to Danville, and move on Paris. Perhaps the troops sent to Jackson and Humboldt can reach Paris by land as easily as to return to the transports. This must depend on the character of the roads and the position of the enemy. All telegraphic lines which can be reached must be cut. The gunboats will accompany the transports for their protection. Any loyal Tennesseans who desire it, may be enlisted and supplied with arms. Competent officers should be left to command Forts Henry and Donelson in your absence. I have indicated in general terms the object of this. H. W. Halleck, Major General. Again on the 2d. Cairo, March 1, 1862. To General Grant. General Halleck, February 25th, telegraphs me, General Grant will send no more forces to Clarksville. General Smith's division will come to Fort Henry, or a point higher up on the Tennessee River, transports will also be collected at Paducah. Two gunboats in Tennessee River with Grant. General Grant will immediately have small garrisons detailed for Forts Henry and Donelson, and all other forces made ready for the field. From your letter of the 28th, I learn you were at Fort Donelson, and General Smith at Nashville, from which I infer you could not have received orders. Halleck's telegram of last night says, Who sent Smith's division to Nashville? I ordered it across to the Tennessee, where they are wanted immediately. Order them back. Send all spare transports up Tennessee to General Grant. Evidently the General supposes you to be on the Tennessee. I am sending all the transports I can find for you, reporting to General Sherman for orders to go up the Cumberland for you, or, if you march across to Fort Henry, then to send them up the Tennessee. G. W. Cullum, Brigadier General. On the 4th came this dispatch. To Major General U. S. Grant. You will place Major General C. F. Smith in command of expedition, and remain yourself at Fort Henry. Why do you not obey my orders to report strength and positions of your command? H. W. Halleck, Major General. Halleck was evidently working himself into a passion, but he was too far from the seat of war to make due allowance for the actual state of facts. General Grant had done so much, that General Halleck should have been patient. Meantime, at Paducah, I was busy sending boats in every direction, some under the orders of General Halleck, others of General Cullum. Others for General Grant, and still others for General Buell at Nashville. And at the same time I was organizing out of the new troops that were arriving at Paducah a division for myself when allowed to take the field, which I had been promised by General Halleck. His purpose was evidently to operate up the Tennessee River, to break up Bear Creek Bridge and the railroad communications between the Mississippi and Tennessee Rivers. And no doubt he was provoked that Generals Grant and Smith had turned aside to Nashville. In the meantime several of the gunboats, under Captain Phelps, United States Navy, had gone up the Tennessee as far as Florence, and on their return had reported a strong Union feeling among the people along the river. On the 10th of March, having received the necessary orders from General Halleck, I embarked my division at Paducah. It was composed of four brigades. The first, commanded by Colonel S. G. Hicks, was composed of the 40th Illinois, 46th Ohio, and Morton's Indiana Battery, on the boats Sally List, Golden Gate, J. B. Adams, and Lancaster. 
The second brigade, Colonel D. Stewart, was composed of the 55th Illinois, 71st Ohio, and 54th Ohio, embarked on the Hannibal, Universe, Hazel Dell, Cheeseman, and Prairie Rose. The 3rd Brigade, Colonel Hildebrand, was composed of the 77th Ohio, 57th Ohio, and 53rd Ohio, embarked on the Poland, Anglo-Saxon, Ohio No. 3, and Continental. The 4th Brigade, Colonel Buckland, was composed of the 72nd Ohio, 48th Ohio, and 70th Ohio, embarked on the Empress, Baltic, Shenango, and Marengo. We steamed up to Fort Henry, the river being high and in splendid order. There I reported in person to General C. F. Smith, and by him was ordered a few miles above, to the remains of the burned railroad bridge, to await the rendezvous of the rest of his army. I had my headquarters on the Continental. Among my colonels I had a strange character, Thomas Worthington, Colonel of the 46th Ohio. He was a graduate of West Point, of the class of 1827. Was, therefore, older than General Halleck, General Grant, or myself, and claimed to know more of war than all of us put together. In ascending the river he did not keep his place in the column, but pushed on and reached Savannah a day before the rest of my division. When I reached that place, I found that Worthington had landed his regiment, and was flying about giving orders, as though he were commander-in-chief. I made him get back to his boat, and gave him to understand that he must thereafter keep his place. General C. F. Smith arrived about the 13th of March, with a large fleet of boats, containing Hurlbut's division, Lou. Wallace's division, and that of himself, then commanded by Brigadier General W. H. L. Wallace. General Smith sent for me to meet him on his boat, and ordered me to push on under escort of the two gunboats, Lexington and Tyler, commanded by Captains Gwynn and Shirk, United States Navy. I was to land at some point below Eastport, and make a break of the Memphis and Charleston Railroad, between Tuscumbia and Corinth. General Smith was quite unwell, and was suffering from his leg, which was swollen and very sore, from a mere abrasion in stepping into a small boat. This actually mortified, and resulted in his death about a month after, viz., April 25, 1862. He was adjutant of the military academy during the early part of my career there, and afterward commandant of cadets. He was a very handsome and soldierly man, of great experience, and at Donelson had acted with so much personal bravery that to him many attributed the success of the assault. I immediately steamed up the Tennessee River, following the two gunboats, and, in passing Pittsburgh Landing, was told by Captain Gwynne that, on his former trip up the river, he had found a rebel regiment of cavalry posted there. And that it was the usual landing place for the people about Corinth, distant thirty miles. I sent word back to General Smith that, if we were detained up the river, he ought to post some troops at Pittsburgh Landing. We went on up the river cautiously, till we saw Eastport and Chickasaw, both of which were occupied by rebel batteries and a small rebel force of infantry. We then dropped back quietly to the mouth of Yellow River, a few miles below, whence led a road to Burnsville, a place on the Memphis and Charleston Road, where were the company's repair shops. We at once commenced disembarking the command, first the cavalry, which started at once for Burnsville, with orders to tear up the railroad track, and burn the depots, shops, etc. And I followed with the infantry and artillery as fast as they were disembarked. It was raining very hard at the time. Daylight found us about six miles out, where we met the cavalry returning. They had made numerous attempts to cross the streams, which had become so swollen that mere brooks covered the whole bottom, and my aide de ca Sanger, whom I had dispatched with the cavalry, reported the loss, by drowning, of several of the men. The rain was pouring in torrents, and reports from the rear came that the river was rising very fast, and that, unless we got back to our boat soon, the bottom would be simply impassable. There was no alternative but to regain our boats. And even this was so difficult, that we had to unharness the artillery horses, and drag the guns under water through the bayous, to reach the bank of the river. Once more embarked, I concluded to drop down to Pittsburgh Landing, and to make the attempt from there. During the night of the 14th, we dropped down to Pittsburgh Landing, 
where I found Hurlbut's division in boats. Leaving my command there, I steamed down to Savannah, and reported to General Smith in person, who saw in the flooded Tennessee the full truth of my report. And he then instructed me to disembark my own division, and that of General Hurlbut, at Pittsburgh Landing, to take positions well back, and to leave room for his whole army. Telling me that he would soon come up in person, and move out in force to make the lodgment on the railroad, contemplated by General Halleck's orders. Lieutenant Colonel McPherson, of General C. F. Smith's, or rather General Halleck's, staff, returned with me, and on the 16th of March we disembarked and marched out about ten miles toward Corinth, to a place called Monterey or Pea Ridge, where the rebels had a cavalry regiment. Which of course decamped on our approach, but from the people we learned that trains were bringing large masses of men from every direction into Corinth. McPherson and I reconnoitered the ground well, and then returned to our boats. On the 18th, Hurlbut disembarked his division and took post about a mile and a half out, near where the roads branched, one leading to Corinth and the other toward Hamburg. On the 19th I disembarked my division, and took post about three miles back, three of the brigades covering the roads to Purdy and Corinth, and the other brigade, Stewart's, temporarily at a place on the Hamburg Road, near Lick Creek Ford. Where the Bark Road came into the Hamburg Road. Within a few days, Prentice's division arrived and camped on my left, and afterward McClernand's and W. H. L. Wallace's divisions, which formed a line to our rear. Lew Wallace's division remained on the north side of Snake Creek, on a road leading from Savannah or Cramps Landing to Purdy. General C. F. Smith remained back at Savannah, in chief command, and I was only responsible for my own division. I kept pickets well out on the roads, and made myself familiar with all the ground inside and outside my lines. My personal staff was composed of Captain J. H. Hammond, Assistant Adjutant General, Surgeons Hartshorn and Lahamadieu. Lieutenant Colonels Haskell and Sanger, Inspector Generals, Lieutenants McCoy and John Taylor, aides de camp. We were all conscious that the enemy was collecting at Corinth, but in what force we could not know, nor did we know what was going on behind us. On the 17th of March, General U. S. Grant was restored to the command of all the troops up the Tennessee River, by reason of General Smith's extreme illness, and because he had explained to General Halleck satisfactorily his conduct after Donelson. And he too made his headquarters at Savannah, but frequently visited our camps. I always acted on the supposition that we were an invading army. That our purpose was to move forward in force, make a lodgment on the Memphis and Charleston Road, and thus repeat the grand tactics of Fort Donelson, by separating the rebels in the interior from those at Memphis and on the Mississippi River. We did not fortify our camps against an attack, because we had no orders to do so, and because such a course would have made our raw men timid. The position was naturally strong, with Snake Creek on our right, a deep, bold stream, with a confluent, Owl Creek, to our right front. And Lick Creek, with a similar confluent, on our left, thus narrowing the space over which we could be attacked to about a mile and a half or two miles. At a later period of the war, we could have rendered this position impregnable in one night, but at this time we did not do it, and it may be it is well we did not. From about the 1st of April we were conscious that the rebel cavalry in our front was getting bolder and more saucy. And on Friday, the 4th of April, it dashed down and carried off one of our picket guards, composed of an officer and seven men, posted a couple of miles out on the Corinth Road. Colonel Buckland sent a company to its relief, then followed himself with a regiment, and, fearing lest he might be worsted, I called out his whole brigade and followed some four or five miles, when the cavalry in advance encountered artillery. I then, after dark, drew back to our lines, and reported the fact by letter to General Grant, at Savannah. But thus far we had not positively detected the presence of infantry, for cavalry regiments generally had a couple of guns along, and I suppose the guns that opened on the on the evening of Friday, April 4th, belonged to the cavalry that was hovering along our whole front. Saturday passed in our camps without any unusual event, the weather being wet and mild, and the roads back to the steamboat landing being heavy with mud. But on Sunday morning, the 6th, early, there was a good deal of picket firing, and I got breakfast, 
rode out along my lines, and, about four hundred yards to the front of Appler's regiment. Received from some bushes in a ravine to the left front a volley which killed my orderly, Holiday. About the same time I saw the rebel lines of battle in front coming down on us as far as the eye could reach. All my troops were in line of battle, ready, and the ground was favorable to us. I gave the necessary orders to the battery, waterhouses, attached to Hildebrand's brigade, and cautioned the men to reserve their fire till the rebels had crossed the ravine of Owl Creek, and had begun the ascent. Also, sent staff officers to notify Generals McClernand and Prentice of the coming blow. Indeed, McClernand had already sent three regiments to the support of my left flank, and they were in position when the onset came. In a few minutes the Battle of Shiloh began with extreme fury, and lasted two days. Its history has been well given, and it has been made the subject of a great deal of controversy. Hildebrand's brigade was soon knocked to pieces, but Buckland's and McDowell's kept their organization throughout. Stewart's was driven back to the river, and did not join me in person till the second day of the battle. I think my several reports of that battle are condensed and good, made on the spot, when all the names and facts were fresh in my memory, and are herewith given entire. Headquarters 1st Division. Pittsburgh Landing, March 17, 1862. Captain W. M. McMichael, Assistant Adjutant General to General C. F. Smith, Savannah, Tennessee. SIR, last night I dispatched a party of cavalry, at 6 p.m. Under the command of Lt. Col. Heath, 5th Ohio Cavalry, for a strong reconnaissance, if possible, to be converted into an attack upon the Memphis Road. The command got off punctually, followed at 12 o'clock at night by the 1st Brigade of my division, commanded by Col. McDowell, the other brigades to follow in order. About one at night the cavalry returned, reporting the road occupied in force by the enemy, with whose advance guard they skirmished, driving them back, about a mile, taking two prisoners, and having their chief guide, Thomas Maxwell, ESQ. And three men of the 4th Illinois wounded. Enclosed please find the report of Lt. Col. Heath, also a copy of his instructions, and the order of march. As soon as the cavalry returned, I saw that an attempt on the road was frustrated, and accordingly have placed McDowell's brigade to our right front, guarding the pass of Snake Creek. Stewart's brigade to the left front, to watch the pass of Lick Creek, and I shall this morning move directly out on the Corinth Road, about eight miles to or toward Pea Ridge, which is a key point to the southwest. General Hurlbut's division will be landed today, and the artillery and infantry disposed so as to defend Pittsburgh, leaving my division entire for any movement by land or water. As near as I can learn, there are five regiments of rebel infantry at Purdy, at Corinth, and distributed along the railroad to Inca, are probably 30,000 men, but my information from prisoners is very indistinct. Every road and path is occupied by the enemy's cavalry, whose orders seem to be to fire a volley, retire again, fire and retire. The force on the Purdy Road attacked and driven by Major Bowman yesterday, was about 60 strong. That encountered last night on the Corinth Road was about five companies of Tennessee cavalry, sent from Purdy about 2 p.m. yesterday. I hear there is a force of two regiments on P. Ridge, at the point where the Purdy and Corinth roads come together. I am satisfied we cannot reach the Memphis and Charleston Road without a considerable engagement, which is prohibited by General Halleck's instructions, so that I will be governed by your orders of yesterday to occupy Pittsburgh strongly. Extend the pickets so as to include a semicircle of three miles, and push a strong reconnaissance as far out as Lick Creek and P. Ridge. I will send down a good many boats today, to be employed as you may direct, and would be obliged if you would send a couple of thousand sacks of corn, as much hay as you can possibly spare, and, if possible, a barge of coal. I will send a steamboat under care of the gunboat, to collect corn from cribs on the river bank. I have the honor to be your obedient servant. W. T. Sherman. Brigadier General, Commanding 1st Division. Headquarters, Steamboat Continental, Pittsburgh, March 18, 1882. Captain Rawlins, Assistant Adjutant General to General Grant. SIR, the division surgeon having placed some 100 or more sick on board the Fanny Bullet, 
I have permitted her to take them to Savannah. There is neither house nor building of any kind that can be used for a hospital here. I hope to receive an order to establish floating hospitals, but in the meantime, by the advice of the surgeon, allow these sick men to leave. Let me hope that it will meet your approbation. The order for debarkation came while General Sherman was absent with three brigades, and no men are left to move the effects of these brigades. The landing, too, is small, with scarcely any chance to increase it. Therefore there is a great accumulation of boats. Colonel MacArthur has arrived, and is now cutting a landing for himself. General Sherman will return this evening. I am obliged to transgress, and write myself in the meantime. Respectfully your obedient servant. J. H. Hammond, Assistant Adjutant General. P. S. 4 p.m., just back, have been halfway to Corinth and to Purdy. All right. Have just read this letter, and approve all but floating hospitals, regimental surgeons can take care of all sick, except chronic cases, which can always be sent down to Paducah. Magnificent plain for camping and drilling, and a military point of great strength. The enemy has felt us twice, at great loss and demoralization, will report at length this evening, am now much worn out. W. T. Sherman, Brigadier General. Headquarters 1st Division. Pittsburgh Landing, March 19, 1862. Captain Rawlins, Assistant Adjutant General to General Grant, Savannah, Tennessee. S.I.R., I have just returned from an extensive reconnaissance toward Corinth and Purdy, and am strongly impressed with the importance of this position, both for its land advantages and its strategic position. The ground itself admits of easy defense by a small command, and yet affords admirable camping ground for a hundred thousand men. I will as soon as possible make or cause to be made a topographical sketch of the position. The only drawback is that, at this stage of water, the space for landing is contracted too much for the immense fleet now here discharging. I will push the loading and unloading of boats, but suggest that you send at once, Captain Dodd, if possible the best quartermaster you can, that he may control and organize this whole matter. I have a good commissary, and will keep as few provisions afloat as possible. Yours, etc. W. T. Sherman, Brigadier General Commanding. Headquarters Sherman's Division. Camp Shiloh, near Pittsburgh Landing, Tennessee, April 2, 1862. Captain J. A. Rawlins, Assistant Adjutant General to General Grant. SIR, in obedience to General Grant's instructions of March 31st, with one section of Captain Munch's Minnesota Battery, two 12-pound howitzers, a detachment of 5th Ohio Cavalry of 150 men, under Major Ricker, and two battalions of infantry from the 57th and 77th Ohio, under the command of Colonels Hildebrand and Mungan, I marched to the river, and embarked on the steamers Empress and Tecumseh. The gunboat Cairo did not arrive at Pittsburgh, until after midnight, and at 6 p.m. Captain Bryant, commanding the gunboat, notified me that he was ready to proceed up the river. I followed, keeping the transports within about 300 yards of the gunboat. About 1 p.m., the Cairo commenced shelling the battery above the mouth of Indian Creek, but elicited no reply. She proceeded up the river steadily and cautiously, followed close by the Tyler and Lexington, all throwing shells at the points where, on former visits of the gunboats, enemy's batteries were found. In this order all followed, till it was demonstrated that all the enemy's batteries, including that at Chickasaw, were abandoned. I ordered the battalion of infantry under Colonel Hildebrand to disembark at Eastport, and with the other battalion proceeded to Chickasaw and landed. The battery at this point had evidently been abandoned some time, and consisted of the remains of an old Indian mound, partly washed away by the river, which had been fashioned into a two-gun battery, with a small magazine. The ground to its rear had evidently been overflowed during the late freshet, and led to the removal of the guns to Eastport, where the batteries were on high, elevated ground, accessible at all seasons from the country to the rear. Upon personal inspection, I attach little importance to Chickasaw as a military position. The people, who had fled during the approach of the gunboats, 
returned to the village, and said the place had been occupied by one Tennessee regiment and a battery of artillery from Pensacola. After remaining at Chickasaw some hours, all the boats dropped back to Eastport, not more than a mile below, and landed there. Eastport landing during the late freshet must have been about 12 feet underwater, but at the present stage the landing is the best I have seen on the Tennessee River. The levee is clear of trees or snags, and a hundred boats could land there without confusion. The soil is of sand and gravel, and very firm. The road back is hard, and at a distance of about 400 yards from the water begin the gravel hills of the country. The infantry scouts sent out by Colonel Hildebrand found the enemy's cavalry mounted, and watching the Inca Road, about two miles back of Eastport. The distance to Inca is only eight miles, and Inca is the nearest point and has the best road by which the Charleston and Memphis Railroad can be reached. I could obtain no certain information as to the strength of the enemy there, but am satisfied that it would have been folly to have attempted it with my command. Our object being to dislodge the enemy from the batteries recently erected near Eastport, and this being attained, I have returned, and report the river to be clear to and beyond Chickasaw. I have the honor to be, your obedient servant. W. T. Sherman. Brigadier General Commanding Division. Headquarters 5th Division. Camp Shiloh, April 5, 1862. Captain J. A. Rawlins, Assistant Adjutant General, District of Western Tennessee. S.I.R., I have the honor to report that yesterday, about 3 p.m., the lieutenant commanding and seven men of the advance pickets imprudently advanced from their posts and were captured. I ordered Major Ricker, of the 5th Ohio Cavalry, to proceed rapidly to the picket station, ascertain the truth, and act according to circumstances. He reached the station, found the pickets had been captured as reported, and that a company of infantry sent by the brigade commander had gone forward in pursuit of some cavalry. He rapidly advanced some two miles, and found them engaged, charged the enemy, and drove them along the ridge road, till he met and received three discharges of artillery, when he very properly wheeled under cover, and returned till he met me. As soon as I heard artillery, I advanced with two regiments of infantry, and took position, and remained until the scattered companies of infantry and cavalry had returned. This was after night. I infer that the enemy is in some considerable force at Pea Ridge, that yesterday morning they crossed a brigade of two regiments of infantry, one regiment of cavalry, and one battery of field artillery, to the ridge on which the Corinth Road lies. They halted the infantry and artillery at a point abort five miles in my front, sent a detachment to the lane of General Meeks, on the north of Owl Creek, and the cavalry down toward our camp. This cavalry captured a part of our advance pickets, and afterward engaged the two companies of Colonel Buckland's regiment, as described by him in his report herewith enclosed. Our cavalry drove them back upon their artillery and infantry, killing many, and bringing off ten prisoners, all of the 1st Alabama cavalry, whom I send to you. We lost of the pickets one first lieutenant and seven men of the Ohio 70th Infantry, list enclosed, one major, one lieutenant, and one private of the 72nd Ohio, taken prisoners. Eight privates wounded, names in full, embraced in report of Colonel Buckland, enclosed herewith. We took ten prisoners, and left two rebels wounded and many killed on the field. I have the honor to be, your obedient servant. W. T. Sherman. Brigadier General, Commanding Division. Headquarters 5th Division. Camp Shiloh, April 10, 1862. Captain J. A. Rawlins, Assistant Adjutant General to General Grant. S.I.R., I had the honor to report that, on Friday the 4th inst. The enemy's cavalry drove in our pickets, posted about a mile and a half in advance of my center, on the main Corinth Road, capturing one first lieutenant and seven men. That I caused a pursuit by the cavalry of my division, driving them back about five miles, and killing many. On Saturday the enemy's cavalry was again very bold, coming well down to our front. Yet I did not believe they designed anything but a strong demonstration. On Sunday morning early, the 6th inst. The enemy drove our advance guard back on the main body, when I ordered under arms all my division, and sent word to General McClernand, 
asking him to support my left. To General Prentice, giving him notice that the enemy was in our front in force, and to General Hurlbut, asking him to support General Prentice. At that time, 7 a.m. My division was arranged as follows. 1st Brigade, composed of the 6th Iowa, Colonel J. A. McDowell. 40th Illinois, Colonel Hicks, 46th Ohio, Colonel Worthington. And the Morton Battery, Captain Bear, on the extreme right, guarding the bridge on the Purdy Road over Owl Creek. 2nd Brigade, composed of the 55th Illinois, Colonel D. Stewart, the 54th Ohio, Colonel T. Kilby Smith. And the 71st Ohio, Colonel Mason, on the extreme left, guarding the ford over Lick Creek. 3rd Brigade, composed of the 77th Ohio, Colonel Hildebrand, the 53rd Ohio, Colonel Appler. And the 57th Ohio, Colonel Mungan, on the left of the Corinth Road, its right resting on Shiloh Meeting House. 4th Brigade, composed of the 72nd Ohio, Colonel Buckland, the 48th Ohio, Colonel Sullivan. And the 70th Ohio, Colonel Cookerill, on the right of the Corinth Road, its left resting on Shiloh Meeting House. Two batteries of artillery, tailors and waterhouses, were posted, the former at Shiloh, and the latter on a ridge to the left, with a front fire over open ground between Mungan's and Appler's regiments. The cavalry, eight companies of the 4th Illinois, under Colonel Dickey, were posted in a large open field to the left and rear of Shiloh Meeting House, which I regarded as the center of my position. Shortly after 7 a.m. With my entire staff, I rode along a portion of our front, and when in the open field before Appler's regiment, the enemy's pickets opened a brisk fire upon my party, killing my orderly, Thomas D. Holliday, of Company H, 2nd Illinois Cavalry. The fire came from the bushes which line a small stream that rises in the field in front of Appler's camp, and flows to the north along my whole front. This valley afforded the enemy partial cover. But our men were so posted as to have a good fire at them as they crossed the valley and ascended the rising ground on our side. About 8 a.m. I saw the glistening bayonets of heavy masses of infantry to our left front in the woods beyond the small stream alluded to, and became satisfied for the first time that the enemy designed a determined attack on our whole camp. All the regiments of my division were then in line of battle at their proper posts. I rode to Colonel Appler, and ordered him to hold his ground at all hazards, as he held the left flank of our first line of battle, and I informed him that he had a good battery on his right and strong support to his rear. General McClernand had promptly and energetically responded to my request, and had sent me three regiments which were posted to protect Waterhouse's battery and the left flank of my line. The battle opened by the enemy's battery, in the woods to our front, throwing shells into our camp. Taylor's and Waterhouse's batteries promptly responded, and I then observed heavy battalions of infantry passing obliquely to the left, across the open field in Appler's front, also, other columns advancing directly upon my division. Our infantry and artillery opened along the whole line, and the battle became general. Other heavy masses of the enemy's forces kept passing across the field to our left, and directing their course on General Prentice. I saw at once that the enemy designed to pass my left flank, and fall upon Generals McClernand and Prentice, whose line of camps was almost parallel with the Tennessee River, and about two miles back from it. Very soon the sound of artillery and musketry announced that General Prentice was engaged, and about 9 a.m. I judged that he was falling back. About this time Appler's regiment broke in disorder, followed by Mungan's regiment, and the enemy pressed forward on Waterhouse's battery thereby exposed. The three Illinois regiments in immediate support of this battery stood for some time. But the enemy's advance was so vigorous, and the fire so severe, that when Colonel Wraith, of the 43rd Illinois, received a severe wound and fell from his horse, his regiment and the others manifested disorder and the enemy got possession of three guns of this, Waterhouse's, battery. Although our left was thus turned, and the enemy was pressing our whole line, I deemed Shiloh so important, that I remained by it and renewed my orders to Colonels McDowell and Buckland to hold their ground. And we did hold these positions until about 10 a.m., 
when the enemy had got his artillery to the rear of our left flank and some change became absolutely necessary. Two regiments of Hildebrand's brigade, Applers and Mungans, had already disappeared to the rear, and Hildebrand's own regiment was in disorder. I therefore gave orders for Taylor's battery, still at Shiloh, to fall back as far as the Purdy and Hamburg Road, and for McDowell and Buckland to adopt that road as their new line. I rode across the angle and met Bear's battery at the crossroads, and ordered it immediately to come into battery, action right. Captain Bear gave the order, but he was almost immediately shot from his horse, when drivers and gunners fled in disorder, carrying off the caissons, and abandoning five out of six guns, without firing a shot. The enemy pressed on, gaining this battery, and we were again forced to choose a new line of defense. Hildebrand's brigade had substantially disappeared from the field, though he himself bravely remained. McDowell's and Buckland's brigades maintained their organizations, and were conducted by my aides, so as to join on General McClernand's right, thus abandoning my original camps and line. This was about ten and a half a.m. At which time the enemy had made a furious attack on General McClernand's whole front. He straggled most determinately, but, finding him pressed, I moved McDowell's brigade directly against the left flank of the enemy, forced him back some distance, and then directed the men to avail themselves of every cover trees, fallen timber, and a wooded valley to our right. We held this position for four long hours, sometimes gaining and at others losing ground, General McClernand and myself acting in perfect concert and struggling to maintain this line. While we were so hard pressed, two Iowa regiments approached from the rear, but could not be brought up to the severe fire that was raging in our front, and General Grant, who visited us on that ground, will remember our situation about 3 p.m. But about 4 p.m. it was evident that Hurlbut's line had been driven back to the river. And knowing that General Lew Wallace was coming with reinforcements from Cramp's Landing, General McClernand and I, on consultation, selected a new line of defense, with its right covering a bridge by which General Wallace had to approach. We fell back as well as we could, gathering in addition to our own such scattered forces as we could find, and formed the new line. During this change the enemy's cavalry charged us, but were handsomely repulsed by the 29th Illinois Regiment. The 5th Ohio Battery, which had come up, rendered good service in holding the enemy in check for some time, and Major Taylor also came up with another battery and got into position, just in time to get a good flank fire upon the enemy's column. As he pressed on General McClernand's right, checking his advance. When General McClernand's division made a fine charge on the enemy and drove him back into the ravines to our front and right. I had a clear field, about 200 yards wide, in my immediate front, and contented myself with keeping the enemy's infantry at that distance during the rest of the day. In this position we rested for the night. My command had become decidedly of a mixed character. Buckland's brigade was the only one that retained its organization. Colonel Hildebrand was personally there, but his brigade was not. Colonel McDowell had been severely injured by a fall off his horse, and had gone to the river, and the three regiments of his brigade were not in line. The 13th Missouri, Colonel Crafts J. Wright, had reported to me on the field, and fought well, retaining its regimental organization, and it formed a part of my line during Sunday night and all Monday. Other fragments of regiments and companies had also fallen into my division, and acted with it during the remainder of the battle. General Grant and Buell visited me in our bivouac that evening, and from them I learned the situation of affairs on other parts of the field. General Wallace arrived from Crump's Landing shortly after dark, and formed his line to my right rear. It rained hard during the night, but our men were in good spirits, lay on their arms, being satisfied with such bread and meat as could be gathered at the neighboring camps, and determined to redeem on Monday the losses of Sunday. At daylight of Monday I received General Grant's orders to advance and recapture our original camps. I dispatched several members of my staff to bring up all the men they could find, especially the brigade of Colonel Stewart, which had been separated from the division all the day before. And at the appointed time the division, or rather what remained of it, with the 13th Missouri and other fragments, moved forward and reoccupied the ground on the extreme right of General McClernand's camp. 
where we attracted the fire of a battery located near Colonel McDowell's former headquarters. Here I remained, patiently waiting for the sound of General Buell's advance upon the main Corinth Road. About 10 a.m. the heavy firing in that direction, and its steady approach, satisfied me. And General Wallace being on our right flank with his well-conducted division, I led the head of my column to General McClernand's right, formed line of battle, facing south, with Buckland's brigade directly across the ridge. And Stuart's brigade on its right in the woods. And thus advanced, steadily and slowly, under a heavy fire of musketry and artillery. Taylor had just got to me from the rear, where he had gone for ammunition, and brought up three guns, which I ordered into position, to advance by hand firing. These guns belonged to Company A, Chicago Light Artillery, commanded by Lt. P. P. Wood, and did most excellent service. Under cover of their fire, we advanced till we reached the point where the Corinth Road crosses the line of McClernand's camp, and here I saw for the first time the well-ordered and compact columns of General Buell's Kentucky forces, whose soldierly movements at once gave confidence to our newer and less disciplined men. Here I saw Willich's regiment advance upon a point of water oaks and thicket, behind which I knew the enemy was in great strength, and enter it in beautiful style. Then arose the severest musketry fire I ever heard, and lasted some twenty minutes, when this splendid regiment had to fall back. This green point of timber is about five hundred yards east of Shiloh Meeting Home, and it was evident here was to be the struggle. The enemy could also be seen forming his lines to the south. General McClernand sending to me for artillery, I detached to him the three guns of Wood's battery, with which he speedily drove them back, and, seeing some others to the rear, I sent one of my staff to bring them forward, when, by almost providential decree, they proved to be two 24-pound howitzers belonging to McAllister's battery, and served as well as guns ever could be. This was about 2 p.m. The enemy had one battery close by Shiloh, and another near the Hamburg Road, both pouring grape and canister upon any column of troops that advanced upon the green point of Water Oaks. Willich's regiment had been repulsed, but a whole brigade of McCook's division advanced beautifully, deployed, and entered this dreaded wood. I ordered my second brigade, then commanded by Colonel T. Kilby Smith, Colonel Smart being wounded, to form on its right, and my fourth brigade, Colonel Buckland, on its right. All to advance abreast with this Kentucky brigade before mentioned, which I afterward found to be Rousseau's brigade of McCook's division. I gave personal direction to the 24-pounder guns, whose well-directed fire first silenced the enemy's guns to the left, and afterward at the Shiloh Meeting House. Rousseau's brigade moved in splendid order steadily to the front, sweeping everything before it, and at 4 p.m. we stood upon the ground of our original front line, and the enemy was in full retreat. I directed my several brigades to resume at once their original camps. Several times during the battle, cartridges gave out, but General Grant had thoughtfully kept a supply coming from the rear. When I appealed to regiments to stand fast, although out of cartridges, I did so because, to retire a regiment for any cause, has a bad effect on others. I commend the 40th Illinois and 13th Missouri for thus holding their ground under heavy fire, although their cartridge boxes were empty. I am ordered by General Grant to give personal credit where I think it is due, and censure where I think it merited. I concede that General McCook's splendid division from Kentucky drove back the enemy along the Corinth Road, which was the great center of this field of battle, where Beauregard commanded in person, supported by Bragg's, Polk's, and Breckinridge's divisions. I think Johnston was killed by exposing himself in front of his troops, at the time of their attack on Buckland's brigade on Sunday morning, although in this I may be mistaken. My division was made up of regiments perfectly new, nearly all having received their muskets for the first time at Paducah. None of them had ever been under fire or beheld heavy columns of an enemy bearing down on them as they did on last Sunday. To expect of them the coolness and steadiness of older troops would be wrong. They knew not the value of combination and organization. When individual fears seized them, the first impulse was to get away. My third brigade did break much too soon, and I am not yet advised where they were during Sunday afternoon and Monday morning. Colonel Hildebrand, its commander, was as cool as any man I ever saw, 
and no one could have made stronger efforts to hold his men to their places than he did. He kept his own regiment with individual exceptions in hand, an hour after Appler's and Mungan's regiments had left their proper field of action. Colonel Buckland managed his brigade well. I commend him to your notice as a cool, intelligent, and judicious gentleman, needing only confidence and experience, to make a good commander. His subordinates, Colonels Sullivan and Cockerill, behaved with great gallantry. The former receiving a severe wound on Sunday, and yet commanding and holding his regiment well in hand all day, and on Monday, until his right arm was broken by a shot. Colonel Cookerill held a larger proportion of his men than any colonel in my division, and was with me from first to last. Colonel J. A. McDowell, commanding the 1st Brigade, held his ground on Sunday, till I ordered him to fall back, which he did in line of battle, and when ordered, he conducted the attack on the enemy's left in good style. In falling back to the next position, he was thrown from his horse and injured, and his brigade was not in position on Monday morning. His subordinates, Colonels Hicks and Worthington, displayed great personal courage. Colonel Hicks led his regiment in the attack on Sunday, and received a wound, which it is feared may prove mortal. He is a brave and gallant gentleman, and deserves well of his country. Lieutenant Colonel Walcott, of the Ohio 46th, was severely wounded on Sunday, and has been disabled ever since. My second brigade, Colonel Stewart, was detached nearly two miles from my headquarters. He had to fight his own battle on Sunday, against superior numbers, as the enemy interposed between him and General Prentice early in the day. Colonel Stewart was wounded severely, and yet reported for duty on Monday morning, but was compelled to leave during the day, when the command devolved on Colonel T. Kilby Smith, who was always in the thickest of the fight, and led the brigade handsomely. I have not yet received Colonel Stewart's report of the operations of his brigade during the time he was detached, and must therefore forbear to mention names. Lieutenant Colonel Kyle, of the 71st, was mortally wounded on Sunday, but the regiment itself I did not see, as only a small fragment of it was with the brigade when it joined the division on Monday morning. Great credit is due the fragments of men of the disordered regiments who kept in the advance. I observed and noticed them, but until the brigadiers and colonels make their reports, I cannot venture to name individuals, but will in due season notice all who kept in our front line. As well as those who preferred to keep back near the steamboat landing. I will also send a full list of the killed, wounded, and missing, by name, rank, company, and regiment. At present I submit the result in figures. Summary of General Sherman's Detailed Table Killed 318 Wounded 1,275 Missing 441 Aggregate loss in the division, 2034 The enemy captured seven of our guns on Sunday, but on Monday we recovered seven. Not the identical guns we had lost, but enough in number to balance the account. At the time of recovering our camps our men were so fatigued that we could not follow the retreating masses of the enemy. But on the following day I followed up with Buckland's and Hildebrand's brigade for six miles, the result of which I have already reported. Of my personal staff, I can only speak with praise and thanks. I think they smelled as much gunpowder and heard as many cannonballs and bullets as must satisfy their ambition. Captain Hammond, my chief of staff, though in feeble health, was very active in rallying broken troops, encouraging the steadfast and aiding to form the lines of defense and attack. I recommend him to your notice. Major Sanger's intelligence, quick perception, and rapid execution, were of very great value to me, especially in bringing into line the batteries that cooperated so efficiently in our movements. Captains McCoy and Dayton, aides de camp, were with me all the time, carrying orders, and acting with coolness, spirit, and courage. To Surgeon Harchern and Dr. Muhammad you hundreds of wounded men are indebted for the kind and excellent treatment received on the field of battle and in the various temporary hospitals created along the line of our operations. They worked day and night, and did not rest till all the wounded of our own troops as well as of the enemy were in safe and comfortable shelter. To Major Taylor, Chief of Artillery, 
I feel under deep obligations, for his good sense and judgment in managing the batteries, on which so much depended. I enclose his report and endorse his recommendations. The cavalry of my command kept to the rear, and took little part in the action, but it would have been madness to have exposed horses to the musketry fire under which we were compelled to remain from Sunday at 8 a.m. till Monday at 4 p.m. Captain Cossack, of the engineers, was with me all the time, and was of great assistance. I enclose his sketch of the battlefield, which is the best I have seen, and which will enable you to see the various positions occupied by my division, as well as of the others that participated in the battle. I will also send in, during the day, the detailed reports of my brigadiers and colonels, and will endorse them with such remarks as I deem proper. I am, with much respect, your obedient servant. W. T. Sherman. Brigadier General Commanding 5th Division. Headquarters 5th Division. Tuesday, April 8, 1862. Sir, with the cavalry placed at my command and two brigades of my fatigued troops, I went this morning out on the Corinth Road. One after another of the abandoned camps of the enemy lined the roads, with hospital flags for their protection, at all we found more or less wounded and dead men. At the forks of the road I found the head of General T. J. Wood's division of Buell's army. I ordered cavalry to examine both roads leading toward Corinth, and found the enemy on both. Colonel Dickey, of the 4th Illinois Cavalry, asking for reinforcements, I ordered General Wood to advance the head of his column cautiously on the left-hand road. While I conducted the head of the 3rd Brigade of my division up the right-hand road. About half a mile from the forks was a clear field, through which the road passed, and, immediately beyond, a space of some two hundred yards of fallen timber, and beyond that an extensive rebel camp. The enemy's cavalry could be seen in this camp. After reconnaissance, I ordered the two advance companies of the Ohio 77th, Colonel Hildebrand, to deploy forward as skirmishers, and the regiment itself forward into line, with an interval of one hundred yards. In this order we advanced cautiously until the skirmishers were engaged. Taking it for granted this disposition would clear the camp, I held Colonel Dickey's 4th Illinois Cavalry ready for the charge. The enemy's cavalry came down boldly at a charge, led by General Forrest in person, breaking through our line of skirmishers, when the regiment of infantry, without cause, broke, threw away their muskets, and fled. The ground was admirably adapted for a defense of infantry against cavalry, being myrene covered with fallen timber. As the regiment of infantry broke, Dickey's cavalry began to discharge their carbines, and fell into disorder. I instantly sent orders to the rear for the brigade to form line of battle, which was promptly executed. The broken infantry and cavalry rallied on this line, and, as the enemy's cavalry came to it, our cavalry in turn charged and drove them from the field. I advanced the entire brigade over the same ground and sent Colonel Dickey's cavalry a mile farther on the road. On examining the ground which had been occupied by the 77th Ohio, we found 15 of our men dead and about 25 wounded. I sent for wagons and had all the wounded carried back to camp, and caused the dead to be buried, also the whole rebel camp to be destroyed. Here we found much ammunition for field pieces, which was destroyed. Also two caissons, and a general hospital, with about 280 Confederate wounded, and about 50 of our own wounded men. Not having the means of bringing them off, Colonel Dickey, by my orders, took a surrender, signed by the medical director, Lyle, and by all the attending surgeons, and a pledge to report themselves to you as prisoners of war. Also a pledge that our wounded should be carefully attended to, and surrendered to us tomorrow as soon as ambulances could go out. I enclose this written document, and request that you cause wagons or ambulances for our wounded to be sent tomorrow, and that wagons be sent to bring in the many tents belonging to us which are pitched along the road for four miles out. I did not destroy them, because I knew the enemy could not move them. The roads are very bad, and are strewed with abandoned wagons, ambulances, and limber boxes. The enemy has succeeded in carrying off the guns, but has crippled his batteries by abandoning the hind limber boxes of at least twenty caissons. I am satisfied the enemy's infantry and artillery passed Lick Creek this morning, 
traveling all of last night, and that he left to his rear all his cavalry, which has protected his retreat, but signs of confusion and disorder marked the whole road. The check sustained by us at the fallen timber delayed our advance, so that night came upon us before the wounded were provided for and the dead buried, and our troops being faggied out by three days hard fighting, exposure, and privation. I ordered them back to their camps, where they now are. I have the honor to be, your obedient servant. W. T. Sherman Brigadier General Commanding Division General Grant did not make an official report of the Battle of Shiloh, but all its incidents and events were covered by the reports of division commanders and subordinates. Probably no single battle of the war gave rise to such wild and damaging reports. It was publicly asserted at the North that our army was taken completely by surprise, that the rebels caught us in our tents, bayonet the men in their beds. That General Grant was drunk, that Buell's opportune arrival saved the Army of the Tennessee from utter annihilation, etc. These reports were in a measure sustained by the published opinions of Generals Buell, Nelson, and others, who had reached the steamboat landing from the east, just before nightfall of the 6th, when there was a large crowd of frightened, stampeded men, who clamored and declared that our army was all destroyed and beaten. Personally I saw General Grant, who with his staff visited me about 10 a.m. of the 6th, when we were desperately engaged. But we had checked the headlong assault of our enemy, and then held our ground. This gave him great satisfaction, and he told me that things did not look as well over on the left. He also told me that on his way up from Savannah that morning he had stopped at Crump's Landing, and had ordered Lew Wallace's division to cross over Snake Creek, so as to come up on my right, telling me to look out for him. He came again just before dark and described the last assault made by the rebels at the ravine, near the steamboat landing, which he had repelled by a heavy battery collected under Colonel J. D. Webster and other officers, and he was convinced that the battle was over for that day. He ordered me to be ready to assume the offensive in the morning, saying that, as he had observed at Fort Donelson at the crisis of the battle, both sides seemed defeated, and whoever assumed the offensive was sure to win. General Grant also explained to me that General Buell had reached the bank of the Tennessee River opposite Pittsburgh Landing, and was in the act of ferrying his troops across at the time he was speaking to me. About half an hour afterward General Buell himself rode up to where I was, accompanied by Colonels Fry, Mickler, and others of his staff. I was dismounted at the time, and General Buell made of me a good many significant inquiries about matters and things generally. By the aid of a manuscript map made by myself, I pointed out to him our positions as they had been in the morning, and our then positions. I also explained that my right then covered the bridge over Snake Creek by which we had all day been expecting Lew Wallace, that McClernand was on my left, Hurlbut on his left, and so on. But Buell said he had come up from the landing, and had not seen our men, of whose existence in fact he seemed to doubt. I insisted that I had five thousand good men still left in line, and thought that McClernand had as many more, and that with what was left of Hurlbut's, W. H. L. Wallace's, and Prentice's divisions, we ought to have eighteen thousand men fit for battle. I reckoned that ten thousand of our men were dead, wounded, or prisoners, and that the enemy's loss could not be much less. Buell said that Nelson's, McCook's, and Crittenden's divisions of his army, containing 18,000 men, had arrived and could cross over in the night, and be ready for the next day's battle. I argued that with these reinforcements we could sweep the field. Buell seemed to mistrust us, and repeatedly said that he did not like the looks of things, especially about the boat landing, and I really feared he would not cross over his army that night, lest he should become involved in our general disaster. He did not, of course, understand the shape of the ground, and asked me for the use of my map, which I lent him on the promise that he would return it. He handed it to Major Mickler to have it copied, and the original returned to me, which Mickler did two or three days after the battle. Buell did cross over that night, and the next day we assumed the offensive and swept the field, thus gaining the battle decisively. Nevertheless, the controversy was started and kept up, mostly to the personal prejudice of General Grant, who as usual maintained an imperturbable silence. After the battle, a constant stream of civilian surgeons, 
and sanitary commission agents, men and women, came up the Tennessee to bring relief to the thousands of maimed and wounded soldiers for whom we had imperfect means of shelter and care. These people caught up the camp stories, which on their return home they retailed through their local papers, usually elevating their own neighbors into heroes, but decrying all others, among them was Lt. Gov. Stanton, of Ohio, who published in Bellefontaine, Ohio, a most abusive article about General Grant and his subordinate generals. As General Grant did not and would not take up the cudgels, I did so. My letter in reply to Stanton, dated June 10, 1862, was published in the Cincinnati Commercial soon after its date. To this Lt. Gov. Stanton replied, and I further rejoined in a letter dated July 12, 1862. These letters are too personal to be revived. By this time the good people of the North had begun to have their eyes opened, and to give us in the field more faith and support. Stanton was never again elected to any public office, and was commonly spoken of as, the late Mr. Stanton. He is now dead, and I doubt not in life he often regretted his mistake in attempting to gain popular fame by abusing the army leaders, then as now an easy and favorite mode of gaining notoriety, if not popularity. Of course, subsequent events gave General Grant and most of the other actors in that battle their appropriate place in history, but the danger of sudden popular clamors is well illustrated by this case. The Battle of Shiloh, or Pittsburgh Landing, was one of the most fiercely contested of the war. On the morning of April 6, 1862, the five divisions of McClernand, Prentiss, Hurlbut, W. H. L. Wallace, and Sherman, aggregated about 32,000 men. We had no entrenchments of any sort, on the theory that as soon as Buell arrived we would march to Corinth to attack the enemy. The rebel army, commanded by General Albert Sidney Johnston, was, according to their own reports and admissions, 45,000 strong, had the momentum of attack, and beyond all question fought skillfully from early morning till about 2 a.m. When their commander-in-chief was killed by a mini-ball in the calf of his leg, which penetrated the boot and severed the main artery. There was then a perceptible lull for a couple of hours, when the attack was renewed, but with much less vehemence, and continued up to dark. Early at night the division of Lew Wallace arrived from the other side of Snake Creek, not having fired a shot. A very small part of General Buell's army was on our side of the Tennessee River that evening, and their loss was trivial. During that night, the three divisions of McCook, Nelson, and Crittenden, were ferried across the Tennessee, and fought with us the next day, 7th. During that night, also, the two wooden gunboats, Tyler, commanded by Lt. Groin, and Lexington, Lt. Shirk, both of the regular Navy, caused shells to be thrown toward that part of the field of battle known to be occupied by the enemy. Beauregard afterward reported his entire loss as 10,699. Our aggregate loss, made up from official statements, shows 1,700 killed, 7,495 wounded, and 3,022 prisoners. Aggregate, 12,217, of which 2,167 were in Buell's army, leaving for that of Grant 10,050. This result is a fair measure of the amount of fighting done by each army. 11. Shiloh to Memphis. April to July. 1862. While, the, Army of the Tennessee, under Generals Grant and C. F. Smith, was operating up the Tennessee River, another force, styled the Army of the Mississippi, commanded by Major General John Pope, was moving directly down the Mississippi River, against that portion of the rebel line which, under Generals Polk and Pillow, had fallen back from Columbus, Kentucky, to Island No. 10 in New Madrid. This army had the full cooperation of the gunboat fleet, commanded by Admiral Foote, and was assisted by the high flood of that season, which enabled General Pope, by great skill and industry, to open a canal from a point above Island No. 10 to New Madrid below, by which he interposed between the rebel army and its available line of supply and retreat. At the very time that we were fighting the bloody battle on the Tennessee River, General Pope and Admiral Foote were bombarding the batteries on Island No. 10, and the Kentucky shore abreast of it. And General Pope having crossed over by steamers a part of his army to the east bank, captured a large part of this rebel army, at and near Tiptonville. 
General Halleck still remained at St. Louis, whence he gave general directions to the armies of General Curtis, Generals Grant, Buell, and Pope. And instead of following up his most important and brilliant successes directly down the Mississippi, he concluded to bring General Pope's army around to the Tennessee, and to come in person to command there. The gunboat fleet pushed on down the Mississippi, but was brought up again all standing by the heavy batteries at Fort Pillow, about fifty miles above Memphis. About this time Admiral Farragut, with another large seagoing fleet, and with the cooperating army of General Butler, was entering the Mississippi River by the passes, and preparing to reduce Forts Jackson and St. Philip in order to reach New Orleans. So that all minds were turned to the conquest of the Mississippi River, and surely adequate means were provided for the undertaking. The Battle of Shiloh had been fought, as described, on the 6th and 7th of April. And when the movement of the 8th had revealed that our enemy was gone, in full retreat, leaving killed, wounded, and much property by the way, we all experienced a feeling of relief. The struggle had been so long, so desperate and bloody, that the survivors seemed exhausted and nerveless, we appreciated the value of the victory, but realized also its great cost of life. The close of the battle had left the Army of the Tennessee on the right, and the Army of the Ohio on the left, but I believe neither General Grant nor Buell exercised command, the one over the other each of them having his hands full in repairing damages. All the division, brigade, and regimental commanders were busy in collecting stragglers, regaining lost property, in burying dead men and horses, and in providing for their wounded. Some few new regiments came forward, and some changes of organization became necessary. Then, or very soon after, I consolidated my font brigades into three, which were commanded, first, Brigadier General Morgan L. Smith, 2nd, Colonel John A. McDowell, 3rd, Brigadier General J. W. Denver. About the same time I was promoted to Major General Volunteers. The 71st Ohio was detached to Clarksville, Tennessee, and the 6th and 8th Missouri were transferred to my division. In a few days after the battle, General Halleck arrived by steamboat from St. Louis, pitched his camp near the steamboat landing, and assumed personal command of all the armies. He was attended by his staff, composed of General G. W. Cullum, U. S. Engineers, as his chief of staff, Colonel George Tom, U. S. Engineers, and Colonels Kelton and Kemper, adjutants general. It soon became manifest that his mind had been prejudiced by the rumors which had gone forth to the detriment of General Grant, for in a few days he issued an order, reorganizing and rearranging the whole army. General Buell's Army of the Ohio constituted the center, General Pope's army, then arriving at Hamburg Landing, was the left. The right was made up of mine and Hurlbut's divisions, belonging to the old Army of the Tennessee, and two new ones, made up from the fragments of the divisions of Prentice and C. F. Smith, and of troops transferred thereto, commanded by Generals T. W., Sherman and Davies. General George H. Thomas was taken from Buell, to command the right. McClernand's and Lew Wallace's divisions were styled the reserve, to be commanded by McClernand. General Grant was substantially left out, and was named second in command, according to some French notion, with no clear, well-defined command or authority. He still retained his old staff, composed of Rollins, adjutant general. Riggin, Lago, and Hillier, aides, and he had a small company of the 4th Illinois Cavalry as an escort. For more than a month he thus remained, without any apparent authority, frequently visiting me and others, and rarely complaining. But I could see that he felt deeply the indignity, if not insult, heaped upon him. General Thomas at once assumed command of the right wing, and, until we reached Corinth, I served immediately under his command. We were classmates, intimately acquainted, had served together before in the old army, and in Kentucky, and it made to us little difference who commanded the other, provided the good cause prevailed. Corinth was about thirty miles distant, and we all knew that we should find there the same army with which we had so fiercely grappled at Shiloh, reorganized, reinforced, and commanded in chief by General Beauregard in place of Johnston. Who had fallen at Shiloh? But we were also reinforced by Buell's and Pope's armies, 
so that before the end of April our army extended from Snake Creek on the right to the Tennessee River, at Hamburg, on the left, and must have numbered nearly 100,000 men. Ample supplies of all kinds reached us by the Tennessee River, which had a good stage of water, but our wagon transportation was limited, and much confusion occurred in hauling supplies to the several camps. By the end of Arrow, the several armies seemed to be ready, and the general forward movement on Corinth began. My division was on the extreme right of the right wing, and marched out by the White House, leaving Monterey or Pea Ridge to the south. Crossing Lick Creek, we came into the main road about a mile south of Monterey, where we turned square to the right, and came into the Purdy Road, near Gilams. Thence we followed the Purdy Road to Corinth, my skirmishers reaching at all times the Mobile and Ohio Railroad. Of course our marches were governed by the main center, which followed the direct road from Pittsburgh landing to Corinth. And this movement was provokingly slow. We fortified almost every camp at night, though we had encountered no serious opposition, except from cavalry, which gave ground easily as we advanced. The opposition increased as we neared Corinth, and at a place called Russell's we had a sharp affair of one brigade, under the immediate direction of Brigadier General Morgan L. Smith, assisted by the Brigade of General Denver. This affair occurred on the 19th of May, and our line was then within about two miles of the northern entrenchments of Corinth. On the 27th I received orders from General Halleck, to send a force the next day to drive the rebels from the house in our front, on the Corinth Road, to drive in their pickets as far as possible and to make a strong demonstration on Corinth itself, authorizing me to call on any adjacent division for assistance. I reconnoitered the ground carefully, and found that the main road led forward along the fence of a large cotton field to our right front, and ascended a wooded hill, occupied in some force by the enemy, on which was the farmhouse referred to in General Halleck's orders. At the farther end of the field was a double log house, whose chinking had been removed, so that it formed a good blockhouse from which the enemy could fire on any person approaching from our quarter. General Hurlbut's division was on my immediate left, and General McClernand's reserve on our right rear. I asked of each the assistance of a brigade. The former sent General Veaches, and the latter General John A. Logan's brigade. I asked the former to support our left flank, and the latter our right flank. The next morning early, Morgan L. Smith's brigade was deployed under cover on the left, and Denver's on the right, ready to move forward rapidly at a signal. I had a battery of four 20-pound Parrot guns, commanded by Captain Silverspar. Colonel Ezra Taylor, chief of artillery, had two of these guns moved up silently by hand behind a small knoll, from the crest of which the enemy's blockhouse and position could be distinctly seen. When all were ready, these guns were moved to the crest, and several quick rounds were fired at the house, followed after an interval by a single gum. This was the signal agreed on, and the troops responded beautifully, crossed the field in line of battle, preceded by their skirmishers who carried the position in good style, and pursued the enemy for half a mile beyond. The main line halted on the crest of the ridge, from which we could look over the parapets of the rebel works at Corinth, and hear their drum and bugle calls. The rebel brigade had evidently been taken by surprise in our attack. It soon rallied and came back on us with the usual yell, driving in our skirmishers, but was quickly checked when it came within range of our guns and line of battle. Generals Grant and Thomas happened to be with me during this affair, and were well pleased at the handsome manner in which the troops behaved. That night we began the usual entrenchments, and the next day brought forward the artillery and the rest of the division, which then extended from the Mobile and Ohio Railroad, at Bowie Hill out, to the Corinth and Purdy Road. They're connecting with Hurlbut's division. That night, viz., May 29th, we heard unusual sounds in Corinth, the constant whistling of locomotives, and soon after daylight occurred a series of explosions followed by a dense smoke rising high over the town. There was a telegraph line connecting my headquarters with those of General Halleck, about four miles off, on the Hamburg Road. I inquired if he knew the cause of the explosions and of the smoke. And he answered to, advance with my division and feel the enemy if still in my front, I immediately dispatched two regiments from each of my three brigades to feel the immediate front, and in a very short time advanced with the whole division. 
Each brigade found the rebel parapets abandoned, and pushed straight for the town, which lies in the northeast angle of intersection of the Mobile and Ohio and Memphis and Charleston railroads. Many buildings had been burned by the enemy on evacuation, which had begun the night before at 6 p.m., and continued through the night, the rearguard burning their magazine at the time of withdrawing, about daybreak. Morgan L. Smith's brigade followed the retreating rearguard some four miles to the Tuacumbia Bridge, which was found burned. I halted the other brigades at the college, about a mile to the southwest of the town, where I was overtaken by General Thomas in person. The heads of all the columns had entered the rebel lines about the same time, and there was some rather foolish clamor for the first honors, but in fact there was no honor in the event. Beauregard had made a clean retreat to the south, and was only seriously pursued by cavalry from General Pope's flank. But he reached Tupelo where he halted for reorganization. And there is no doubt that at the moment there was much disorganization in his ranks, for the woods were full of deserters whom we did not even take prisoners, but advised them to make their way home and stay there. We spent the day at and near the college, when General Thomas, who applied for orders at Halleck's headquarters, directed me to conduct my division back to the camp of the night before. Where we had left our trains the advance on Corinth had occupied all of the month of May, the most beautiful and valuable month of the year for campaigning in this latitude. There had been little fighting, save on General Pope's left flank about Farmington, and on our right. I esteemed it a magnificent drill, as it served for the instruction of our men in guard and picket duty, and in habituating them to outdoor life. And by the time we had reached Corinth I believe that army was the best then on this continent, and could have gone where it pleased. The four subdivisions were well commanded, as were the divisions and brigades of the whole army. General Halleck was a man of great capacity, of large acquirements, and at the time possessed the confidence of the country, and of most of the army. I held him in high estimation, and gave him credit for the combinations which had resulted in placing this magnificent army of a hundred thousand men, well equipped and provided, with a good base, at Corinth. From which he could move in any direction. Had he held his force as a unit, he could have gone to Mobile, or Vicksburg, or anywhere in that region, which would by one move have solved the whole Mississippi problem. And, from what he then told me, I believe he intended such a campaign, but was overruled from Washington. Be that as it may, the army had no sooner settled down at Corinth before it was scattered, General Pope was called to the east, and his army distributed among the others. General Thomas was relieved from the command of the right wing, and reassigned to his division in the Army of the Ohio, and that whole army under General Buell was turned east along the Memphis and Charleston Road, to march for Chattanooga. McClernand's reserve was turned west to Bolivar and Memphis. General Halleck took post himself at Corinth, assigned Lt. Col. McPherson to take charge of the railroads, with instructions to repair them as far as Columbus, Kentucky and to collect cars and locomotives to operate them to Corinth and Grand Junction. I was soon dispatched with my own and Hurlbut's divisions northwest 14 miles to Chuala. To save what could be of any value out of six trains of cars belonging to the rebels which had been wrecked and partially burned at the time of the evacuation of Corinth. A short time before leaving Corinth I rode from my camp to General Halleck's headquarters, then in tents just outside of the town, where we sat and gossiped for some time. When he mentioned to me casually that General Grant was going away the next morning. I inquired the cause, and he said that he did not know, but that Grant had applied for a thirty days leave, which had been given him. Of course we all knew that he was chafing under the slights of his anomalous position, and I determined to see him on my way back. His camp was a short distance off the Monterey Road, in the woods, and consisted of four or five tents, with a sapling railing around the front. As I rode up, Majors Rollins, Lago, and Hillier, were in front of the camp, and piled up near them were the usual office and camp chests, all ready for a start in the morning. I inquired for the general, and was shown to his tent, where I found him seated on a camp stool, with papers on a rude camp table, he seemed to be employed in assorting letters, and tying them up with red tape into convenient bundles. After passing the usual compliments, I inquired if it were true that he was going away. He said, yes. 
I then inquired the reason, and he said, Sherman, you know. You know that I am in the way here. I have stood it as long as I can, and can endure it no longer. I inquired where he was going to, and he said, St. Louis. I then asked if he had any business there, and he said, not a bit. I then begged him to stay, illustrating his case by my own. Before the Battle of Shiloh, I had been cast down by a mere newspaper assertion of, crazy, but that single battle had given me new life, and now I was in high feather. And I argued with him that, if he went away, events would go right along, and he would be left out, whereas, if he remained, some happy accident might restore him to favor in his true place. He certainly appreciated my friendly advice, and promised to wait a while, at all events, not to go without seeing me again, or communicating with me. Very soon after this, I was ordered to Chuala, where, on the 6th of June, I received a note from him, saying that he had reconsidered his intention, and would remain. I cannot find the note, but my answer I have kept. Chuala, Jane 6, 1862. Major General Grant. My dear S.I.R., I have just received your note, and am rejoiced at your conclusion to remain. For you could not be quiet at home for a week when armies were moving, and rest could not relieve your mind of the gnawing sensation that injustice had been done you. My orders at Chuala were to rescue the wrecked trains there, to reconnoiter westward and estimate the amount of damage to the railroad as far as Grand Junction, about fifty miles. We camped our troops on high, healthy ground to the south of Chuala, and after I had personally reconnoitered the country, details of men were made and volunteer locomotive engineers obtained to superintend the repairs. I found six locomotives and about sixty cars, thrown from the track, parts of the machinery detached and hidden in the surrounding swamp, and all damaged as much by fire as possible. It seems that these trains were inside of Corinth during the night of evacuation, loading up with all sorts of commissary stores, etc., and about daylight were started west. But the cavalry picket stationed at the Tuscumbia Bridge had, by mistake or panic, burned the bridge before the trains got to them. The trains, therefore, were caught, and the engineers and guards hastily scattered the stores into the swamp, and disabled the trains as far as they could, before our cavalry had discovered their critical situation. The weather was hot, and the swamp fairly stunk with the putrid flour and fermenting sugar and molasses. I was so much exposed there in the hot sun, pushing forward the work, that I got a touch of malarial fever, which hung on me for a month, and forced me to ride two days in an ambulance, the only time I ever did such a thing during the whole war. By the 7th I reported to General Halleck that the amount of work necessary to re-establish the railroad between Corinth and Grand Junction was so great, that he concluded not to attempt its repair, but to rely on the road back to Jackson, Tennessee and forward to Grand Junction. And I was ordered to move to Grand Junction, to take up the repairs from there toward Memphis. The evacuation of Corinth by Beauregard, and the movements of General McClernand's force toward Memphis, had necessitated the evacuation of Fort Pillow, which occurred about June 1st. Soon followed by the further withdrawal of the Confederate Army from Memphis, by reason of the destruction of the rebel gunboats in the bold and dashing attack by our gunboats under command of Admiral Davis, who had succeeded Foote. This occurred June 7, Admiral Farragut had also captured New Orleans after the terrible passage of Forts Jackson and St. Philip on May 24, and had ascended the river as high as Vicksburg. So that it seemed as though, before the end of June, we should surely have full possession of the whole river. But it is now known that the progress of our western armies had aroused the rebel government to the exercise of the most stupendous energy. Every man capable of bearing arms at the South was declared to be a soldier, and forced to act as such. All their armies were greatly reinforced, and the most despotic power was granted to enforce discipline and supplies. Beauregard was replaced by Bragg, a man of more ability, of greater powers of organization, of action, and discipline, but naturally exacting and severe, and not possessing the qualities to attract the love of his officers and men. He had a hard task to bring into order and discipline that mass of men to whose command he succeeded at Tupelo, with which he afterward fairly outmaneuvered General Buell, and forced him back from Chattanooga to Louisville. It was a fatal mistake, however, that halted General Halleck at Corinth, 
and led him to disperse and scatter the best materials for a fighting army that, up to that date, had been assembled in the West. During the latter part of June and first half of July, I had my own and Hurlbut's divisions about Grand Junction, Lagrange, Moscow, and Lafayette, building railroad trestles and bridges, fighting off cavalry detachments coming from the south. And waging an everlasting quarrel with planters about their negroes and fences, they trying, in the midst of moving armies, to raise a crop of corn. On the 17th of June I sent a detachment of two brigades, under General M. L. Smith, to Holly Springs, in the belief that I could better protect the railroad from some point in front than by scattering our men along it. And, on the 23d, I was at Lafayette Station, when General Grant, with his staff and a very insignificant escort, arrived from Corinth en route for Memphis, to take command of that place and of the District of West Tennessee. He came very near falling into the hands of the enemy, who infested the whole country with small but bold detachments of cavalry. Up to that time I had received my orders direct from General Halleck at Corinth, but soon after I fell under the immediate command of General Grant and so continued to the end of the war. But, on the 29th, General Halleck notified me that a division of troops under General C.S. Hamilton of Rosecrans's Army Corps had passed the Hatchie from Corinth and was destined for Holly Springs, ordering me to cooperate as far as advisable, but not to neglect the protection of the road. I ordered General Hurlbut to leave detachments at Grand Junction and Lagrange, and to march for Holly Springs. I left detachments at Moscow and Lafayette, and, with about 4,000 men, marched for the same point. Hurlbut and I met at Hudsonville, and thence marched to the Coldwater, within four miles of Holly Springs. We encountered only small detachments of rebel cavalry under Colonels Jackson and Pearson, and drove them into and through Holly Springs. But they hung about, and I kept an infantry brigade in Holly Springs to keep them out. I heard nothing from General Hamilton till the 5th of July, when I received a letter from him dated Rienzi, saying that he had been within 19 miles of Holly Springs and had turned back for Corinth. And on the next day, July 6th, I got a telegraph order from General Halleck, of July 2d, sent me by courier from Moscow, not to attempt to hold Holly Springs, but to fall back and protect the railroad. We accordingly marched back 25 miles, Hurlbut to Lagrange, and I to Moscow. The enemy had no infantry nearer than the Tallahatchie Bridge, but their cavalry was saucy and active, superior to ours, and I despaired of ever protecting a railroad, preventing a broad front of 100 miles, from their dashes. About this time, we were taunted by the Confederate soldiers and citizens with the assertion that Lee had defeated McClellan at Richmond, that he would soon be in Washington and that our turn would come next. The extreme caution of General Halleck also indicated that something had gone wrong, and, on the 16th of July, at Moscow, I received a dispatch from him, announcing that he had been summoned to Washington, which he seemed to regret. And which at that moment I most deeply deplored. He announced that his command would devolve on General Grant, who had been summoned around from Memphis to Corinth by way of Columbus, Kentucky, and that I was to go into Memphis to take command of the District of West Tennessee. Vacated by General Grant. By this time, also, I was made aware that the great, army that had assembled at Corinth at the end of May had been scattered and dissipated, and that terrible disasters had befallen our other armies in Virginia and the East. I soon received orders to move to Memphis, taking Hurlbut's division along. We reached Memphis on the 21st, and on the 22d I posted my three brigades mostly in and near Fort Dickering, and Hurlbut's division next below on the river bank by reason of the scarcity of water, except in the Mississippi River itself. The weather was intensely hot. The same order that took us to Memphis required me to send the division of General Lew Wallace, then commanded by Brigadier General H.P. Hovey, to Helena, Arkansas, to report to General Curtis, which was easily accomplished by steamboat. I made my own camp in a vacant lot, near Mr. Moon's house, and gave my chief attention to the construction of Fort Pickering, then in charge of Major Prime, United States Engineers, to perfecting the drill and discipline of the two divisions under my command, and to the administration of civil affairs. At the time when General Halleck was summoned from Corinth to Washington, to succeed McClellan as Commander-in-Chief, 
I surely expected of him immediate and important results. The Army of the Ohio was at the time marching toward Chattanooga, and was strung from Eastport by Huntsville to Bridgeport, under the command of General Buell. In like manner, the Army of the Tennessee was strung along the same general line, from Memphis to Tuscumbia, and was commanded by General Grant. With no common commander for both these forces, so that the great army which General Halleck had so well assembled at Corinth, was put on the defensive, with a frontage of 300 miles. Soon thereafter the rebels displayed peculiar energy and military skill. General Bragg had reorganized the army of Beauregard at Tupelo, carried it rapidly and skillfully toward Chattanooga, whence he boldly assumed the offensive, moving straight for Nashville and Louisville. And compelling General Buell to fall back to the Ohio River at Louisville. The army of Van Dorn and Price had been brought from the Trans Mississippi Department to the east of the river, and was collected at and about Holly Springs, where, reinforced by Armstrong's and Forrest's cavalry, it amounted to about 40,000 brave and hardy soldiers. These were General Grant's immediate antagonists, and so many and large detachments had been drawn from him, that for a time he was put on the defensive. In person he had his headquarters at Corinth, with the three divisions of Hamilton, Davies, and McKean, under the immediate orders of General Rosecrans. General Ord had succeeded to the division of McClernand, who had also gone to Washington, and held Bolivar and Grand Junction. I had in Memphis my own and Hurlbut's divisions, and other smaller detachments were strung along the Memphis and Charleston Road. But the enemy's detachments could strike this road at so many points, that no use could be made of it, and General Grant had to employ the railroads, from Columbus, Kentucky, to Corinth and Grand Junction, by way of Jackson, Tennessee. A point common to both roads, and held in some force. In the early part of September the enemy in our front manifested great activity, feeling with cavalry at all points, and on the 13th General Van Dorn threatened Corinth, while General Price seized the town of Aoka which was promptly abandoned by a small garrison under Colonel Murphy. Price's force was about 8,000 men, and the general impression was that he was en route for Eastport, with the purpose to cross the Tennessee River in the direction of Nashville, in aid of General Bragg, then in full career for Kentucky. General Grant determined to attack him in force, prepared to regain Corinth before Van Dorn could reach it. He had drawn Ord to Corinth, and moved him, by Burnsville, on Aoka, by the main road, 26 miles. General Grant accompanied this column as far as Burnsville. At the same time he had dispatched Rosecrans by roads to the south, via Jacinto, with orders to approach Aoka by the two main roads, coming into Aoka from the south, viz. De Jacinto and Fulton Roads. On the 18th General Ord encountered the enemy about four miles out of Aoka. His orders contemplated that he should not make a serious attack, until Rosecrans had gained his position on the south. But, as usual, Rosecrans had encountered difficulties in the confusion of roads, his head of column did not reach the vicinity of Aoka till 4 p.m. of the 19th, and then his troops were long drawn out on the single Jacinto Road, leaving the Fulton Road clear for Price's use. Price perceived his advantage, and attacked with vehemence the head of Rosecrans's column, Hamilton's division, beating it back, capturing a battery, and killing and disabling 736 men. So that when night closed and Rosecrans was driven to the defensive, and Price, perceiving his danger, deliberately withdrew by the Fulton Road, and the next morning was gone. Although General Ord must have been within four or six miles of this battle, he did not hear a sound, and here General Grant did not know of it till advised the next morning by a courier who had made a wide circuit to reach them. General Grant was much offended with General Rosecrans because of this affair, but in my experience these concerted movements generally fail, unless with the very best kind of troops, and then in a country on whose road some reliance can be placed. Which is not the case in northern Mississippi. If Price was aiming for Tennessee, he failed, and was therefore beaten. He made a wide circuit by the south, and again joined Van Dorn. On the 6th of September, at Memphis, I received an order from General Grant dated the 2d, to send Hurlbut's division to Brownsville, in the direction of Bolivar, thence to report by letter to him at Jackson. The division started the same day, 
and, as our men and officers had been together side by side from the first landing at Shiloh, we felt the parting like the breaking up of a family. But General Grant was forced to use every man, for he knew well that Van Dorn could attack him at pleasure, at any point of his long line. To be the better prepared, on the 23d of September he took post himself at Jackson, Tennessee, with a small reserve force, and gave Rosecrans command of Corinth, with his three divisions and some detachments, aggregating about 20,000 men. He posted General Ord with his own and Hurlbut A divisions at Bolivar, with outposts toward Grand Junction and Lagrange. These amounted to nine or 10,000 men, and I held Memphis with my own division, amounting to about 6,000 men. The whole of General Grant's men at that time may have aggregated 50,000, but he had to defend a frontage of 150 miles, guard some 200 miles of railway, and as much river. Van Dam had 40,000 men, united, at perfect liberty to move in any direction, and to choose his own point of attack, under cover of woods, and a superior body of cavalry, familiar with every foot of the ground. Therefore General Grant had good reason for telegraphing to General Halleck, on the 1st of October, that his position was precarious, but I hoped to get out of it all right. In Memphis my business was to hold fast that important flank, and by that date Fort Dickering had been made very strong, and capable of perfect defense by a single brigade. I therefore endeavored by excursions to threaten Van Dorn's detachments to the southeast and east. I repeatedly sent out strong detachments toward Holly Springs, which was his main depot of supply. And General Grierson, with his 6th Illinois, the only cavalry I had, made some bold and successful dashes at the cold water, compelling Van Dorn to cover it by Armstrong's whole division of cavalry. Still, by the 1st of October, General Grant was satisfied that the enemy was meditating an attack in force on Bolivar or Corinth, and on the 2d Van Dorn made his appearance near Corinth, with his entire army. On the 3d he moved down on that place from the north and northwest, General Rosiorana went out some four miles to meet him, but was worsted and compelled to fall back within the line of his forts. These had been began under General Halleck, but were much strengthened by General Grant, and consisted of several detached redoubts, bearing on each other, and enclosing the town and the depots of stores at the intersection of the two railroads. Van Dorn closed down on the forts by the evening of the 3d, and on the morning of the 4th assaulted with great vehemence. Our men, covered by good parapets, fought gallantly, and defended their posts well, inflicting terrible losses on the enemy, so that by noon the rebels were repulsed at all points, and drew off, leaving their dead and wounded in our hands. Their losses were variously estimated, but the whole truth will probably never be known, for in that army reports and returns were not the fashion. General Rosecrans admitted his own loss to be 315 killed, 1812 wounded, and 232 missing or prisoners, and claimed on the part of the rebels 1423 dead. 2025 prisoners and wounded. Of course, most of the wounded must have gone off or been carried off, so that, beyond doubt, the rebel army lost at Corinth fully 6,000 men. Meantime, General Grant, at Jackson, had dispatched Brigadier General McPherson, with a brigade, directly for Corinth, which reached General Rosecrans after the battle. And, in anticipation of his victory, had ordered him to pursue instantly, notifying him that he had ordered Ord's and Hurlbut's divisions rapidly across to Pocahontas, so as to strike the rebels in flank. On the morning of the 5th, General Ord reached the Hatchie River, at Davies Bridge, with 4,000 men. Crossed over and encountered the retreating army, captured a battery and several hundred prisoners, dispersing the rebel advance, and forcing the main column to make a wide circuit by the south in order to cross the Hatchie River. Had General Rosecrans pursued promptly, and been on the heels of this mass of confused and routed men, Van Dorn's army would surely have been utterly ruined, as it was, Van Dom regained Holly Springs somewhat demoralized. General Rosecrans did not begin his pursuit till the next morning, the 5th, and it was then too late. General Grant was again displeased with him, and never became fully reconciled. General Rosecrans was soon after relieved, and transferred to the Army of the Cumberland, in Tennessee, of which he afterward obtained the command, in place of General Buell, who was removed. The effect of the Battle of Corinth was very great. 
It was, indeed, a decisive blow to the Confederate cause in our quarter, and changed the whole aspect of affairs in West Tennessee. From the timid defensive we were at once enabled to assume the bold offensive. In Memphis I could see its effects upon the citizens, and they openly admitted that their cause had sustained a death blow. But the rebel government was then at its maximum strength, Van Dorn was reinforced, and very soon Lt. Gen. J. C. Pemberton arrived and assumed the command, adopting for his line the Tallahatchie River, with an advance guard along the Coldwater, and smaller detachments forward at Grand Junction and Hernando. General Grant, in like manner, was reinforced by new regiments. Out of those which were assigned to Memphis, I organized two new brigades, and placed them under officers who had gained skill and experience during the previous campaign. 